Hi, everyone. Hello, good morning. Hi, morning. Hi, Dr. Vinod, Dr. Raja, Dr. Rohan. Hi. Good morning, Dr. Malika. Hi, morning. Thanks a lot. Nice to see you. Yeah, and so nice to see you all up to yeah. an RPC. We'll just start in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Malika, Dr. Parijat, Dr. Rohan. Hey, good morning, sir. How are you? Great. Great to see you all. Good to see you, man. Hello, Dr. Malika. Hello, Dr. Parijat. Hello. Hi. Dr. Parijat Chandra. How are you? Thanks. Thank you. लाइव कर दिया क्या जब लाइव करेंगे तो बता देंगे लाइव यू आर लाइव डॉक्टर परिजात वी कैन सी यू एंड हियर यू टू ओके चलो हेलो डॉक्टर नमस्कार 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 नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग कौशिक So I would like to now invite our moderator, Dr. Rohan Chawla, sir. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Rohan Chawla. I will request uh, Dr. Mohan Chawla My to please to... introduce our chairpersons, and I would like to hand over the virtual dais and the physical dais to Dr. Rohan Chawla. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, and uh, I think we should take off the mask now. <laughs> okay, so. welcome everyone early morning saturday thank you everyone for joining us so early and let's hope we get to hear some lovely talks on retina so without delay we'll start the session uh, is dr brijesh online i think we'll take the second speaker first uh, we'll start with dr kaushik tripathi dr kaushik was a senior resident with us and a wonderful retina surgeon and he's also done uvitis fellowship under stephen foster professor stephen foster so he will be talking to us about the role of wide field fluorescein angiography in present retina practice over to you kashik so we will be discussing the uh, currently available commercial white, uh, white field uh, fundus imaging systems the relevance of fluorescein angiogram in current practice ultra wide field uh, fundus imaging and fluorescein angiogram for retinal disorders and for ocular inflammation 
currently available uh, wide field fundus imaging uh, systems include red cam which can uh, measure uh, which can show up to 130 degree of retina optos 200 degree of retina heidelberg spectralis which has a non contact method to of 105 degree and uh, contact method using a uh, storing lens showing 150 degrees of retina and claras Optos is a confocal scanning laser microscope. It has a, uh, an elliptoid mirror, which has two uh, focal points. And the second focal point is located behind the uh, pupil so that it can uh, image up to 200 degree or 80 to 82% of retina. And there are three, uh, this is a pseudo color image uh, and three lasers are used, red, green, and blue. Even in the uh, current era of Octa, uh, most many uh, retina, retinal physicians and uh, not using fluorescein angiogram because it is invasive and there are rare incidences of nausea, vomiting, vesicular at attack, anaphylaxis, and obviously you need a fluorescein angiogram machine and you might have to take uh, clearance from the uh, nep nephrophysician be uh, before planning this. But as of now, leaks of new vessels and central serous retinopathy cannot be uh, seen in OCTA. And also peri uh, in imaging periphery is very uh, easily done uh, with ultra -wide field uh, imaging and they, that shows peripheral capillary non proliferation very nicely. And phobiosis versus CME uh, is noted by seeing the leak in cystic macular edema. In astrohyalosis, fluorescein angiogram can give very uh, clear picture. And uh, in optos, we have a single panoramic image. It, it can be used to monitor the disease, can be used to counsel the patient, and also can be used to target the peripheral capillary non proliferation area in ischemic uh, retinal diseases. And another thing is in optos, we can image in very uh, hazy media and even in very small pupils. And obviously, many eyes which seem that the eye is doing okay in. Uh, casual examination, there might uh, fluorescein angiogram might reveal multiple new vessels and the need of anti-PEG or additional uh, PRP. Also, white field angiogram, uh, we had reported this uh, family with uh, carrier atrophy and uh, phobiosis. There was uh, interretinal uh, septae and no leak on angiogram. And we had followed this family for five years and it showed. It showed an wonderful uh, like progression of the disease. The patient was advised uh, vitamin six supplementation did not take, and uh, he was non-compliant. We also reported the ultra wide field angiographic features of uh, uh, retinal detachment, and we showed that in all cases there are uh, significant areas of peripheral capillary non perfusion Also, this was another case in which uh, there was uh, lacrimal abscess, and we uh, mis mistook at uh, it as a coronal mass or scleritis, and then uh, the angio uh, angiogram here shows that there is there was some uh, retinal tortuosity and crowding of the vessel at the location of the mass. So this is uh, like this is how it can image like give a panoramic view of the retina and uh, the uh, pseudo color image, the autofluorescence, the OCT, and angiogram shows the findings in base disease. Uh, another thing is that um, uh, capturing whole retina is very much easily possible with the this thing uh, with optos and this choroidal detachments are so um, nicely captured. This was the case with supracortical uh, hemorrhage in pregnancy induced hypertension. Obviously, exudative RDs also can be uh, seen uh, uh, imaged using this optos. This was a case with uh, subacute closing and incompatibility so whom we uh, like followed up with ultra -wide field imaging and it shows the whole image including hemorrhagic retinitis also there was peripheral capillary non production on angiogram and vascular anastomosis in the periphery this is uh, in uv it is where there is cataract small people posture sinica we can actually see even though uh, uh, in direct ophthalmoscopy may be very difficult this was a case, uh, case with cmb retinitis with large break and retinal detachment and Acute retinal necrosis can be uh, can be uh, monitored very nicely using this uh, multiple images of uh, with of optos. And we had recently published this uh, feature that GIA, though it was th thought to be a primarily uh, anterior segment disease, it uh, it co definitely causes peripheral uh, like around in around seventy percent cases we saw peripheral vascular leakages.
in uh, GIA and uh, it changed the management plan in many in many cases whom in whom we do not see enter segment activity on slate lamp. It also uh, can show uh, inflammatory component in RP retinitis pigmentosa. This was a case with retinitis pigmentosa and intermediate degradation and CME, which who responded very nicely to oral steroid. And then we shifted to uh, posterior subtenone because the patient developed some complications due to oral steroid. Thank you. But definitely, cost is a uh, major limitation of optos. It is pseudo color image, it is not a true color image. There are artifacts due to cataract and eyelid. The superior and inferior retina uh, is imaged. Imaging superior and inferior retina is difficult, but we can li like shift the eye and image them also very nicely. Ora to ora is ora to ora, and actually panoramic image is not possible. And obviously, it doesn't replace a clinical examination. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Koshik, for such nice images. Uh, time permits, I think we'll take the questions at the end. So I would just like to welcome our chairpersons, uh, Professor Rajpal, Professor Pradeep Venkatesh, uh, Professor Sarita Perry, who has joined us online. She's head of department, Lady Harding, and Professor Malika Goel, who is also senior consultant at Hyderabad. Welcome, Professor Malika and Professor Sarita Perry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. GVN Ramakumar to come and deliver his talk on OCTA. He's a leading uh, a practitioner at uh, Indore. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. I loaded my presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's an honor to be here as a speaker and uh, always pleasure uh, homecoming uh, and meeting all the friends over here. Thanks a lot. So. Uh, Okta, is it a, still a research tool or already clinical? What is my experience? I wanted to share with, all you, with you all. I don't have any financial interest. Usually the basic uh, equipment for retina practice, uh, whenever one wants to start their own practice, basic ophthalmology clinic, fundus camera, OCT, B scan and green laser, microscope uh, viewing systems and VR surgical systems. Uh, like when I was asked to uh, give my consent for a presentation over here, uh, someone asked me they're purchasing OCT uh, and uh, the person is uh, asking them to take uh, Okta also. So they asked me, call, they called me and asked me, is it worth taking Okta? So because any of the OCT, uh, if you are uh, going for Okta software in that, it costs at least 15 lakhs to 40 lakhs extra um, uh, over and above what you're investing on it. So first commercial Okta equipment was launched uh, in the world in 2014. And uh, now many ophthalmic institutes are, all, are having Okta systems. And uh, most of the publications and presentations, they uh, keep uh, showing the Okta images. So everyone is uh, like, is it that new thing which is already clinical? Uh, they want to know. So I had started working on Okta two years back, though it's pandemic time, I could get good uh, hands on on that. So I wanted to share my experience. Look at this picture. This is a patient uh, post trauma and uh, recent uh, diminution of vision. If you look at the OCT uh, images, all the 12 scans also, you, you cannot see any kind of a uh, kind of uh, obvious except for some doubt regarding a subretinal hyperreflective material, uh, nothing like an active uh, kind of a CNVM or anything. So if you just go to this, you may not, even if you do an FFA because there is no fluid space also, you may not be see seeing a leakage also. But if you look at the Okta, you can see the uh, beautiful uh, CNVM next to the uh, scar which was there. So this is where Okta is giving uh, good, good support for your uh, clinical decision making. So what you, I look at usually is the superficial uh, plexus, deep plexus, uh, the avascular zone that is the outer retina, chorea capillaris, and the uh, flow overlay. So this is what I usually look at. I'm also not well-versed yet. I'm still, because Okta is, uh, is, a, is a big uh, question mark for many also. Uh, same for me, still uh, not at well-versed, but whatever I'm uh, able to comprehend, I'm just trying to present that here. So early cases of diabetic macular edema in the deep plexus, you may be seeing the uh, macro aneurysms, even if there is no macular edema. And this is the best part of it. Like within uh, uh, no time, you can tell the prognosis to the patient if you are seeing any kind of an ischemia like this, even, even uh, like with, with edema, though we treat, but the prognosis can be explained to the patient when you look at the macular ischemia like this. There are different grades of macular ischemia, which you can image with Okta. And you can see, uh, though there is no macular edema and the patient, uh, after evaluating everything, you are also not uh, seeing anything significant. 
but you look at the octa you see this macular ischemia the patient is 618 and is worried about improvement in vision you can explain to them that because of this ischemia you may not be improving much so prognostication becomes much easier and faster in cases of diabetic uh, retinopathy and these are the different grades of ischemia which i came across uh, in in different uh, patients and this this is the severe grade of ischemia where you can see only some ghost vessel vessels kind of thing so these are uh, the worst possible cases which you can see and montage picture it like dr uh, koshik was mentioning the peripheral uh, uh, capillary non perfusion is not that clear yeah i do agree it's very difficult uh this this montage picture uh, showing uh, new vascularization and a uh, lot many uh, new vessels uh but the drawback of this octa is you can't see the leakage so here you can see the capillary non perfusion in this octa montage imaging you can see the non perfusion and also the new vascularization corresponding to the new vascularization which is faintly visible on the color fundus photograph and masked by a uh, hemorrhage here so you can see that kind of a uh new vessels uh on on octa 2 but definitely you cannot see the leakage and this is pre uh, avast in a sheet of uh, new vascular uh, new vascular uh, membrane over the macula so this was pre avast i planned for a surgery so i gave avast in and after the avast in the uh, new vascularization comes down though the uh, matching is not there 6 mm scan and 4 mm scan but still you can see the reduction in the vascularity though color fundus photograph is not showing that much of vascularity uh, in the previous pre avastin picture also but the octa is giving you good uh, this thing about the density of the new vessels over there and uh, one whenever you are seeing a br vivo this was a uh, 39 year old uh, male without any systemic illness who got uh, 10 days later at uh, branch retinal vein occlusion and uh, one one i think two months after the uh, first injection of anti vgf he came back and he didn't require any repeated uh, injections and you can look at that the fo the foveal avascular zone is not much altered over here and the uh, ischemic retina is little definitely away from the fovea so this this kind of a uh, faster and easier uh, way of looking at the macula perfusion is uh, possible in this octa and brvo collaterals you can see uh, beautiful collaterals forming next to the fovea over here and uh, ischemia also uh, though this is a new case uh, the fresh case of uh, brvo because of the profound ischemia over there over the long term you may say that the patient may not be doing well even if the edema resolves we need further uh, this thing uh, follow up on these cases and a beautiful imaging of the retinal ma artery macro aneurysm so you can see though it is not that clearly visible and you you may not be able to uh, see that uh, uh, on the on the color fundus or in your clinical examination you can see it on the b scan and the uh, flow overlay is also showing and you can see that uh, retinal artery macularism being responsible for the macular edema over there similar kind of a picture when you do the octa the same kind of sarcinate exudates and you suspect there may be a uh, macro aneurysm but when you do octa you don't see uh, there are uh, micro aneurysms only and there is no macro aneurysm so this kind of a differentiation is possible when you can do uh, octa and the right angle venules on a uh, parafoveal tel injectasia and uh, mostly the earliest pictures they show changes in the deep plexus and uh, when when uh, like this patient was uh, shown that he uh, he had a, on a routine b scan he was told that he has pft and uh, he 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 was not advised any treatment elsewhere but when he came to me i saw this uh, beautiful choroidal vascular membrane associated with the pft so though there was no subretinal fluid uh, i i told him you, he has to go for a uh, treatment so and ischemia of the crvo especially the macular ischemia you can uh, image that on octa and the most uh, useful uh, this thing re is regarding exudative amd and the uh, choroidal vascular membranes and the follow up how the membranes like you can see 3rd of april this uh, membrane uh, was shown like this and with uh, retinal and subretinal fluid and after the treatment you can see the vasculature coming down on uh, and sorry for the repeat and myopic cnvms though they say uh, octa is pretty useful in uh, diagnosing without ffa and uh, i i my experience with uh, myopic cnvms is most of the times i i keep getting artifacts and disturbances because of the uh, thin thinning over there and also because of the degeneration around uh, i can say out of 10 or 15 uh, my, my myopia uh, cnvm where i image i may get one or two cases some kind of faint uh, membrane kind of a picture and this patient had a, a subfoveal hemorrhage but uh, and you can say that that you you 
prefer because one eyed patient and uh, getting 624 i did uh, i didn't go for a ffa and i just uh, saw this but though i could not uh, image anything i i did treat this patient but the patient improved very well don't know whether the hemorrhage resolved or the injection worked but yeah but my experience with myopic cnvms is that you don't get good imaging most of the times even if you uh, try to keep getting all those images repeatedly so these are kind of post trauma cnvms where uh, 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 after the trauma, the patient had a CNVM. I treated uh, stable and uh, for two months, he didn't get the treatment. The membrane increased. And then after the treatment, again, the membrane started coming down. And these are quiescent MNVs, which I have been following up over six months. They have maintained very well. So as of now, we are not treating these cases. So the follow-up of these quiescent MNVs is also pretty good. And the capillary hemangioma, which is imaged, and a post-fever retinating showing the capillary non-perfusion. So on conclusion, I would like to say that it's a very good, useful clinical tool, but pretty time consuming. Out of the 30, 40 images I saw for that, I had to go through 1000 images on my system. So most of the times you don't get good uh, images, especially if you are giving it in the hands of an assistant. So it is useful. Invest for it before your second laser console or a second VR surgical system. And if you can have a dedicated operator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dawa. Like you said, I think it's best that the ophthalmologist himself or herself sits on the machine, segments the images properly and interprets yes. them properly. And I think we can always keep discussing on which OCTA membranes are to be treated and which are not. Yes. But I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll go on to the next talk. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, can we have the timer on screen also, please? For, the, for each talk, we are not able to see the timer. Please give it on the screen also. Yeah. So now I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Brijesh. Dr. Brijesh was also senior resident with us and now he is consultant at uh, LVP Hyderabad. And Dr. Brijesh would be speaking on I hope focus retina. Are you there, Dr. Brijesh? Yeah, good morning, sir. I, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. Can you be a little bit louder? Uh, I hope you can see my screen, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, not yet, not yet. You are not able to see my screen. At least online, Dr. Prajesh, we cannot see. Yes, online, we, we are all, uh, Dr. Malika and myself are online and we cannot see your screen. So please check. This slide should be visible online as well. This is your slide. Uh, please go to the Zoom screen. Dr. Prajesh would be there. It, it says Prajesh Tucker has started screen sharing. Uh, don't start this presentation. Please switch this off. Go back to the Zoom screen. Dr. Brijesh is there online. Allow him to share his slides, please. Are you able to share, Dr. Brijesh? Yes, sir. Can you see my slides? Mm, Not yet. Not online. I'll do it again. I'll unshare and share again. Now? Yes. No, sir, not able to see. Ah, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Now we are able to see. Oh, I'm so sorry for the trouble early on. I have been a part of the trouble that RP Center also. So, uh, as sincerely as ever, I'm over here in front of you. And uh, I take the liberty of putting this slide in front of you. So, a lot many thanks to all of you on the dais uh, in RP Center as well as in Ames. So, you have taught me how to stand and walk. The impetus that you have given, this gun that you see is the impetus that you have given, given me. And the support which, which, with which you have turned me how to be responsible is something that I still carry with me. So I was part of uh, AIMS from 2003 to 2017. And it's uh, my voice is shaking as I speak. It was this nostalgia and pride which is making me shake. So it was a blessing being over there. And it's another blessing in which I have stepped into with your support. So I uh, will be speaking about I hope focus retina. So I shall introduce the group about I hope first. So I hope or Indian Health Outcomes Public Health and Economic Research Center uh, is basically a collaboration between LV Prasad I Institute Network, the IIM Ahmedabad, and Indian Institute of Public Health Hyderabad. It is supported by DBT Welcome uh, India Alliance group, and it started as a. a grant proposal which was placed in November 2019 got approved in December 
and finally in april 2020 uh, the i hope was launched so this is the scientific team so uh, dr raja is the principal investigator and the other investigators are uh, dr chirantan from iim ahmedabad dr vipin from uh, lvpi only dr gvs murthy from iiph dr rohit from lvp and dr mehul from harvard boston so these are some of the activities with what we have been doing and for the past two years so our basic focus if you will see my cursor also has been on big data health economics and public health the idea is to bring all these things together and to impact policy at our own hospital level, uh, level at regional level or at national or international level so uh, the main outcomes the main goals remain development of a sustainable system which can attract and train the best talent as well as influence the health policy so our milestones till now have been uh, development of the skilled human resource i cannot uh, present everything in the 8 minutes which are allotted to me we had around 30 publications in last years and three fellows were inducted into this i am one of those fellows so uh, we also launched our journal in the january of uh, this year and we also launched our learning hub objective which actually rolls out many online courses which can be taken by clinicians researchers and public health professionals as well so uh, i hope has also collaborated with nice international towards formulating standard treatment guidelines so these are the three fellows and uh, i am one of them as i said some of our activities have been um, our annual conference which was done last year in september the journal as i mentioned and the learning platform also as i mentioned we have also been doing a host of webinars so focusing now on retina which i think uh, interest us more after a brief introduction of i hope so there are three projects with which i am involved as a lead investigator from representing i hope so the first one is the uh, sanscog project so this is the srinivasapura aging neuroscience and cognition study the collaborators are us at lvp uh, iisc and nimhans and uh, the basic aims of this project is that can we predict uh, mild cognitive impairment and alzheimer's dementia and from the ophthalmic perspective uh, we are looking at changes in oct and oct angiography in the long term so the idea is to screen and to keep on screening this cohort model for more than 10 years and uh, with a sample size which is in five figures so we have planned three visits we go to the homes of the patients we recruit them get them to local centers do their uh, blood testing genetic profiling and uh, ultrasound of abdomen and echocardiograms then we get them to our the tertiary centers in bengaluru and over there we perform the oct oct angiography mri pet scan etc etc and also uh, develop ipsc lines for future research so the results so far we have recruited 3000 uh, patients through primary visits and we have had 800 mri done and more than 300 oct oct angiography is done five months into this project as of now the uh, other project which i am doing with i hope is developing a normative indian database for a newer uh, method of measuring the macular pigments so uh, the collaborators over here are us at lvp azul optics university of bristol and tufts university so the aims are to develop again a net normative database for macular pigment optic density so this one uh, in itself is not going to change treatment but it is going to impact uh, the research further ahead for macular pigment and uh, the diseases which uh, revolve around this particular fulcrum so we have also developed some uh, specific diet scores which look at measurement of lutein and zeaxanthin itself these are they are based on uh, on both us as well as indian guidelines utilizing both icmr nin as well as us fda data so um, a lot of input had gone into this months of planning had gone so the method over here is a simple cross sectional study which assesses the lifestyle diet as well as carotenoid scores and also assesses smoking towards their impact on macular pigment density so we have already crossed the uh, finishing line over here the recruitment process has been done though we are still continuing to recruit more to have a better number and uh, uh, next month we should be analyzing this and hopefully present in another forum to you so the third project which i work on is uh, drishti or diabetic retinopathy retardation in its incipient stages so the collaborators are uh, multi pronged over here spread all across our uh, country and i am hoping to get more collaborators into this 
the aim is uh, it's a phase two phase study one first phase is to evaluate various factors which are influences and risk factors in people who have diabetes but not dr and in phase two we a certain therapies for all these factors trying to treat diabetic retinopathy in the non stdr phases so uh, this is a uh, 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 long model study and it will go on till 5 years and uh, we are yet to start on it so uh, this the results should be out in another 5 to 10 years it's a long timeline but this i think is what is needed for uh, managing a complex disease like diabetic retinopathy which involves metabolic factors lifestyle factors physical activity factors genetics so on and so forth so it has to be a very uh, broad as well as narrow study at the same time so this is what i wanted to tell about i hope but uh, my voice was sharing and it is shaking and it's still shaking because it's really nostalgic to be present in this forum and i will again say to uh, my professors my teachers who are there in on the dais as well as those who are not in the dais or not a part of our center right now you made me walk you actually taught me how to be a doctor how to be responsible and you still continue to help people like me run so thank you again thanks a lot thank you dinesh i think you have started a very nice projects collecting big data is not easy and i think these projects would definitely give us results in the next 4 5 years and they would be really valuable results for clinical practice as well uh, please keep up the good work uh, one more thing sir i am touching all your feet please please thank you okay next i would like to welcome uh, dr raju again an ex senior resident with us and an accomplished retina surgeon working at bangalore dr raju please yeah uh, continuing the note i would uh, like to convey my pranams uh, to all my teachers here it's indeed a nostalgic moment uh, to be here and that's why i made it a point to come to rp center and uh, present uh, here personally rather than online so i'd like to thank uh, uh, the chief uh, dr jst sir for giving us this opportunity to share our little experience that we have uh, in front of all of you uh, i'll be speaking on uh, something that uh, we rarely encounter that is retinal detachment in uh, retinoschisis and um, this is the brief outline of uh, what i'll be speaking we'll look at uh, why we have vision loss in retinoschisis and how to manage uh, uh, these patients of uh, retinal detachment in retinoschisis so we are all aware that uh, there are uh, uh, three types of retinoschisis it could be acquired it could be congenital and it could be secondary commonly we encounter the uh, senile or uh, degenerative uh, uh, retinoschisis and uh, these are usually benign but however they can cause vision threatening complications so if you look at this table very nice table from jacobic uh, the differences between the acquired and congenital is with respect to the age of the presentation and how the breaks are so in uh, the acquired variety the outer retinal breaks are larger while uh, in the congenital variety the inner layer breaks are larger and the presentation is usually in the first decade in the con congenital variety while in the acquired it is usually in the fifth decade so why do you have vision compromise in these patients with retinoschisis so it could be because of the posterior extension of the retinoschisis cavity or it could be you can have outer wall breaks and the schisis detachment which happens wherein the the schisis fluid extends into the subretinal space the next uh, cause for vision loss could be the progressive regmatogenous retinal detachment wherein you will have breaks both in the inner and the outer layers which allows the liquefied vitreous to enter into the uh, both the schisis cavity as well as the subretinal space so this is how a posterior extension would happen but however this almost never happens uh, if you observe these patients very closely and uh, you should resist lasering because these are very very slow to progress and most of the times they never progress so no treatment including laser has been shown to halt the progression of retinoschisis the next cause is the uh, the formation of the outer retinal breaks so once the outer retinal breaks happen the schisis fluid which is rich in mucopolysaccharides actually enters into the subretinal space and this can start extending and these are usually large breaks and the uh the if they may be have uh, the breaks may be there for long time and you may see a ring of pigmentation 
And usually, again, these also do not progress very rapidly. And re-examination at uh, regular intervals is what is recommended. And this is a photograph which I've taken from Retina today, wherein it shows that this Shisis detachment has been there for almost four years and has not progressed. So basically, in these patients, you need to follow them up regularly. And this, in this study by Bayer et al. showed that over a nine-year period, most of these patients did not progress. So hence, in these patients, you can follow up them. And only if there's an extension you feel on a case-to-case -case basis, we may have to treat it. So we should use uh, our judgment. If it is a progression is happening on a case-to-case -case basis, we may have to either consider a laser barricade or consider a buckle in these patients if it is peripheral. The next is the progressive retinal detachment wherein there will be breaks in both the uh, inner layer and the outer layer and then the fluid enters into the uh, subretinal space. This leads to a retinal detachment and this behaves like a regmatogenous retinal detachment and you can see the corrugated retina in these patients. However, this is very rare to happen. It happens only in 0.5% of the patients with retinoschisis and the patient becomes symptomatic because of the progressive scotoma here. As far as the principles of management are concerned, the treatment is same as for any regmatogenous retinal detachment. Here, the main primary uh, goal, surgical goal is to close the outer retinal wall breaks and you should treat the inner wall breaks also. Collapsing the retinal schisis cavity is optional, but even if you collapse uh, on table, it may still recur or it may happen in the post-operative period again. Uh, as far as the what are the uh, techniques that you can use to fix this, either you can use a scleral buckling or a pass plan a vitrectomy. If the break is anterior, that is the outer retinal wall break is very anterior, then you can consider a uh, scleral buckle. And uh, however, if there is PVR or a posterior location of the break, then we can consider a uh, pass plan of vitrectomy. Then what should you do with the inner retinal layer? If there is no traction, then one can consider retaining the wall. And if you want to do a drainage, you have to drain it, make a drainage retina to be above the outer retinal uh, wall so that you can drain both the fluids. However, if there is a traction present, then it is better to excise the uh, out uh, the schisis cavity wall. Uh, this is a patient who presented recently to me. This is a 50-year-old diabetic patient uh, with uh, presented with vision loss in the other eye. He had a retinoschisis in this eye, uh, and in the other eye, he had a six by uh, four by sixty vision and a large uh, outer wall break. So I'll show you, sharing with you a small video here. Uh, this patient also had uh, proliferative changes. So I went ahead with the vitrectomy in this patient and he had a very adherent uh, vitreous. You can see here at the time of induction of PVD, there were a lot of neovascular uh, fronts which were there, and there was some amount of bleeding from there, and went about uh, uh, doing the vitrectomy around those fronts. And this is the large uh, break, and overlying vitreous was quite densely adherent. So we had to separate that out. How this patient actually did not have any proliferative changes in the other eye. So uh, this is more likely because the long-standing retinal detachment and the schisis itself can cause uh, the, the, this kind of uh, proliferation in some of these patients. It can cause neovascularization. It has been reported. Here, the neovascular front has been trimmed here. So then I went ahead and did the uh, diathermy to the uh, schisis cavity. There you can see that I'm uh, uh, excising the schisis cavity now. So the outer retinal wall break had a rolled up edge and it was a, quite a large uh, break. The schisis cavity is being removed now. You can see the edge of the schisis cavity there. So 
then I did the diatomy to the edges of the outer wall break and uh, went ahead and uh, freshened up the edges because the it appeared to be very taut. So this last part. So it's important to uh, make sure that uh, the all the traction is relieved. Otherwise, uh, there's a chance when you have such a large break, uh, the uh, PVR can happen at these edges and again, the retina can get uh, lifted up. And they are also the epiretinal membrane is patient. So we, uh, after injecting, uh, BBG, we just uh, removed that membrane and went ahead with the fluid air exchange. And then uh, we did a laser and injected silicon oil. So this is the post-operative at uh, three weeks. This patient required to a vision of six by 24 at uh, three weeks with silicon oil still in C2. So to conclude, uh, most cases of uh, degenerative retinoschisis require observation only. Uh, intervention is only required when there is a posterior extension of the schisis detachment or there is a progressive uh, regmatogenous retinal detachment. And the main aim of the surgical management is to close the outer wall breaks. And the surgical technique chosen must be individualized on a case-to-case -case basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raju. Dr. Raju has been a pioneer in developing techniques for uh, posterior segment video recording at low cost. And I think you could see from his recording, he's done wonderful recording. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Raju. Thank you. Now I will call upon Dr. Vishal for the next talk. And Dr. Vishal is also an alumni from our center and he has also been presenting wonderful surgical videos which have uh, won awards internationally. So, uh, can you connect the computer, please? Did he connect the computer? Any questions for any previous speakers? Any, uh, Dr. Malika, Dr. Sarita? Uh, I have one question for Dr. Koshek. He had explained about the octos being saying that it is. Dr. Koshek is there? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So you did mention that the octos has some problems, like it does not give you a, a like a full figure. Like you have to make. I think again, you have to make a. Uh, you have to. It uh, doesn't give a 200 degrees thing, but and also you said that it was. I have never seen octos. Like we were in planning to buy one octos for lady hand, uh, one wide angle fundus camera. So what would you suggest would be the good wide angle fundus camera, which is? Um, um, I think uh, octos is the best among what is available now. As of now, octos is the uh, uh, camera which gives the most wide image as of now, and it gives 200 degrees. I said that. The superior and inferior uh, periphery uh, imaging is difficult because of the lashes. Upper eyelashes and lower eyelashes, they can obscure the images. But uh, definitely, the uh, almost all the centers, including international centers, they are they have optos and optos is the currently uh, it is the, the like the coverage is maximum for optos. But in rare cases, in, if you have uh, any peripheral lesion like dialysis or something, you have to ask the patient to look downwards. And also, I did not show the images of ROP in uh, ch uh, children also. They can be kept in flying baby position and uh, ROP images have, can also be captured with this very nicely. Uh, any uh, idea about the size wide-angle cameras? Yes, uh, Clara's. Claros is there, but uh, the periphery aura, you, you can definitely image uh, aura with optos um, by uh, asking the patient to look sideways. But I think uh, because the uh, Claros is a like true camera, true image, uh, like color, true color image, and it can, you can create a montage image, but imaging uh, aura and parse planner will be difficult with Claros, which might be possible with Optos after uh, like maneuvering the patient's eye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, mine is connected. Can I have this feed on the screen? Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you, RP Center. Or Mere Samast Guru Janoko Sada Pranam Yape. And it's always a humbling experience to be in your parent institute and present something you're doing. 
so i'll be discussing vitrectomy in pediatric uh, retinal detachments besides rop uh, the challenges faced and how is it different from the adult detachments we do in our daily practice so i'll be skipping the theory part and i'll be presenting the of course uh, the cases here which were you know deemed uh, unsuitable for scleral buckling which we all know is the gold standard for uh, pediatric detachments so coming to the common denominator uh, in all uh, pediatric detachment uh, that is the adherent hyaloid and it's always been a challenge you know to to induce a pvd in these cases and for the past 5 6 years we have been doing this technique which we introduced and it uh, involves you know creating a cleavage plane in the posterior hyaloid after staining it with transferon acetonide and once the cleavage plane is formed we fill it up with the pfcl you know cleaving the hyaloid till the equator and then uh, with mild section uh, with a cutter so it always works it's a very elegant technique it's uh, safe to the underlying retina it's uh, quite reproducible and always works in every case i do and of course we have modified uh, you know uh, the technique in many ways now we don't uh, you know use just the forceps as you can see we are uh, we have made a hole in the hyaloid and we have filled it with the the pfcl and we use any blunt instrument like the light pipe you know just to swipe it from the other hand <coughs> to create that well and then we can uh, you know put more pfcl in that well and uh, increase the size of that uh, hole and uh, cleave the hyaloid so that's about pvd induction in pediatric detachments and of course these uh, uh, traumatic cases uh, have a anterior pathology they may have a you know retinal dialysis and this is one of my very old videos in which you know you, you can see the kinking of the cannula and what happens is you have to be very careful because all the the fluid goes into the subretinal space and it's uh, you know mess when you go inside so you have to be very careful that the fluid is directed into the vitreous cavity not in the subretinal space so we had uh, you you know in this case we had to you know remove the cannula and put it in the infra nasal quadrant and proceed with the surgery so we have a large department of you know a rare disease in pediatric uh, age group and they you know routinely diagnose tickler syndrome and they present to us uh, with a wide you know variety of grts with radial rapes and with the curled retinas because as there is no vitreous <coughs> even the fresh grts you know get adherent the retinal flaps get adherent very difficult to separate the important point i want to highlight here is that even in the attached part of the grt there are you know many sleeve like holes and when you are doing a base trimming they open up and can uh, create a rd and of course this is a 270 degree grt and the hallmark here is you know these radial rips and you have to be very careful while putting pfcl and unfolding the retina because the pfcl go in, uh, can go into the subretinal space but more difficult is these cases which are old and in which you cannot induce the pvd and here i have found that more than the uh, trypsin or acetonide a uh, trypan blue or any blue dye works more efficiently in you know highlighting the cleavage plane as you can see we thought that uh, there was a uh, induction of pvd but uh, after staining under pfcl you can see a very sticky thin membrane of hyaloid is coming out with you know repeated multiple attempts and finally we are able to find that after the first nick when it unfolds on itself we can you know identify the borders and gradually we try to dissect it till the arcade and then beyond the arcades to the equator so if you don't remove these membranes it's a sure shot recurrence in these cases <clears throat> so the the crux here is multiple stainings with trimsonone with repan blue and to make sure that there is no hyaloid left behind before you proceed to fluid exchange and laser finally the boy did well in the post op period i'll not go into the details of the coloboma rd but uh, i'll just you know show you a small video of a recurrence of coloboma rd after 6 months of sor and here i want to highlight again <coughs> that in adult detachments if there is a recurrence it occurs in the first couple of weeks or one month at the most but in these if you are not very meticulous uh, during the silicone oil removal you can miss the thin sheet and these recurrences because the uh, sheet is so thin these recurrences occur a couple of months or maybe 4 to 5 months after the silicone oil removal as you can see we identified that thin sheet and after 6 months the patient you know he was doing fine with 624 vision but after 6 months the patient developed a recurrence and the reason was that missed thin hyaloid sheet coming to fevr cases this uh, is the <clears throat> one eye of a patient which i operated 10 years back again and at that time i did not know i did not have much experience about fevr and here uh, the 
thing is that the uh, temporal fibrovascular arcade, which is very adherent to the retina, has to be taken care of. You cannot peel it off. So in inadvertently, while you are you know pulling it on it, you can create iatrogenic breaks. And that was the lesson I learned in my first case. And the same patient, although very well lasered, developed art in the other eye. Uh, Ten years later. And as you can see, there are so many additions, but at this time, I was very careful not to pull on the temporal fibrovascular arcade, but still there are, uh, you know, additions extending to the macula. And here, as I pull that highlight, a macular hole is formed, iatrogenic. Otherwise, the uh, surgery was routine. You trim the interior part, the posterior part of the fibrovascular band, you repair the macular hole, you laser it thoroughly. Albinotic fundus is always challenged because of the low contrast and you cannot see. So this was a recurrence after scleral buckling and we could not find the primary break. So we created a break, injected, uh, you know, subretinal uh, brilliant blue after posterior PFCL bubble. And you can see the movement of the BBG, uh, the Brownian movement, and you can see the, uh, the dye is coming out of the primary break, which was temporal to the macula. Here it came out and we found the primary break and then we lasered it with long duration burns and interior cryopexy. Of course, re detachments will occur in these cases always, and you have to go inside sometimes more frequently than adult detachments. And if you're lucky, you will find, you know, this whole sheet of, you know, proliferation, uh, and it can come in one piece meal if you go early. And of course, in these patients, you have to take care that if you are removing all these membranes, in addition, you do ILM peeling also to prevent macular pucker and ERM formation in the post-op period. Of course, these are not cosmetic surgeries and you have to sacrifice the lens along with the capsule if there's anterior PVR. You always try to dissect the membranes bimanually or unimanually as much as possible before, of course, you know, deciding for a relaxing retinotomy. But if you do a relaxing retinotomy, it should, it should be adequate inside. It should not be cosmetic because a small retinotomy is of no use. And here we did a you know, thorough uh, ample retinotomy to settle and relax the retina. And some cases present with macular holes and this was a large macular hole and this would not have closed with a routine ILM peeling. So what, uh, uh, here we are doing a multi-layered inverted ILM flap uh, under PFCL because a routine ILM flap would not work in this case. And as you can see, large leaflets of the ILM are stepped into the retina, extending from the arcade to the macular hole. And you can see a poster period, the hole is closed. So in conclusion, PPV in children is challenging because of the unique anatomy of the pediatric eye and if performed meticulously taking care of the complex anatomy, it can yield excellent anatomical reattachment rates. Of course, it's not a perfect science and every case has to be customized. And of course, a thorough counseling to the parents is mandatory because visual gain is suboptimal in view of late presentation and possible irreversible photoreceptor damage and disc damage. Thank you. Vishal, all of us know the cases that he has shown are quite tough and not easy to manage and how beautifully he has shown the videos, the management of these cases and how now he's nicely he has used PFCL. Just one tip that when you have so much of PFCL in the eye, probably we should keep the infusion very low with our closed systems. Otherwise, yes. the PFCL can go in places where we don't want it to go. Okay. Anyway, so we'll call the next speaker, Dr. Thirumulesh. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Yes. Dr. Thirumulesh, also an alumni of RP Center. Now working at Narayan Nitale. Uh, and we have Dr. Thirumulesh presentation. Uh, Dr. Thirumulesh has done wonderful study in early detection of diaptic retinopathy and his paper was appreciated multifocal ER in diaptic retinopathy. That is one of the, his contribution. And later on, other people have started. Thank you. Thank you. You can see our student, the senior resident or the junior resident who takes up the thesis carefully can produce so many things. And that idea was a thing. So in early detection of diabetic retinopathy, he has done the multiple ERG. Thank you very much sir, for the, the kind words. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Jeevan Tithyal for giving me this opportunity and also faculty right now for considering me uh, to come here and deliver a lecture. Oh, slides. So I'll be talking about why it is important to kind of uh, look at uh, your uh, clinical uh, uh, cases and go back and uh, you know learn from the failures. So uh, this is about uh, what I learned after doing a few macular hole cases. 
So I'll not go into this that we all know that uh, for macular oral surgery, ILM peeling has pretty much become the standard. And um, these are the various modifications where, you know, uh, one does a ILM peel or we can use a temporal flap or multi-inverted flap or, you know, some people plug the ILM, some people put amniotic membrane, some people actually transfer, you know, autologous, uh, do an autologous retinal transplant. Uh, you know, one might be as good as the other. I'm not going to go into the discussion of that part. Uh, the second controversy with macular oral surgery is how many days do you position? So as you can see, there have been many papers where the positioning ranges anywhere between one to seven days and uh, the tamponading agent can be anywhere between either using an AR or two uh, SF6. Again, uh, the views are varied. Uh, my preference is to use an SF6 and I'll tell you why. Because at some point of time, uh, this was a paper I presented in AOS where I did uh, these 20 uh, patients and uh, I thought that one day positioning was good enough. But uh, on the follow-up part of it, when I was uh, looking into my cases, what happened is uh, this is the technique that you usually use. Uh, pretty much standard. I do a, a predominantly a 23 gauge uh, short plane. Okay, anyways, I think ILM uh, peels uh, most of us have seen. So let's not delve into too much of that. So these are the cases where uh, I was able to image the OCT on the first post of day using an SS OCT. You can see that, uh, uh, you know, majority of them are closed. So this was what gave me an impression that one can stop positioning the day you see that the next day the hole is closed. Other thing that I want you to note is that on the SSO city, there is a granularity at the place where there was a hole, right? So what happened was there was reopening in two of the cases. This particular patient I had used air and uh, this reopened, I was able to image and you know the image showed that there was a closure, but day five, you see that the hole had opened up. So why it opened up? So then I did a peripheral examination and I could see that there was a white glial plug sitting below. So this was the glial plug which was, you know, which over a period of time closes the hole. There was another patient who had undergone a type two closure. Even this patient had post of day one closure under uh, the gas in this particular patient, the gas fill was not very adequate and it escaped and this had a type two kind of a closure. Now, based on these two, I wanted to know what is that that went wrong? So for that, uh, uh, one has to understand what is the molecular basis of how an ILM, you know, closes when you do an ILM surgery, either with flap or otherwise. So this paper published in retinal cell biology says that whenever you do a, a you know ILM peel, there are migrating Muller cells and glial cells. You know how can you identify these? Is that these are GFAP positive cells? So when I did the surgery, what I did was I took the ILM and I sent it to our lab. Uh, Praveen Machiraju is our uh, postdoc uh, who is working on cyto microscopy. So uh, using this particular uh, 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 Thermo Fisher Scientific, we were able to find the cells. So the theory was actually right that there were glial cells in the ILM. So when you do the flap, these are the ILM uh, uh, you know, cells uh, which are going to proliferate and form the plug initially. So this was the technique that was used. So we are stained with GFAP antibody and then uh, we used a 647 uh, laser filter to image the cells. So if you look at reconstructive morphology, initially when you do a flap, there is a filling up of the gap by these glial uh, cells, which will then contract and then uh, there is bridging of the ELM and then uh, the excess glia is eliminated and that's how the macular hole, you know, gets opposed. So based on this, I went back to my uh, case. So I did a patient who had a macular hole and I had did a uh, macular hole surgery, but here I use silicon oil tamponade. So this helped me in understanding this. So if you see this, the first one is the pre-op where there is a macular hole. Then I did a ILMP. So this is normal routine OCT, you know, which all of us have. And you can see that uh, under the oil meniscus, uh, the glial plug can be seen on post of day one. Now, within a span of two days, what happens is that the glial plug becomes a little more denser. By day five, you know, it's already uh, getting uh, reorganized. By day seven, the, the, uh, the bridge is pretty much better. And in, by first post of month, you can see that the glial plug, which is excess, is getting chucked out. And by third month, you can see that uh, you know, all the layers have been integrated well. So why I come to this particular slide is for that important reason that the two failures that I had, the one under air, where the glial plug fell down, probably uh, it was not uh, tight enough, you know, uh, attached on the sides. 
and the other one which had a, a, a you know a, where i had put air maybe the 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 template support to the glide plug was not that much so it's important that you know it's pretty good to say that yeah maybe we can stop positioning on one day but until and unless there is a adequate filling of gas which will support the glial proliferation and the glial bridge you know we might end up with cases so one extra day of positioning has never done any harm and uh, i would not really advise on air tamponade in macular hole cases because you never know how much tamponade it is able to provide as a template for the glial plug to actually mature and form this bridge and uh, so based on that uh, the reason majority of the times now i counsel patients is that yeah i'm going to do the macular hole surgery but you know the you know, the post operative positioning is on an average of 3 days so uh, we have stopped doing one one day post operative positioning so we are now at 3 uh, days uh, thoughts on the autologous retinal transplant i have not done many uh, uh, if uh, you know uh, you guys would uh, give me some input regarding this it will be greatly appreciated because i feel i mean this is my thought i might be wrong so what i feel is that when you do an autologous retinal transplant it's not that the retinal integration is happening like uh, many authors claim you are just uh, putting more Uh, glial cells to proliferate, which might actually do, and you know, out of uh, you know, they're going to eat up the retinal cells, and the bridge is still going to form. So, uh, if there is anything that uh, that can be discussed beyond this, that's great. So, I end my slides here. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the opportunity, and thank you all for teaching me what I, you know, to be what I am today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor Phil. <clears throat> thank you i think regarding the retinal transplant even i of was of the opinion that no regeneration will occur there but i think the literature is coming up and showing us things which we never thought would happen i think probably dr raja can comment on that thanks a uh, very nice presentation to everyone thanks uh, rohan uh, i i think we have done in one particular case a very good documentation of multifocal erg OCT, OCT angiography, and fluorescein angiography also, and uh, there was retinal integration. But the edges, the remodeling keeps on happening over a very long period of few months. It's not like macular hole within one month. Most of the remodeling happens, and the the there is scar formation at the edge of the recipient and the host. That's also there, and that is very densely adherent. So I have even tried to remove after a few months. See, because I had one edge of that retinal transplant was not completely reattaching, but the rest of it had attached. So I tried to see if I need to remove it and re-put a re-graft again. But it was very densely adherent. But retinal integration in terms of the multifocal ERG that was very nicely shown. There is some recent paper which has shown that even some photoreceptor. Uh... the uh, redifferentiation and all is also being occurring at the edges also so maybe we need to look into this but actually uh, in now uh, uh, in one of the animal experiments what they had shown was that uh, if if it is in the zone where uh, you know you put a reconstructive cell a neutrophil can actually redifferentiate or allow you know uh, induce an activated neutrophil can induce a redifferentiation of the residual cells to the you know to regenerate the region but uh, in humans i don't think there is any reports which actually showing something like that the so, one of the problem can be how you can put the uh, the retinal transplant uh, over the macular area okay that is the main thing which uh, uh, rohan has put some slurl graft uh, over that it is very difficult in other cases now recently we are in the process of a new technology which we will declare either it will come in the new in the Uh, any general, but that is a very simple technique which will be which will become rather than the, that thing. The only thing is in which cases we have to use these thing transplant. Uh, at one uh, side we are seeing ninety percent success, but uh, other side we are having uh, all these cases. There is a lot of controversy as a presentation. So we were uh, we are unable to put that graph over the hole and keep it over there. Yes, Ron, what is your experience? So with the new techniques, with bimanual manipulation, PFCL, yes, maybe we can. But again, we are not no, no. too many of these cases. No, no, but it is very them. difficult to stick over there unless you put some glue and all these things. We are practical. I would again welcome Dr. Rajesh, and he is again Vitor Reta Sajan from Bangalore Sankara Hospital. Please, Rajesh. Thank you, sir. Um, good morning, uh, respected colleagues and teachers. So. 
it's very nostalgic uh, and i would proud to be a part of this uh, great institute and that the latin word uh, specifically means alma mater means nourishing ma mother i thank all my teachers who have nourished us with appropriate knowledge and hand holding and teaching us and more importantly i would say with pride that the senior residents who are the lifelines for us throughout this course and you know we came out to do much better in life thanks one and all so i would like to start my talk with unconventional methods of how we practice uh, the usual cases nothing great about these but um, there are some uh, you know snippets of how we can manage alternatively to the conventional methods so let us see um, one of the commonest surgeries which was done uh, previously or the only surgery which used to be the um, the burnt banner of uh, uh, vr surgery before and once vitrectomy was introduced it's gone uh, taken a step back and rarely we do it so that's the buckle surgery so this is a 60 year old gentleman who has a fake uh, retinal detachment with a superior temple hst so what we all want to do is nowadays maybe there is a you know you get a 50 50% of uh, a uh, decisive uh, decision once uh, some people will say vitrectomy some people will say buckle so when we do a buckle and if the buckle fails so what are the primary causes the buckle will fail one is uh, that it was a not an appropriate selection of case that you had a missed break or you had multiple breaks or the break was not adequately supported whatever like that so uh, the obvious the conclusion will go is go into vitreoretinal surgery but let us look into some other other uh, situation in which a buckle fails see uh, you have a parallax error if there's a bullous retinal detachment and the buckle uh, you couldn't really you know uh, isolate the break and uh, the buckle was somewhere else and the break was not supported so you do a buckle revision you place you drain the srf you again see the buckle i mean the break localize it and do the buckle revision the next part is you have isolated the break but once you saw in the pre op the break was very small because of corrugations or whatever but once the retina set settled the break was quite large and it lifted up back again so i'm talking about a buckle augmentation what we can do so this is a retinal detachment with a large break so you have placed the buckle but the posterior edge is not supported now so you go ahead with what we call as a augmented buckle so this is a video so what we do is you, you whatever you are taken a 276 or 279 so one of the edges you have shaped you have placed the primary buckle you leave it over there and on top of it you sleeve another part of the buckle below it so i'm taking a you know a suture about 2 mm posterior to the largest thing so this is a 276 buckle that's 7 mm so that's in c2 pass another buckle below it so now approximately about 12 to 14 mm of uh, uh, you know the retina has been supported because of this uh, simple augmentation so this avoids us from you know going again and taking the all the pains of inducing the pvd and sometimes which also had shown cases where it was very difficult to induce PVD in these cases, high myo pediatric cases where you don't want to venture inside. So in this case, we just you know increase the augmented augmented the buckle effect a little bit and thereby helping the patient uh, preventing unnecessary further procedures. The case scenario two: if you have a macular edema like this and you have a particularly tortuous blood vessel, you always look in the periphery and you can see a large capillary hemangioblastoma. Treating these hemangioblastomas is sometimes if it's a small one it's quite easy you do cryo and it responds well you can see very well responded the macular edema is gone but if you look at the way if you treat peripheral lesion it's okay large if you do cryo or laser if it's a large with traction particularly you will prefer to do brachytherapy because if you do cryo or laser it will cause further traction cause a traction retinal detachment or a combined retinal detachment if it's posterior location there's not much of treatment uh, which is available the whole and soul we go ahead for brachytherapy but it has its own complications such as radiation retinopathy due to proximity and the exudates and macular edema because of these uh, treatment per se or because of the exudating hemangioblastoma there's conflicting reports some say anti of work some don't i just accidentally bumped upon a patient i'll um, discuss about it these are some of the treated patients so the macular edema and the hemangioblastoma do respond to laser i think this is a brachytherapy um, you know treated patient both the cases did well so this is a patient who was a childbearing age who presented to us she didn't know what was the problem she had some kind of a blurriness in the vision in the right eye we looked upon there is a you know macular edema and there is a posterior located capillary hemangioblastoma and when we further investigated she has a full blown vhl with bilateral renal cell carcinoma and other issues so let us stick up on treating the eye since she was a childbearing age she didn't want any anti-VEGF into the eyes. So we didn't have any other options. So we, I just gave 
sorry the IVTA in first post of day, you could see the complete normalization of the four-wheel contour. It was quite a surprise for me. I didn't have um, such kind of an experience before. We have treated before only with, uh, you know, uh, saying that it may or may not respond, but it beautifully did respond to the injection. Yeah. And then um, how to treat about these uh, patients? You don't want a brachytherapy in the source. Um, I did TTT. Though uh, way back, um, Shields Group has uh, described doing TTT for uh, these patients, only five cases they have uh, treated and most of them were very papillary. The uh, case selection was not that very good. That's what I feel like because they were all about more than three disc diameter. If you could see it's wonderfully responded, the macular edema has not gained back and the vascularity has completely regressed. This is the other eye of the same patient which had a macular role with an ERM, with an again, a capillary hemangioblastoma, which is just about at the posterior pole. So did the routine macular role surgery, which closed along with TTT to the lesion and it has responded beautifully. Suppose that I have treated almost six patients, all of VHL with TTT and it has responded well. Other application of TTT is this uh, acquired retinal astrocytoma, which had exudated and multiple antivirals were given elsewhere. That's the treatment which has been described. But TTT, the patient has responded beautifully. The lesion has regressed along with heart extracts. Coming to the third scenario, which we um, um, sometimes commonly you know, we get a bump up on. So this is a patient who is a 52 year old male who had sudden uh, diminution of vision about seven days. When you see there's a large uh, macronism with uh, multiple level of hemorrhages, it's more of subretinal also. So this is the OCT showing, uh, you know, a huge amount of amount of subretinal hemorrhage. So the treatment options for such kind of an, uh, not, not the lesion per se, but for the subretinal hemorrhages, anti-VEGF monotherapy, pneumatic displacement, or a combination of pneumatic displacement along the RT RTPA or a past plan of vitrectomy going full blown either into the vitreous cavity or into the subretinal cavity. Uh, the most common approach is using a 41 gauge needle. So this is a post-operative of the same patient. The fovea is, um, you know, back to its normal place. But when I looked into uh, the problems of using a 41 gauge, it's costly. Not all institutes or not, it's not available in every place. Not all institutes can afford it. And the common is because it's costly, we start reusing it. That's the commonest issue as far as India is concerned. See, when you look, the most commonly used port is a 23 gauge. And when you see that it, it transmits, there is a huge amount of space for it to the transmitted, uh, uh, you know, uh, alterations of one, whenever you do something, it, it, the, the way it is transmitted at the end of the retina is very high. So if at all you want to do this case in a 41 gauge, you need to put it in the first or second when your hand is very stable, it's not you know, shaky. But if, you, if it's around fourth or fifth or sixth case, then your hand is pretty shaky and those transmitted movements can go and injure the retina. So what I did was uh, just take a 26 gauge, one and a half inch needle, which we use for FNAB, most of these patients. And when I inserted this to a 23 gauge cannula and saw, so it's pretty stable. There's no transmitted uh, movements at all, and it's very cheap. So it's universally available, and it can be, you know, uh, the one of the advantages which we speak about 41 gauge is self sealing. I'll just show a video. So just a small modification of it, just bent at the tip, made a small retinotomy, and changed the way it has to be injected also. I've injected first the subretinal uh, air so that it acts as a tamponade for this uh, retinotomy which we are doing. And after that is done, I just go inside and uh, inject the uh, tissue plasma in activator. So now that the um, the gas or the air which is over there tamponades and prevents the the recombinant tissue plasma in activator from coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raji. We could probably have injected the cocktail itself, combination of DPA and gas air together. Sir, we can, sir, definitely. But um, you know, one after the other, or the sequence of it might be a bit of a difference. So I do. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now I welcome Dr. Dipinder. Presentation on myopic traction maculopathy. So Dr. Dipinder and um, myself, we are colleagues, and he is now director of a very prolific eye chain in Delhi, and doing very good retina work here. 
till he sets up his presentation i think uh, professor pradeep would be uh, quite happy seeing your presentation uh, rajesh about the revision of buckling because many of us are yes, wary right. of reopening the you know younger of... generations now every time uh, buckle fail they do uh, we are sorry but we were in that that phase we used to revise once or twice i have seen one patient in which i have revised three times and got the retina test so that is the misconception dr pradeep and we are still the the thing but because of the lack of time dr pradeep is also found ki in case we must do where buckling is possible we, we must do the buckling that is the thing and uh, dr pradeep anything you can uh, go ahead dr pradeep yeah uh, very good morning and uh, at the outset i'd like to congratulate all rpc alumni sitting here and watching us online on 55th uh, foundation day it's indeed a, a very uh, uh, great moment for all of us to come back and present and like dr bijesh was saying goosebumps are natural because uh, you are presenting in front of your teachers it reminds you of your thesis presentation days and all tough cases and you know all the grilling so uh, but yes that made us uh, whatever little we are so uh, today i'll be uh, speaking on uh, managing myopic tractional maculopathy and in fact when we were doing our sr shape uh, very few surgeons were actually operating these cases so whatever we have learned or uh, uh, you know uh, by burning our fingers or by learning from other colleagues in is it in last one decade only and as you see the literature i think long back when oct came into our practices that uh, uh, soji kishi and takano they initially described this oct picture of uh, tractional maculopathy where you can see these things happening in uh, over the staphyloma in myopic eyes and then in way back in 2004 uh, penezo and mercanti they were the first to coin this term myopic tractional maculopathy and what followed next was a series of efforts to classify uh, you know uh, this entity and i'll not go into the details of these classifications uh, references are there you can i think refer to them uh, they have done a good effort to classify but point i wanted to make was that whenever you try to classify an entity this tells us that it's a very heterogeneous uh, entity so you have multiple things happening in these myopic eyes and uh, it can be retinoschisis or it can be surface issues like erm and lamellar macular holes then you can have a limited foveal detachment or you can have whole posterior pole which is detached and that is what these people who are classifying they are trying to explain to us that uh, it is a heterogeneous entity so once it is a heterogeneous entity our surgical approach will also has to be modified depending on what we are dealing with now but the million dollar question which comes to our mind is once we have started detecting it and classifying it How, how to decide which cases are operable and when to operate them now like it's true with all macular diseases i think uh, if you have to document progression uh, before you decide upon surgery and second you have to look at the visual potential so for visual potential we can always look at outer retinal layers and uh, if photoreceptors and rp are healthy and no point operating atrophic eyes and of course duration of symptoms the uh, for how long patient is having vision loss that is again very important just like uh, involvement of fovea so just to show you an example of both eyes of uh, one patient even in color picture you can make out right eye is much much better than left eye but when you compare octs you can see uh, that retinoschisis involving center both sides but on the right eye you can see outer retinal layers are well preserved unlike in the left eye where it's gone and you can see this transmitted hyper reflectance uh, showing that there are no photoreceptor left so this is how you can take a clue that whether to touch this eye or not but before you jump for surgery there are lot of people who have tried to see uh, see the natural course of myopic tractional maculopathy and in general consensus is majority of them will not progress almost 80 85% cases will stay static for years so that's why i highlighted that document the progression before thinking of surgery and this is just an example of a young uh, software professional who was actually advised surgery at uh, some other hospital but he came with 66 vision and we started following him and just to show you that despite having traction and retinoschisis in the parafoveal area he had very good visual acuity 6 by 6 even till last follow up a uh, few a couple of weeks back you can see the fovea is undisturbed there is a retinoschisis even 
uh, peripapillary detachment also happening, but fairly stable. So that is really the, and his, even his left eye, the fellow eye is also fairly stable all these years. So the important pearl I would like to start with is that most of them are stable and don't jump for surgery. Now this uh, another lady in which she was initially treated for myopic CNVM and she did well with just one injection and then she has been fairly stable uh, since 2014. And you see again, developing retinoschisis, but she was quite uh, stable and fovea not affected till 2020 when she came uh, with drop in vision. And you can see now fovea getting involved with phobioschisis and vision dropping to six by 24. And you can see it on the scans. And this is how it looked. So uh, we decided to operate her. And because there was no lamellar macular hole and no, uh, there was no uh, foveolar detachment. So in these cases, uh, what we do is we do uh, conventional ILM peeling, no sparing of fovea. So again, this is one pearl I wanted to share. So don't think that myopic tractional maculopathy is you have to do foveal sparing peel for all cases. And in general, contrast is poor in these cases, but only till you have raised the flap. Once you have raised the flap, then actually you get a better contrast in these atrophic eyes because uh, that brilliant blue uh, shines nicely against the background of white uh, atrophic areas. So you have to raise the flap carefully. And after that, you can always peel it like your regular macular hole cases. So now you see, uh, even at day one post-op, you can see uh, uh, retinoschisis settling down and we just use air in this patient. And again, day five, you can see schisis settling down and visual acuity improving to six by 12. So the point I wanted to highlight was that you are following them serially with OCT scans. The moment fovea gets involved and vision drops, if you operate them early, and this is what I think when we hosted Dr. Soji Kishi a few years back, he was highlighting, unlike Europeans, uh, the Japanese, they operate them quite early. And that's why probably they have better prognosis and they don't have to resort to things like macular buckling and all extreme steps because they are happy doing vitreous uh, surgery with ILM peeling. Now, another uh, challenge when you handle these myopic eyes is uh, they are uh, much longer eyes and they are different eyes than your our routine emetropic eyes. So how do we adjust for that? I think I'll just very quickly run through this because you have heard this in a lot of other meetings also. So first thing, if you have a detachment, we don't put PFO straight away. We start peeling in a detached retina because that reduces the effective axial length. And normally I don't peel away from the disc. I rather peel towards the disc because if you peel away, you are putting traction on nerve fiber layers. You are creating more trauma. So uh, it's not a good idea. Peeling becomes easy if you pull away, but it's, it is more traumatic. Now, if you notice that I, my forceps is not reaching retina. So the moment we encounter this, we can always take out the cannula, but again, I'm not able to reach. So next step is you can shift the sclerotomy posteriorly, take out the cannula and fix a contact lens. So if you are using a contact lens, then your effective length, which is available to you becomes better. And then uh, we were able to peel. So to sum up, uh, uh, start peeling in detached retina, shift to a contact lens, remove cannula, shift the sclerotomy posteriorly. But more important than that, measure axial length pre-operatively and be prepared. Choose a longer forceps. And, and now a lot of companies are making these long forceps, which are as good as our conventional forceps. So uh, the next pearl I would like to, I think I'll quickly sum up, is uh, look for paravascular breaks uh, in these eyes. And this is again, one of the uh, myopic detachments with fractional maculopathy, where I was trying to peel this, uh, the second layer of vitreous, like Dr. Vishal was showing, it's very important to remove it. And you can see this attachment to pigment over the blood vessel. So again, this is uh, one of the uh, pearl to the, I think, fellows that, if you notice a thick pigment over any vessel, especially in a uh, extra macular stephyloma, the break can be lying there. And this is what happened. Uh, I, I realized that there is a paravascular break. So plan was to peel ILM and put a ILM flap over this paravascular break. But somehow I lost uh, the ILM flap. So then 
I just did a very heavy long duration laser in that staphylomatous area. And this is a pearl I wanted to share and that patient did really well, retina nicely getting attached. And this is the area which had the paravascular break. You can see uh, there is no subretinal fluid on either side and patient had very good long-term success also. So just, I think I'll just finish with this case. Again, uh, this was a patient with advanced retinitis pigmentosa with myopia and uh, myopic tractional maculopathy. Now, again, uh, we have to scan whole area of shysis and detachment to look for breaks. So this patient, we didn't find any break. So intraoperatively, uh, also you can actually look for breaks and you just run your soft tip near the blood vessels. And sometimes if you are lucky, you can actually see SRF coming out. But in this particular case, we didn't find any break. So again, peel the ILM only over the detached retina, not in the attach and created a small retinotomy and drained it. So again, uh, if you see, uh, and this patient, I spared the fovea because there was a lamellar macular hole with LHEP also. So you can see retina nicely attached, although there was a, a lamellar hole which was still persisting, but patient's visual equity improved significantly. And this was his better eye actually. Again, another patient I'll skip, uh, just to highlight that if there is a high, uh, foveolar detachment. So sparing fovea in during ILMP also is a, I think, very good maneuver. You can see now this patient, this patient I didn't drain. So you will see shysis and uh, foveal detachment taking very long to disappear. And almost at six months also it is settling down, but has not uh, settled completely. But because we have spared the fovea, we didn't uh, uh, land up with a post-op macular hole. And this is again another case where we scanned the area of detachment. We were lucky to find a break preoperatively and that actually will change the success because then you close it and these patients, uh, they do well. So I'll sum up uh, with a few surgical tips, which I have already shown that uh, you measure the axial length, scan whole area of uh, detachment or shysis, choose a longer forceps, use contact lens. You can do other modifications to address long axial lengths look for paravascular breaks. And if you have a lamellar hole or a high foveal detachment, then probably do fovea sparing lamellar, uh, fovea sparing ILM peeling. And if you have a LHEP, I think uh, avoid disturbing it, leave it uh, there only. So I think with this, uh, I'll sum up and we can thank, take questions. Thank, thank you. At that time, when the machinery was not there to see it very well. Now, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Rohan Chavala to talk about uh, bimanual rotary surgery. He's a traditional officer in RP Center. And uh, this is uh, very close to his heart, bimanual rotary surgery. Thanks, <laughs> Rohan. Thank you, Professor Rajpal sir and Dr. Parijat. So I'll go ahead with my talk. So how can we go bimanual? There are many techniques. We basically need a chandelier, which can be again of many types and it depends on whichever you become comfortable with. You could also use illuminated instruments for doing bimanual surgery. So what is the benefit? It definitely helps to delineate the plane between the retina and the overlying pathology, especially in diabetics. And in diabetics, again, you can do a simultaneous cautery while flushing the blood. Uh, if you have multiple bleeders there, it may help in removing foreign bodies, doing a direct PFCL silicon oil exchange, as well as placing various types of grafts. So I'll show you some of the videos of uh, some of these cases. So this is a diabetic patient. So where you have these uh, tabletop detachments, you cannot see the posterior pole pathology perfectly, uh, anatomy at all. Then you use biomanual to create the plane. So you see with one hand using the forceps, you gently pick up the tissue. We are not going to apply too much of traction to create a break. And with the second hand, with the uh, curved scissors, we are identifying these small pegs of attachment of this fibrous tissue and trying to cut that and create a separation. And here, what I'm doing is what I like to call a radial segmentation. So what I'm doing with the scissors is once we have the plane, we are going from the arcade towards the fovea. And what we have seen is that generally the attachments are much more firm around the arcades. And whereas the at the fovea and the papillomacular bundle, they are 
not that strong and maybe you can go there with the scissors and not be too scared that you would be damaging the fovea and you can then segment these membranes and once you go in from the center and create a uh, plane uh, two flaps would form one will fall temporally and one will fall nasally and then you can then separate and dissect them uh, separately so uh, this is one technique just to show you another uh, diabetic patient so here also you see uh, when you start the surgery with the cutter it might be difficult to create a plane so again gently pull up the tissue and create a pocket there and use the scissors both for a blunt dissection as well as see again i am going radially and you will see that at the macula there is some gap there and once this membrane is off you would uh, never im imagine probably that the macula of this patient was not as bad as it was looking uh, pre operatively so you see you can create that central cauldron then again use your uh, forceps and other instruments here i am using the bimanual technique to flush out the blood and cauterize with the other hand so in interest of time i think i'll just forward the videos so another place where we can go ahead and do bimanual is pvr dissection so this is again a pediatric case like dr vishal showed uh, we can have a lot of problem in teasing out the vitreous up to the periphery and like he said you could add pfcl to stabilize the central retina and it might also push the vitreous peripherally but sometimes uh, you can attach a chandelier and again hold it with one hand and tease it off uh, you could also do it with the light pipe which uh, i have started doing in some cases but many times even doing a bimanual dissection helps and you can hold the vitreous sheet with the forceps and put your scissors into that tease it off that also reduces the traction and cut it and that might again give you a plane where you can insert your cutter later and expand it and complete the peripheral vitrectomy this is an interesting case of foreign body removal uh, which i wanted to show you so here i put the chandelier through one of the ports itself and since i am creating a midline sclerotomy here to insert my uh, forceps or the magnet and this is a fakeic patient but yet uh we have been able to manage the patient without with uh, sparing the lens so we put the magnet and we hold the foreign body there and with the other hand see still it is having so many vitreous adhesions so if i pull it directly i'm definitely going to create a break so just stabilizing it with one hand and using the cutter with the other we remove the adhesions remove wherever it is attached the uh, vitreous hemorrhage as well as the vitreous and once you feel it is significantly free only then would i attempt to remove it from the eye and despite all these maneuvers still you should examine the periphery and you might find a peripheral dialysis or break there as we did in this case and then you still have to manage that so removing the foreign body is just one part of the surgery and enabling that the retina stays attached is the another important part of a foreign body removal so here you can align it in the long axis keep an external magnet as well so as it was not aligned just tugging it with the forcep and for, with the magnetic thing itself it gets aligned pull it out of the sclerotomy and once it's out you can close the sclerotomy the and definitely examine the periphery so you see there is a break there and probably do a wide laser so that you do not end up, end up with a retinal detachment later so this was a patient which had been operated for keratoplasty and had an inferior dense vitreous hemorrhage with a localized detachment beneath the hemorrhage so first i tried teasing off the hemorrhage from the detachment with one hand itself and uh, main risk is that while pulling on the hemorrhage you might create a inferior break so i inserted a chandelier and again stabilizing it with the left hand with the forceps and the right hand scissors you try to cut it from the underlying retina and create a plane so that the pull on the retina reduces so the main aim is to try to avoid creating secondary breaks so for beginners i think when you start the important questions would be where to place a chandelier and what type of instrumentation so when i started i used one port as a 23 gauge port because the 23 gauge are instruments are more sturdy 
and they would not bend initially when i used 25 gauge i spoiled few forceps because they would just bend and now i have totally shifted to 25 gauge because now i have probably better control on my movements and the movements are less but initially you could start with a hybrid you can make one port 23 use a stiffer instrument and as you become more experienced you can move on to 25 gauge placing the chandelier i think one position is 12 o'clock but that sometimes causes shadows so now i have shifted to placing it at infro nasally that is probably the best position to avoid shadows and if you have a twin chandelier then you can place one at 12 o'clock and one at 6 o'clock so uh, all this you can uh, improve with your experience but definitely i think it adds to our armamentarium and my simple message is don't hesitate to go by manual whenever you feel that two hands would be better than one thank you thank you for your patience thank you dr rohan chabla now i will in i will invite the next speaker dr raja narayan he will be speaking on combination of dexamethasone implant in anti vagus resistant pcv he is working as a senior consultant at lb prasad institute very good presentation by the rohan chawla and you know our senior resident are also doing diabetrectomy and they are doing very good diabetic vitrectomy tractional detachment all these thing which rohan chawla has shown earlier we used to take 2 to 3 hours but now because of the instrumentation a young surgeon very good excellent surgeon they are completing within an hour these surgeries so clap for the dr rohan chawla thank you so much uh, to dr kigal and all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present in this session although i am not an alumnus of rp center but i thank everyone because you all have been teachers of our art our teachers i am from gurunanak eye center and also an lb prasad institute A lot of uh, my teachers have been from rp center so i'll be talking about uh, a very um, unusual Uh, treatment intervention in resistant cnvms we all know about resistant cnvms but there can be numerous causes of resistant cnvm and uh, in this case uh, we use dexamethasone implant along with anti vgf and i would like to acknowledge my colleagues up front uh, who have helped in this uh, manuscript uh, from uh, washington university raj apte and uh, um, khushi malikarjun rajiv raman from chankar netralaya um then dr mahesh shanmugam dr srikant padi from lb prasad institute and also arshad khanani from las vegas i have no financial interests or relationship to disclose we all know about these graphs i don't know as a pg question we all can write long answers if we ask about cat trial marina anchor but if we show this and ask someone to identify okay which trial is this you know the left hand one is merina and anchor the top one is merina bottom one is anchor then we have the afli bursep and the right hand side is the cat trial the purpose of this is to let everyone know that in cnvm if we treat with anti vegf this graph doesn't say that everyone gets 6 by 6 but that's a hope and expectation with patients talk to us and we also try to convince the patient somehow that you will be better off may not be 6 6 but definitely patients do not achieve normal vision but very important to look at is the bottom graph in the left hand side this is the natural history graph if you don't treat these patients what happens unless we don't know what happens if we don't treat these patients as dependent or suspension of myopic traction maculopathy we can avoid surgery in the initial stages observe unless there is progression how long does it take to progress in every disease that's the case every disease not just i not just retina it is all across all specialties if we don't know the natural history of a disease we will not know what we are trying to convey to the patient by treatment but if you look at this slide this is the real world this is not from rct in spite of many years of treatment if you see the real world data these patients lose vision 
which is quite different from the previous graphs which i had shown in rct it always once you have taken off lift off you are flying cruising altitude but here you come back again you know fall back but you must compare it with the natural history which i showed the bottom graph that you start going down immediately if you don't treat c and vm whereas here even if you are coming down it's over many years that you come down so that's the important reason and the biggest challenge is frequency of injection multiple injections patients have received more than 100 injections also we know many armd patients around the world but these are the new treatments which are coming up but the resistance could be due to various reasons and what we are looking at is let's say a combination of dexamethasone implant along with anti vegf in armd cnvm as well as pcv this was a single center study at lb prasad institute 16 patients 17 ice patients were injected dex implant along with bevacizumab and ranibizumab if for the previous 3 months they had received three consecutive injections but there was no response that is less than 10% reduction in thickness the outcome measure was anatomical response on oct and also gain in visual acuity and injection free interval this is another important outcome measure not a usual outcome measure in most of the trials usually gain in vision uh, or oct response but what about the treatment free interval so uh, the mean age was 69 uh, gender is equal distribution pcv was 12 wise armd was 5 which is in re reality what in asian eyes we see the mean prior number of injections before dex implant was given was 4.5 and the mean follow up after dexamethasone implant was uh, close to 1 year and if you look at the oct there was significant reduction from pre dex implant injection that is they had received at least 3 injections of anti vegf it was 612 microns but um, after one injection of dex implant and anti vegf injection it was 306 micron but if you look at the visual acuity there is hardly any difference you see this uh, error bars as well as the box there is not much of a difference in fact 20 by 60 and 20 by 60 and what i showed from the real world data we don't we are not looking at you know gaining improving vision here we try and struggling actually to maintain that vision after three injections patient is here then after a few months they are coming back down but the important thing here is injection free interval 35 days if was the mean pre injection interval that we had to repeat but after dex implant and uh, intravertebral injection went to vegf to 169 days but doesn't mean that recurrent doesn't come recurrence does happen but it's much prolonged this is one example patient had received three injection and still the fluid was there pd was a dex implant and uh, ranibizumab substantial resolution this is another patient massive uh, fluid intraretinal fluid after four bevacizumab run ranibizumab no response and we gave dexamethasone this is dramatic drastic response but it does come back this patient again after six months started developing fluid we are given injections again so the limitations of this study are it's a pilot study small sample size as you could see the reinjection criteria are not fixed at this point of time should we inject dex implant along with anti vegf when the fluid recurs or just go back to anti vegf and now we have the alternatives of brolizumab parisumab um, whether that changes this but there may still be cases of resistant to injections because of antibodies in those cases uh, dexamethasone may help so in conclusion dex implant combined with uh, anti vegf treatment can reduce the cmn activity for sure while maintaining visual acuity and the burden of frequent injections can be reduced with the addition of dex implant so this is the uh, yeah thank you so much Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Raja. Excellent, no, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. And really, that's and you have conveyed the message, and that should be the type of lecture depending on the audience and the public. Thank you, Doctor Raja. Yeah, Doctor Malika. Doctor Raja, I have a comment. Excellent uh, points that you made. I just wanted to. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Doctor Malika. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about. Uh, Uh, my experience with a one-eyed lady with PCV, where we, where she stopped responding. There was a large RP detachment. Stopped responding to aflibercept repeatedly. We did a photodynamic therapy. Even then, there was no response. And when we gave an uh, Ozodex implant, suddenly the RP ED flattened out. And then we could continue just with aflibercept. So that's my experience with AMD PCV. 
And earlier when we used to use uh, triamcin alone and avastin, there were a lot of patients which required uh, very frequent injections. We could increase the treatment interval just by uh, adding triamcin alone to the avastin in the same syringe. And we could prolong the treatment intervals to two to three months. Uh, so that experience was very actually for a large volume of patients. Very nice. In fact, earlier before Avastin came, we were giving IVTA for many ARMB patients also. Yes, yes, we were. Thank you, Raja. Very good presentation. Yeah, Dr. Vinod. Sir, do you think in future maybe we can use a study where we use dexamethasone purely as an agent to prolong the interval between the injections and treatment live patients? That's a good question. Unfortunately, the point is uh, Ferisimab by itself is coming up to 16 weeks now. That is on label. And that's a big problem in most countries where, you know, it will not be taken up as off label. But uh, it could be done if Ferisimab, we don't know what the price will be and what there is. But then still, there may be some resistant cases even for Ferisimab where dex implant may be useful. But Dr. Anand, what I remember when we initially started, there were talk of triple therapy, but somehow it did not catch much of vogue and we are not using it. Do you think that your dexamethasone might work more, which has more of intraretinal fluid rather than subretinal fluid or it is, you are not evaluated? No, it's that? both. Massive PDs have reduced with dex implant. The triple therapy was PDT, anti vegf and dexamethasone, that injection solution. Yeah. Uh, but I feel that it it can be an option for resistant cases. I would not recommend it for routine cases which are already this one. Dr. Thirumalis, anything? So I just wanted... Uh, Dr. Vishal. So your yeah. rationale is that uh, the inflammatory component uh, is more in IPCV than in uh, neovascular membranes. That's because, not my because... contention. These are resistant cases. It's more of the anti vegf not being able to act because of the antibodies or tachyphylaxis. So in those so cases, what is the mechanism they are working? On? How is dexamethasone reducing the? How is dexamethasone flattening the PEDs? So it, it is the potentiating action of the dex implant on the anti -vegab. By itself, it may may not be acting as much as the anti -vegab. We all know just steroid alone. If you compare with anti -vegab, it will not be matching anywhere near the anti -vegab action. But it potentiates the actions in cases where there has been an antibody response to the anti uh, vegf that they are not being able to act. In those cases, it See, is. Even in AMD, we know that there is a <clears throat> component of inflammation which is involved in the etiology of AMD as well. So, so that is how. Yeah, so many cases, even with steroids, can uh, be completely dried, even with just anti vegf It's still there, that inflammatory component is there. But in which cases will this get added benefit? At this point of time, I would reserve it for resistance. Basically, uh, when it uh, becomes more and more chronic, that's when probably the combination would work because then uh, the part of the vessel which is uh, still there, patent and leaking, might be inflammatory based because already the vessel price is gone because the scar is up. Quite possible. Quite possible. Uh, Dr. Dipinder? Dr. Dipinder? Uh. I think I just uh, wanted to add that uh, in a uh, lot of case series have already uh, shown this, and its group and all, they have published in ophthalmology. Uh, the usefulness of combining uh, steroid to anti vegf in AMD. The setback was in DRCR trial uh, where they didn't find uh, uh, much benefit. But the challenge which I, I can see is that it was never tried as a monotherapy. So to know the real efficacy of any drug, I think one of, one of the arms could have been a monotherapy. And just like Dr. Malika was saying, one of our patient uh, type 1 CNBM, frank fluid, IRC, subretinal fluid, he brought uh, DEXA implant by mistake and he insisted that give me this only. So I gave it no anti vegf and he dried completely, completely. And I was also surprised because I was expecting that he will need anti vegf within two weeks. Nothing will happen with the DEXA implant. So it works. And I can share the images uh, if you know, on the, a different photo. In the last, I will yeah. comment the world is changing. You know, after 10 years, the whole thing will change because we don't know anything about the pathogenous CNBM because this word itself is changing. So change is the type, the more we go into molecular level. Absolutely. So nothing is true. This is the untrue word. Let me tell you today, whatever is true will be wrong after five years, will be wrong after 10 years. So word will be changing. Thank you, change, change. Narayan. Thank, Thank you, Narayan. And you must read what is Narayan. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go on to Dr. Malika Goel. Uh, she's again uh, 
ऑपरेशन Uh, then we had some post viral sequelae like uh, acute macular neuroretinopathy and pam and post fever retinitis and then some treatment related adverse effects particularly voriconazole related non specific visual symptoms and uh, steroid related central serous retinopathy now why were they on voriconazole because secondary fungal infections are very common in covid and they were therefore on voriconazole for those systemic fungal infections so this was a, a 40 year old male uh, who came with symptoms of endophthalmitis that started during his covid infection and many of these patients developed diabetes during their covid infection because covid itself is known to predispose uh, to uh, causing diabetes from insulin resistance as well as because they are on steroids and uh, this was the picture we could microbiology negative we assumed this was fungal it was treated as a fungal and bacterial and resolved completely this was an aspergillus endogenous endophthalmitis along with intracranial infection with aspergillus that started during the covid infection by the time he came to us it was already 6 weeks onset uh, despite multiple surgeries he developed neovascularization of the iris and uh, atrophic uh, but we could clear the infection with 6 months of voriconazole intracranial infection as well as ocular infection this was a gentleman who developed candidemia with renal candida during covid infection he was sent for routine fundus screening because of candida uh, candidemia and we found that he had retinitis in the right eye uh, had to give him intravitreal injections along with voriconazole uh, systemic and 6 months later he resolved so uh, systemic candidiasis is known uh, during covid infection but not ocular candida or ocular fungal infections then we had a lady presenting with choroidal abscess and multiple inflammatory deposits starting during a covid infection she also became de novo diabetic during the covid all investigations negative based on clinical judgment we started her on anti tubercular therapy and she resolved this is a young man just came two days three days back again during his covid infection he developed fever pulmonary tb and uh, intracranial tuberculoma and uh, subsequently uh, this is the picture 6 months after starting att he has developed this so it could be non compliance with att or multiple drug resistance that we have to see we have to do a biopsy so systemic tb has been reported with covid 19 but not ocular tb and this is because again altered host immunity caused by the covid infection then we had a, uh, an elderly gentleman with uh, choroidal uh, lesion as you see there but we could not find the cause <clears throat> multiple investigations were negative treated it with levofloxacin as broad spectrum toxoplasma igg did return positive so added bactrim and after 6 weeks of uh, levofloxacin and bactrim he resolved with good vision then we had a young man with sudden onset of negative scotoma in his right eye 4 months after his covid infection everything was normal systemic investigations only on oct we could see the rp disruption and then when we went back to the fundus photograph we could see the deep seated yellow lesion which is amn and then there were certain other superficial pam lesions even in his other eye which was asymptomatic and these are reported with viral infections including with covid there are two reports then we had a patient elderly again with the symptoms starting after 3 uh, uh, months after his covid infection and he had already been on doxycycline for a week no response and he had been investigated uh, for infections negative so we treated it as with steroids with post and it resolved as post fever retinitis which is an immune condition and very interestingly we had patients not one but actually two to three patients who complained of multiple visual symptoms and his, their objective evaluation was completely normal so when we did the drug chart review we found that they were on voriconazole which can induce Uh, trans, uh, you know, reversible visual disturbances. So when we reduced the dose or eliminated voriconazole, the symptoms resolved. 
But when they had to go back on voriconazole, the symptoms recurred, which again confirmed the diagnosis. So this should remain an important uh, diagnosis in patients with COVID. However, it should be a diagnosis of exclusion, having excluded other important causes for visual symptoms. Because many of COVID patients are on voriconazole due to secondary fungal infections. Then we had many patients with uh, mucormycosis and CRAO. And the, not, the thing about them was that most of them were also diabetic, either de novo diabetes during COVID or pre-existing, and they were on steroids. Several neuroophthalmic sequelae were seen, but interest, uh, of, of interest to the posterior segment was cases with uh, uh, benign or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, severe papilledema. One thing which I noted about them was that they were generally more severe than we see uh, regularly. And uh, the one patient, uh, most of them continued treatment for more than a year. This lady required surgery, uh, lumbar puncture, uh, sorry, the VP shunt more than a year after continuing medical therapy and there was no resolution. Again, very severe, continuing for several months treatment. And the pathogenesis during COVID for IIH is multifactorial, could be hyperviscosity of CSF or a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is not seen on the MRI, subclinical. Now, interestingly, we had several cases of post-COVID vaccine problems, which can be divided as vascular occlusions, inflammations, and very interestingly, reactivation of neovascular AMD and PCV. Now, this is a young lady with a, who came with sudden vision drop three days after a second dose of COVID shield, no other systemic uh, comorbidities. And you see CRVO along with inferotemporal BRAO. We put her on oral steroids and anticoagulants and uh, she has improved. She's now asymptomatic. Initially, there was a large superior field defect corresponding with the BRAO, but that's gone now. This was a patient, young male, 11 days after the second dose of Sputnik vaccine, coming with superior hemiretinal vein occlusion, required a ranibizumab finally, steroids and anticoagulants helped, but did not completely resolve the disease. Uh, with ranibizumab, now his vision is six by six and that's single injection. Another young male, no comorbidities, seven days following the second dose of COVID shield, he developed a CRAO, which did not reverse. He continues to be no PL. Several cases of inflammation, we saw anterior uveitis occurring as a first event, even in a 90 year old male, immediately following two weeks following a vaccine, which we don't expect. Uh, also several cases of optic neuritis in elderly patients. Um, and we saw that uveitis, which happened sometimes following COVID infection, record after they took their vaccination. This was a, a young male, uh, actually an ENT surgeon, who three to four days after his uh, second dose of COVID shield came with bilateral multifocal choroiditis. And this is more than a year back now, and he still requires immunosuppression, other he, otherwise he gets reactivation. All etiological investigations were negative. Uh, another young lady had iridocyclitis following COVID infection. And then when she took a vaccine subsequently, she developed intermediate uveitis. We tried to stop steroids after five months, which led to vasculitis, retinal vasculitis, and now she's on steroids with azathioprine. And this is the last, I think I've overshot my time. So this is just to show patients who were uh, quite stable on uh, therapy, uh, without therapy or just observation or minimal injections, coming back with massive reactivation following vaccines. These are just three cases with bleeding and, uh, and they now require monthly aflibacets just to get back to uh, some kind of vision. And many of them have developed fellow eye reactivation within six months to eight months of the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you again for showing such nice cases. But I think the unanswered question always will remain that despite the temporal association, how much can we actually blame it to COVID or COVID vaccines? And probably we don't have the answer for it at present. I we, have, we, I have the, we, we do have the answer because we did the COVID antibodies. And in one of them, it was 3000. Uh, whereas the what you need is just 50 to be positive uh, for antibodies to COVID. 3000. So all of them are very high titer of COVID uh, antibodies. Perhaps I would rather not go into the antibody debate as well because the antibody itself is quite fallacious of what antibodies we are measuring and what actually they have. But still, yes, we have to keep a watch out for these and manage. Vaccines are, vaccines are known to uh, trigger autoimmunity. It's not unknown. 
Yes, they, yes, they can cure have... major diseases like PAN and SLE. Uh, so they know it's known fact. So this yes, is yes, not definitely. unexpected. So we uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Professor Sarita Berry. Welcome, ma'am. I'll Sarita share Sarita. my screen. Speaking, uh, ma'am would be speaking on management of ROP. Thank you, Dr. Rohan. It has been a wonderful session with such valorous surgeries and sharing experience. Learned a lot. So today, and now I'll be talking about management of retinopathy or prematurity. There are, there's a large literature on this, but I will be highlighting how we manage in a, at Lady Harding Medical College. At the outset, I'm grateful to chief and organizers of RP Center, Dr. Dr. Tityan, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this. Uh, this slide shows the enormity of the problem of retinopathy of prematurity, especially 40,000 children in India annually need treatment without which they will go blind. So the overview of my talk would be diagnosis, treatment, follow-up, and also a bit about prevention of ROP. The diagnosis has been guided by the various ICROP studies, 84, 87, 2005, 21. And uh, 84 tells us about how to document how to describe ROP by location, severity, extent, and the plus disease. Retinal detachment was added in 87, and uh, aggressive APROP pre-plus, and how to say that this is zone one in 2005. The latest 2021 has highlighted a uh, uh, few changes into the normal ICROP, which we had. It has defined the posterior zone two. The term notch has been introduced. We will talk about it uh, later in the talk. and. Uh, also, sample pictures have been given for diagnosing pre-plus aggressive ROP instead of uh, aggressive posterior ROP has been added on. So first of all, uh, the ICROP has told about the zone one, uh, zone two posterior, which is two disc diameters anterior to the zone one. This is almost as equally important as zone one. So this has na been named as posterior zone two region the notch one to two clock hours to the posterior zone has to be mentioned and documented as ROP in zone two in most places, temporal notch extending to zone one, secondary to notch to say that it is a zone two disease and not primarily a zone one disease. And if there is no ROP, incomplete vascularization up to the particular zone, say zone two, so that, and not the terms like no ROP or immature retina, because this could have a medical legal aspect to it. The stages we all know, uh, the pre-plus images which have been put as sample pictures from normal to pre-plus to plus disease, which show which is to be assessed in the zone one, and the toxicity of the arteries and the dilatation of the veins. So this will help us to again tell us whether it is minimal, pre-plus, notable, pre-plus, plus, or severe plus, in which both the arteries and the arterioles and the venules are dilated and tortuous. 5C in ICROP has been again created so that anterior chamber shallowing, iridocorneal lenticular adhesions, corneal opacifications suggesting closed funnel configurations uh, has been added. Aggressive ROP may occur beyond posterior retina. It may happen into the anterior zone too as well, in, and even in larger preterm infants, especially in developing countries. Therefore, the term has been changed to aggressive ROP. So here, this is a picture from ICROP3 study where this show that there are these retinal vessels, even which are looping uh, vessels in the anterior part of zone two. And the FFA shows clearly that how large avascular retina is seen posteriorly. So documentation is very important because, because this is going to, uh, for follow-up as well as treatment of our patients. And of course, even the medical legal part of it is looked after. There are the treatment guided by ETROP 2003 and BTROP 2011. First of all, we talk about type 2 ROP in which we need observation nearly follow up every week, where zone 1, stage 1 without plus, zone 2, stage 1 with or without plus, stage 2 without, two without plus, zone 3, any stage without plus, rarely stage 3 we see with plus and will need laser. While our main management treatment is for type 1 disease, the zone 1 and the posterior zone 2 in which we do intravitreal anti uh, this, uh, this is how we follow up. And uh, then zone, uh, that, that's how we treat. And zone two, we treat with laser. It can also be treated by intravitreal anti uh, These are a few pictures of our treated patients. So what happens when you give an intravitreal? There is always a regression in the beginning. 
but they can either spontaneously vascularize till the uh, till the uh, aura or they may have persistent avascular retina this term is also added by icrop3 and uh, here we wait only for 10 weeks we discuss it later and then we do not let the persistent avascular retina to go beyond 10 weeks there could also be reactivation in which we again treat persistent avascular retina if left alone for a long time can cause retinal thinning retinal holes lattice like changes increased chances of retinal detachment later in life and we have seen that if we do peripheral laser ablation at the right time these can be uh, prevented regression could be after we which must uh, we must document whether it's a spontaneous or after laser or after anti vegf it could be complete or incomplete in case it is incomplete then it is marked as persistent avascular retina there could be reactivation usually seen after anti vegf and the uh, presence and locations it could be at the new rop features or at the original ridge or new leading avascular retina or even in the vascular retina so we see sometimes that there are some abnormal vessels even in the vascular retina so we have to also look up re for reactivation in the area which has already been vascularized and then treat accordingly with a peripheral laser ablation or another rarely of course if it is still in the zone 1 we have repeated very rarely we have repeated intravitreal anti vegf once again seeing almost like 20% of the babies with zone 1 with zone 1 have had uh, Uh, re reactivations and uh, PA are the persistent uh, and pers persistent avascular retina. So we had done a few hybrid in which we had given anti vegf and done a peripheral laser. Uh, the very few cases which we did, we did not get much of our uh, results. In fact, they also went into reactivation. So I would like to ask how others, if they have tried, what are their results? So we have given up the hybrid. We are only doing anti vegf and then we wait for the vascularization to happen. if it is if it is uh, if it stops and par persistent avascular retina is seen we do laser at 10 weeks for, for us the indications of laser are monotherapy for zone 2 anterior disease the uh, disease reactivation following anti vegf persistent avascular retina after 10 weeks of anti vegf posterior barrage for advancing stage 3 and early 4a and if it is contraindicated sometimes the patients will have conjunctivitis then also we cannot give intravitreal and we do laser complications we have seen are exudative rd tractional rd cataract formation indications of anti vegf zone 1 disease arop non dilating pupil or reactivation after the first intravitreal injection especially if it is at zone 1 only uh, approved by the european commission in 2019 these anti vegf are uh, approved for giving rop uh, but biosimilar rasmap of intest of off label use we are using it for many of our patients because that's a government supply and we have got very good results these are how we give the the pair our patients for anti vegf and both the eyes are given in the same sitting but two different vials of rasmap are used and it like a setup of two surgeries which we are doing in the same sitting complications systemic complications ocular complications and uh, word about the surgical management which we have recently started in our institute for 4a and 4b doing lens sparing past placata 1 to 1.25 mm from the limbus Trocars are direct, uh, directed uh, towards optic disc or parallel to the op, uh, visual axis, and if it's a high temporal TRD, only then uh, lensectomy may have may have to be done. Uh, peripheral TRD, then lensectomy have to be done. Still, buckling is also can be considered for stage five only to give a navigable vision. Uh, lensectomy, retrolental membrane removal, and limbal vitrectomy to open up the funnel. Uh, these are the various complications corneal edema hyphema regardi and vitreous hemorrhage may be noted uh, lifelong follow up it's very important for them to have a lifelong follow up they have to be told in the beginning that they have to come for myopia and refraction has to be done uh, and uh, glaucoma iop measurement and retinal examination at each visit once the disease is settled 6 monthly for the first 10 years have to be done at least long term sequelae as described by icrop3 as well is tractional rd reg rd myopia macular abnormalities including smaller fas macular dragging secondary angle closure glaucoma strabismus and retrochisis a uh, very happy news about the prevention that we all know that with the good antenatal care antenatal steroids to uh, pregnant women delivering preterm baby within 7 days judicious oxygen use judicious use of blood transfusions micro sampling early breastfeeding protocolizing the neonatal care has really decrease the incidence of rop and we see that 
highly advanced neonatal care ICUs have very low ROP incidence. This is our team, Retinite Lady Harding. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Excellent talk by Professor Sarita Berry. And she is one of the ladies who had uh, started this ROP. I think ROP must be started in, uh, should be learned by the, all the people. When I started ROP in 95, there were not so many patients. You know, number of patients are increasing. We request younger people to take because the ROP management is a service. It, it will not give anything like FACO and other things, but this will give the service, additional service, which will help you to satisfy your yourself you know that is the important i request i again request because these are the younger people who have to survive and this this blessings will go to directly to god you will not have anything like here uh reputed faco surgeon uh, all these things but the way you give reason to the child when they come i had a child who is uh, engineering 25 years now when i can see that he is uh, doing engineering, doing good, it's a uh, give a pleasure to us. So don't hesitate in doing ROP, but ROP definitely requires some learning and training curve. It is not like other FACO, you can do uh, less. It. it has required the training because the progression of ROP, it depends, very difficult to tell which patient will progress, which is not. Recently, I have also joined with Parijar Chandra as my guru for the seven years in learning, but I have seen a lot of change, you know, a lot of we have to, uh, learn from Parijata, but they never hesitate because somebody was senior, you must learn. The one thing I would like to tell, whenever you give anti vegf you must either send a patient or ready for the surgery because sometimes where we give anti vegf they progress very fast. And if you give injection and watch and then refer, it is too late. That is my experience. People give injection, then wait and they send. By the time they give the two send it to us, they are already late. We had a child, we give injection after three days, there was a tractional detachment. So we operated immediately. So people give and they don't see the periphery. Sometimes there's a traction. We give injection, tractional detachment increases. Uh, we have a Dr. Parijat who will give you the further opinion. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful lecture. So I, I think sir has already said uh, presentation. Dr. Parijat, I have a question for you. Uh, do you also do hybrid treatment like giving anti vegf and peripheral laser so that uh, because we see so many babies with zone 1 disease having persistent avascular retina and then uh, they become big and we need a GA to give uh, at 10 weeks, sometimes we do laser. So we started doing after one week, we started doing peripheral arcuate laser. But yes. these children never did well actually. So what is your experience about it? So ma'am, we inject and then we wait for around uh, 6 to 8 weeks for the retina to grow. So that really works very well because the injection helps the retina to grow to a, at least a zone one, it can go to zone two anterior uh, at the least. And that really helps. So if you do a real laser, then you know that advantage is lost, which the injection will give for increased visual field. So I feel uh, if you just wait for the retina to grow as far as growing, and at six to eight weeks, there's a high chance if you are injecting dynamite, it will recur. If it recurs, then we go in for a peripheral laser. And as soon as it starts recurring, we know it's going to go into an advanced stage. So we just uh, don't wait for it to go to uh, proper type one arrow. We just go ahead and laser it, and then the disease mostly is no, we, we were the we were we were, we, we were the first to start the anti vegf in India. You know, I we, I was the principal investigator in Rainbow Trial. Earlier that the the uh, anti vegf was not given. What is my in that they have given the three injections. Now people will start using one, two, three, and all these things. Okay, because the vascularization, how long it will take. How much that is the kind of, that is why, as Parija said, we are doing uh, laser in these cases. So my question uh, was a little different. Like we do not uh, we do not do the whole laser of avascular retina at one week post I anti vegf We were doing lasering to the peripheral yes, peripheral yes, arcade yes. only, so that that's, we, that's, we are that, waiting that, for the vessels to grow up to that. Uh, and, that's and we don't another have to do hybrid. That. That's a good suggestion yes, which we are we are having in a mind to giving that we should do anteriorly. Let there's a gap that will fill up later on. That is also a good suggestion. But our uh, we did not have a good experience of that. No, that no, no, no. That is that that is that you can do because the retina will grow and later on the remaining you can do the thing. But so grow grow later. how much will grow in each case? We don't really don't know. Uh -huh. so this will come. Paper is coming next. You can you USA people are doing something which we don't get the ethical clearance. You know, I was the first one to start, but it took me two years to get the ethical clearance by other people give. The another question, ILEA. The practitioner has started ILEA six years back. 
and that they had produced the theory. But giving an idea here is a controversial thing. Dr. Parijat, a lot of thing in a government setup uh, we can't do. Okay, so that is the thing. But you are doing a wonderful thing, the taking ROP cases and decreasing our load. That is the one thing because we don't have other person in the India in, in in Delhi who is doing ROP. So we are increasing a lot of cases. We are getting how many cases per week? 10, 10 cases, new cases per week. And we are having old patient around 40 to 70 patient in two clinics to follow. And you know, one single person, two or three senior and can't do so regular follow-up is required. So we would like our seniors then to get training so that they can follow up and do the needful because we can't take the load, all of the load of the country. Thank you. I think we can see this next session, people here. So Achha, I'll oh. just take a minute to thank uh, Professor oh. Saita Berry and Professor Achha, Malika Goel for joining us online on the panel. And all the speakers <laughs> and all those who have come here physically, a big thanks to them. And even those who are online, thank you very much. It has been a very wonderful session. Thank, thank you, you for taking your time. But those who are coming must learn the ROP. At least they can send at the proper time. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, our moderator, Dr. Rohan Chavla. Thank you so much for being here and thank you all the speakers. So for the upcoming session, I would like to invite the moderator, Dr. Manpreet Kaur. Do we have Dr. Manpreet Kaur with us? I request Dr. Manpreet Kaur to please join us. Kimi, I am here. Good morning, madam. Namaste, welcome. Namaste. We'll just begin shortly. I'd okay, like to invite the panelists, Dr. Shanavas, Dr. Manzoor, Dr. Sohini, Dr. Uh, Suman on the dais. Welcome to the Cornea and Refractive Surgery Forum. We'll have a mix of talks pertaining to anterior segment. The first talk, I have the honor of introducing a very eminent ophthalmologist and my dear friend, Dr. Fareen R. Sheikh, who will be presenting patient screening for refractive surgery, decision making and case selection. May we have the slides, please? Good morning, all. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Professor J.S. Titial, sir, for giving me this opportunity to be here today and talk about patient screening for refractive surgery. I'll be discussing mostly with the theoretical part of general decision making and case selection for a candidate who's interested in refractive surgery. So as we all know, there are different types of uh, refractive surgery. It can be cornea-based, lens-based, or bioptics. The most commonly performed surgery in our routine clinics are PRK, LASIK, SMILE, and fakic IOLs, as well as refractive lens exchange, or CLE. So the dilemmas in refractive surgery decision-making are, uh, first of all, to know if the patient is suitable for refractive surgery, and if the patient is suitable, then which surgery is best for this patient. The ideal suitable candidate for a refractive surgery is a person who is more than 18 years old with a stable refractive error for more than one year, who is not pregnant, not lactating, and free from any systemic or autoimmune disease. Absolute contraindications as such uh, are corneal ectatic disorders, uh, eye inflammation, or hepatic eye disease. And in relative contraindications, there are cases like severe dry eyes or large pupil size and cases of glaucoma and systemic and autoimmune diseases. There are multiple factors which influence our decision making uh, for a case of refractive surgery and we'll be discussing it one by one. In patient factors, uh, the most important factor is the age. 
Ideally, the corneal ablative procedures have been approved by FDA for age of more than 18 years, and fecal have been approved for people more than 21 years old, and presbyopic corneal inlays are approved for patients more than 41 years of age. Occupation is an important factor while considering the type of refractive surgery to be done for a patient as if the person is driver, it, he, he or she might be unsuitable for corneal ablative procedures as there is a risk of postoperative glare and halos. Patients who are into contact sports should be avoided with flap-based procedures and smile can be preferred for such patients. Uh, in patients with systemic diseases, corneal ablative procedures are contraindicated uh, with, uh, in patients with collagen vascular disorders or immunos immunodeficiency diseases or patients who are taking medicines such as isotretinoin or amadarone. General systemic examination before opting for any type of surgery is important to know if the patient is going to be cooperative for surgery under topical anesthesia and if he is fit uh, without any systemic com comorbidities. In ocular history, one should note that uh, if the patient is a contact lens user, he should discontinue soft contact lenses at least for two weeks before undergoing any workup for refractive surgery. And if he is using RGP contact lenses, the contact lenses should be discontinued for at least three to four weeks. Fundus examination is of utmost importance to rule for any peripheral treatable regions. And if there are any treatable regions, those should be lasered properly at least three to six weeks preoperatively. So ocular surface evaluation is one of the most important parameter, which is generally neglected in patients who are undergoing refractive surgery as uh, patients who are uh, pre, uh, preoperatively having dry eyes usually end up with worsening of their symptoms after surgery, especially if LASIK is done in these cases. So if one has to perform surgery in patients with preoperative dry eye, smile is usually preferred over LASIK. So how to judge for stability of refractive error in these cases? Ideally, a stable manifest refraction is defined as less than 0.5 diopter of a, a, refract, a spherical equivalent chain shift over a year prior to surgery. And it should be looked for in any patient undergoing refractive surgery to prevent post-operative refractive errors. So depending upon the type of refractive error, there are various procedures which can be done. One should know that for hyperopia, fakey chiovels are still not FDA approved. Depending upon the spherical error, one can go, uh, go and opt for different types of surgeries. Smile is uh, approved only for cylindrical error uh, of less than 0.5 diopters. And fakey chiovels are approved for refractive errors of minus 3 to 20 and cylinders up to 4 diopters. Corneal thickness is of paramount importance in patients undergoing uh, laser-based refractive surgery. And corneal, if the corneal thickness is less than 480 microns, one should uh, see it with caution, even if the uh, topography is normal, as uh, prevalence of keratoconus in this group is generally on higher side. PTA, uh, the percentage tissue altered should be calculated preoperatively, and if it, uh, it is uh, more than 40%, risk of post lasic ectasia is higher in these cases, and one should avoid laser-based surgeries in these cases. Ideal residual stromal bed thickness should be more than 250 to 280 microns for any LASIK or SMILE or surface ablation procedure to uh, reduce the risk of post-operative ectasia in these cases. Uh, post-operative keratometry ideally should uh, be in the range of 34 to 48 diopters to uh, reduce the optical quality, uh, to maintain the optical quality post-operatively, reduce the risk of ectasia in uh, cornea-based procedures. And if the uh, keratometry falls beyond these limits, one should avoid cornea-based procedures and opt for lens-based procedures in these cases. A normal corneal topography is an important prerequisite for all corneal ablative procedures and for infirstry or keratoconus and uh, degenerations, uh, 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 degenerations like PMD are contraindications for any refractive surgery. So how to know at-risk corneas? A corneal topography screening is very, very important in all cases undergoing any kind of refractive surgery, be it uh, lens-based procedures, be it uh, cornea-based procedures. One should look for a K-max, it should not be more than 48.7. Inferior superior asymmetry, more than 1.4 diopters is again a risk, a risk at-risk cornea. Pachymetry less than 470 microns with normal topography and less than 500 microns with abnormal topography should be looked at with caution. Posterior elevation more than 17 and anterior elevation more than 12 micron is again a risk at risk cornea. On placido disc based systems, one should look for central keratometry. It should be less. Uh, it should be less than 47.2 diopters, and inferior superior diopteric asymmetry should be less than 1.4 diopters, and Kisa index should ideally be less than 60%. On VKG, one should look at eccentricity and Q value less than 0.5, uh, less than 0.5. 
is important and central keratometry if it is more than 47.2 and difference between central keratometry of two eyes is more than one diopter one should look at caution at these eyes because these are keratoconus uh, uh, keratoconic eyes and uh, refractive surgeries especially uh, cornea based should be avoided in such cases on pentacam one should look for at sagittal map for k max more than 47.2 in face superior asymmetry more than 1.4 diopter to rule out any keratoconus pachymetry uh, on pachymetry map superior inferior asymmetry of more than th uh, 30 micron cct less than 470 and uh, pachy apex and uh, thinness should not be more than 10 microns on anterior elevation map, as we've previously discussed, if anterior elevation is more than 12 microns and a posterior elevation is more than 17 microns, these patients are usually keratoconus suspect. One should look at also ART max the, uh, index and PPI average to rule out any keratoconus and D value more than 1.6 is again suspicious of keratoconus. If one is having options like Galilee, one should look at uh, parameters like IAI, SDP and SRI to rule out any keratoconus. Mesopic pupil size is again of importance and one should look at wavefront abnormalities and uh, ideally opt for wavefront guided LASIK or wavefront optimized LASIK in such cases. So which surgery is most suitable of, uh, for these patients? One should look at RSBT, PTA and look at post-operative keratometry to uh, decide between corneal-based and lens-based procedure. And in lens-based procedure, ideally look at age and cataract changes to decide which procedure should be done for these patients. In ICL, as we all know, there are V5, V6A, and V6B options also available, which can be treated, uh, which can be used for patients uh, for treating presbyopia and older age group myopia as well. Indication for ICL are generally the candidates who are not suitable for cornea-based refractive surgery and patients who are having a higher refractive error with ICD three, more than three uh, more than three mm. One should look at uh, an idocorneal angle, mesopic pupil size, and white to white diameters in such cases to uh, ideally measure the correct ICL sizing. So, I think take home message is assessing the patient profile or demeanor before planning any surgery is very crucial. Always take into account the patient's expectation and occupational needs before deciding any kind of surgery. Counsel the patient well about potential visual activity and their post-operative risk associated. A thorough clinical examination and investigations in a meticulous fashion are a must factor for deciding any kind of refractive surgery and informed consent obviously is of a paramount importance before any surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fareen. That was a very comprehensive insight into decision making for refractive surgery and the preoperative patient screening, which I believe is the most important aspect for refractive screening. Do we have any questions? Uh, now, I would like to invite Dr. Manpreet Kaur for uh, her talk on learning curves of smile. Dr. A very good morning to all of you. My talk is on the learning curve of small incision lenticule extraction. There are no financial disclosures. So SMILE, as we all know, is more surgically challenging than the conventional flap-based corneal ablative procedures. And majority of the complications are observed in initial few cases with lenticule dissection and extraction being the most challenging steps. So what we observed was that a plethora of complications can be observed, including, including suction loss, black spots, opaque bubble layer, cap lenticular adhesion, retained lenticule, cap and side cut tears. And the incidence was 16% in our initial 50 cases, which decreased to 2% and even less in the subsequent 50 cases and more. So coming to suction loss, the basic principle of SMILE is based on soft talking, which uh, the patient interface accurvates rather than applinates the cornea. And it's a low pressure suction core, which generates around 35 millimeter mercury of pressure at the cornea interface. So the longer suction times and the lower pressure leads to a higher incidence of suction loss in presence of other predisposing factors, such as surgeon inexperience, uncooperative patient, and difficult or vital anatomy. In fact, the incidence may be as high as 11% in novice surgeons. Management is based on the stage at which suction loss occurs. So if it occurs at less than 10% of the lenticule cut, you have to redock and restart the procedure. If it occurs at more than 10% of the lenticule cut, you can convert to surface ablation or LASIK at the same setting or a later date. Lenticule side cut, cap cut, and cap side cut, you can redock and repeat from the 
point at which the suction loss occurred and you should ideally decrease the lenticule diameter by 0.2 to 0.4 mm and the cap diameter by 0.2 to 0.4 mm so coming to difficult lenticule dissection the pathophysiology conventionally you dissect the anterior plane first and then the posterior plane and you may have difficulty in identifying and dissecting the posterior plane especially in your initial cases then you have cap lenticular adhesion when the posterior plane is dissected first and there is difficulty in identifying and dissecting the anterior plane this may lead to a host of complications including retained lenticule delayed visual recovery cap side cut tears posterior stromal damage epithelial defect and irregular astigmatism asoct has been used as a rescue tool to identify that you have dissected the wrong plane and sinski hook can be used to nudge the lenticule off from the overlying cap and then you may proceed with just peeling it off from the overlying cap and extracting the lenticule so this is a video of a cap lenticular adhesion so the uh, moment we realized what helps you confirm is you just take a sharp instrument and just nudge off the lenticle from the overlying cap and when you see a minuscule shaped gap it confirms that the lenticle was indeed stuck to the cap and you had uh, dissected the posterior plane first you can bring it to the site of your cap side cut and then create a small pocket to enter the anterior plane and then you can enter the anterior plane with the dissector itself and subsequent dissection we have found is more or less similar to a plane uh, to a case in which you dissect anterior first and then go posterior in fact in this case after going anterior i was able to extract the lenticule without a forceps despite having a cap lenticular adhesion so this is another case in which there is a lot of opaque bubble layer and very difficult dissection so as you can see there is a struggle to dissect actually and then we went in with the forceps to try and extract the lenticule but all the peripheral adhesions were not released so what we ended up with is a torn lenticule and retained fragment can be very challenging to manage because you cannot really take out the fragment without a significant trauma and it leads to irregular astigmatism and suboptimal visual outcomes vision quality especially is decreased we have also described the double crescentic edge separation for the management of cap lenticular adhesion in smile which is based on nudging of the lenticle from the overlying cap from both sides so it gives you two planes to try to separate the lenticle from the overlying cap then we have also uh, described step by step management algorithm for difficult identification of the correct correct dissection place in the smile which the beginners can specially go through to help in a step by step management when they get stuck cap tears and side cut tears have an incidence ranging from 16.2% for cap tears to as high as 4% for side cut extension and tears as long as they don't involve the visual axis more or less they do not really affect the final visual outcomes though the visual recovery is delayed surgeon in experience bulky instrument hub excessive surgical manipulation sudden patient movement and small incision size is the predisposing factors you can put in a bandage contact lens and wait for reepithelialization and generally they do well then patient selection and perspective a good patient selection is essential especially for beginners you should choose higher magnitude of refractive error so you don't have to handle too thin lenticules and generally avoid difficult uncooperative patients meniscus sign has been described by us to identify the lenticular edge in small incision lenticular extraction because prevention they say is better than cure so what you do is you just nudge off the lenticule while delineating the anterior and posterior channels initially and you see a meniscus shaped gap so when the instrument is above this gap you are in the anterior plane when it's below this gap you are in the posterior plane microscope integrated intraoperative optical coherence tomography has also emerged as a useful tool the only drawback is it's not integrated in the smile machine as of now so you have to shift to a different ot and maybe the future has a smile machine which has an integrated iocity and can let you know in real time which plane you are dissecting so just to conclude the initial learning curve of smile is surgically challenging during femtosecond laser delivery you may have suction loss black spots opaque bubble layer and during lenticule dissection you may experience lenticule mist dissection cap and side cut tears and retained lenticule prevention of course is better than cure so identify the meniscus sign complications are inevitable you should know how to identify and manage them timely detection and management gives both the patient and the surgeon a reason to smile thank you for a patient hearing these are our books on smile and current concepts in refractive surgery which detail the latest updates of refractive surgery and i would like to acknowledge professor jeevan s tithyal who's my mentor and guide thank you so much 
Thank you, Dr. Manpri, for the beautiful, uh, enlightening talk. Um, may we now invite Dr. Vardhman Kankarya, who will be uh, speaking to us on suction loss management in smile surgery. Thank you very much. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Titiyal sir and Dr. Namrata for the kind invite. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is the suction loss. So basically, we know that uh, suction loss is one of the uh, evident initial uh, common complications of smile procedure. But of course, nothing is lost in suction loss if you really manage it well. Uh, we all know that smile has uh, the preferred choice uh, at the centers where it is available because of its advantage of being flapless with less dry eye and other advantages. However, the intraoperative suction loss can occur during the femtosecond laser application and that most commonly results if the patient suddenly moves his eye because of a sudden contraction. Uh, this is common in people who have more anxiety, there is watering or chemosis, if there are peripheral uh, vascularization and especially in patients who have small palpebral fissure. Uh, we all know how the smile is performed. Smile typically involves a posterior lenticular cut, as you can see in this animation, which is followed by a side cut of the lenticule and then the anterior cap cut and the small incision cut, which are all created with a Visumax femtosecond laser. During this application of femtosecond laser at any step, if there is suction is lost, then of course the femtosecond application is incomplete and you cannot proceed by, by removing a, a smile lenticule. This is seen by the study, uh, which is published in GRS uh, as the most common step of suction loss was seen during the cap cut. That specifically happens because you have a, a kind of haze after the posterior cut has been performed and the many patients may become anxious during that time, uh, which is followed by, of course, the posterior cut and it is minorly, but possibly also possible during the small incision creation itself. After you have encountered a suction loss, uh, there is no need to get alarmed. You have to go in a method uh, which is step by step. You have to understand how to tackle it. First and foremost, the, there will be a pop-up window which will tell you what are the steps which are complete and what are the steps which are still remaining uh, in terms of the femtosecond laser application. Once you understand that, you can tweak your parameters according to the step of suction loss. As you can see here, this is the first um, suction loss case that you can see during the posterior cut. If there is more than 10% posterior cut, which is done already, you cannot redox. So in that case, we'll have to shift the patient into a femto flap. So in this case, I have shifted to a 100 micron femto flap, as you can see. Uh, once the femto flap is created, you're going to see the, the side cuts of the femto flap, and then you raise, raise the flap in general, and then you can do the, uh, the rest of the laser. The other maneuver, of course, can be that you can convert it into an advanced surface ablation procedure on table itself. It is slightly more uncommon to have suction loss during what can be called as the side cut of the lenticle itself. So this is the posterior cut is complete. And just before we start the lenticular circular side cut, as you can see, there is a suction loss. Uh, again, during this step, the laser will not allow you to redock or continue with smile. You have to convert this into FM to flap, as you can see very well in this uh, video. So I'm converting this into 100 micron FM to flap. Usually my settings for the cap are about 120 microns. So that gives me a good amount of space to create my femto flaps. But here onwards, uh, whenever you have a suction loss, which occurs during the anterior cut of the cap, uh, of course, there is still a chance that you can proceed by redocking and continuing with smile. You can see the, the circular cut is complete. And now I'm going with the anterior cut. That is where there is a conjunctival protrusion and the suction is lost. So during this time, it's very crucial when you redock, the centration has to be perfect. And that's when, as you can see here, with the help of uh, your uh, a small mark in the uh, entrance pupil, as we have done it here, you can proceed redock in this case. Once you have redocked, uh, you have to make sure that that entrance pupil central mark is now matching with your redocking centration. And then you proceed as always. It is going to proceed and start from the last that was in it will now from the anterior cut as it see once the anterior cut is complete after that uh, you're going to go ahead and do the small incision cut with the femtosecond laser and then you enter into the same 
interface which was created and actually the case is treated as normal. So this is the best way to go forward, but it is very crucial that your centration has to be absolutely perfect. As you can see, I'm going to the anterior surface of the lenticule, then I'm going, uh, I'm entering behind this uh, side cut of the lenticule and I'm going to the posterior edge. Once I have identified that, it is very crucial that uh, this identification has to be done very well, especially if there is a double ablation, uh, there will be, you have to be very, very careful that you're entering into the right planes. So once it is done, then we just go enter and remove the lenticule in one go. So it is actually quite uncommon, uh, but I have had one case in which we had a suction loss during this small incision creation. As you can see, this is the posterior cut, which is being done. Now there is the circular cut. There is a bit of meniscus of the TFN, which is trying to sipping in, but I thought that we can still go ahead. And actually we were still proceeding pretty well. But towards the end, uh, there was a suction which was lost. Of course, because it was towards absolutely end, we couldn't really realize there was a suction loss. And I thought that the small incision was created. I tried to enter the small incision, but it could not be opened because always the femtosecond laser starts from the posterior side and then it goes anteriorly. So I think the posterior half was created, but it did not actually join the epithelial surface. So then I realized that some uh, application of femtosecond laser was still remaining. And that is when we actually went ahead to read off. And as you can see very well, we have gone and created only the small incision. On the left side video, you can see there is only a small incision which is created with the help of the remnant femtosecond laser pulses. So with this case, again, we could proceed very well and we could uh, treat the patient as normal. So this was again a unique case that we had uh, recently. In this case, uh, again, you can see very well there is uh, this femtosecond laser application. The conjunctiva started to sip in. Uh, so in this case, the difference as compared to the previous case here, it was that all the femtosecond laser pulses were already fired and there was a pseudo suction loss. So the conjunctival protrusion was there and that actually had the lenticule which was complete, but we didn't have any access to the formed lenticule. So what we did in this case, because we didn't have a redocking option. So in this case, we used a novel technique of use of circle software. Circle software is a software which converts your cap into a flap. So in this case, you can open the flap and remove the lenticule as a whole. But of course, in that case, you lose the opportunity and the advantage of smile being flapless. So what we did in this case is that we tweaked the parameters of the circle flap. And in this case, where your hinge in circle is supposed to be about 20 millimeters, actually your side cut is supposed to be 20 millimeters and hinge is supposed to be three millimeters. We completely reverted it. So we created it a hinge which was 20 millimeter and of and the side cut of the flap which was only three millimeters so this was almost simulating only a small incision creation with the help of circle software so as you can see it here this was a circle uh, this was a circle software which was used and we have just created only a small incision with that so once we did that we entered the uh, lenticule uh, as normal and we have removed the lenticule in one piece uh, so the case could be actually planned and managed pretty well by giving the same advantage to the patient of being flapless. So this is the first day, as you can see here, uh, uh, on OCT as well as on the slit lamp. And this was the case that we published as the first case of use of surgical software in terms of the suction loss during smile procedure. So of course, the learning curve plays a major role. Uh, there was a paper which was published by uh, SNEC. They have seen that your incidence of suction loss becomes half after the first 100 cases are done. We have I've seen the same thing also at Asian Eye Hospital at our center, where uh, one of the first uh, 18 suction losses happened in 500 eyes, but the next uh, first nine suction losses happened in first 500 eyes, and the next nine suction losses happened in the next 3,700 eyes. So there was a very big drop in suction loss. With the current generation of the Visumax, uh, which is uh, which is much more high frequency, the suction time has reduced from 22 seconds to now eight seconds. So the chances of suction loss will reduce to almost negligible levels. But what is most crucial for you to know is that in spite of the suction loss, you can achieve excellent outcomes. You have to just understand how to manage these cases in step by step and according to the step of the suction loss. And typically patients do extremely well according to the series that we have recently published. So I would like to thank you again to RPC and Dr. Titiyal sir and Dr. Namrata ma'am for the kind invite. It has been a pleasure to be part of the symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vardhaman. May I now invite Dr. Heman Kamble, our alumnus, who will present his talk on flaps try after LASIK <coughs> management and prevention. Uh, hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
thank you for having me here dr titial and everybody on the dais uh, what i'll talk is uh, management of flaps try after lisic so uh, why are flaps try important and what are flaps try so basically refractive surgery be it lisic be it smile or any refractive surgery is a very demanding surgery uh, patients not you know just don't want 6 by 6 vision they want a good quality of vision uh, that is where flap stry come in so stry are basically wrinkling of the flap tissue they are pretty common post lasic complications there are two types of stry micro and macro stry micro are small superficial stry mainly asymptomatic macro will be foot thickness uh, if in the visual center they will be symptomatic so not all patients will have flap stry uh, the most common cause is tenting effect that is if you ablate the more you ablate the more there is a difference between the flap and the bed of the cornea this will lead to tenting effect and uh, cause flap stry others could be surgical problems that is intraoperative misalignment of the flap microkeratom lasik by itself does not cause stry but yes as compared to femto lasik a uh, patient with microkeratom lasik has a high incidence of flap stry eye rubbing itself a uh, flap stry are significantly more common in left eyes uh, if the same microkeratom is used for the left eye the flap in the left eye is going to be thinner if the same microkeratom is used in multiple eyes subsequently thinner flaps are formed and these thinner flaps have a high incidence of flap stry dry eye yes i mean if there is dryness uh, the tarsal conjunctiva is going to rub against your uh, flap and will cause stry older patients have a high incidence of dry eye older patients also have abnormal keratocyte activity they have lower uh, endothelial pump activity and therefore older patients also prone to having flap stry there are multiple reports of post operative use of brimonidine brimonidine by itself also causes decrease in the endothelial cell activity uh, endothelial pump activity and therefore causes flap stry so what are stry going to cause stry is going to decrease the uh, corrected as well as the uncorrected vision of the patient uh, many patients come to us with normal vision but they can be glares halos ghosting of images monocular diplopia and loss of contrast so if you see a flap stry time is of essence you will have to act immediately the earlier you act the easier it is and the lesser steps you need to take but what is important is that not all stry will need to be treated if the stry is in the visual axis if it is causing symptoms you need to treat so normally what all lasik surgeons do is that we uh, will like to see the patients immediately post operatively maybe say 15 uh, 15 30 or 45 minutes post lasik surgery before you send the patient off to home uh, on slit lamp if you see flap stry what could be tried is a simple flap sliding technique wherein you use one or two wet merosal sponges you apply pressure perpendicular to the stry and try to straighten the stry out so this can be tried in the opd itself you don't need the, uh, need to shift the patient into or again but suppose you don't uh, see the patient immediately you see the stry next day uh, in that case then you will have to shift the patient to or you will have to lift the flap refloat and reposition it many a times you might not be able to see the patient immediately you maybe the patient comes to you after 7 days 10 days 15 days that is where problems will start now these stries of folds will become fixed folds the epithelial hyperplasia will prevent these folds from being normalized so in this case now additional steps have been added now you'll have to debride the epithelium also along with lifting and refloating the flap in cases of recalcitrant stry then flap sutures will might be needed and if all of this fails maybe you will have to do a ptk or a surface ablation so here is a, a video wherein a patient presented to us with flap stry in her left eye uh, she presented to us almost 3 weeks after surgery so as you can see there is a center flap stry here which is causing her diminution of vision her vision was 6 by 6 parts but the main complaint the patient had was ghosting of images and monocular diplopia we had to do something for this so what we did was uh, yeah so there is a central flap stry which is there 
So I am applying twenty percent alcohol to remove the central corneal epithelium uh, using an iris repositor to remove the epithelium. Therein will lift the corneal flap up. So it was a ninety uh, micrometer flap which was made. We've removed forty fifty of the epithelium, so it's a pretty thin flap. You lift the flap off. Now, whenever you're lifting the flap off, there is a chance of uh, epithelial cells going down inside the interface. So I'm applying some mitomycin 0.02% for around 15 seconds to remove the epithelial cells. You wash the cornea off, you re re reposit the flap back, you wash the flap. So here after what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to iron out the wrinkles. So there was a central wrinkle. We are trying to apply some stretching forces parallel to the wrinkle so as to iron out the wrinkle. So what is going to be the end point? The end point is you won't be able to see the wrinkle in the center. What is also important is to dilate the patient prior to, the, uh, prior to taking the patient into the OR. These things are visible better on retroillumination glow. So prognosis is good. There have been multiple studies which have been done for this. Treatment by lifting and irrigation significantly improves the accuracy. Uh, but a few eyes might require some eczema treatment later on. Uh, so the take-home message is simple. Early detection is the key. Flap stri are common. You need to look out for them in the post-operative period. Not all stri will require intervention, but the prognosis is pretty good wherever it is required. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heyman. I now invite Professor Harish Sina, Professor of Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at Abhishek Center Ames to present his talk on vaulting issues in fake tiles. Uh, thank you, Manpreet. And uh, I must tell you all that Manpreet has worked very hard for making this uh, Foundation Day celebration successful. And uh, congratulations to all of us for this uh, wonderful Foundation Day, 55th Foundation Day. And I'll be talking about vault-related issues in ICL. Okay, so eight minute. I'll just uh, do this way. Okay, fine. So, uh, so the point is that uh, what are vault related issues and what is an acceptable vault and what is unacceptable vault? We all know that. Uh, the acceptable vault is 250 microns to 750 microns. And this vault was actually defined, this normal range was defined when we had the V4 uh, ICLs, when we did not have the center, uh, central aqua port. With the central aqua port, we may go a little bit 50 microns low, below and, and a few microns above as well, because the risk of uh, you know, less nutrition to the lens has been minimized. The less risk of pupillary damage, uh, pupillary block glaucoma has been minimized. And that is why we may accept maybe up to 200 to 1000 microns. It's still acceptable. Thousand, why I say, because with time it will reduce uh, as we all know. And, but less than 200 and more than 1000 is not acceptable at all. So why it's not acceptable? If it's a low vault, then it can cause cataract because it can, you know, directly sit on the capsule. And if it's a high vault, uh, if it's a low vault, it can also lead to uveitis because there is, when there's a low vault, what happens that it's more in touch with the iris tissue. And that is why there is more of rubbing uh, with the normal pupillary reflex. And uh, that results in uveitis, as you can see here in this particular case. And if the vault is very high, then in that case, uh, you can have the risk of glaucoma. 
So why this vault surprise? Because we have done all these measurements, everything has been sorted out, but still we get surprised because we place the ICL in the sulcus and we measure the white to white. We do the measurements based on white to white. So that is the reason. But then there is a relationship of, you know, uh, sulcus with the white to white. Sulcus is about 0.42 millimeter more than uh, the white to white diameter. But it is not exactly true. It is not exactly 0.42 in every meridian. And that is the reason why we get surprises in spite of all the best of, uh, uh, you know, uh, measurements. So we did a study, a thesis, uh, uh, wherein we did repeatability in white to white measurement and comparison of uh, with sulcus diameter for assignment of uh, for assessment of size of ICL. And we did white to white with OpScan 2, eye trace, lens star, IOL master, digital caliper. And we found out, uh, and the sulcus to sulcus diameter was done by the help of uh, uh, this uh, UBM. Now, one thing before I tell you uh, what actually happens, UBM definitely gives you a sulcus to sulcus diameter very nicely. But sometimes because of this insertional changes, because of slightly higher insertion, slightly lower insertion, you may not exactly go at the recess the last point of the recess of the sulcus because you have to put the cursor manually and there is the chance of human error and that is one issue which has still not been solved so we found out that one thing is repeatability that the measurement should again and again come to uh, come as the same that gives the reliability of the instrument so repeatability we found that the IOL master had the best repeatability the coefficient of repeatability is inverse of uh, actual repeatability so IOL master had the best repeatability but opscan as well as digital caliper also had a very good repeatability then we wanted to compare the various methods and we found out that there was a good correlation between the IOL master and opscan this study was done uh, i think four or five years back when we had opscan uh, and now we do only with digital caliper. So there was a good correlation with the digital caliper versus IOL master as well as OPSCAN versus IOL master. And the difference was 0.364 millimeters. So uh, if you are measuring, uh, doing, you just have IOL master, you can still go ahead and do an ICL practice. You can reduce 0.364 from the value that you are getting in IOL master uh, white to white measurements. And what we found that the vault uh, kept on decreasing with time, as has been noted in other studies as well. So what we found in the study was that in majority of cases, in 80% of the cases, we found that the, uh, the sizing of the ICL was appropriate with the OPSCAN and with the digital caliper. But uh, additional 7%, we had 87% of patients who had uh, uh, whose uh, ICL sizing based on the post of vault was good with uh, UBM sulcus to sulcus diameter. So there was an advantage of 7%, but still 13% was still left because of the human error that we can have in uh, sulcus to sulcus diameter, as I was mentioning earlier. So in conclusion, we, we thought that uh, probably if we combine sulcus to sulcus with white to white, if we get certain nomograms, certain software, then perhaps we may cross from 87 to maybe 94, 95%, but uh, getting up to 100% accurate vault is still a challenge. So if you have unacceptable vault, like if the vault is very low, then what will you do? If it's low, less than 200 microns, then you have to explant it. There's no other option because it will keep on reducing. If it's a high vault, if it's a toric, uh, implant, then if it's 1000 to 1200, you can still wait for a couple of months and see because it may reduce. Now, reduction in vault, I would just like to, uh, I'll just take one more minute because of the delay. And so, uh, see that the reduction in vault with time happens not only because of the increase in the uh, lens thickness, etc., but also because of the repositioning of the ICL. A study has shown that a lot of ICLs had one of the foot plates. Uh, you know, uh, stuck to the ciliary process. And that way, that was the reason why there was a higher vault. So with time, with the movement of the, uh, this iris and the pupil, what happens that it reorients and that is why there's further reduction in the vault. That is also one of the reasons. So we may wait for some time in toric uh, ICL if it's uh, 1000 to 1200. And if it's not reducing, then we have to explant it. If it's more than 1200, then we have to explant it immediately. If it's a spherical lens with a high wall, 1200, 1300, in that case, we may rotate it. We may bring it vertical because as opposed to the horizontal white to white, uh, horizontal white to white is more than vertical white to white. 
the sulcus to sulcus diameter is more vertically than horizontally. So we can rotate it and make it vertical. And uh, so if we, uh, once we make it vertical, let me just, so what, what you have to do while you are rotating? One point which I would like to highlight here is this, that you should inject some viscoelastic at, at the edge of the ICL. It is not showing, I was pointing here, but it's not showing anyways. At the edge of the ICL, you should put some viscoelastic. Why? Because it will not only form the chamber, it will go slightly behind the ICL so that when you are rotating, it will not damage the zonule. There will be a cushion between the ICL and the zonule. That is very essential. And I'll just go to the picture. You can see here that this was the pre-operative vault, which was uh, 1200 uh, microns and post-operatively it has reduced down to 650. And if the vault is too less, then you can explant the uh, uh, ICL or this is an IPCL. So for explantation, uh, you, as you can see here, the vault is too less here. It is almost uh, close to almost touching the uh, capsule at some places, so it's less than 100 microns. So while you are explanting the uh, phacic uh, IOL, one thing that you should see that you should not hold it from the center of the foot plate, hold it from one side and then pull it. So it just, you know, uh, 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 you know, folds and it comes out through that small opening. So it is very easy to, to do that. So I'll just uh, move on. We had a wonderful study done by, uh, uh, done in our unit, a lot of effort done by Manpreet. And uh, we uh, tried to correlate the preoperative vault to postoperative vault. And uh, there was a formula also that was derived. And this is the formula based on which we can predict the postoperative vault based on the intraoperative vault if we have the intraoperative OCT. So in conclusion, the uh, uh, ICL sizing is still a little bit of concern. The only, perhaps the only concern left with the phagic implants and that is in the post-operative vault. So there can be some issues related to post-operative vault if there is some ICL sizing concern. There are multiple methods that have been tried and uh, by combining all these methods, we can uh, uh, reach out uh, to the best possible size in majority of cases in close to 90%, but still five to 10% of cases may require some intervention like rotation or exchange, et cetera. So maybe with time we can become wiser and, uh, and maybe uh, we may attain 100% correct sizing in future. So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. I now invite Dr. Sanjay Kumar to present his talk on recurrent corneal erosions. I invite Professor Radhika Tandem, ma'am, on the dais. I would like to thank uh, Professor Tikyal and uh, the entire RPC team for this wonderful opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. I'll be talking about recurrent corneal erosions. I have no financial interest to declare. The current corneal erosion was first reported by Hansen in 1872 uh, and most commonly seen in fourth to and fifth decade. Uh, and trauma is the most common cause. Fingernail scratch by babies is the most common cause among females. Uh, it is uh, presented uh, as an acute onset pain, redness, watering, and blurring of vision, which starts early in the morning and cornea shows loose mobile epithelium with underlying grayish deposits. The infiltra infiltrates are absent unless there is a secondary infection and the adjacent conjunctiva shows congestion and some reaction. The most common cause is uh, trauma, which accounts to uh, up to 70% of the cases. And the uh, second most common cause is superficial corneal dystrophies like epithelial basement membrane dystrophy and Bowman's layer dystrophy. Pathophysiology is characterized by an, uh, absence or anomalous hemidesmosomes or absence or destruction of anchoring structures. 
by matrix metalloproteinases. Abnormal deposition of basement membrane is also seen and uh, along with edematous basal epithelial cells, uh, which uh, turn into a circular shape rather than a, a cuboidal shape. The diagnosis is mainly clinical based on careful history taking and slit lamp evaluation. Grayish deposits in subtle cases has to be identified and uh, confocal microscopy has shown deposits in the basal epithelial cells, subepithelial uh, microfolds and streaks, damaged subbasal nerves and also altered morphology of the anterior stroma. The treatment uh, before discussing treatment, there is a disclaimer that it is called recurrent corneal erosion because in spite of all the possible treatments, there can be uh, uh, recurrences in these cases. Uh, step ladder treatment is, step ladder approach is recommended uh, and the primary most, uh, uh, I mean, initial treatment is to address the cause of the recurrent corneal erosions. Uh, like any tear film abnormalities or lid abnormalities has to be treated first uh, before considering the definitive treatment for recurrent corneal erosion. Conservative approaches are always advised, uh, uh, advised before trying any surgical procedure. Uh, conservative treatment includes uh, uh, copious lubricants, uh, steroids to reduce the matrix metalloproteinases activity and uh, prophylactic antibiotics uh, and also uh, preferably combined in steroid drops to avoid any preservatives in the steroids and uh, oral tet tetracyclines can reduce the MMP activity and autologous serum in very refractive cases and dry eyes associated with recurrent corneal erosions. Bandage contact lenses are advised along with the topical medication uh, as these help in epithelial uh, migration and healing. Uh, a tighter fitting with uh, one millimeter or less moment is advised with large diameter, high water content bandage contact lenses. And uh, most importantly, the bandage contact lenses should be left for at least six weeks so that the hemidesmosomes are formed and they are there to the uh, underlying basement uh, membrane. The surgical treatment uh, includes superficial keratectomy where a thin layer of cornea including the basement membrane and possibly a Bowman's layer is removed around uh, 25 microns. You can use a diamond burr also to remove the superficial uh, uh, layer. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, it can cause irregular astigmatism and also haze formation. Anterior stromal puncture has uh, by using a 20 to 26 gauge needle, uh, double bent like in show, it is shown in the uh, figure. Multiple punctures like 0.5 to 1 millimeter apart, uh, especially in the periphery where you cannot uh, do laser uh, is very important in treatment of uh, such recurrent corneal erosions. And uh, to avoid visual axis in uh, uh, doing the stromal puncture, it acts by inducing scar and improving the quality of the basement membrane. Phototherapeutic keratectomy has reported success rate of 75 to 100%. Uh, you only ablate uh, 5 to 10 microns and uh, maximum up to 25 microns in such cases uh, also acts by increasing the accumulation of type 7 collagen and hemidesmosomes. May cause haze formation and uh, hyperopic shift in refraction. Uh, secondary microbial keratitis is a risk in such cases. Here is an illustration of uh, recurrent uh, corneal erosion treated by uh, PTK. You can see the loose epithelium even without application of uh, uh, alcohol, any alcohol, it is uh, coming with just a sponge and uh, make sure you remove the peripheral epithelium also. And once you apply the laser uh, in the periphery, you make sure that uh, you do a anterior stromal puncture with the 26 gauge needle and apply uh, bandage contact lens in the end. To summarize, recurrent corneal erosion is caused by defective anchoring mechanism of the corneal epithelium. Trauma following, uh, followed by superficial corneal dystrophies are the leading causes. Careful clinical slit lamp evaluation 
helps in swift diagnosis. Treatment should always uh, start from conservative uh, methods. And uh, in spite of all measures, the condition can recur in some individuals. So the patient counseling is very important in such case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nakesh. I now invite Professor Radhika Tendon, Professor and Head of Unit, Cornea Cataract Refractive Surgery and Ocular Oncology Unit to present her talk on microbial teratitis case-based discussion. Thank you so much, Manpreet. Uh, good morning, everybody. So lovely to see uh, so many nice familiar faces in the audience. It's really feeling really good today. So I'm going to talk about uh, a case-based approach for um, microbial keratitis. It's a huge topic. Basically, just as, in a nutshell, I'd say that uh, though we have all the protocols, we have all the criteria and the treatment regime, still you have to use a tailored case-based approach because there are many factors which come in in looking after an individual patient. The clinical assessment and you as a person who's seeing is of course most important and always make it a point to document because you never know how the case is going to go on later on. And so with a few examples, I'll show you that how uh, useful it was for us that we have happened to have the documentation. Apart from academics, um, teaching and research, even for the clinical care, having proper documentation makes a huge difference. And then we have a whole host of wonderful machines at our dis disposal now, which improve the speed, accuracy and reliability of our care. Don't forget the simple clinical photograph that's extremely useful, so proper documentation. And then of course we have higher range instruments such as OCT and confocal microscopy. And when the patient recovers from the illness, then you have further uh, help for op optical and visual rehabilitation, where you can use the optical effects of the scar, by aberrometry, densitometry, and then um, decide how best to rehabilitate. So what works, what's new, slit lamp with camera, very important. And of course, confocal microscopy and ASOCT are also very useful practical tools in certain situations. You cannot do them in every case. And these other ones like densitometry, aberrometry, AI, deep learning are a little bit more like work in progress and more futuristic. Now, talking about case-based studies, we have several reports from our study, uh, several in, um, publications from our center as well. Looking at ASOCT, there are very great benefits in clinical applications for early detection, diagnosis, and management, particularly in cases of deep keratitis, you monitor the response and you know, plan the surgery. And uh, looking at the actual practical approach for the uh, investigation of confocal microscopy, it is very helpful in atypical infectious keratitis, sometimes with viral and bacterial, but certainly the atypical cases, particularly I would like to highlight acanthamoeba and fungal keratitis because it gives you the diagnosis straight away. And these are some useful papers which have largely shown that this is how it works. For bacterial also, you can get it, but the sensitivity and specificity is not that great. And obviously you realize are not going to ask for a confocal microscopy for a simple bacterial keratitis. Now, coming to uh, microsporidia versus adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis, this is one example where, though it seems that, oh, I can make out clinically, but sometimes it is difficult. And with the ASOCT, you can make out when their lesions are sub-epithelial and involving the stroma, they're more likely adenoviral, whereas when they have a stuck-on appearance, it could be microsporidia. But then there are the exceptions which prove the rule. So there are so many exceptions which confuse you, and a few cases I'd like to show you. So we have this uh, gentleman who, in fact, even came to the OPD today, and I'm so glad I was in the OPD today morning because this fellow came back after, on follow-up. So he has lost vision in one eye because of a CRVO, and the other eye, he was suspected to have a recurrent HSV keratitis for which he was given the usual treatment, topical steroids and oral antiviral. And he used to keep having this waxing and waning um, kind of a pattern. His vision would improve to 660, 636. He had secondary glaucoma periodically, which was treated, and then he would deteriorate. And it was like becoming very frustrating because he would feel so helpless because he would improve to very good vision and then lose it again. Then we did the confocal microscopy and we found that there were features suggestive of a fungal keratitis. 
And also what we thought at that time were acanthamoeba involvement. So he was treated as a fungal keratitis as well as a, a, a coincident acanthamoeba infection. And another useful um, tool of confo or application of confocal microscopy in 2019 has also been to show the reduction of the acanthamoeba cyst density associated with treatment. Now this doesn't work out practically very good for us because it's not, you know, it's somehow you feel it's a very invasive, you do feel it's an invasive uh, investigation, but it's good to know that this is something that you can do if you particularly want to see what's happening. And now this gentleman, the same one I'm talking about, who we thought was uh, first viral, then uh, acanthamoeba, as well as fungal, uh, he eventually required keratoplasty, which we were, uh, thought was an optical keratoplasty. Everything had settled down, but his vision had fallen down to finger counting. And we knew his vision had, uh, he had a potential of six, 36 to 624. Now, surprisingly, the histopath microphotograph showed these numerous overall spores of microsporidia and the mid and deep corneal stroma. And I would like to acknowledge Ritika Mukheja because she, throughout the pandemic, also supported this patient. He would come despite the various lockdowns. And this is what it turned out to be that was actually microsporidiosis. This is what we got on the PK button. Coming to another example, this is a patient who has this kind of a ring-like uh, lesion and normally typically this kind of appearance you would think would be again a form keratitis and confocal microscopy in this patient showed these activated keratocytes and it was, um, uh, a, but they were also associated fungal elements. So this was another case of co-infection. Coming to one more case, this was a 32 year old female and Dr. Suresh was a senior res junior resident at that time when this patient was being looked after. Patient was a, an unreliable informant, gave a history of pain, redness, watering, photophobia, loss of vision in both eyes, and a history of several months. So she reached RPC after several months of treatment, after seeing several ophthalmologists and not responding to anything. There was no history of trauma, contact lens, dirty water, self-medication, traditional eye remedy, or any known systemic illness. And this patient was extremely photophobic and very painful. She was sitting with her head in her hand, very difficult to do any investigation. But we managed to do a confocal microscopy, and that this did show the features of um, these hyperreflective overround cystic structures, suggestive of acanthamoeba. So she was treated with that. So we were not sure whether it was a combination of HSV and acanthamoeba, because she'd already been treated for several months, but she was treated then with topical PHMB propamidine. We also use boriconazole when there is such co-infection, cycloplegics and anti-glaucoma. And she was like in the ward, sometimes you would think she's getting better, sometimes she was not getting better. So finally, she had to undergo a therapeutic keratoplasty. We did one eye and then the other eye after a few days. And HSV was not confirmed. And after three months, the eye settled down. And then she came for uh, cataract surgery, two-year follow-up, and she has remained. So she got the full six months treatment of um, uh, uh, PHMB for her, uh, acanthamoeba. So she was a little unusual case because um, uh, we had used an, uh, a non-optical grade cornea, but it was from a younger donor. And you can see that sometimes they do quite well. And she had 6 by 9 OU vision. And this patient also came back for follow-up a, a month later. Now, bilateral keratitis can complicate, complicate, complicate conjunctivitis quick a case of a young girl, 11 year old, she developed acute onset watering redness pain and she was recovered in one week. She was treated outside. She was asymptomatic for two weeks and then she came with this severe photophobia. There was no history of any actual risk factor, though it was a rainy season. She had severe blepharospasm and photophobia. This is what she looked like. Again, she had to be admitted because she was very uncomfortable and we started blunderbuss treatment, which again, I say that we always say you not to do. But in this particular case, we were quite desperate and this was a child, 11 year old. She refused to undergo the uh, confocal microscopy. So this patient, we really had to treat with everything. And then uh, she showed, started showing improvement, visual acuity improved over three, four days to one by 60, three by 60, then six by 60. And this is how the eye started looking. And then six, 12, six, nine, and uh, gradually all the, the opacity started resolving. This is how it looked like initially. And then finally, and this is what she was at the time of admission. She had a rapid deterioration of vision. And this is how she was six, six and six, nine, 
and on the follow-up visit. This is two years after surgery. So these are examples not to recommend that this is how you approach the patient, but just to give you examples that sometimes you do have to do unusual measures. But in such cases, always remember, look at the other factors. Uh, conjunctivitis also, if you see, there can be several other uh, host um, problems. Uh, and uh, of course, if you have associated allergic disease, that has to be treated as well, but it can be an uncommon manifestation of a disease. One last case, keratitis with a ring um, ulcer, 40 year old female had no history of trauma, was a farm worker. She had already consulted and, uh, several ophthalmologists and because of a ring, Wesley ring appearance, she had been started on uh, antibiotics and antifungal when there was no improvement in uh, symptoms. Now you see this looks very similar like the previous case I showed you. And this patient had three by 60 and has slightly elevated IOP, but we thought it was a disciform keratitis and there was decimates fold. She had re reduced corneal sensations. And this patient's confocal microscopy did not show any fungal elements, did not show any acanthamoeba uh, cysts. And then she was treated on oral acyclovir and topical steroids and she recovered uh, to a vision of six nine. So Wesley immune ring, these are the common organisms, um, fungal, acanthamoeba, as well as viral, keep it in, in view. And we do have this book, Corneal Infection and Inflammation, where a lot of um, such examples are illustrated. And looking at the future, I think uh, that uh, it's all the contribution which all the residents do in taking care of the patient, as well as in keeping the records for us, and also coming up with interesting questions and you know uh, what to do for this patient. Uh, and then a futuristic view, one, well, I think there's possibly a densitometry and amidometry will have some future for uh, the visual rehabilitation of these patients. But don't forget the simple photo and um, they are atypical cases and often difficult to handle. So Suresh was a senior junior resident when that uh, acanthamoeba keratitis case was there. And these are the rest of the people. There's so many people working in RCC and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities we get to take care of patients. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the, uh, such a nice spectrum of uh, cases that you presented. Uh, we move on to the next talk, and that will be done by Dr. Kuresh Muskati, who is uh, joining online, and uh, he'll be presenting on acute chemical burns management. Thanks, uh, uh, Rajesh, and uh, sorry, oops. I'll just start with the first slide. I take this opportunity to invite all of you present in the audience as well as those viewing online uh, to Mumbai for our DreamCon 2022 from June 2nd to June 5th. We promise you an experience you will remember for your life. So as a member of the LOC, as a, as a past president of AIOS, do join us for the first physical conference after Guru Gram. Uh, modern approach to acute chemical um, uh, injuries much has remained the same. Um, Can't see your no slides, more. sir. Sorry, my slides are not visible. No, no. Uh, sorry. Yes? Yes. So much has remained... Um, uh, the same and a lot has changed as well as in our approach to chemical burns. We know thanks to Professor Dua about two decades ago, he helped us to replace the Tufts classification and asked us to look at perilimbal ischemia and the concept of stem cells. Of course, we, uh, when we are looking at chemical burns, we also need to look at the eyelids very, very closely because a failure of blink, lag of thalmos will affect our prognosis. So the just do us classification, which still holds true two decades later, we go from grade one, which is very good, which can be treated by a family physician perhaps, to grade six, which is poor, which even in the best of hands at the RP center will, have, will give you a poor grade. So we have various grades and we look at the limbal clock hours involved. We look at the conjunctiva, we look at the leads. And this is a dynamic classification because every time you see the patient, you need to grade him again. He may move from grade three to grade two or from grade three to grade four uh, with the treatment and you need to titrate your treatment accordingly. A little uh, word on pathophysiology in acids. The acid patient looks bad in the initial stages, 
because the, the, there is protein denaturation which occurs and precipitation and coagulation. So you get this ground glass appearance, um, uh, but acid burns are not as bad as alkali burns, exception being hydrofluoric acid, which behaves like an alkali because of the fluoride ion. So in alkali burns, the early appearance is not so bad as the acid because what happens, there is no ground glass appearance. The alkaline substances are lipophilic, so they penetrate the cell membranes very easily, taponifying them. And the, this causes deeper and deeper penetration, and soon the alkali reaches into the anterior segment, uh, into the anterior chamber as well. So what is our emergency treatment? Copious lavage, one to two hours is what we mean by copious lavage, not five to ten minutes. If reported in one to two hours, I would do a paracentesis. If there is any lime burns, unfortunately in our country with the tuna being the, the, the lime, the calcium hydroxide, with the pan cellars being given in packets, especially a child, uh, you need to do a double eversion, remove every bit of lime which is there. You might use EDTA to chelate to remove this. Uh, and you must remove all the necrotic material because the more the necrotic material, the more the polymorphic nucleosides come there. Uh, the thing that we do, of course, atropine is used, but the thing we do differently is 10% ascorbate, which is put one hourly. And we give all these patients subconjunctival venous blood. So the patient's own blood is taken from the vein and the, the, the injected into the fornices. And if the patient is admitted, then I put drops of the blood onto the cornea and form a clot at night. And then put an eye patch on at night. Why do we stress the role of vitamin C? First of all, it's very easy to make vitamin C. You don't have to dilute it. You get uh, the 5 ml uh, vials of vitamin C, which contain 500 milligram. So 500 milligram in 5 ml is 10% vitamin C, which is what is required. So no dilution. If you don't have vials, and if you have to take tablet of 500 milligram of vitamin C, just dissolve it in 5 ml of distilled water, and you can use this. So why vitamin C? Because it, it, it reduces the incidence of ulcers and perforations. It's required by the fibroblasts to make collagen. And it is very, very almost zero, close to zero in the anterior chamber uh, in uh, chemical burns. What about blood? Why am I using blood? Because it acts as a buffer. It dilutes the chemical. It separates the tissues. It acts as a barrier against further penetration. And it's fibronolytic, so prevents simulifron from uh, occurring. Mm -hmm. So the, it, uh, further, it contains antiproteases, which inhibits collagenase. The collagenase is the enzyme which breaks down newly formed collagen. So you want the collagen to form. And the platelets fill the gaps on the denuded surface. So when there is a denuded surface, you know, the platelets change their shape from being bi <laughs> bicuboidal to becoming amoeboid. And they hold on to the collagen fibers and prevent them from breaking down. So physically, they hold on because they develop amoeboid pseudopods, as it were. Um, atropine, of course, continues. You must use steroids in patients unless you're actually seeing a melt happening in front of you. Otherwise, steroids are very important, again, because they, they destroy the collagenase enzymes. So I would continue with the ascorbate, subconjunctival venous blood, as I told you, formation of blood clot at night, and then eye patch. So this is the uh, 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 just a short video on the formation. Is There's no rocket science to it. I'm just opening the eye and with a uh, syringe, putting a drop, putting drop by drop, and the blood clot forms uh, on the cornea. And then you just pull the upper lid gently over the lower lid and close it and apply an eye patch. This blood comes from the venous blood, the elbow, and there's no dilution or anything done. Uh, uh, the use of amniotic membrane has been proved by a landmark paper from Sridhar et al. again about two decades ago. And uh, it, we always used it only in cold cases, but they showed us that you can use it in acute chemical burns. It has a, a tremendous anti-inflammatory role. It might get absorbed in a few days to a week, but you can again put it again twice or thrice also. You can do this, of course, after thorough lavage. I uh, won't go into the details of how it works. We know that it is a multi, multiple ways. It en enhances typical cell differentiation, alters the stromal microenvironment, makes it more friendly for epithelial cells to migrate. It's anti-angiogenic, and it, at the very least, it acts as a bandage contact lens. The new thing I want to share with you is the role of oxygen. Again, something very, very, uh, we, we know the good role that oxygen played in COVID crisis and these Iranian papers which came out, which showed that a simple use of oxygen for ocular burns 
uh, they compared patients treated with oxygen to those without, and they found that the oxygen group showed increased corneal transparency, decreased vascularization, and better visual equity with fewer complications. And it's very easy to apply. All it needs is 100% oxygen using a simple mask at a flow rate of 10 liters per minute, just for an hour twice daily. So one hour twice daily, you put an oxygen mask uh, with 100% oxygen, 10, 10 liters per minute flow rate, very easy to do in your wards. And the healing is so much better. The other treatments are <coughs> quite uh, the same. Ascorbic acid can be given orally and IV as well. Doxycycline we give because it reduces melt. Um, and this is again, quite well uh, known. And in the visual rehabilitation stage, which is much later and outside the scope of this uh, mitomite of the mucous membrane grafts and keratoprosthesis have a huge role to play. To conclude, you are at this point here. We have just talked about acute chemical burns management. And I thank you again for your attention and invite you to Mumbai. Sorry if I've overloaded your brain by a, a, a very fast glimpse of what all you can do. But those who slept through it all, I have finished. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It was really very informative. And we move on to our next speaker, that is Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, who will be uh, talking about corneal patch grafts. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope I'm audible and my side slides are visible. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll be talking about uh, corneal patch grafts and uh, I'll quickly show you a couple of cases. This is a three millimeter perforation case of Steven Johnson syndrome where we wanted to do a three millimeter full thickness patch graph. And these are the tools that I'm using. These are dermatological punches, two, three, and four millimeters. They are uh, uh, available with the friendly dermatologists around the corner. So uh, I'm going to use a corneal tissue that's already been used for uh, another case where a transplant was done. This is a corneal scleral rim. And I'm going to take the rim tissue, punch out a three millimeter donor uh, profile, and eventually suture it on to the site of perforation. So we use the Polak double edged fo uh, forceps to actually grasp the tissue because it's very difficult to handle these uh, small uh, lenticules. The bites have to be short in the donor and long uh, at the host cornea short bites in the donor and long deep bites in the host cornea. So opposed to regular penetrating keratoplasty, the burying of the north sphere would be uh, into the host cornea. And this is the post-op picture you can see after three months, uh, the tissue is, uh, the eye is much quieter because of the concomitant treatment that was being given and the graft is well taken up and the eye has been saved. This is a case of uh, Increasing size of cyst uh, just at uh, upper temporal area, you can see within a period of four months, the size of the cyst has increased and there was a malformation that the patient kept noticing. This was a corneal graft done by us nearly 25 years ago. So what we wanted to do was explore. Uh, at that point of time, we did have to access to UBM or any uh, fancy tools. So this was a case done quite a few years back. So just opening up the cystic area and we see a defect there, uh, thinning and melting we could see a notice over there. So we formed the chamber under the graph. We just pushed in some methyl cellulose and we excised the, you can see how thin the tissue has become. So we excised this thin tissue and we again used a tissue from a donor lenticule that was a con corneal button that was used for another patient. So we free fashioned that tissue and after excision of all the thinned out areas, This is the donor, donor rim, as you can all recognize. And we tailor-made customized free fashion graft for this particular patient and just sutured it on over there. So I just skip it from here. And this is the post-operative picture that you can see within two weeks. There's no cyst reformation. The AC is very stable and the patient is doing pretty well. So this is a very interesting case of a one-eyed patient who had a white mature cataract with a desmetoseal because of uh, and, and a very severe dry eye. So we did a routine phaco emulsification and my plan was to do a four millimeter lamellar patch graft 
for this patient then the interesting choice of tissue uh, not by uh, uh, design uh, it's by fate that we had no access to tissue at that particular time. So we used a glycerin preserved tissue for this particular case. And I'll show you the post-op results, which are fantastic. And I still follow up this patient's up to, patient after many, many years. So I'm using a beaver's blade, guarded beaver's blade. And I'll be dissecting the bed where I want to place the lamellar uh, graft. See, the idea is to be very careful so that we don't perforate. There's already an existing decimeter seal in the center. We're creating a groove all around with the crescent blade to pass our sutures as well as anchor the tissue as well as we can. The point about suturing in such cases is even the needle can actually perforate the thinned out tissue, the decimeter seal. So we have to create this groove. So this is a glycerin preserved cornea. As you can see, it's chalky white. So I'll just skip it from here. It's a regular suturing. And this is a case one year post uh, the surgery. And you can see the oval circle behind is the capsular axis that's fibrosed. And you can see the anteriorly placed uh, uh, lamellar corneal graft, which is still doing well. And the patient is enjoying a 618 vision unaided till date. This is an interesting case referred to me post FACO tunnel infection. So again, we took up a five millimeter thickness patch graft over here, dissected the tissue all around. Sorry for the poor quality of the videos because these have been taken uh, almost 15 years ago. So, so again, I'm uh, dissecting out the infected tissue. We sent it for histopathology and microbiology and uh, cleaning up all the iris uh, fibrillary material on the iris and doing a peripheral diarrhea at that site. So this again is a tissue from a corneal scleral rim. You can make out that spiral part, that white part. And suture it as it is. This is a case of PUK, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, ker 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 showing a progressive keratolysis, impending perforation uh, with a desmetocene. So we take this up for a tailor-made, customized, free fashion banana graft. So, uh, a lamellar graft again. So, we mark out with a trifine, about 9 millimeters. Do a sectoral peritectomy and uh, kind of prepare the bed for the graft to be placed. So this is the lamella graft, again, a corneal scleral tissue that we had used for a central penetrating graft. We place it there and then suturing is just regular. So again, so this is the post-operative picture after four weeks, uh, the first day post-op as well as the post-op uh, post picture four weeks. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Rajiv, for some very nice videos, some very nice cases that you presented. Uh, we move on to our next speaker, Dr. M. Vanati, who will be talking about pediatric keratoplasty. Thank you, Rajesh. And, uh... It's always nice uh, to see all our alumni here and happy to be amongst you today. And congratulations to all of you on our 55th Foundation Day. Uh, no financial interest in this talk on uh, an overview and concerns of pediatric erythroplasty. The particular uh, concerns would be uh, to make a proper diagnosis, looking at the indications and correlating with its relevance to the prognosis, the particular preoperative considerations and the surgical considerations 
looking at the effectiveness of alternatives to penetrating keratoplasties in uh, pediatric age group, challenging scenarios, and the post-operative concerns here. The preoperative indications in India mostly are uh, congenital corneal opacities, CHED forming a large amount of it, but now today the classical CHED has moved in, moved away from being called CHED and it's CHED type 2, which we are now going to be referring to as CHED. And uh, the functional outcome in that is probably not as good as the, the type 1 or what is now gone into the PPCD grouping here. The congenital corneal opacities, non-shed opacities, uh, the prognostic and the anatomical outcome for keratoplasties in these grafts still remain guarded. A large amount of uh, keratoplasties in Indian scenario are acquired traumatic and acquired non-traumatic causes here and uh, a prognosis depends upon the severity or the morbidity of the associated uh, uh, conditions uh, in these cases here. Pediatric keratoplasty, uh, what is different is that uh, most of them, most of these cases will require the use of Leringa rings here because of the low spiral rigidity here. Much of the other uh, procedures, uh, other intra-surgical types are similar to adult keratoplasty. But the concerns is that you will always need an examination under anesthesia for uh, looking at or uh, making a precise preoperative diagnosis and assessment of uh, associated ocular comorbidities. Functional assessment preoperatively is very important here. Doing a preoperative uh, UBM particularly helps you to look at the associated ocular conditions and also effectively plan your surgical interventions in these scenarios here. So now a preoperative UBM has sort of become a, a, a mandate or protocol in the uh, in the planning in the surgical planning of pediatric keratoplasty cases with the advent of uh, uh, intraoperative uh, microscope or CT here then uh, that decreases the time in, uh, in the UBM imaging and we are able to do pretty much see these images as we are uh, uh, um, delving into the surgery of these patients here so a particular word on uh, looking at uh, the role of, of keratoplasty in uh, congenital hereditary endothelial distribution and uh, here you would see that um, the, the kind of opacity or the density of the opacification is perhaps important in deciding the, uh, whether you want to do a full thickness or a, a lamellar a posterior endothelial keratoplasty in these cases here. Uh, the, the type 1 CHED or the PPCD now here has a very good prognosis for uh, both functional and, uh, and uh, the visual, out, uh, both the anatomical and visual outcome of these patients here. Uh, but also depends on the timing the surgery is done for these patients. And uh, remember when you're doing endothelial keratoplasties uh, for these cases, be it DSEC or DMEC here, uh, remember to suture these uh, incisions here and not as in adults, do not leave them unsutured and you would lose your graft in the post-operative phase. And uh, particular importance is the post-operative positioning of these patients, pediatric patients is particularly difficult. So you will have to consider these before you're making a decision to do the type of surgery in uh, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophies here. When you're looking at uh, uh, another particular uh, difficulty and as beginners, you will always have to remember that uh, retained Desmet's membrane, you have a higher incidence when you're doing it in congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophies. You might probably inadvertently leave behind the very transparent Desmet's membrane in these cases. So do look out and uh, always, uh, uh, always be careful that this does not happen here, but it does invariably do happen to the best of the hands as well here. When you're looking at congenital corneal opacification, which now falls under the broad heading of anterior segment uh, developmental anomalies because of the various phenotypic presentations of a similar genotype which is being mapped onto it here. And uh, the prognosis varies widely and uh, these cases still do not have uh, very good, uh, uh, good visual outcomes as compared to your, uh, your CHED or dystrophies in pediatric age group here. These cases are particularly challenging, the associated ocular comorbidities and the multiple interventions to manage them is a particular concern when you are looking at these cases. And uh, this is something which needs to be counseled and talked about in detail with the parents 
evidence before you're going to take on uh, such cases for uh, keratoplasty and the need for these patients to follow up with you lifelong and be able to access the physician's care as and when required is mandatory when you're looking at uh, anterior segment developmental anomalies in, uh, in patients and when you want to do keratoplasties for these patients. Acquired pediatric corneoaridic scars and uh, uh, post-keratitis corneoaridic scars still form a major part of indications of, pedi of uh, pediatric keratoplasty in our scenario. And uh, keratoconus, the, the need to decide on whether to do a full thickness or an anterior lamellar grafting will again depend upon the scarring which is present on these patients. Due to lack of time, I will not delve into more details here, but it is imperative to know what are the particular challenging situations in, the, in these pediatric eyes here, such as uh, you have chemical injuries, you have congenital, uh, um, congenital anterior um, stephyloma, such as this dermoids here. And uh, this is one particular scenario where you should know that you probably an intervention is not going to be beneficial and these eyes are uh, uh, perhaps left, uh, left uh, untouched as you would see in such patients here where uh, uh, they have nystagmoid movements and not nystagmus, which uh, beginners usually tend to, um, uh, tend to miss in these uh, scenarios here. Another challenging scenario is looking at heterosensory autonomic neuropathies here. These are neurotrophic corneas, and please beware that these are all better managed medically rather than taking in for surgical interventions. You would burn your fingers here, and you will land up with more and more problems if you would plan even lamellar procedures. So uh, non-surgical interventions or simple procedures such as tarsographies with, uh, with uh, copious lubricant therapy works best for these eyes in uh, management. Uh, we being a tertiary care center, uh, we do see a lot of keratomalacia here, perhaps in private practice, you would not see that much, but uh, this is still an entity which, be, which needs to be dealt with. And, uh, and the, it's one of the emergency situations in uh, cornea practice, and they will have to be managed both medically and surgically. And prognosis for keratoplasty is not so encouraging in these uh, cases. I'll just take a minute more. And uh, looking at alternatives such as rotational autokeratoplasty is very rewarding in cases, especially in one-eyed pediatric patients where the outcome can do away with many of the other concerns here. So just to close with the, the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty indications as you would need to do them in chemical injury, post-chemical injuries, uh, eyes which have been adequately uh, rejuvenated and primed with uh, bioengineered transplants here. The, uh, the dark procedures are particularly different when you would uh, look at the indications in these cases here. And the outcomes is also different and the post-operative management is also different here. Uh, do remember that when you do DALC for keratoconus cases, the sutures tend to loosen very fast as in pediatric, in pediatric cases, and especially those with associated VKC when you do take them on and they are more advanced cases. So the big bubble formation is also not as easy as you get in adult cases. So these are particular tips which you will have to look at when you're managing uh, these cases. I think you the lack of time. I will not take you through the others, but then remember, establishing the diagnosis, assessing the visual potential, <clears throat> the managing the associated ambilopia, looking at the uh, okay, look, comorbidities, assessing, and the ability of the family to participate in the course of treatment for a long period of time is perhaps imperative in the, um, in the success of surgery in these cases here. One, one particular concern is the rapid suture loosening, the need for repeated examinations under anesthesia, and then postoperative graft infection, management of glaucoma, rejection and astigmatism play a key role in the continued success of these patients. I'll skip the role of DMEC in these, but in order to achieve something as successful as this in, in patients, you need a, a team of, um, of corneal physicians and your pediatric ophthalmologist for effective visual rehabilitation in cases of pediatric keratoplasty. Thank you for your patient attention. Thank you, Dr. Vanati. And now we have the last speaker of the session, Dr. Jayanand Durkude, who will be talking about surgical management of microspherophakia.
good morning everyone i will be talking about the surgical management of microsporophyia it is a developmental anomaly of crystalline lens associated with a small spherical globular lens and there are abnormally lats and broken zones which leads to freely mobile lens in antechamber surgical uh, requirement is there when there is a recurrent attacks of papillary block glaucoma se severe subluxation or dislocation of lens and corneal lenticular touch so uh, the standard approach in such cases is to do a endocapsular lens aspiration which is uh, which has the advantage of being a closed chamber surgery laser anti chamber fluctuation and less chances of interaction with the vitreous so there are various approaches are given to uh, for the endocapsular lens aspiration but in cases with microsporophyia because of the extreme mobility of lens there are uh, lot of challenges so to overcome it we have given a modified technique uh, we call it as a kissing mur technique in which we use two mur blades uh, through side ports placed as a 180 degree apart uh, using two mur blades the dislocated lens can be brought in a center as well as stabilized with the help of mur blades and it also act as a counter traction force while creating a capsular opening the major modification in our technique is we created a capsular opening at the equator and not in the anterior capsule so uh, i would like to play here a small comprehensive video on our technique microsporophyia is an uncommon bilateral development anomaly of crystalline lens characterized by abnormally lax and broken zonules resulting in a small spherical globular lens There are various techniques that have been described in the literature for surgical correction. Intraventricular lens aspiration with bimanual irrigation aspiration can be done in such cases wherein two small rexes are created in anterior capsule. Further, a similar surgical approach with slight modification has been described wherein the vitrectomy probe was used along with irrigation cannula instead of the bimanual IA. In this conventional approach used by most surgeons either a capsular rexus is created or an MVR blade is used to create an anterior capsular opening the main problem associated with both the techniques is the absence of any counter traction force and excessive mobility of the lens during manipulation most of the surgeons face a major challenge during this step and may land up with a posteriorly dislocated lens or an inappropriately large capsular tear which may result in migration of cortical matter in vitreous we describe a new technique for the effective and controlled endocapsular lens aspiration in cases of microsporophyia the kissing mvr technique two clear corneal stab incisions are placed at 180 degrees apart at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock In such cases despite several attempts it may be difficult to create capsular bag openings by using a single MVR blade further the lens is pushed posteriorly with the movements of MVR increasing risk of posterior displacement peripheral iridectomy is created in supranasal quadrant viscoelastic is then injected near side ports to create space for maneuvering instruments At this stage the surgeon decides to use another MVR blade from the opposite side to provide counter traction to the initial MVR blade. Two 23G MVR blades are held facing each other and simultaneously introduced through corneal stab incisions and engaged at the equator of the lens or just posterior to it forming a dumbbell sign. MVR blades are then moved towards each other. until the surgeon senses a giveaway feeling once the nvr tips touch each other blades are then withdrawn back a good hydrodelineation is carried out with the help of 25g bss cannula without disturbing the peripheral cortex 25g bimanual ia probes are then introduced in the capsular bag through equatorial openings in retro illumination mode The central core of the lens is aspirated first, followed by removal of the peripheral cortex. 
intracameral pilocarpine is then injected and the empty capsular bag is removed with a vitrectomy cutter. Finally, triamcin alone assisted limited anterior vitrectomy is performed and the anterior chamber is formed with BSS. In our technique, simultaneous horizontal and forward force is applied on the lens to make entries into the capsular bag, while in conventional approach, vertically downward force is applied to create openings in the anterior capsule, which can increase the risk of posterior displacement of the weakly supported microsperophagia lens. The rationale behind the ideal site of entry being equator or just posterior to it, as compared to routinely done openings in the anterior capsule is that the capsule is relatively thicker and hence stronger in this area and has more resistance to tear, thus minimizing the risk of extension anteriorly or posteriorly. Another advantage of equatorial openings is the good visibility of both instruments through the undisturbed anterior capsule, as well as easier surgical maneuverings owing to the good distance between them. Using our technique, endocapsular lens aspiration was successfully performed in all patients without any intraoperative difficulties and complications. Thus, our technique is simple, precise, and reproducible, and has the potential to optimize the surgical and visual outcomes. Uh, this video was presented at various conferences and uh, received a few awards too. The results, uh, this uh, technique was performed in eight eyes of four patients, out of which three eyes had entry dislocation, two eyes had a lens in a pupillary plane, three eyes had a posterior chamber subluxation. In all, uh, uh, all cases, it was done successfully without any complications. And six eyes were left aphakic and two eyes underwent a simultaneous scleral fixation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jayanand. It was very nice uh, to see that video. Wonderful. Uh, any comment from anyone before we actually end this session? And and I request uh, all of you to uh, come to Hall A as the oration has started. So let's uh, move to Hall A. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us over here. Prashant, sir. Prashant, Prashant. Prashant. Sir, Dr. Prasad, take photograph. The session in Hall B will start at 3 p.m. I don't get it. I don't get it.
माइक को आगे रख
अरे ये तो नहीं चल रहा है 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 वहाँ पे आ रहा है तो यहाँ पे बेटा श्रीनी आई एट सो मच इन द मॉर्निंग को वेलकम कर देता ना नो ही सेड आई हैव लॉस सो मच वेट दैट आई शुड पुट ऑन आई शुड फील माय चीज इट बिट मोस्ट आई एट सो मच इन द मॉर्निंग आई नो द लॉजिक आई नो द लॉजिक ये मतलब वो नहीं चल रहा है सो माइक्रोफोन भी बंद है क्या नहीं 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 Uh, for this uh, session name uh, of ophthalmology redefined so uh, i welcome professor pravin basis uh, who is sitting next to me and uh, professor uh, tanush dada so uh, he is also next uh, sitting uh, to me and uh, so uh, so with this uh, i would like to pass you know uh, to dr pravin basis to start this session so uh, thank you suraj <coughs> we welcome you we welcome all of you on this session is of thalmology redefined and this is uh, you know this is 55th foundation day of rp center so uh, this is a session contain different topics in different areas the first of all i would like to invite uh, dr prashant bhartiye who is aims alumni and currently working in indor he'll be talking about corneal tattooing art and science dr prashant मेरा टॉक वहां से होगा जानू कैसे होगा इस पे है thank you uh this is not my last slide this is my first slide i am going to start with a thank you big thank you to uh, rp center my alumni my alma mater and uh, professor jeevan titial sir uh, namrata ma'am and all of you here from rp center so i'll start with my talk on corneal tattooing very unusual talk uh, not uh, spoken about in conferences uh both the science and art of corneal tattooing obviously the tattooing means uh, insertion of dyes and then into the deep uh, part of the dermis and if you do it on the skin it is called dermatography uh, that is the scientific term which uh, the journals use and for our corneal tattooing they have a term called keratopigmentation the indications would be cosmetic like if you want to hide a corneal opacity or if you want to hide a lenticular opacity in which you don't plan to do a corneal uh, do a cataract surgery or you might use this uh, tattoo to block a large optical iridectomy so this is an optical use of corneal tattooing it has been evolving from uh, two more than 2000 years ago when galen used copper sulfate for leucomas then it gradually moved to india ink ziegler and taylor are, pro are prominent names who used needles then there were there are multiple case reports series 
there are animal studies there are review articles and now there is a textbook on corneal pigmentation also so this subject is not a very unique subject it's it's been studied extensively so the science is basically to paint or impregnate the corneal stroma with some coloring agent the coloring agents which you have you could have uh, metallic uh, agents or chemicals like gold chloride platinum chloride silver nitrate which are reduced with a solution of hydrazine hydrate the, there are certain micronized metallic salts available which are ready made colors you can mix them and uh, they are prominently used for uh, an artistic uh, coloration there are colored uh, the other pigments which are organic dyes are india ink soot and some dyes which are used in paints uh, what is the difference between these metallic and organic dyes the metallic dyes uh, get uh, deposited in the extracellular uh, region so they fade faster they are they create more toxicity the organic dyes uh, they are usually intracellular longer lasting and they are less toxic if they are pure and especially if they don't have any other metallic ingredients see the regular tattoo dye which is used by tattoo artists is soot based organic and this is a very this is the most common dye which we use we corneal surgeons use for tattooing uh, our own alumni dr uh, ms ravindra from bangalore has uh, propagated this use of uh, lamp black or soot which you can prepare in the ot so you can either put it on the surface or you can put it into a pocket so the into the pocket now even femtosecond assisted laser uh, femtosecond laser assisted kerato pigmentation has arrived with you can use needles you can use 30 gauge needles 26 gauge needles or the 10 0 nylon needle and you can use the micropuncture needles of the tattooing machine also which i'll show you soon so the stromal micropuncture could be manual or motorized manual with 26 gauge needles or motorized with the tattooing gun so this is a very small video with the tattooing gun uh, this is a corneal opacity uh, the dye which I had shown you before uh, is placed and the tattooing gun is used to place uh, multiple micro punctures. It can be repeated till you get the desired color and a simple bandage contact lens is applied. Now for a lamellar uh, insertion, you can either dissect it manually or nowadays uh, femtosecond laser assisted uh, keratopigmentation has been described but i assume it should be very expensive this is a small video where the patient has a cataract in a nearly prethysical eye but uh, there was no intention to sorry since there was no intention to remove the cataract because it would have shrunken further a lamellar pocket is made and this, then this suit is inserted into the pocket the whole cornea is painted black this is a wonderful article from dr susan jacob where she has used uh, a uh, pigment to stain the uh, scar which uh, rises from uh, after removal of the dermoid and she has placed a lenticule re removed from the smile surgery these are the, uh, the, she has shown wonderful results with in uh, normal light the thing is not visible at all femtosecond laser i as i mentioned it should be very expensive i have no experience i'm not going to discuss about it what could be the possible complications if the cornea is thin and irregular you can perforate it uh, you can get infections and especially you can have non healing defects and you can have late fading of the dye with cosmetic effects and there could be others like what have been described from one from pgi where they have described non-infectious inflammation because of the uh, dye. Some have described, in, you can get an incomplete coverage, you can get conjunctival seepage. This is a toxic anterior shock syndrome-like picture from self-inflicted injury with a tattoo uh, pigment by a schizophrenic patient who used the tattoo gun in, in both the eyes and tried to inject, uh, the try to paint his own corneas. He developed this dissolved TAS or uret zavalia like picture. So to be on the safe uh, part, you should always assess the corneal thickness, use sterile and tested pigments, avoid colors, especially red, which are, got, which are zinc compounds. And healing is always delayed in non-functional eyes, so you should be careful about the healing aspects. There could be artistic refinements uh, where you can uh, put the uh, different color in the center and a different color on the sides. 
this is done by micronized metallic pigments can, uh, that's my phone i think you can just stop it yeah uh, you, you use different pigments for the cent, uh, for the center you use a jet black and for the side you use different combination of colors in indian eyes uh, it's not uh, usually required because the most eyes are either dark black uh, in the normal lighting conditions or uh, jet brown here we have used a differential pigmentation where we have uh, made a dense black uh, tattoo in the center and we have reduced the density of the uh, pigment on the sides to create a uh, pattern so you, you, you there's a bandage contact lens placed over it if it appears as if it's a cosmetic contact lens so this was that patient where uh, we had this uh, corneal opacity with spheroidal degeneration you can see except for that little pterygium which she still has uh, the the cosmetic results are pretty good and uh, I think it's uh, this corneal tattooing is a uh, marriage of art and science, and it should uh, help those uh, patients who are uh, socially not uh, happy with their appearance. Thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Prashant. It's really nice, and at the time we really like uh, it's a combination of art and science. Thank you, thank you. Now I request Dr. Srini. And, and to present his uh, presentation on Fragpoint lens induced glaucoma, Dr. Srini. Hello, Dr. Vinod, how are you? Doing fine. Good to see you all. <laughs> So we use the mouse. So after this is your presentation. Is after this ready. presentation. Hmm? Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Yeah. Just connect it again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Dr. Titial and uh, uh, number of the ma'am uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, see, of the different ways in which uh, lens can induce glaucoma, the most common uh, uh, types of lens induced glaucoma are uh, phacolytic and phacomorphic glaucoma. And my presentation, I'll be basically dealing with uh, these two conditions. And uh, uh, the challenge in managing th these cases is that uh, medical management almost never works in uh, the control of intraocular pressure and you have to you have do cataract surgery and there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges in uh, cataract surgery in these cases and uh, just see this case uh, it's, it's a uh, phacolytic uh, glaucoma you can see how much of uh, lens matter has actually leaked through the anterior capsule into the aqueous and uh, this uh, lens material and uh, uh, the in inflammation induced by it uh, causes uh, endothelial damage and uh, this is one challenge that uh, you have to take care of while managing these cases because the endothelial uh, status would be uh, very poor in uh, most of these cases and uh, uh, see this case after uh, uh, blue is there you, you do the wash of uh, blue you can see that uh, there is a very significant uh, zonal dialysis there uh, this is another challenge uh, Almost all the cases have uh, loose zonules and some have frank uh, subluxation that, like this. And uh, you might have to plan for a uh, primary uh, iris claw lens or uh, skill fixation in these cases. So you have to be prepared for that. And uh, obviously, in a phacomorphic glaucoma, the lens is fallen up, the AC is uh, shallow. Uh, so the problem with uh, crowded anterior chamber is there uh, during phacomulsification. And uh, the, the Anterior capsule is so tense that it has a tendency to run out to the periphery, and which is uh, what has happened here. Uh, you can either go for a brand little manoeuvre, uh, pulling it in this direction or a quick pull, but it's not really run off uh, to the zonule. So I decided to go from the, uh, the other direction and complete the rexus, uh, covering the uh, area where uh, it has actually run off to the 
uh, periphery. And once that is done, you can uh, safely do fake emulsification. So uh, what uh, should we do to avoid this uh, uh, Rex is running off to the periphery? Uh, see, you can uh, go for a, a small Rexes initially and uh, decompress uh, the back by washing off uh, the, the lens material. You tap on the nucleus also to uh, release a, whatever uh, loose lens material is uh, there uh, from behind and do a, a larger Rexes and then uh, do fake emulsification. So uh, that is, and uh, this is uh, uh, show it once again. You you do the rexis, a small rexis in the center. Make sure that uh, you keep pulling uh, the uh, rexis margin towards the center, uh, so that it doesn't run out to the periphery. And that's what's being done. And uh, uh, this this uh, every, all of us uh, of you would have uh, faced uh, this Argentina flag and on. See, it's it's open, quite a bit open. Uh, but if you do FACO through this, you'll find the nucleus in the vitreous because there is no rexis here. It's just uh, ripped off to the periphery. So do a rexis on either side. So you cut the uh, capsule either with the uh, micro scissors or vanna scissors and uh, do the rexis either with uh, ultrata forceps or micro uh, rexis uh, forceps like here. So this is va vanna uh, scissors being used. See, you do FACO emulsification like this never will the nucleus drop down. You have uh, such a, a rip off or a run off to the periphery in an immature cataract and do all these circuses and do fake emulsification. There is a chance uh, that it'll run out of the periphery. Somehow, uh, when there is an Argentinian fact sign and you do a procular excess, it'll never uh, run off to the periphery. And uh, uh, you continue the surgery. And uh, this is one more thing that I wanted to show. The axis of placement of the IOL, uh, the haptics, have to be in the direction opposite to where the rexus has run off. So I'll uh, uh, show that uh, in uh, one more video. So this is, uh, this is uh, another rexus running off uh, uh, to the periphery. Send it again to see really where uh, it has run off. Then uh, with the uh, uh, micro scissors and uh, micro rexus forceps, uh, extend uh, the rexus, make it uh, larger and uh, uh, continue uh, the surgery. And again, uh, to show the orientation of IOL placement, See, uh, the rexis is run off is in this direction and uh, the haptics are uh, placed in the opposite uh, axis. So, uh, so there is uh, one more way uh, to avoid the rexis runoff is by decompressing the back using a 26 d nail. So the trick here is to uh, not just poke it inside and aspirate. So you just poking it inside, you might get a, an Argentinian flag sign. You uh, keep aspirating that uh, so that there is some uh, negative pressure or suction at the tip of the 26 needle. With the suction, you go in and aspirate. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it'll, it'll decompress the uh, bag, and uh, then you can go for a smaller rexis initially. Once that rexis is done, if you want to decompress it again, uh, use a FACO probe. So once you're sure that it's uh, uh, totally de decompressed, go for uh, one more. Uh, uh, bigger rexes and uh, con uh, continue a fake emulsification. Or if, uh, again, this is another case in which uh, uh, the bag uh, uh, is being decompressed. And if you're sure that uh, enough of bag is uh, decompressed, you don't have to go for a uh, two-stage rexes. You can go for a single-stage rexes and uh, uh, safely do fake emulsification in this case. And uh, this is another fa fancy technique. I have uh, uh, just showing it for demonstration. I've tried it uh, because I've seen some people doing it. Go in with a, a, a FACO probe with uh, foot position three. Just give a burst on the uh, uh, capsule. It opens the capsule and uh, aspirates a bit. Uh, then uh, you decompress it and do uh, rexes in uh, uh, two stages and uh, continue. See, I'm, I'm not a good fan of that. It uh, looks fancy. I mean, you can easily decompress with a, a 26 needle. There's no, uh, uh, no reason why uh, you should go for uh, all this. And if the, if the rexis is small, uh, after a fake emulsification, you can uh, make it larger before IOL implantation. So uh, this is uh, another technique. This is another, another situation. You can see that uh, the uh, anterior capsule is somewhat fibrous. And during rexis, you can see almost uh, the 50 percent of the uh, the bag has become empty. So all the liquid material has come. So uh, the lens bag is so loose that uh, rexus is uh, difficult in this case. And you have a very small dense nucleus in the back. So because the posterior capsule is loose, I mean, during fake emulsification for this, you there is a possibility that you might uh, catch the posterior capsule. So to avoid that, you can uh, use an IOL scaffold. You put the IOL in the bag and do fake emulsification. It's not, not uh, that easy. 
because it'll keep on slipping. You have to use a lot of uh, dispersive OVD because I mean you're basically doing it in in, in the in the chamber. It just keeps on slipping. It's just a funny feeling, uh, and uh, you can't use a sharp a big chopper because it's in the uh, uh, in the in the AC. You can use a dialer even with the dialer. It's not easy. You ch chip off from the periphery, and once it is uh, small, then then it becomes easy. Like uh, uh, the IOL scaffold for a uh, PC rent, uh, it, it works uh, uh, well there. So uh, this also works uh, quite well. So uh, to conclude, uh, there will be inflammation uh, which has to, to be managed by uh, frequent topical uh, prednisolone acetate. You have to use uh, uh, topical uh, um, anti-glaucoma medications, oral uh, acetazolamide, IV mannitol have to be given. If it is a phacomorphic uh, case or if there is only dialysis, see, uh, for primary iris crawl lens, iris crawl lens always do a peripheral eye like to me you uh, do it through a, a scleral tunnel it is very difficult to do uh, iridotomy and uh, you might have uh, bleeding and all make the uh, iris scleral lens implantation uh, very messy so you do a yak pi if uh, the cornea is clear if, even in, in phacomorphic glaucoma it, it helps to uh, uh, to deepen the ac or i mean somehow it, it works well in my hands uh, no trap is required. Manual small incision cataract surgery works uh, as well as phacomalsification in these cases. Use Stripan Blue, use uh, Viscoat or any other. I mean, all the all the Indian uh, uh, dispersive uh, visco elastics are uh, really helpful in protecting the endothelium. Hydro procedures are not required because uh, and also you're not really sure if there is a, a, a posterior polar element uh, in that because it's a, a, a nucleus is dense. So uh, avoid hydro procedures. And uh, do a careful uh, slow motion FICO. You don't need uh, higher end FICO uh, machines. Uh, uh, I have a higher end mach uh, FICO machine and uh, two low end machines. I mean, it works uh, the same. You don't need a higher end FICO machine to manage uh, uh, these cases. But uh, uh, be uh, be slow because you you might uh, you might see a, a white uh, a cataract and uh, uh, when the when the lens matter goes, oh, you'll find a dense. Uh, uh, nucleus uh, behind it and postoperatively give uh, uh, frequent topical steroids and continue an anti medication till uh, uh, the stage if we, uh, you really know that uh, uh, they are not uh, required. And uh, uh, just to end, uh, see, this uh, this is uh, is not actually cataract. The cataract, uh, total cataract has been removed. This is uh, lens matter here. Uh, I, I'd shown this uh, video in the beginning. The lens matter has uh, uh, leaked into the anterior chamber. Here, the lens matter actually has actually gone into the vitreous. Uh, I, I, occasionally, I've actually done a, a, a posterior capsule rexus and uh, a, and release it. Just uh, make the rexus; it comes out. Or uh, occasionally, I've put an IOL and uh, make made a nickel in the posterior capsule. Or uh, like here, just put an IOL. Or, uh, after some time, uh, uh, it just it gets absorbed. So uh, plan properly. Uh, uh, plan for all, all the all the eventualities. Okay. Take care to protect the endothelium. Uh, make sure that uh, you have your plan in place for uh, zonal dialysis. You will get uh, excellent results with uh, uh, lens induced glaucoma. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srini. Our next speaker is Dr. Vinod Arora. He will be speaking on refractive surprise management following cataract surgery. Uh, good afternoon, sir. You may share your slides. Yeah, sure. Thank you, RPC, for allowing me to uh, inviting me to present my talks. Uh, basically, if we talk of cataract surgery, my slides visible? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. So basically, the cataract surgery has now become a refractive surgery. Patient wants the very best. Thanks to our enterprising surgeons, patient want to have six by six vision or even the N six the very next day. The question comes, are we ready for this challenge or this demand? So let us consider why we get surprises. The risk patient are small hyperopic eyes. If there's a large myopic eye, myopic eyes, which have big back and very steep or flat case, if there is shallow tear chamber depth, if there is a prior history of refractive surgery, like LASIK, which is coming in a big way, or keratoplasty, then vitectinized eyes, then corneal ectasia. If there's, we don't give sufficient time for contact lens, uh, we, we have to discontinue it for sufficient time to avoid the warpage. Then there are some causes of ametropia, like uh, data capture inaccuracy, preoperative uh, ocular surface diseases, dry eye diseases, anterior basement membrane, dystrophy may be there, IOL miscalculation may be there, residual refractive astigmatism may be there, and postoperative shift in the position of IOL because we don't know where the exact ELP would be. 
so what to do we think nothing can go wrong without all these equipments everything but things go wrong so we have to determine what went wrong whether the it was the right patient sometime in a queue there may be same sounding patients and patient may be have number change or something or whether it was the same eye patient may have cataract in both eyes and he put uh, drops in the other eye and we were confused and whether we have used the right iul sometime we have calculated for me technics and it was not a stock in our stock and our staff gives a whole lens then everything will go off so what to do if there is a capsule block that can cause a forward movement of the lens and there may be myopic shift that is very easily dealt with using a yaw capsulotomy we do the phonix on the tear capsule and it is get relieved pure mixed astigmatism which can be performed peripheral corneal relaxing is it i'll come to later that one so how to manage if we get a refractive surprise first is the prescription of spectacles if patient is happy with glasses don't do any heroic don't try to do anything contact lenses may be given if the patient is young but most of the elderly patient don't accept contact lenses then we can perform the corneal surgery lri or laser vision correction we may do iul exchange we may do the rotation of toric iuls and we can have piggy back implantation like iul or even icl also so incisional surgery is quite good very economical and it can be used for low myopia we we'll use leave with 3.5 mm zone optical zone in the rear it's not very precise and but it can reduce the myopia in a good number and there may be clear in few of the patients then lri is good for residual cylinders we have got calculators in fact if it's a pure hypermetropic it can really take care of the spherical pot also so there are calculators we can feed and we know, can know how much incision is required we can determine the arc and can do accordingly only thing we have to have a good uh, calibrated knife a diamond knife preferably with us then toric i will not go in detail because it's separate chapter itself but we have got a lot of things where we can see whether the rotation will help or not uh coming to the other things like implantable fake iuls we have icl or ipcl which are much cheaper then we got a wide range we can cover myopia we can cover hypermetropia we can cover astigmatism with these lenses the advantages are it retains the corneal aesthetic there is no regression it's not expensive in long term uh, we don't know how much how it will affect in the long term but it can be used safely we know the long term about in fake eye Uh, then coming to the indication of piggy back lenses it can be used in hypermetropia it's a better outcome than laser vision correction there will be less aberrations piggy back iul have shown to be more accurate than iul exchange and uh, insurance can cover it also in rk patients again it's a good choice then what are the complication with piggy back now we will perform the color album test which will give a real time analysis of it's a interlenticular membrane that may be pseudo exfoliation there may be pigment dispersion with their corneal endothelial cell disc, uh, cell disc composition but these were the earlier things with the newer style of piggy back lenses these things are of uh, we hardly see so this is a new lens that's called sulcoflex uh, it's an optical size it can be fixed into the sulcus and very easy it can be just slide over the lens we have multifocal and trifocal in this well we have the toric one also so we can practically cover most of the things with these lenses and the surgical procedure is very simple let's just like we have to insert a lens in the back everything is there it's very very safe because the lens is there we have to put on that on put a viscoelastic and it's like a routine surgery routine implantation <clears throat> the power calculation is very very easy myopic correction it may be have to the same power what we are getting on the spectacles so it's not dependent on the anything like k reading or x length or anything just we have to know the uh, spectacle power and accordingly we can just correct it for hypermetropia we just multiply with 1.5 it should be plus i was written my guess i'm sorry for that and uh, the technique i'll not go that's very very easy it's much easier than doing a cataract surgery or putting a, even iul implantation that's much easier only thing we have to slide it into the sulcus our, our primary lens has to be in the back that's important for that then we have the indian variant which is much cheaper the advantages are it's safe reversible less trauma than i will exchange and it's biocompatible it's a additive implant post operative fraction high predictability and is a simple calculation it's a reversible if anything goes wrong it hardly goes wrong but you can take it out also there is a specific indication also you can treat dysphotopsia by using these lenses also and if a patient is not using a mono uh, monocular uh, this mono uh, ocular lens you can just put a uh, multifocal lens over it that may be even plano also the negative side is 
non new concept there is a lack of peer review publications rotational stability is not very very high but it's good so to conclude i just missed because i think uh, some slides are missed there there may be laser vision correction which is very very important uh, so variety of options we have got iul exchange we can do laser vision correction that's very accurate laser vision correction can be done in most of the cases uh, we can correct myopia hypermetropia even astigmatism the only thing is the accessibility and there is a cost also involved for myopia i think laser vision correction is the best choice for hypermetropia piggy back or iul exchange is a better choice for astigmatism piggy back or laser vision correction or we can do L, uh, lri also these cases so just to conclude we got a lot of variety in our armamentarium and we can manage these patients as on today if we get a refractive subsides thank you thank you so much thank you very much dr vinod that was a excellent lecture and thank you so much for joining us in this rp central celebration event our next speaker is dr manisha acharya who will be speaking on therapeutic keratoplasty pearls and paradigms very good morning i'll share my screen here uh, at the outset i want to thank uh, 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 professor detail dr namrata sharma for giving me this opportunity to be part of this very um i would say uh, a very memorable event which is happening in rp center i hope to see you all today uh, is my slide visible and am i audible yes they are visible please go ahead thank you uh, so Could not a small piece of cornea be excised and refined the size of a small bristle or a large quill, and would it not heal with a transparent scar? These were the thoughts of late Erasmus Darwin, who was the grandfather of Sir Charles Darwin. So, so long time back, he thought, could it be possible? And we know that it has been possible. So, coming to therapeutic keratoplasties, which, as most of my teachers and I also now tell to my students, that it's one of the most difficult keratoplasties. It is mainly done to for restoration of structural integrity, that is, tectonic purpose, or to resolve an infectious or inflammatory keratitis, which is refractory to conventional medical treatment. Usually, it's an emergency procedure, and it's done on an inflamed eye. And we uh, here the primary aim. may not be visual rehabilitation but to take care of the eye pathology so tectonic pk is at times very difficult and generally and most of the time a general anesthesia is what is uh, i would say preferable to do for such cases resolving an infection and inflammatory keratitis to, uh, is also an important indication for therapeutic keratoplasties and if you do not have a perforated cornea it can, they can be managed well under local anesthesia so in infective keratitis the indication remains a progressive ulceration a non response to therapy and large areas of perforation we all know the covid pandemic has not shown what we were seeing earlier smaller ulcers but the patients were coming with us with these refractory sort of perforations happening and there was dearth of tissue at that time as well so doing keratoplasties was the only option there the other indications for therapeutic keratoplasty are non infectious which may result in progressive stromal melt or loss wherein we need to put in a therapeutic patch or chemical injuries neurotrophic injuries exposure keratitis xerophthalmia or some autoimmune dis diseases something like uh, rheumatoid arthritis leading to a corneal melt it's not just about surgery what's important the major pearls are also pre op evaluation and the post op management of these patients the vision status slit lamp examination a b scan whenever possible it has to be done and should be made mandatory microbiology remains the di uh, remains the uh, big backbone for these therapeutic cases one of the important aspect for these patients is counseling what antimicrobial therapy the patient is on iv mannitol is mandatory for these patients we should try to give them in most of them because we know most of it is something sort of coming up the other i would say important pearl remains that a good facial block sometimes helps and if, if it is augmented with peribulbar we can take care of most of these cases in general anesthesia definitely preferable for large perforations the debate always happens should now we consider a, a therapeutic tissue for a therapeutic keratoplasty obviously we all would say an optical tissue would be our preference uh, 
because healthy epithelium minimizes the risk of reinfection. A clear tissue, with a clear tissue, we can monitor what is happening in the anterior chamber and a healthy endothelium gives it a better chance for the graft survival in the primary uh, uh, keratoplasty itself. While operating, we need to make sure that we have a screw speculum. To we should never use the other speculum that sometimes creates a positive pressure. Flaringer's ring is a must and trephines should be ready. Vitrectomy machines switched on, that's the basic thing important. And the sutures, both 10O and 9O should be ready uh, uh, at the time where you started your case. So trephination should be large enough to include one mm of the surrounding normal cornea. And removal of iris membranes, the necrotic iris has to be done whenever we are doing such a case. And preferably two surgical PIs should be done because when you're doing infective cases, chances of inflammation is high and one may get blocked. Preserve lens in infective cases whenever it is possible because it, it is an effective barrier for endophthalmitis and prevents expulsion. Preparation of donor tissue is important and preferably if it is beyond a nine millimeter trephine, I would suggest that we have now come to a consensus that more, that at least a one millimeter difference between a donor and a uh, uh, host, uh, the definition size should be there. Microbiology remains the backbone for most of these patients and these tissues have to go one half for histopathology and the other half as a sterile vial for microbiology evaluation. Interrupted sutures are the uh, sutures of choice for therapeutic keratoplasty. And uh, most of the time, if it's a larger uh, graph, 24 sutures or beyond that are needed. And AC should be formed by BSS at the end, an intracameral antibiotic or antifungal, depending on what pre-op microbiology is showing, should be done. And tarsorephy should always be done whenever you are uh, expecting a poor ocular surface post-op. Definitely there are challenges post that. The first important challenge is the frequent follow-up you need to see these patients. We have to maintain graft clarity and also fight infections. Sometimes they may come up, they may take up well initially, then come up with a sutured infiltrate. If you look at this large perforation which was there, if you take up a good quality graft, the primary graft has good chances of survival. She was a 30-year-old female who presented in the clinic with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the diminution of vision and pain since a month and being on treatment. A B scan was done. The limbus was spared in that case, as you see. And a systemic examination a little bit on the blood sugars and uh, liver function test for that. We knew we were dealing with a fungal uh, element. We did a keratoplasty beyond the level of the infection which was there, and it did well. Postoperatively, the button did show uh, fungus as pergolas here, and also the histopathology report did correlate with what we had thought before. So eradication of infection is the absence of recurrent infiltrate on the cornea sclera, recurrent hypopion, or any posterior segment vitritis. This is an important, uh, I would say, the patient from Madhya Pradesh, a 48-year-old, presented with a 1.5-month history, consulted various doctors in those one and a half uh, months, no relief, and advised corneal transplant there itself. He traveled to Delhi, which is more than a 14 hours journey. I would say he presented to us on 19th April, the day that Sitting in the, uh, on cocktail therapy, the patient was on, and sitting in the OPD, we knew that we were dealing with a patient of keratitis with a normal B scan and not showing any uh, the, uh, the organism right now. In the OPD, we came to know that it's, a, it's going to be a lockdown from the next day. So there were a lot of questions in our mind. An outstation patient staying in a hotel in Delhi in Pahar Ganj, what to do? We will not be able to follow up this patient. How will we monitor the recurrence? But sometimes you have to think and a little more bravely than you would in normal circumstances. So we planned therapeutic keratoplasty, which was done the same day. And we taught the patient how to take good pictures. We sent him videos how to take good pictures. And one of my fellows was daily in contact with the patient. So we did whatever background we had to do in the hospital. And the patient was sent back the next day because there was no place to stay. So this has been the pictures which have been sent by the patient from a normal mobile phone. And uh, we thought uh, making a fortified was a problem. So we gave 1.5 levoproxacin, which was not available in the vocal. So we arranged for online delivery and, uh, and the patient did well. And at day 40, also tele teleconsultation, he was doing well. And now he came to me sometimes back with the 612 six, uh, vision and was quite happy with the if, thing which we had thought. 
So teleconsultation for follow-up will have to be done with this COVID pandemic being uh, going on because we know we have to, but there are some limitations because IOP is something which cannot be monitored and there are nuances which will be lost. I would just, in the interest of time, just uh, show a little, uh, this was a post TABCL patient and a, just a small snippet of the smaller uh, pearls, which I was just saying, we have to first size out what, how much the infiltrate is and, uh, and then, I'm so uh, sorry to interrupt you, ma'am, but the time was up. Could you please summarize? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just, it's, it's I already can. done. I was just about to. So to uh, summarize, I would say that therapeutic keratoplasty definitely is more uh, challenging than most of the uh, other keratoplasties. And uh, uh, follow-up is very, very important. And RSVP is something which we have to tell all the patients and put them on the discharge card that whenever they are having redness, sensitivity to light, vision deterioration and pain, they must uh, come back to any, to, they must go to any ophthalmologist local and then may con contact you as and when uh, needed. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And uh, I would uh, like to thank RP Center for giving me this opportunity to present today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manisha, for a wonderful lecture. I would call upon our next speaker, Dr. Srinivas Joshi. So have you joined? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we'll be speaking on multifocal IOLs with retinal problems handling the double X ward. So we can see your slide. I think you, you are muted, Dr. Srinivas. Just unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, respected uh, chairpersons and uh, uh, the conveners, and uh, my regards and thanks to uh, Titiyal, sir, and Amrita, madam, and the entire RPC staff, and congratulations on their 55th year of uh, uh, anniversary celebrations. So I'll be quickly speaking on the multifocal IOL and the, the retinal problem. And if you see the, the multifocal IOLs, they are usually discouraged uh, in patients who are at the risk of the retinal diseases whether it's adaptic retinopathy or macular degeneration, and they are believed to reduce the contrast sensitivity. Now, let us look at this. This is the use of dark adaptation to screen before the multifocal IOL implantation. So this is one which was approved uh, by the ASCRS uh, in 2014, where they uh, use that uh, uh, no, uh, to assess the macular function in the multifocal IOL candidates and the ADAPS uh, DX can detect subclinical AMD. So before the AMD usually happens. So the subclinical AMD at least three years earlier than it is clinically evident. And uh, the next one is if we can look into the OCT, that is the cost effectiveness of the pre-op OCT in cataract evaluation and the multifocal IOL lenses. Yes, definitely a pre-operative OCT screening during the evaluation of patient considering added to the cost of cataract surgery, no doubt on that. But the OCT increased the detection of the macular pathologies and definitely the qualities over the time was definitely better when you have done a pre-op OCT, uh, uh, irrespective of whether the patient is having any retinal pathology or not, to detect something which was not seen clinically. Now, let us look into the 61-year-old software engineer, bilateral drusenide PED and right eye multifocal. Now, what to do the next? How to choose and what to choose for the other eye? So these are plethora of lenses available now. And look at this, the stage of the disease must be considered in choosing the best lens. Say, for example, if the patients without clinical evidence of macular disease, they are, say basically they are normal patients and hence these are the candidates for the multifocal IOL technology. But patients with early maculopathy, whether they are having soft drusen or pigmentary changes in the macula, they are kind of difficult counseling, but definitely not a the absolute contraindication, but a relative contraindication because of the loss of contrast sensitivity and lower spatial frequencies, even in the mild forms of AMD. Now, patients with moderate to severe AMD with the presence of uh, geographical atrophy or exudative changes, definitely these are the patients who are only fit for the monofocal IOLs and definitely multifocal IOL on them would have a deleterious effects on the visual acuity. So we all know that Pros are definitely reduce the lifetime of cost of glasses, more freedom, but however, reduce contrast sensitivity, the night vision like halos, glare, starbursts are still the problems. So these are the views you know, of uh, uh, different authors who say that sometimes the patient even went for depression, you know, as something not uncommon among the patients of AMD. This is what described by few of the uh, authors from the West. 
And if you look into what's the lifespan expectancy of the pay, uh, people in India, say you take around 70 years, average around 70 years, which was done in 2017. Even if you take the Canada and the United States, they are around 75 to 77. Now, why I'm saying this, let's look into the demographics of the wet AMD. So if you see here, 60 to 60 is just 0.4% where India, Indian population falls, or even if you take 2.2% at the age of 80 years, it's only after age of 80 years that it uh, uh, higher range is up to 8.2%. Similarly, in geographical <coughs> atrophy as well, even at the age of 80, it is just up to 2%. And more than 80, it is 6.9%. So why not try to prevent 92% of the patients from putting multifocal IL at the age of 50 or 60? This is, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be thought about it. So these are other various other pictures which have shown that the combined phacovitrectin membrane peeling with MFIL implantation with idiopathic IRM, and they say that multifocality was achieved, uh, uh, visual uh, was, was delayed due to the PCO and the macular healing. Now, scenario two, if there is a wet AMD, definitely there is a plethora of the anti which is still available in the market. And the most important, I would like to say, is the home-based OCT. I think Novartis is already coming up with that. So what is this home-based OCT? The AI-based nodal OCT analyzer successfully tracks the executive AMD changes uh, detecting uh, activity along the longitudinal debt. So this was uh, also uh, very well said by Usha Chakravarti, which said that the performance of the image, that is automated fluid detection, localization and quantification, it just takes around 10 OCT scans per day. And if there is any uh, anything uh, uh, suspicious, it pings the doctor, you can always meet him. So these are the kinds of uh, um, um, artificial intelligence technology with which we are going to have it in future. Now, the last thing, scenario three is, needing surgical attention, if there is a bleed, then definitely you need to know uh, what's the differences between the biome and the contact lens. So let's look into some of the pictures, some of the papers which say that diffractive multifocal IOL interferes with so uh, intraoperative view. So they have described that there is some crystal-like appearance when you are peeling the ILM peeling, the shadow, the wedge-shaped kind of artifacts which you see. And they, uh, they have also shown that, you know, wave-shaped archers, and all these things, they, they say that the diffractive multifocal IOLs definitely interferes with that. But yes, it is only with the contact-based lenses. Now, if you see these uh, pictures, they say that initial view through a multifocal IOL, and you see this after putting up helon on the anterior or coating with the posterior coat of these, I think you can come out of these what kind of you know artificial artifacts which we are going to get because of these uh, uh, multifocal IOLs. So uh, this is our surgery when we do it through biome and definitely with the 3D technology which we have with the Zeiss or the Ingenuity from the Alcon. I just want to show the snippet. It's just a few seconds. Where this is a, a diffractive multifocal IOL where I'm trying to do a vitrectomy. I initially uh, did a PC capsule capsulectomy. And if you see, definitely there is no interference at all. You can see this the very bad PVR or even on the disc, I tried to remove the membranes. There was a, a subretinal gliotic membrane here, which we can I, I could easily peel and, and the, definitely the surgery went well. So with the advent of these kind of biomes, I think definitely we are having an added advantage. And even in multifocal IOLs as well, we can do uh, even the best of the surgeries. So this is my last slide. Say that multifocal intraocular implantation and retinal disease with my good senior colleague, that's Andrew Gribrovsky, who published in Graf's Journal of Ophthalmology in recently in 2020. He said that we were unable to find evidence suggesting that patients with macular disease should be advised against MFIOLs. Several contraindications with the, in the patients with retinal disease have a hypothetical character and are not evidence-based. So he also said that, that definitely more research is uh, needed to especially address this effect. So lastly, I would like to say, uh, choose between clarity and convenience for the patient for the risk of just around 2 to 18 percent. So we do we want to devoid those patients of putting a multifocal IOL where they can enjoy right from the age of 50, 60, up to 20 years at least they can enjoy. From the surgeon point of view, yes, definitely contact lens definitely is a uh, tough thing. But, but as I said, if you coat it with the helon, then even with the contact lens also you will not have. But the biome with a wide angle viewing system, I don't think we are having any problem uh, doing the surgeries or even the lasers in these kind of patients. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for the wonderful talk. 
Uh, now next I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Parikshit Gopte sir, who would be speaking on residency training in India, how it compares with developed and developing countries. Uh, thank you for your kind uh, invitation, uh, Professor Vashish, Professor Dada, uh, Professor Swati Fuzare Devang Angro. I would like to thank Professor Tetial and uh, Professor Namrata ma'am for the kind invite. This is something that uh, we have done a long time ago, a study called Les Reads. Can you see my screen, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes. It's all visible, sir. Okay, so this is just comparing residency training in India and in the neighboring countries and across the world. Well, in many ways, residency training in India has been like the Gurukul system. The student first follows, observes, works and learns from a teacher in the next two to three years that they are with the teacher. But today, teachers have become facilitators of knowledge and not just knowledge, also of wisdom. And this is something that is seen even in countries around India. So the REIT study was uh, commissioned by the AIOS in 2014 to get feedback from young ophthalmologists how their residency training was. So those who entered the residency system between 2001 to 2012. And this was to help AIOS frame guidelines for residency training. And we know that India of today is very, very different from what it was 40 years ago. It's not just that the population has increased, but the entire disease scenario has also greatly changed. So we have respondents from 28 states and union territories. And what we saw is first is ophthalmology is still a top career of choice for a about one third of the residents. But the number of second generation doctors or those who are from a family of ophthalmologists had increased. If you look at the rating of clinical skills that have been taught, almost every clinical skill was taught well or better as than what it was 20 years ago, except perhaps refraction, where those who were trained in the 20th century said they were taught refraction in much greater details. Now this is perhaps thanks to our optometry friends and autorefractometers, which are ubiquitous in our OPD. Also, when we look at skills for glaucoma diagnosis and management in our residency training, in clinical skills, it's an improvement all over, except perhaps trabeculectomy, which was a surgery that was done very commonly or taught commonly in the last century, but is not done anymore. For retina-related skills, as we had all the speakers from Dr. Srinivas, uh, Dr. Arora, all of them, yes, there is so much of high-tech retina that has come, that retina-related skills have become better. But then for India's 400 million children, the pediatric ophthalmology-related skills are still not that much emphasized in Indian residency training programs. When we look at surgeries performed independently during the residency, we can see that the median for FACO is still one. It was zero last time. The manual small incision cataract surgery is still the backbone of our training system. And mercifully, ICC is gone and ECC also is on the way. For taught academic programs, yes, the infrastructure for dissertation is much, much better. The academic schedules are much, much better. Then we also did from the AIOS, this from the teacher's viewpoint. And teachers said that communication skills financial literacy, balancing work life also must be taught. But then teachers still don't agree as to how many FACOs and SICS should be done independently by the residents. And while cornea, glaucoma and retina related skills are adequately taught, what about pediatric? And they said that perhaps for refractive and oculoplasty, the residents can wait for their fellowship. If we compare this in Europe, Ophthalmology is taught in their respective languages. Their FACO is the norm. ECC is done only in a special setting. In Germany, in fact, there is a medical and surgical ophthalmology. All ophthalmologists don't become surgeons. Just about one third or one fourth of them actually go to do surgery. The rest of them just do medical ophthalmology. There are no optometrists in the German speaking countries. In Africa, where I was lucky to have gone and taught in more than 10 African countries as a faculty of the African Vision Research Institute, 
It's mostly a four-year residency program with hands-on training in the last two years in Ethiopia or Zambia, but again, very less surgeries. South Africa was very phaco-centric, while in the West African College of Ophthalmologists, which is Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa, there is a structured program, but in many of them, just ECC is taught. Even in Egypt, which is relatively very well off, is, I mean, quite in sync with the European ophthalmology. Residency is only in the last, of the surgeries given only in the last two years. In the Middle Eastern countries, the Gulf states, because they're very, very rich, they all depend upon expats and they just, you know, uh, import ophthalmologists. But in Saudi Arabia, there is a large population of indigenous and local trainees where there is also an emphasis on corneal and and retinal problems. In Syria, again, where I was there, it's a four-year program, but again, very less hands-on training. And many of them then prefer to go to the richer Gulf countries. In Southeast Asia, we know Singapore has one of the best structured training programs, which is mostly FACO as it is in Malaysia. But in Indonesia, again, the program is very cataract-centric, less hands-on work. And here, geography is a challenge because there are 26,000 islands. They want to teach SICS and FACO, but well, there is still a lot more that needs to be done. Similarly, in Cambodia. In Latin America, the three countries where I visited and attended surgeries, uh, delivered lectures, everywhere, FACO is still the norm. And manual small incision cataract surgery is taught in very, very few programs even though they have a large population of very mature and dense cataract, where doing FACO is difficult. And then uh, trainees end up doing ECC. The United States, of course, has one of the best structured residency programs and fellowship programs. Officially, a resident in the United States is supposed to do 84 cataract surgeries before they finish their residencies. And they have numbers for YAG lasers, for YAG caps, for doing B scans, for doing OCTs. But it's not just the US, even the Asia Pacific region also has a fairly structured program. Japan, Korea, Taiwan in their own language. In Mongolia, we were surprised to find that the teaching is in Mongolian and Russian. Only in Hong Kong is it in English. But the program that I think we in India can easily follow and help emulate is the United Kingdom's higher specialty I training program. Summarize. I'll just take a minute, ma'am, which is taken from RANSCO and which is there in the Canadian ophthalmology societies. So in Indian ophthalmology, our main weakness is that there is a geographic imbalance. Non-cataract surgery is not adequately taught and journal clubs and wet labs are underutilized. So we have the islands of excellence like the RP Center and of course all the institutes in the South. But then if we look at our average programs, all our government medical colleges, then still a lot needs to be done. And this lack of standardization has to be done away with because there is a huge variation and this is where, of course, the Medical Council of India or its new avatar, the National Medical Council, can take and where AIOS and RP Center can also take the lead so that we have a better residency training, not just in the best institutes, but all over. Because residency training is the bedrock on the foundation of an ophthalmic career. And unless we have that, then, well, still a lot needs to be done before we can say that Indian ophthalmology is truly an international ophthalmology. Thank you. Thank you for your invite. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk and uh, showing us the global uh, residency uh, program and also giving us an overview of the lacunae that we have. Now with this, I would like to call upon Dr. Deepak Mishra, who would be speaking on how to keep the motivation going during residency. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Steady Alsar and the whole team of RPC for giving me this opportunity. This is something 
another talk on the residency, not on the true ophthalmology or the clinical ophthalmology, how to keep the motivation going on. So there is nothing new in this picture. When all of us see, seen it many times from many books to current status, but what is behind this film or this picture is that from couching to recent smile and toric and different kinds of surgeries we are doing nowadays. How it is possible? It is not possible without the motivation of our great, great ancestors and previous scientists who have worked a lot and develop and given us the current generation so much flexibility that from we reached from couch, couching to these surgeries. Similarly, I'm going to give four, seven, eight few tips how to keep motivation motivated. First of tip is that for any resident, avoid distraction and be a positive state. Always you have seen what you have seen, it is not, I'm, yeah, it's moving. It's seeing is not same as of doing. If we have seen that anyone is doing something, first of all, see what he or she is doing. Don't rush for the things which is not available at your place or institute or anywhere that we are moving something and not seeing what the precautions they are having or by what means they are able to do it. So best thing is learn or master the things available at your place and be positive. Every problem have a solution. If anything is not available, then you can go for the e-learning. And nowadays due to the, after the COVID crisis, we learn a lot about the online teaching methods too. Second is manage your stress level. It is something that it you face in your residency program daily. There will be some problem, some complication, late coming, everything will be coming up and down either uh, by our own mistake or sometimes uninvited. Then be relaxed because residency is not a one uh, month or two month job. It is a three year whole duration is there. So one day you may be not up to the mark, but next day you will be as good as possible. Third thing is don't question your abilities. There are many types of ability. It is not never think that this is not my cup of tea. I am unable to do such uh, surgeries or anything. Maybe there are different methods. Someone have adopt different methods than you and you have some different methods. So have a patience and do and believe me that each and everyone can do but everyone have some different ability to do that another is visualize yourself from the starting it is just shown in the picture it is not possible that this bird has gained such a coordination and activity on the day one so even seeing what your seniors are doing what your consultants mentors are doing and asking them you can have lot of things you can learn by yourself. Evaluate yourself bit in between the time and learning like that in the first year I am unable to make even the side port now in second year if Rexis is not possible then at least I have achieved something in making side ports. Again fifth tips is always whatever you learn try to teach us if we see this learning pyramid then the maximum retention is that when we discuss or teach with each other after explaining what the problem you are facing or what you are seeing with each other, there will be always a win-win situation. When we ex try to explain yourself that I have did something wrong with uh, my clinics or OT anywhere and you ask with your seniors or mentors, then there will be a good thing to share each other. One thing again, very much important is you have to follow and know all the guidelines regarding to your course, when your thesis will be submitted, what is the region or timing given for your enrollment. Sometimes there will be a panic situation that uh, the, the resident doesn't know this time frame, and at the last they will be at trouble that I am not able to know or I didn't complete it on the time. So have and go through the, all the rules and regulations by which your course is governed. Seven thing is, always it's try to develop a bonding and sharing with your peers because these your colleagues and mentors will always have carry some little things from you whatever the things whatever we learn we always remember that who had told 
teachers how to give first block who is the teacher whom we have interacted in conferences or our colleague who can save us in during my mistake so even sharing the things with each other it will give you a great confidence in your future life and remember that residency is not only for teaching training and everything whatever the hobbies you have at least give some time for that too save some time if not daily at least weekly and whatever the hobbies you have carry on for making it so that you can make and be happy and manage your stress level try to understand that not only academics things beyond academics relieves your academic uh, tension much faster than the some success in the academics and my take home message is just you have seen these birds these birds comes to varanasi from the siberian region lot of the, the journey they cross but you have only just keep your eyes open and keep moving on your feet one day you will see and you will have reach whatever the things possible and given to your course with this i would congratulate all the rpc team for their 55th foundation day thank you sir Thank you, Dr. Deepak. And uh, just a quick points regarding this yes. presentation. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is just a discussion panel thing. So uh, now it is now we use sort a lot of animation and virtual learning. So in AIMS yes. in anatomy department, we go to the forensic medicine department. So they have started using this kind of virtual learning and animation. So would it be better if in you know, ophthalmology science also some kind of virtual learning and some kind of animation? Because the area stuff is so small, and there will be, uh, you know, what do you? I mean, can you give some light on that? If there's animation and some kind of virtual learning, because in AIMS, other department they have started using, especially in anatomy and the forensic medicine department, so they have used all kind of virtual things. Sir, uh, the new curriculum developed by the NMC National Medical Com Commission already divided and framed the PG and residency program, even the UG program in such a way. that they have different doves methods direct learning the small group teaching and now there is books are many books are coming in which the things are written in a animated or some figure formats just for that i think this is the time for the future that we will see some more things uh, on this virtual platform and yeah. other thing thank you, thank you, thank you sir Deepak. thank you and with this i would like to say to our residents that uh, be a lifelong learner because learning is the key to success and with this i would like to call upon professor kirti singh for her for the next talk uh, topic on color blindness thank you it's always a pleasure to come back to happy center and meet friends and i'm talking about something which has been my passion now for the last 4 5 years and because i am in the medical board of color vision and generally medical board for all the judges the doctors and when it comes to doctors and the gazette of india the guidelines are different from india vis-a-vis -vis rest of the world i don't understand why is it so because the rest of the world is not legally oriented which we seem to be more most western countries doctors with congenital color vision deficiency it's not called as blindness anymore because that's a negative connotation it's cvccvd are not debarred from training in specialty of their choice this gentleman who started the ball rolling way back 20 30 years ago dr anthony spalding was a dutton and he confessed to all this after he retired and he said i never really realized what all i'm facing and this was a dutton not an anomaly who had a problem however when it comes to india we all know the scenario this is from my college mulana that medical college where in the ug first year you all would have gone through this in the current commitment department psm department not times you get this issue or a testing done and you are asked to trace it out and in some register that register it is labeled whether you are color deficient or not and then it's forgotten that register is kept and forgotten but when you come when you clear the neat exam when you come to us after testing your color vision it shows that you have color vision defect this sadly implies that you won't be able to pursue post graduation or government jobs in india according to the gazette of india what i wanted to become a surgeon and nobody told this to me while i was doing my mbbs now i how am i going to fulfill my dreams this is the gazette of india 
mind you, till today. I leave you with questions. Is it ethical? Is it moral? And above all, is it rational? In the absence of evidence-based guidelines, learners with CCDVD are arbitrarily debarred from specializing in some disciplines. And this came out in the disability rights issue in the December 2020. And this is the actual uh, Gazette of India notifications for doctors. Higher grade of color perception, lower grade, and that's, mind you, by Eldridge Green Lantern. India has a dubious distinction of making their students unfit. Okay. Now, Supreme Court has endorsed a lot of petitions by doctors and said that they should not be debarred. However, health is a state subject, and no state has yet endorsed the Supreme Court judgment. This leads to despair and frustration of students and doctors. And we also understand as, as physicians, as ophthalmologists, that the color vision test by Ishihara, Shinobu Ishihara test, does not accurately predict real life performance. So with that in mind, we devised a CAT test or a color album to revise, devise a more realistic clinically applicable test to identify errors while performing clinical pre and paraclinical tasks, evolving color identification, generate a color album with specialty specific signs and test and clarify relevance of Ishihara for grading. This is a cross-sectional study of students of Mulan Azad, where a picture album detailing to each specialty taught during medical training was generated by our specialty experts. More than three errors were taken as CVD as per Ishihara. And then F funds were D15 test was done to categorize the type. And this accuracy or the total error score of for each task was done on the color album for these color vision individuals vis-a-vis -vis color normal hierarchies. Only 31 of the 42 students consented because they were scared of being identified and blacklisted. Prevalence in our student population was 2.8% and 4.8% on the male population, which was less than the 8% of country population or country prevalence. Dutinamily was the commonest, followed by anopia or dutinopia, and protonopia, thankfully, was the least. This is the color album, a snapshot of the different tests which we had done. And we had taken pictures of actual patients or the investigations. And this called color album or the CAT correlated very well with Ishihara and with D15. And the students always all said that they had a more realistic representation of the CAT with the Ishihara or D15. Anybody didn't understand too much of D15, but Ishihara they were more comfortable with. And the protons had more errors vis-a-vis -vis dutans, which is mind you the commoner one. Maximal errors were in shades of red seen during hematology, zeal Nielsen staining, diagnosing melina, and skin signs of lymphangitis, tenia or milia. Red-blue differentiation for skin signs of bruise in, in forensic, peripheral cyanosis, and green differentiation in hemolysis identification. Minimal errors to our surprise, there were minimal errors in integrating mucus signs, mainly conjunctival pallor, Shadwick sign, pharyngitis, and otitis media. I think it was because differentiation of red and blue was required in this, and that's very well visible to these children. Stereoscopic clues, wherever visible, really reduced the errors and that we could identify. This is how the color album was done, and that's the resident who is doing the color album test with them. Uh, we also had a questionnaire we designed ourselves for the self-perceptions. After the questionnaire, they found that 90% of the students coming to our college were unaware of the CCVD prior to the medical college screening. This was the situation by United States in uh, UK also. And it's important that screening has to be there because doctors who are aware of the limitations are more likely to make corrections. And the screening should be there at school time. Positive family history was only there in one fourth. 52 of our children had driving license. Only 38% of these were actually subjected to a color vision test. So the government of India feels it's okay for these children to drive, but doesn't feel it's okay for them to become PG students. 19% had difficulties during school with chemistry being identified as the major problematic subject. 13% said they would not reveal their color vision defect to anybody for fear of stigma. Screening was desired by all. 32% said prior to medical entrance would be better. And 23% said it's okay at the time of joining college. Counseling was desired by all. And they all said that stat test was more realistic and relevant. So yes, students do face difficulties, especially dermatology, pathology, hematology, microbiology, and biochemistry. The clinical subjects of pediatrics, medicine, ophthalmology, since they have other clues, stereoscopic clues and the historical clues and the clinical clues, the specific training can be done. And that's what has been done in Cambridge. 
So CBT screening is must because informed career choices are there. Otherwise, the student feels doubts his learning capacity. Since it is not a contradiction currently for joining a medical college, it is now unethical to debar them from pursuing higher education or becoming a faculty in the same profession. So the way forward is use CAT or something like that, do counseling, teach them about safe clinical practice, which anyway they have adapted naturally, right? Contrast, border, surface, stereopsis. Last two slides. Uh, since none of the doctors anywhere are given any advice, I'm sure none of us, if any of us was colorblind, we would have really hidden it in the textbook inside and not told anybody. Very often I find that in the older times. Now you can't do that. It's linked with your pictures. So colors surround us. Colors dictate our decisions, sometimes conditioned decisions. However, for doctors, these conditioned decisions are not really based only on color clues. It is unethical because altered color perception has been there since birth. They have adaptive cues. It is unethical and we should all join in this color crusade. Please, whoever feels, because I'm sure in your family, in your friend circle, and in brilliant doctors, I know at least five ophthalmologists right now who are color deficient and who are brilliant surgeons. So let us join this color crusade because it is totally unethical to bar these children. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Please, yeah. if I may. Yes, now, actually, here also same, there's the same problem when the people are coming for counseling. The job from the job. The PG is prepared the bipolar pathology and the next country. What is right? As per Gazette of India, Dr. Sir, what we write is we take the you know the middle path. We'll say, let's say I'm sending it to ophthalmology. I write if Dr. Tanoj and their team has no problems because by the time they come to us for medical already, they've already done. So we just give them a leeway because we can't otherwise legally write that if they're color vision deficient, you have to write. So if it is less than six errors, it's at mild, more than six errors, it's more, it's severe. And again, this as per guess, it is an Edridge Green Lantern. Most of these hospitals don't have Edridge Green Lanterns. We are still doing Ishihara. So what we write is that if the department feels it's okay, they can pursue it. However, that is okay for PG level. I was told by Dr. Nardo Radhika and Anamrita that we don't want anyone to do That's okay. But once they go out from the umbrella of the institutes, when they go out in the big bad world, there, there are all types of touts waiting for them. There are all types of uh, issues for any government job, for any, again, I'm using strong words, for any government job, you are unfit. But if you're practicing, you're fine. Okay, then it is not a debar. When you get the DMC license, do they ask you whether you're color vision deficient? They don't. But if you apply for a CDMO job or a specialist job, they ask you. So there are some, you know, murky areas here. Yes, and I don't think it's the fault of anybody. It's just that British Raj said nobody has really bothered to change the archaic rules, which we need to. Britishers themselves have changed it. The only country in the world is Taiwan, which is trying to change it, and India, which is not doing anything much about it. The last country to change it was Japan. Again, an ophthalmologist took up the struggle. For 20 years, she fought. I don't want to fight for 20 years. I hope I only fight for five years before the, everybody sees the rationality because I'm not saying anything irrational. And again, I'm repeating all of us in our own homes, in the quietness of not homes, I'll say in our institution, we would know many doctors who are color deficient and who are, have no problems. Thank and remember, it's not a disability. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. With this, I would like to call upon our next speaker, Dr. Sabya Sachi Sen Gupta, who will be speaking on applying health economics in retinal factors. Thank you so much. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to congratulate everyone at RPC for the you know for the occasion today, and uh, thank you so much to TTL sir and Namrata madam for this opportunity. So, you know, I thought we'll discuss a little bit about applying health economics in retinal practice because this is coming in more and more, you know, as insurance starts playing a more hefty role in, uh, you know, in a lot of our treatment protocols. I have no financial disclosures in any of these uh, that we're going to talk today. And uh, so I'm a practicing vitro retinal surgeon in Mumbai. 
So, you know, I think the real question here is, is it worth spending so much, uh, you know, this is a question which is being asked by all concerned, including government organizations, physicians, uh, taxpayers, and most importantly, our patients, is it really spending, uh, you know, I'm spending so much on this particular treatment, is it, is it worth it? So, uh, you know, one thing that before we start, we should remember is that the earlier the impairment in age, the earlier the impairment, the greater the economic burden of disease on society. And uh, so generally, you know, what we talk about is value-based medicine now. And so it really is based on you know, cost considerations of medical interventions. And really the two main aspects are the human or the patient value and of course the actual financial value. So, you know, due, due to disease, debilitating the nature of vision loss, indirect costs, including productivity loss and long-term care often exceed direct costs. So the direct costs, as we all know, are you know, inpatient hospital care, physician costs, emergency room costs, um, you know, medications, surgical costs, etc. The indirect, you know, the direct non-medical costs are housekeeping if they need uh, admissions, you know, care provided by, by relatives, uh, you know, home remodeling sometimes, uh, lost opportunity costs uh, and all of these. And then there are some indirect costs such as productivity loss, which is something that, you know, I think most physicians don't consider when we are treating these patients, uh, you know, time, time loss while seeking medical services in travel and lost opportunities in the future, disfigurement, disability, etc. And also let's remember that, you know, this vision impairment also leads to effect, it affects mental well-being, reduces mobility, increases likelihood of, you know, uh, traffic accidents, crashes, uh, falls, uh, social isolation often happens. Uh, there are reduced educational activity, uh, opportunities, reduced employment, uh, you know, gender inequity is exacerbated, also leads to, you know, depression, uh, increased, uh, you know, problem for caregivers, uh, and sometimes these are risk factors for mortality as well. So the real question, uh, sort of, uh, you know, from a clinic point of view, if your patient is sitting in front of you, is if, if this is a 52-year-old diabetic patient with PDR. So he, he is in the most productive phase of his life. Monetarily, he's late repaying his loans. He's still under a, some EMI pressure. He has children to educate, married, uh, you know, get them married, settlement costs for them. He's the sole earning member of the family. You know, what if he loses vision, isn't it? So there's a very high likelihood that that would happen because he's already progressed to PDR at age 52. And then I'm sure most of us, uh, you know, sort of identify with this uh, with this uh, situation. So what would you allow the government of India to spend so that he does not go blind? You know, what would the patient be willing to pay to retain six by six in both eyes for the rest of his life? So can you really put a price to his vision? So that is the real uh, question. And, you know, we'll try and answer it with some uh, specific metrics which are established. So overall, you know, in real life challenges uh, lie in trade-off between overconsumption of care and too little care. It is important to make most of the finite resources we have. And it is not enough that an intervention is clinically effective. It needs to be cost effective as well. And clinicians need to weigh benefits and risks, but should consider whether benefits are worth the resources consumed. So, you know, the metrics that are well established, and we'll take a quick look at some of these are cost benefit analysis, cost effectiveness analysis, and cost utility analysis. These are the three, you know, globally accepted metrics. And uh, sometimes these are loosely interchanged with each other, but, you know, they are very different from each other. Uh, the crux is, uh, you know, analytic techniques used for economic evaluation, such as these are designed to compare alternative courses of action. The choice of technique, you know, depends upon the decision they intend to influence. Some basic terminologies are quali. I think one of the speakers made a quick uh, note of this, uh, you know, in their presentation. So quali or quality adjusted life years is a measure of health as, you know, combination of the duration of life that is left and the health related quality of life. And the primary outcome of a cost utility analysis is the cost per quality. So we'll take an example, uh, look at examples so you'll uh, understand what this is. So, you know, if you pl plot, uh, a, you know, age in time uh, and the X axis is increasing age and the Y axis shows quality of life with, you know, as this increases. So what we want our patients to be in is this, this green uh, uh, circle where they have a long life with a good quality of life. And what we don't want them to have is a long life with a poor quality of life. So we are all striving to have our patients in, in this box. So, you know, quality of life, of course, in ophthalmology uh, requires questionnaires and the VFQ25 is the one which is utilized most often. Uh, this is the uh, IND VFQ33, which is, uh, you know, India specific and can be used. Uh, this is one of my blogs on uh, where I have written about best practices for design of questionnaires. You can take a look at this. There are certain etiology specific uh, 
quality of life questionnaires for cataract, glaucoma, etc., which can also be used. And once we have the quality, we calculate cost per quality. So that is incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is calculated as the difference in expected cost of two interventions. That is the inter incremental cost divided by the difference in the expected quality produced by the two interventions. And there are threshold ISR, which are used by different nations. In the United States, it's about 50,000 US dollars. Uh, per quality gain. So this is, so, you know, if the uh, particular intervention is more costly than this, they, you know, the uh, the American government will not uh, sort of approve this. Uh, and if it is, you know, below this, they would approve this for their Medicare's expenditure. Uh, so, you know, the different uh, terminology, like I said, are the cost benefit, the cost effectiveness and the cost utility analysis. The cost benefit is the most simplistic uh, where both cost and benefits are monetized. Cost effectiveness uh, is where cost is, of course, monetized and effectiveness is non-monetary units, uh, depending upon what outcome you're uh, studying and cost utility analysis is, you know, costs, of course, are in monetary and utility is in terms of quality. So that is the commonest used. And, uh, you know, overall, the cost benefit analysis is this most simplistic, but uh, it assumes that all benefits can be monetized, but this is not always the case. Uh, cost effectiveness analysis, uh, you know, what it does is, uh, you know, uh, it makes results comparable to other interventions with the same outcome. And cost utility analysis is the one which is uh, generally used by, you know, most uh, uh, national programs internationally to, you know, to uh, recommend uh, any new treatment under their, uh, you know, sort of their uh, health policies. And it, though it is most complicated to measure. Some examples from ophthalmology, you know, so this is health economics and safety considerations for AI. This is majorly coming for, you know, diabetic retinopathy screening. Uh, so if you see, you know, these studies have looked at uh, you know, how much AI is saving per, uh, you know, uh, sort of reference uh, that is made. So this is, you know, these are all in terms of uh, money. But if you see these are ISERs reported here, this study again reports uh, quality. Uh, you know, this is another example of uh, one of these study, major studies from France, which looked at whether femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery or phacal emulsification surgery should be, you know, uh, should be paid for by the French government. And what they uh, found is that flax, uh, you know, costs of 305 euros on average more, and it is less effective on that uh, compared to manual FACO. And the ICER was uh, 10,000. Uh, so yeah. we are running out of time. So kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. So just yeah, go to sorry. the next slide. No. You know, so what we need to do is we have some you know, very simplistic calculator. So this is one calculator which is available uh, and should be available to all of us pretty soon. This is called the Optim I cost calculator. So you know, this is where you you can input uh, you know costs for each of these injections and you know input many different parameters you want and you can actually get the cost uh, to the patient per injections. Uh, the best uh, you you know the parameter to use is cost utility analysis. So in summary, you know value based medicine is really the need of the R. And cost utility analysis should be available to physicians to make best decisions. Allocation of limited funds should be strictly based on ICER and should not be arbitrary. And safety analysis is essential for medicine in the next decade. In India, you know, there are not much uh, that has been done. So, you know, we need to develop these uh, qualities and, you know, then go ahead. And until then, uh, uh, surrogate measures such as the OPTI calculator I showed you can be utilized to have, uh, you know, to have better idea of indirect costs and serve our patients better. So thank you so much, and uh, no, I'm happy thank you, Doctor Sarvajasi. Uh, it seems like you have changed your profession, and you look like a health economist now rather than looking at So uh, thank you, thank you so much, Doctor Sarvajasi. It's uh, really wonderful in terms of talking about health economics, uh, which is so important. Uh, so for the country as well, I mean, especially in India. So now, uh, I mean, since we are running out of time, so uh, we have uh, last, uh, I mean, speakers that uh, Doctor Chaitra uh, Yadav. Uh, Dr. Chadra is either. So uh, she will be talking on uh, aerosol, aerosol in, in the ophthalmic uh, operation theater. So Dr. Chadra, please. Uh. The AV team. So as I connect my laptop, I must uh, thank uh, Team RPC. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, to invite me for their uh, foundation day. Congratulations to all of you. And uh, more importantly, it's my first time at RPC. So I'm, I'm extremely excited and privileged to be here. So thanks all of y'all. So today I'll be speaking on uh, aerosols in the operation theater and particularly our uh, ophthalmic OTs. I don't think we give uh, too much importance to it. 
uh it uh, brought about uh, you know major change to us especially when the pa- pandemic came in and thankfully we are now at the end of the pandemic uh, but we'll never know what we're going to face ahead so we did a series of uh, you know experiments to see how much each of the specialties uh, are exposed to which kind of procedures are safe to do and which not and uh, we kind of came up with some form of guidelines which we published so i'll quickly show you all that So is my presentation visible? We've already tested this out actually. No, we tested this before. Huh? Is it just? So I think it's visible now. Okay. So I'll be speaking on aerosols in the ophthalmic OT and how are we at risk uh, primarily. I have no financial disclosure. So what is the importance? Like we already uh, spoke about, uh, the importance is because uh, we've uh, just faced a pandemic and we are hopefully coming to the end of it. Uh, transmission primarily occurs uh, through droplets and uh, surgical procedures were deemed to be a risk factor and uh, very well aware that one of the earliest uh, to succumb was an ophthalmologist himself. And we really don't have uh, too many studies that have shown us uh, about the risks of aerosol generation and how it can affect our surgeons. We do very well know that uh, the virus has been isolated from uh, conjunctival uh, swab specimens uh, during the pandemic. And uh, more than 45 patients were positive for RT-PCR uh, for the virus and conjunctival swabs. So what we did were to unravel these uh, you know, questions was we conducted a series of experiments in collaboration with IASC in Bangalore. We had a team uh, from the fluid uh, velocimetry uh, you know, department that helped us conduct these uh, experiments. We used uh, something called as uh, shadowgraphy and uh, high speed uh, resolution, high resolution cameras as well to capture them at 5,000 to 20,000 frames uh, was utilized so that we could pick up the smallest of aerosols. So uh, this is to show you how a live camera slow motion uh, video depicts these aerosols versus the shadowgraphy. So uh, going straight away to ophthalmic uh, plastic surgery, these were the experiments that we did. We used a surgical OT setup, uh, which we used food grade uh, chicken and instruments. Uh, This was how we captured the aerosol generation. And uh, importantly, while we uh, performed syringing, no droplets of the size of an aerosol uh, was seen, uh, so which is uh, fairly safe. Uh, Whereas while doing cautery, there was a plume generation, which is why we uh, suggest that we use uh, something like a suction, which uh, took away 90% of the smoke and aerosols as well. Uh, this is a monopolar uh, cautery without suction. Again, uh, you can see uh, when we use a suction, there was no plume and therefore also no escape of aerosols. This was micro drilling, uh, where uh, we did see that during uh, micro drilling, uh, there were droplets and particles that were generated. Uh, which traveled up to the surgeon and the assistant. So it was a little worrying uh, and hence more care needs to be taken. 
So these are our recommendations which we've uh, published. Uh, electrosurgical devices generated surgical smoke both while cutting and coagulation modes. The spread of this smoke was significantly controlled using a suction apparatus and the use of a mechanized drill generated droplets with a spread extending to the surgeon and other personnel in the OT. So we recommend a slower rotation on a smaller burr that can reduce the number of droplets. Lacrimal syringing can be safely uh, performed with protective gear in place. Preparing mucosal surfaces with povidone iodine definitely increases safety. Cold steel is preferred to electrosurgical instruments and drilling with or without irrigation should preferably be avoided. So refractive surgery, we wanted to see whether aerosols were generated during microkeratome. And this is what we found. Uh, as the microkeratome oscillated during the flap cut, large droplets measuring greater than 90 microns were created that could travel up to 1.8 meters. The droplets were too large, therefore they settled down and uh, the risk of aerosolization and transmission was therefore very, very low. Adequate precautions should still be taken during flap cut with microkeratome. So uh, use, uh, you should avoid pooling of the fluid. Adequate drying of the ocular surface, uh, beta in filled pouch helps and changing gloves, definitely. Going on to FACO, I think this is very important because this is the most commonly performed uh, ophthalmic uh, surgery. So this was the setup that we used. This is how we looked at uh, shadowgraphy. This is a quick video. So this is how we set up the mannequin. We used the uh, goat's eye mounted. We used uh, coronal uh, incisions of different uh, sizes. So this was uh, different wound sizes and uh, the sleeve sizes, 2.2 was the sleeve size used and there was no aerosol generation uh, with 2.2 incision and 2.2 sleeve. There was slow leak at the main wound when we used a large incision of 3.2. This was an artificial anterior chamber that was uh, created. We also wanted to know when we are doing the actual FACO in the anterior chamber, was there any aerosolization? So there was profuse aerolization when you did it at the corneal lip, but when you did it in the AC, we hardly saw any generation of aerosols. So this is uh, the, uh, our uh, paper on the same. Uh, recommendation are, is that virus is presented uh, on the ocular surface, so you should be careful. Topical povidone iodine is definitely helpful. Use a similar size dip sleeve and incision size. This reduces the generation and ultrasound usage only within the anterior chamber. So air puff tonography as well, uh, we did a series of experiments and what we found using high speed assessment of droplet and aerosols was that there was no generation during NCT performed in a natural setting. However, when you did NCT uh, during high tier volume, whether it was natural or artificial, there was droplet spread and uh, as well as tactile contamination, hence adequate precaution should be taken. So this is going on to the VR uh, surgery part of it. Let me go straight to the experiments. So this was the team. We used a high speed resolution camera with a shutter speed of one in one lakh. This was the entire setup that we used. We used a wet lab mannequin. We even got an, uh, you know, wet lab uh, machine, a constellation so that we could do the entire process in the lab. So we did intravitreal injections. We used different gorges. We used valve versus non-valve, active, passive, port removal, suturing. So what we uh, found in each one of these is that uh, there was no significant aerosol generation unless we're using a very, very high uh, FAX. So during vitrectomy 23 and 23, uh, 25 gauge as well, we did not see any aerosols. Uh, when we looked at non-valve versus valve, definitely non-valve, there was uh, aerosol generation. But in all these, when we kept the air pressure low, there was no aerosol generation. It's only when we went above 30 is when we actually saw uh, generation of droplets and aerosols and uh, when we used uh, active FX as well we saw but not during so this is when we saw it at 35 you can see the shadowgraphy showing the aerosols and you can see the spread as to how far they went as well so this is just a video to show the same we even calculated the the spread it can travel up to 0.4 meters to 0.67 meters so this is the paper and we recommend use valve cannulas whenever possible. Avoid passive FAE, direct the exit port away from the surgeon as well as the assistant whenever possible. Maintain air pressures at less than or equal to 30 and to stop active air infusion and clamp the infusion cannula during removal of the ports and during suturing. So with adequate personal protection, I think eye surgeries appear to be a safe procedure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chaitra. Uh, just one question for you. How long did the droplets stay there? 
So it depended actually on the size of the droplets. I just mentioned that before. Heavier droplets instantly, you know, settled down. So they were not much risk. It was only the tiny ones which traveled. But I think with our masks and everything, even that was fairly safe. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we start the next session now. And uh, in the next session, we have our first speaker, Dr. T.P. Lahane, who will be joining online. Is it there? Okay. Uh, I can see Jagatram sir sitting there. So uh, can we start with you, sir? Yeah, sure, sure. No, no problem. Okay. So we have uh, Professor Jagatram who will be talking on uh, optimizing outcomes in UVIT cataract. Yeah. Uh, we will we will share the presentation uh, can you can you can yes, you sir. see the presentation yes sir. yes sir go ahead sir okay uh, first of all i am thankful to professor j s tatial and uh, uh, faculty members of the Department of RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences uh, for inviting me. Uh, I will be speaking on optimizing outcome in UVIT cataract. Uh, there are uh, several causes of uh, UVIT cataract, idiopathic, juvenile idiopathic arthritis in children, Fuchs heterochromic UVITs, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, pars planitis, infective uh, etiology, toxoplasma, toxocera, herpetic, and several others. And what is in the pre-operative evaluation in UIT cataract? Most important is to establish a specific uh, etiology. Then uh, before undergoing cataract surgery, it is important to have control of the inflammation at least for three months prior to surgery. Then assessment of the visual potential and then whether to implant IL or not. Then there are uh, some of the consideration uh, in the pre-operative period, as already said, control of inflammation. Then uh, if we are putting IL, which type of IL should be put, then uh, we have to have a different uh, uh, surgical technique for uh, if there is a cyclotic membrane or whether to give pre-operative steroid or not. In the operative, uh, then uh, pure, uh, poor pupillary dilatation is one of the issue, whether to give steroid implant uh, intraoperatively or not. And then in the post-operative period, uh, we have to tailor the drug regime and because there is much more uh, inflammation in these cases and uh, there are several of the complications. Most of the, most of the author, they give uh, uh, systemic steroid, particularly in recurrent uh, UVITs. And uh, these are some of our uh, publications uh, in the different uh, journals, such as Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, and others. And uh, what these publications shows that in the bag, IOL implantation after control of inflammation provide good outcome and is safe in UVITs, including JIA associated UVITs. Uh, there are some of the surgical challenges, such as small pupil and posterior synecy, which we deal by using the synecholysis, iris sucs, malusian ring, and uh, pupillary stretching sometime, and intravitreal steroid whenever it is indicated. And IOL in the bag is the most important. So here it it is a there is a a uh, small video, surgical video. Here we have given a Zurdex, 3.5 millimeter from the limbus. Uh, there is a visually significant cataract here and uh, 
360 degree posterior sinus so here after side port incision we are doing sinusolysis uh, and uh, here in this case after putting viscoelastic into anterior chamber uh, we are using malusian ring to dilate the pupil and uh, this has given adequate dilatation of the pupil then performing continuous curvilinear capsular axis followed by multi quadrant hydro dissection this is a soft cataract so it is just like a phaco aspiration and uh, the, then removal of the cortex from the capsular bag and uh, then uh, implantation of hydrophobic acrylic iol into capsular bag here this iol is implanted into bag and then we have to remove the malusian ring from the uh, and uh, it is uh, now now the malusian ring is removed carefully and uh, viscoelastic from the anterior chamber is removed several time even we have to do peripheral iodectomy in some of the cases and uh, uh, this is the completion of surgery most of the time we give subconjunctival dexamethasone and this is a another case which is a uh, with the infantile uveitis and uh, our uh, uveitic uh, specialist they advised uh, intravitreal azure dex which was given and uh, then uh, starting the surgery side port incision then uh, main incision and then the sinusolysis here uh, uh, we have stained the anterior capsule with the dye trypan blue dye and uh, sinusolysis has given uh, good uh, pupillary dilatation and here we are doing a continuous curvilinear capsular axis removal of the cortex uh, by ia from the capsular bag because uh, this is a child so here we are also doing a primary posterior capsulotomy and uh, this is the completion of primary posterior capsulotomy and some uh, limited uh, anterior vitrectomy and then iol implantation into the capsular bag we have to ensure uh, capsular bag fixation of iol in all patients where there is a single piece iol then suturing is of course important in infants and uh, the, uh, this is a, a case 3 uh, 10 year old child with jia with bilateral cataract where systemic immunosuppression is given and uh, uh, this was later on operated uh, this is uh, uh, before and after uh, this is uh, after surgery uh, there may be lot of inflammation particularly in J jia uh, this is a different case uh, irwan with cataract 14 year old girl with idiopathic retinal vasculitis aneurysm and neuroretinitis this uh, a uh, girl has uh, undergone several injection of azurdex uh, and other anti vegf so what is important the, what are the various factor affecting the outcome of uh, uh, uveitic cataract one is meticulous case selection and we have to establish the etiology then control of inflammation pre operatively is very important meticulous surgical technique in the iol implantation of iol uh, in the bag implantation of iol management of post operative complications post operatively uh, we we have to use much more uh, topical steroid than uh, other uh, cataract cases uh, these are some of the complications such as glaucoma pco cystoid macular edema recurrent uveitis 
or some of the other uh, such as epiretinal membrane or cyclic cyclic membrane formation in these patient of uveitis so in summary a uveitic cataract poses a management challenge phaco emulsification with in the bag implantation of hydrophobic acrylic iol is procedure of choice for a patient with well controlled uveitis pre operative and post operative control of inflammation are the most important prognostic factors drug regime and decision to implant iol should be taken on case to case basis i am thankful to dr rajesh sina and other faculty of the department of uh, uh, rp center for giving me this opportunity thank, thank you very sir. much thank you sir for wonderful pearls that you gave in uh, how to manage manage a case of uvit cataract wonderful cases uh, uh, do we have dr vavikar here okay uh, next is dr roop chakravarty so i can see him there and his topic is rexis tricks you have to unmute dr roop is it okay now can you hear yeah, me absolutely absolutely yeah. so uh, a very good afternoon friends and uh, a big thank you to the organizers for having me here today Uh, my uh, presentation is going to uh, consist of a couple of uh, videos demonstrating teaching pearls and bringing out nuances in performing rexis uh, for uh, surgeons uh, who have gone beyond the past the learning curve uh, rexis journal does not pose much problem in routine situations however uh, even after decades of experience uh, there are there, there are situations uh, challenging situations where can can you see the video moving uh no okay yeah yeah so this was uh, one such case where the lens was really swollen and it was subluxated so this is uh, the technique that i'm using and uh, it will have some take home messages so the anterior capsule has to be stained with trypan blue dye it is must and uh, you have to use a, a, a uh, highly vi viscoelastic agent uh, i'm using a soft shell technique with viscoat and helon 5 here just to flatten out the cent central portion of uh, the of the uh, anterior capsule and then start my rexis uh, using uh, the cystitome uh, my plan here is to have a rexis about 4 4 1/2 mm in size there are various uh, uh, options that are available actually to the surgeon now he can uh, there have been uh, surgeons who have been using pre op iv manitol for these cases to soften up the globe and dehydrate the lens capsular excess should be performed through a tight fitting incision you know uh, some some surgeons have done the capsular excess to stab entry uh, anterior chamber uh, anterior capsular puncture with a 30 gauge needle and aspiration of some of the liquefied cortex material or a two stage excess so whenever you approach the sub incisional area particularly when your incision is slightly larger this is about 2.4 mm in size uh, there can be some uh, problems for example you know in controlling the con capsular tear because there is always little bit of over leaking uh, there is acute angle of attack so what you see here is there is a tendency for the excess margin to go to the periphery so i come back again with helon 5 inject helon 5 in the periphery don't inject uh, any uh, any viscoelastic in the center of the eye because it will push the flap towards the periphery so here uh, because helon 5 was used so i just raised up the capsular flap and i'm going to use uh, a side port incision which is already fashioned earlier use the modified uh, little uh, capsular excess rex a uh, 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 salvage strategy here if you see here i'm pulling the flap towards uh, the incision and towards the center of the globe and then i'm able to retrieve uh, the rexis uh, tear which was going to run away to the periphery so this is uh, uh, one of the techniques that could be used now this was another case if you see here most of the cases that i'm going to show you have uh, you know uh, some challenges or the other are the fibrous capsule or a very swollen lens matter and please remember that if a step is not well done that it could have a cascading effect on the subsequent steps for example if you see here 
my inferior paracentesis was very long. Uh, so let us keep that in the mind. And then a small rexis is done. My plan is to make a two-stage rexis here. So a more, small mini rexis is done. And then the anterior chamber as well as the bag is slightly inflated with a cohesive OVD. Then going into the vana seizures, and, for, and surprisingly, this acts like a seizures as well as a forceps. You know, it gives a nick to the rexis margin, but then it grabs the rexis flap and it, it brings it towards the periphery. Fortunately, this was realized by me earlier, so I immediately halted, injected Helon GV on the periphery, not at the center. I did not go through the initial incision because that was pretty long, and that would have given us to overlocking. So I created a new paracentrist incision. So here, this is how the little the, the, the Brian Little Rexis escape um, retrieval strategy works. You know, you pull the capsular flap uh, opposite 180 degrees from the direction of the tear where it was heading to, and then bring it to the center. So if you see carefully here that I, though the Rexis margin had gone very much into the periphery, I was able to still retrieve it. Now it is not a circular Rexis, it is a curvilinear uh, Rexis. So I need to make it curvilinear, uh, to make it circular, so that I have a more a big, a better access in the nasal nasal portion. So now I was more careful. So I changed the vana scissors into micro rexis scissors, and then going to the micro rexis uh, forceps, and then got uh, myself a very decent size uh, rexis uh, opening. Uh, it was continuous, and subsequently all the steps went up pretty well, as you will uh, see here. Uh, so then this is after the intraocular lens was implanted. There is not much of uh, uniformity in the coverage of the rexis margin on the optic because there was a tendency to go to the periphery in the previous case, uh, in, the, in the previous step. Now, this was another case where the anterior capsule shows some amount of fibrosis, uh, the significance of which was not realized when the surgery was started. So at this stage, I uh, encountered some resistance while tearing the capsular flap at this point. Then I realized there is a capsular plaque or, or some kind of a band. It does not go to the periphery because if you see the periphery, there's a uniform ring of a triplanar staining of the capsule. So I, the cystitum did not work. So I went with my uterator forceps. Uterator forceps generally allows you to tear better, and uh, but it still uh, did not uh, really work well. You know, and then I'm stretching the zonules. So I decided to change my strategy. Instead, I created another flap. And if you see here, there is a triradiate extension. There was one tear here, another tear that happened on this, on this side. So uh, this one has to be mindful of that. So the, this, this portion of the flap is converted into curvilinear tear. And as you go around, make sure that you, you keep the tearing, the active portion in the, in the dye stained capsular area where there is no fibrosis. So you come from outside inside, from outside to, to the center of the eye. So that way you circumnavigate the area of the capsular fibrosis, capsular plug, and you get a very complete rexis here. Now, uh, let us also not forget that there was another nick that was accidentally made uh, in, the, in the superior, in the, on the temporal aspect. So that also has to be taken care of. Otherwise, if you go ahead with phacomalsification, you can have a radialization of the rexis tear. So friends, uh, uh, I'd just like to summarize by telling that you know, whenever the visibility is low uh, in certain situations, please stay in the anterior capsule with tripe and blue dye. Pre-op IV mannitol has really helped me in situations where the, the cataract was really intumescent with a very shallow anterior chamber, less than two millimeters in depth. Uh, needle cortex aspiration with a 30 gauge needle has uh, given good results in hands of many people. Always attempt a smaller initial rexis. Never go, uh, go for the standard rexis because if it tends to go to the periphery, it will be difficult for us to salvage it, retrieve it back. Two-stage rexis may be useful in intumescent cataracts. So maintain the anterior chamber depth, use a cohesive OVD, be ready to work from the side ports. Micro rexis scissors and forceps are to be kept handy and exercise caution when flap tear reaches a sub area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Roop. Very nice tips and uh, very you know, practical tricks that you have uh, shown. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Prashant Garg, who is the director at LV Prasad Eye Institute. He'll be talking on cataract surgery in fuchs and endothelial dystrophy. Thanks, Professor Sidna. Uh, first of all, my congratulations on the 55th uh, Foundation Day of RP Center. Thank Let you. Let me share my slides. Uh, So today I'll be talking to you about the 
uh, cataract surgery in fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Let me begin with this case of 70-year-old lady who had a poor outcome after cataract surgery in one of his one of her eye, and she came to us for management of poor vision in the other eye. And examination of the eye showed a significant cataract. But before we handle this cataract, the question that we need to answer is, what are the possible causes of poor outcome in her uh, uh, previously operated eye? And some of the possible causes seems to be poor surgery, uh, toxic anterior segment syndrome, or some cause of higher endothelial cell loss. But a careful examination of the corneal endothelia on the slit lamp using a specular reflection showed very clearly multiple gateta. And it became obvious to us that this lady is suffering with not only cat senile cataract, but also Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Fuchs endothelial dystrophy is a progressive disease of endothelium and testmates membrane that results in progressive loss of functionality of corneal endothelium that finally results in corneal edema and decreased vision. Why is it important while doing cataract surgery is because cataract surgery can hasten this process of decompensation and corneal edema. The condition remain mostly undiagnosed. And if that happens, you may end up with three situations. One, prolonged corneal edema that recovers over a period of time. And in that case, this disease remains undiagnosed. The second scenario is where one end up with corneal edema that persists all through the life. A third scenario is where patient end up with good clear cornea but over the year, there is a progressive loss of endothelial function and subsequently corneal edema. So the question here is, how do we manage this second eye for which this lady has come to us? And some of the options that we have are, we do cataract surgery alone, or we combine cataract surgery with corneal transplant surgery. And the third option is, we give the option of cataract surgery, and in case if edema develops, we do the corneal surgery. During this talk, I'll talk about pulse in managing cataract in these kind of cases, having concomitant endothelial dystrophy. The first important thing is that we must recognize the disease. And we must remember that signs appear before symptoms. And therefore, it is very important that every patient of cataract surgery must undergo a thorough clinical evaluation, including slit lamp by microscopy of focusing on corneal endothelium. If you have slightest doubt of corneal endothelial morphology on by microscopic examination, understand the function and the morphology of corneal endothelium using corneal thickness and corneal uh, endothelial morphology. Based on these data, you must classify patients onto the severity of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Grade one endothelial dystrophy cases have no corneal edema. Corneal thickness is usually normal. Endothelial cell counts are higher than 1500 with a reasonable population of healthy endothelial cells. In a grade two, you will find some stri on cornea indicative of mild corneal edema or a history of morning blurring of vision. The corneal thickness will be higher than normal and endothelial cell count will be lower with multiple gateta and poor endothelial morphology. In grade three, you will have an obvious corneal edema with corneal thickness being increased and endothelial cell count being lower than 1000 with extensive gateta and only few or no normal looking cells. Now, based on these gradings, as well as the density of the cataract, you need to decide on the management. If the patient is having a grade one corneal endothelial dystrophy, cataract surgery alone can be conducted without much difficulty. However, you need to take some additional care while performing surgery, and I'll be discussing these in my subsequent slides. In grade two, 
up, there is more of a challenge. And therefore, it will be important to counsel the patient giving option of simultaneous corneal and cataract surgery or a subsequent corneal surgery in case the edema develops. However, in grade three, the decision is straightforward. These patients need to be operated with a combined cataract and corneal endothelial replacement procedures. Once you have decided on cataract surgery alone, more planning and preparation is necessary with the objective of modifying cataract surgical procedure to reduce endothelial cell loss. And some of these steps are power modulation on your phacoemulsification machine, performing surgery with relatively lower uh, the, uh, the fluidics or aspiration flow rate, so as to reduce turbulence in the anterior chamber. And an intelligent use of dispersive viscoelastic, and here we can prefer to do soft shell technique. While doing cataract surgery also, it is important to keep away from endothelium. Most of the procedure should be done at the plane of iris. And since you are operating under relatively low aspiration flow rate, you need to be little patient while removing uh, these fragments from the anterior chamber. Is there a role of femtolaser assisted cataract surgery? The Cochrane Review, published few years earlier, clearly said that there is not enough evidence of the benefits of the laser assisted cataract surgery. However, the more recent publication has found that the overall central corneal thickness in patients who have undergone uh, a laser cataract surgery. Uh, is relatively lower. That is, the cornea is maintained compact for a longer period of time. The last pearl is that even if the patient develops corneal edema, we need not panic. Treat them with the conventional uh, post-operative care. And once the eye is quiet, these cases can be managed very effectively using corneal transplant surgeries. And these surgeries have really uh, lead to a very good outcome, particularly decimate membrane stripping endothelial keratoplasty. To summarize, early diagnosis is crucial. Choice of surgical procedure depends on the grade of the dystrophy. However, we should keep in mind to modify these surgeries to reduce endothelial cell loss. A preoperative counseling plays a very, very important role in the appropriate management and putting realistic expectation on the part of patient. Thank you very much for your patient here. Thank you, sir, for a very crisp and very to the point uh, uh, presentation. A uh, lot of things to learn. Now we move on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Suvain Bhattacharji has to leave. He has requested for an early presentation. So uh, he will be presenting on IFIS understanding and, strat and strategy. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, uh, for accommodating me. Uh, uh, you can see my slides? Yeah, we can see. Yeah. So let me go to slide share. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to everybody at RPC, past and present, for the 55th Foundation Day. And thank you, Professor Tikhail, sir, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, Dr. Namrata, and everybody at RPC for this very kind invitation. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, I'll be speaking on understanding and strategizing in IFIS. Uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Deepak Magur and Dr. Ajay for lending their videos. And I do have a financial interest in the BX Google Expander. Now, the patient's dilemma is to see or to be. And the surgeon's dilemma is to use a people expanding device or not. So there are concerns we need to address. <laughs> in the OPD or in the OT, what is the safe preoperative pupil size to eliminate risk of IFIS? Actually, this is a paper in 2011 in the JCRS. The conclusion was that for a pupil of seven millimeters or smaller, the risk of IFIS exist, existed regardless of alpha blocker treatment. In the IJO, this was published in uh, 2014 that the risk of IFIS and tamsulosin intake was much higher in India and hypertension was a very important risk factor. We thank Dr. Shilpa Goel and the co-workers for this wonderful paper. Now, this is a long list of drugs which can cause IFIS and systemic conditions like hypertension, chronic heart failure, diabetes. So no amount of history taking can prevent surprises. Intraoperative myosis is unpredictable, and let's come to terms with that. 
The IFS clinical grading, uh, the mild, moderate, and severe, is mostly a post facto uh, grading. What is more important is we have a non-dilating pupil or intraoperative myosis, a floppy iris, and that these are the three, uh, three components we need to deal with. <laughs> the complications of, are mostly because of incarceration of the iris in the incision or at the phaco tip, and all of this can be avoided or minimized by using a good strategy. So the general principles work very well, long incisions, long and tight incisions, slow hydrodissection, intracameral phenylephrine or adrenaline, and a proper use of OVD and low IA uh, parameters. Preoperative NSIDs do not have a primary role, though they can inhibit uh, surgically induced myosis. Uh, this is a landmark article in 2005 by Chang and Campbell, wherein they said that unlike the non-elastic myotic pupil, the IFS pupil immediately snaps back to its original size following attempts to stretch it, which means that there is an elastic pupil and a rigid pupil. So we could check before starting the surgery as to whether it's elastic. So inject a little BSS through the parasitism, and if that pupil momentarily expands, you know it's an elastic pupil, and you have a different strategy for that. Whereas if it's a non-elastic rigid pupil, it won't budge. So this needs to be stretched and to accommodate a pupil device and how you want to stretch it would depend upon your choice. So once you have stretched it, it's more uh, open to kind of uh, uh, using a device, and more favorable, let's say. So mechanical dilatation, we have iris hooks, we have uh, pupil expansion rings. And like I said, in IFIS, stretching is no good. So in an elastic pupil, it's like a rubber band. So it's stretchable. Any pupil expander would work. Whereas in a rigid pupil, it's like a string, whereas it needs to be torn. And you could use either a strong or bulky uh, pupil expander or Kuglen hooks to give you a very good tear. So the choice of pupil expander depends on how you wish to tear the rigid or elastic pupil. If you, you could do it with two Kuglen hooks, you could use a very thin device like the BX, and which occupies less space in the anterior chamber. Whereas if you choose to do it with a pupil expander, the pupil expander would be bulky and it would occupy a lot of space in the anterior chamber coming in the way of your uh, process. So what matters most is the elasticity of the people and not the size. Oh, sorry. Uh, slides are moving a little slow. Okay, so this is a replace video. So this is a video by Dr. Deepak Megur. It's a hard cataract, it's a rigid pupil. It's being stretched a little to accommodate a pupil expander. And if you can see the BX produces only a 5.5 millimeter pupil. It just can't produce a pupil larger than that right now. So, and this is a pretty hard cataract. The all you need to do is chop it into small fragments and you have a wonderful uh, pupil. Uh, I mean, you can uh, remove the hardest of cataracts to the 5.5 millimeter pupil. So it's never the size of the pupil which is important. It's the, what you don't want is the, the pupil to come down on you. So, so, and this is a video which I had presented in the ASCRS in 2012, 13 in San Francisco, and this was shown world over. Now, these are the three grades of IFIS, and what I'm trying to show over here is just the little undulation of the iris, and here, this is an old video taken from a VHS before we even recognize the term IFIS, and this is so typical that you have iris prolapse, you inject viscoelastic into the antechamber, the pupil expands, and again, nothing wrong with the flow parameters, the pupil comes down. And this is a case which was a nightmare for me. Uh, I, I used iris hooks and I still couldn't uh, complete uh, the uh, capsular excess without the iris being frayed. So what I'm trying to emphasize over here is that the device is uh, that this has got very a role only in uh, limiting the intraoperative meiosis. It really does not prevent the floppiness. So we did manage to complete the case and uh, put in a lens, but then we had iris prolapsing from all sides. And at the end of the surgery, it was a reasonably decent picture, but it was a nightmare for me. So now uh, I would like to think that the BHEX uh, would uh, be uh, preventive uh, in uh, IFIS, but that's not the case. Let's see this case. I had a hint of IFIS, so I injected a little bit under the pupil margin and put in a BX and Lo and behold, I have uh, iris prolapsing from my side port. The side port isn't actually very large. It's the iris prolapse, which is look, making it look large. And I have iris prolapsing through the main incision. We managed to do the case well and align the toric IOL. Uh, the advantage of BX over here was that I could remove it through the side port. And that's a huge blessing in, with iris prolapsing through all your incisions. 
Now, intraoperative mitosis can be a real pain, and this is, this is a hard cataract of deep duct, uh, so showing you how once intraoperative mitosis has occurred, we can inject a little bit of viscoelastic on the anterior capsular rim and then tuck those flanges one after the other. And as you tuck those flanges and you extend the flange to the periphery, you have instant confirmation that the uh, capsular excess margin has not been engaged and you are back to your comfort zone. Once you have assured that the pupil is not coming down and you, you can go back to your search. So what I'm trying to emphasize over here, for IFS, the meiosis component, iris hooks or pupil expanders provide a constant pupil size which allows good visibility for safe fake investigation. As far as the iris prolapse is concerned, no device really helps. It depends upon the severity of the IFS. So there is no credit to the pupil device when you are not having iris prolapse. It's basically lower grade IFS. So a favorable pupil expansion device in IFS would be one which requires small incisions, has a low vertical profile, can exit to the side port if possible. So IRIS hooks and BX pupil expander kind of fit the bill perfectly. And this is again another surgery where the BX can be removed through one millimeter side port. And that could be a huge blessing, like I said, in uh, IFS. This is a case of uh, femtofaco being done by Ajay Paul. And what caused the small pupil was either the uh, laser treatment or IFIS is not sure, but at the end of the surge, uh, treatment and when he started after the capsular excess, the people was seen to be at 4.1 uh, millimeters. So uh, that is a tough call. So here we can see him using a BHX pupil expander. The uh, ring is, the flanges are tucked under the pupil margin over the capsular excess uh, rim. And once you have that pupil of that size, you can happily finish off the FACO surgery without any complications. Medical management and strategy, uh, there is a host of systemic conditions, like I said, and so history taking is not going to be helpful. IFS can occur in seven millimeter pupils. It can occur one year after time solution has been stopped. It can occur within three to seven days after time solution has started. And stopping time solution is of no value, actually. And we must remember that women also are often on time solution for UTI. So it would be good to have a disciplined approach as far as surgery is concerned. Please keep a stock of pupil devices, whatever you're fond of. Uh, use viscoelastic judiciously. Uh, we need to distinguish the elastic and the non-elastic pupil. And whatever you want, over the iris hooks or pupil expander would depend on the elasticity of the pupil or how, you, or how you wish to tear the rigid pupil. And like I said, a 5.5 pupil is pretty good for any surgery. I would uh, encourage you all to take a look at this uh, article that is available on eofta.com on 10 tips for fecal multiplication in small pupil. And thank you once again, Professor Tiel, sir, and the entire RPC team for this kind invitation. I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Suvain, for uh, introducing a wonderful device and for a very nice presentation. Thank you, Rajesh. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Pankaj Sharma, and uh, he will be presenting on uh, endonucleation CHOP, simplifying rock hard cataract pequemulsification. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Dr. Pankaj. Yes, uh, I hope I'm audible now. Yes, yes, yes. So, and my slides are visible. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's a, really an honor to address my uh, old alma mater. Uh, I'll be speaking on endonucleation chop, simplifying rock hard cataract emulsification. Now, uh, grade three, four, and brown black cataracts, it's still a uh, a uh, case of concern for any surgeon, whether at, at, at all levels of cataract surgery. Now, chopping is, chopping is problematic. There is minimal cortical cushion. Zonal support is uh, usually uh, less pupillary. The dilatation is compromised, and too much energy is used for the uh, for the phaco emulsification. So. Uh, the techniques which have been described are divide and conquer, which, which is, uh, uh, causes too much stress on the zonules. The crater chop is the uh, usual technique which is used in, all, uh, in most of the cases. We have multi-level chop by Dr. Vasavada. Uh, the direct chop, we have uh, femto-assisted softening of the nucleus, tilt and chop. Now, decrease in conquer was first reported by Hong Kim, uh, Kim in 2009. But uh, I have uh, modified that uh, technique to some extent because he gave a, a very large peripheral incision. By giving very small peripheral incisions, uh, we, we can uh, de de deal with this uh, rock hard cataracts. 
and then remove this smaller endonucleus from inside. Now, these peripheral chops can be given because the because the nucleus is not that hard in the periphery. It is the central part, which is the unchoppable part. So uh, as you can see now, I, I'll be showing a video. So first of all, the important part is to ensure that the nucleus rotates freely in the bag. Then in the periphery, we give very small chop in the, and just separate uh, a, a millimeter or so. And during the separation, we can see uh, like here, uh, there's a small disc which uh, becomes uh, visible after the chop. The harder the nu nucleus, the more the smaller pieces have to be chopped in the pe pe periphery. Once this flap petal has been opened up, then the central uh, core we can uh, engage and bring up in the iris plane. Now, once this gets up, uh, gets outside in the iris plane, we have to. Uh, inject a cohesive viscoelastic so that we don't uh, the, 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 the damage the endothelium. And this can be crushed in between the uh, phaco needle and the chopper. So it minimizes the power used to emulsify the central core, which is uh, rock hard, brown or black. Now this gives us increased space in the bag. We can continue and complete the initial chops and the, 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 the direct visualization, these peripheral uh, segments can now easily prolapse into the center of the bag. And we have so much increased space in the bag. So it makes the whole pr 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 procedure, uh, in, uh, which is completed now in the bag, except for the first disc, which is uh, emulsified in the iris plane. It is a, a consistent and a repeatable initial uh, uh, we have to, you know, uh, learn how to remove this central core. We can do it even in uh, white cataracts with brown nuclei. It is, uh, oh, but you have to just learn the trick of how to remove this endonucleus from inside. Once this endonucleus has been removed, then these uh, these chops can be uh, further extended and the nucleus can be emulsified completely in the bag. So we compared this endonucleation chop with the crater chop, and we found that the mean ETT value, the mean BSS volume used was uh, significantly less with the endonucleation chop. We used uh, uh, about 100, uh, we did about 100 cases in these each of the group. The uh, best uh, corrected visual accuracy day one was uh, significantly be be better in the endonucleation chop as compared to the uh, Crater chop, standard crater chop. However, the endothelial cell density was same over a period of three months. The central corneal thickness was significantly less in, on the first post op day in uh, the endonucleation chop group, but uh, there was no significant difference in the IOP uh, post operatively. Uh, regarding the complications, only one complication was significantly higher, which, higher, which was corneal edema on day one or a striate keratopathy, and that was encountered in the crater chop technique. Uh, we didn't have any nucleus drop. We had one uh, posterior capsular rent in the crater chop, and one as a zonal dehiscence in the endonucleation chop, and two in the crater chop. So it was a, a safe, a repeatable, and consistently repeatable. Uh, procedure, there was less stress on the zonule, but however, to remove that central core, we need a, 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 a initial uh, like a, a, a learning curve to how to disengage that nucleus core from the uh, remaining shell of the nucleus. Once that is achieved, then uh, any amount of any hardness of the cataract can be dealt with quite easily. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj, for a topic which really requires a lot of attention and it was very nicely presented. Uh, now we go on to uh, Dr. T.P. Lahane, who will be talking about cataract surgery, FICO dynamics or foot dynamics. Lahane, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, sorry, because I am on the way from the Ranchi to Jamshedpur. So my son Sumit will share the screen from Mumbai. 
and I will speak on the Fook dynamics or Fico dynamics. Definitely, uh, uh, the Fico dynamics is there definitely, but the put my financial disclosure, as you know, they should help us in the conferences. There is no any financial interest. Next. And here you will see the machine surgeon or foot surgeon. If it is a machine surgeon, I don't think that is going to work. So these are, I think both are related each other. So foot surgeon is also required. And uh, uh, the other, uh, the see this, surgeon is also required. And that is very, very important. So though there is a good uh, dynamic, foot dynamics goes hand in hand. Next, hmm. I think there is some problem. So your voice is breaking. Ah, uh, my voice is breaking. Huh? Now it's better. Now it's better. No? Yeah. Uh, Meet, can you hear me, Sumit? This is not moving, Sumit. It's moving, sir. For us, it's moving. And for me, it is not moving. Can you, can you just? Uh, I think, uh, sir, he has a bad network because of it. Yeah, just... I think he has a bad network and uh, so because he's traveling, so it's difficult. So, sir, if the panel don't mind, can I just uh, share the slides and uh, talk about it? Please, please, go ahead. Go ahead, Sumit. So uh, basically, uh, what I uh, wanted to show is that it's a hard cataract and it takes a, quite a trouble for a surgeon to complete the surgery with uh, uh, even with the advanced machines. So basically, uh, when you want to plan a surgery, you know, simply you have a continuous mode and whatever good machine you're using, what happens with you stay in a FACO 3 for longer time and you use quite an amount of FACO and that increases your... Uh, cumulative dissipated energy and also your FACO power and that can cause a lot of endothelial damage as all of us know. So uh, it, it's a, a simple uh, thing that you can have a, some primary adjustment depending on the uh, type of cataract that you are going to operate. It, it could be in a pulse mode, it could be in a burst mode. You have a, a dual mechanics, if you can add a longitudinal component to it, uh, basically, you can try and uh, do your surgery with the machine-assisted uh, intelligence and you can utilize and optimize your machine completely. Now, seeing all this, Fresh. Th this is just uh, what happened at the FACO tip when you uh, use both. Uh, so, uh, basically, to tell you that if you are using only the machine parameters or only the foot parameters, it is not going to uh, help you uh, uh, crack this kind of hard cataracts. So for anything you want to plan, you you use your machine uh, in the adequate settings and along with that, use your foot also. Because many of the times, especially in the learning curve, <clears throat> if you're not able to manage and your foot movement, especially generally as in a learning curve, we don't know how to use it properly, can inadvertently cause a lot of damage and uh, could be zonular dialysis, PCR, and that happened with all of us during our learning phases. So this is uh, just to tell you that if you combine both the things and uh, then you plan your surgery, it, it makes your life more comforting and basically gives a better surgical outcome in such cases. So uh, just to give a take away a take home message that with the time being the machines are becoming more advanced and the smart but the smart machine makes us more machine dependent like somebody who has learned on a machine with the one i showed it, it it becomes very difficult for him 
to go and work on a peristaltic machine so you should know whatever thing you are using you should know how to adjust the parameter and that itself is a skill to be learned and combination of having a high end machine and a skill surgeon basically optimizes the surgical outcome i thank you and i'm really sorry on uh, behalf of uh, dr tp uh, lane sir because of his bad network he could not present so i had to uh, just take over in between and, uh, sorry for the inconvenience to the no, fan no. thank you thank you sumit and very nicely concluded and very well said very well presented uh, thanks a lot we move on to our next speaker and that is dr bhavna sharma and uh, do we have dr bhavna sharma okay so i can see shail there and uh, can we have dr shail vasavada uh, he will be talking on anterior vitrectomy for cataract surgeon thank you very much uh, dr sina sir dr namrata ma'am dr tyal sir and congratulations uh, to rp center Uh, <clears throat> i'll be talking about uh, some of the tips that we find useful when encountering a complication that eventually everyone will encounter we do receive research grant support from alcon laboratories uh, but has no relevance to this presentation so pcr can occur at any stage of surgery and the first thing that we want to make sure is to make sure that the probe is not withdrawn before tamponading the bare area Uh, and here i would specify injection of a dispersive viscoelastic because dispersive viscoelastic will be more retentive cohesive can easily come out as one block so here specifically a chondroitin sulfate based dispersive viscoelastic should be used before withdrawing the instruments then you need to assess the extent of pcr uh, identify whether there is already vitreous in the chamber or not and ask your ot assistants to look for three piece iol scleral fixation iols etc if in case required at the end of surgery the best way to identify vitreous is not by even the most sophisticated microscopes you may be excellent you may have a slit lamp attachment so on and so forth but the best way to identify vitreous is to inject preservative free triamcinolone acetonide Uh, and it was originally used in pediatric cataract surgery uh, but over the period of time uh, we've all realized the role of triamcinolone when do we do vitrectomy i think the answer is very straightforward whenever you see vitreous present so it could be as late as cortex removal it could be as early as before starting the capsulorexis it could be as in between as 3/4 of the nucleus being there or it could be as late as after the capsulorexis the ia cortex everything is done so a uh, vitrectomy needs to be done whenever you identify vitreous before moving on to the next step uh, whatever is remaining and we must understand the goal of doing vitrectomy so the goal of doing vitrectomy is to prevent acute intraoperative vitreoretinal traction and our aim should never be to salvage the sinking lens material anyhow just because we are cataract surgeons doesn't mean it's we we can salvage or do anything and this is an excellent uh, clip shared by a vitreo retinal colleague to show a spontaneously dropped nucleus showing how much the attachments of the vitreous are around this nucleus and if we quite often if we feel that it's just behind the posterior capsule let me pull it up with a glide or you know let me pull it up with a phaco probe so on and so forth the amount of traction that you will cause to the uh, uh, you know vitreous base and that will decide the eventual post operative outcome so it's not just important to remove the lens at that point but it's the life of the patient's eye that is remaining and therefore removing this attachments around this around around the lens are very important before tackling it the other goals of vitrectomy are to prevent further enlargement of the pcr uh, cause adequate vitreous removal and provide a uniform scaffold never perform dry vitrectomy and the times of sponge vitrectomy using a sponge to try and identify and cut with scissors are gone uh, you must have fluid inside the eye when you are performing vitrectomy and there are two ways of performing limbal or pars plana we prefer the pars plana but that doesn't mean one is uh, far superior over the other we must do vitrectomy one way or the other and while doing limbal vitrectomy make sure that you go face down that is the uh, you know the face of the vitrector facing down so that you are putting less traction or pulling less on the vitreous Uh, in spite of doing that limbal vitrectomy has the limitation that you are attacking a larger bulk of vitreous and therefore more chances of more vitreous prolapse 
and enlargement of the PCR compared when you go through the parse planner, you're draining it from where the actual uh, vitreous is coming for, from, so less chances of uh, enlargement. Uh, and also, it also gives you a, a, a more equi equal access around the PCR. With the limbal vitrectomy, with ergonomics, even if you change side port hands, it's difficult to remove symmetrical vitreous around uh, the PCR, which can lead to tilts uh, eventually. Whereas with the pars plana, it's very easy ergonomically to remove uh, the vitreous from all around. But whatever the technique you prefer, limbal or pars plana, uh, please do a thorough vitrectomy with triamcinolone and acetonide before moving ahead uh, with any step of cataract surgery. Look at this case with three-fourths of the nucleus being there, uh, but that doesn't mean we have to remove the nucleus before we do vitrectomy. We first injected triamcinolone and uh, to our, I mean, not much of a surprise, we found vitreous. And notice how through this pars plana, that vitreous that was there in the anterior chamber got nicely sucked in through this pre-existing or this PCR that has occurred uh, without the PCR enlarging in any which ways or more, you know, vitreous prolapsing from anywhere. So that's the advantage of pars plana. And following that, with low parameters, we could go ahead and remove the entire rest of the three-fourth nucleus without causing a further drop. Another similar situation where here the IOL is placed in the bag and apparently there was nothing. The zonules are intact and everything, but we could still see, uh, you know, some strands in the eye. We stained it with triamcinolone and to our utter disbelief, it was actually some vitreous which somehow through some loose zonules came out into the anterior chamber. Uh, you can do it even with a lance knife. You don't necessarily need a trocar. Uh, and notice once again how uh, with the pars plana uh, side, with the infusion from the front, this vitreous strands which are there, which have come out through the weak areas and the zonules will get sucked back again through that same route uh, and it's cleared off. So we find this quite advantageous. I think important to understand the machine dynamics that there are two ways vitrectomy works. One is cut IA versus IA cut. Uh, you must always use the cut IA mode in which the first the cutting is done. That is first irrigation. Second foot position is vitrectomy and then aspiration. So you don't, you produce very less traction. And the second is IA cut where you actually first aspirate and then cut. That the, This mode is required only and only in cases where after doing vitrectomy, you, you're still not sure and you want to remove cortex or something, you can use the IA cut mode. But for a primary vitrectomy, you need cut IA. Use a mo moderate vacuum, but a low flow rate. So flow rate of 10 to 15, a lower bottle height or IOP. Uh, and 300 to 400 vacuum is something that is useful for all forms, whether it's limbal or pars plana vitrectomy. And choose the gauge which is compatible with your machine. Most uh, modern generation FACO machines are compatible with 23 gauge uh, trocars. Uh, irrespective of limbal or pars plana, make sure that the retinal evaluation is done thoroughly post-operatively, peripheral evaluation done uh, by the retinal surgeon. And also remember such eyes have a higher chance of developing CME. And it's not just pars plana patients who develop retinal breaks. Uh, in fact, the limbal vitrectomy causes more traction and chances of breaks are even higher. So I think it's time that we all start to change our mindset. We have a lot of such avenues of interacting with our colleagues, wonderful webinars and all the material available thanks to AIOS uh, on the website, on YouTube. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think all of us can get better and improve our outcomes when we are encountered in this situation. Once again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shan. Thank you for such wonderful demonstrations. Uh, we quickly move on to the next talk, which is uh, on flax in complex cataract surgery by Dr. Himanshu Mehta. Uh, in case Dr. Himanshu has not joined us yet, we can move on to the next talk, which is mixing and matching IOLs to optimize the outcomes by Dr. D. Ramamurthy. Sir, if you may share the slide. Uh my slides are seen? Yes, sir. It's visible and you're audible. Great. It's indeed wonderful to be part of this uh, excellent series of lectures, and it's always a pleasure to be part of the RPC meetings. I'm going to be talking on mixing and matching IOS to maximize visual outcomes. I think the goals of modern uh, cataract surgery is to optimize the IOL type and power in the fellow eye 
is not always emetropia that we are aiming at. So as to provide a continuous range of vision and maximize image quality and reduce the photic issues. So we are concerned both quantity and quality of vision and so that the patient bilaterally implanted is able to do all his activities without relying upon a touch of glasses. The most common scenario is a situation like this where similar intraocular lenses are implanted in both eyes. As you can see here, hardly any astigmatism, a simple power of 24 diopters, receives bilateral symphony, though we were always told that this EDOF lenses are somewhat deficient for near vision. You do find that very often these patients are quite uh, uh, happy with the same lens implanted bilaterally. And this is what we do most often. But what when we are, uh, the situation is somewhat different. As you can see, you see over here, here the same EDOF intraocular lens has been used, uh, uh, walk in the park case. But uh, what you find is that the patient in the was first underwent surgery in the left eye and was not quite happy with the outcome because he required a plus one diopter ad as far as near vision is concerned. So what we do in this situation is to go ahead and aim at 0.75 diopters of myopia in the second eye. The patient actually had a biometry of plus 22.2, but what we implanted was plus 23. So because of this in the right eye, which was operated the secondly, the near vision was extremely good and bilaterally implanted, the patient did well. So this is mixing and matching without really changing the type of intraocular lens. Here again, we come across an 80 year old male patient, had a symphony in the first eye. And uh, again, the situation was somewhat uh, similar to what we faced in the earlier situation. But this patient was uh, required a plus 0.75 as far as near vision is concerned. He was hardly going out much. All he was bothered about was picking up the newspaper in the morning and reading quite comfortably. So was not quite happy with the visual outcome. So what we did in this case was implant a plus four diopter tectus multifocal lens in the fellow eye. To my mind, this is one of the lenses which gives the best quality of near vision, though there is a certain amount of attendant dyspotopsia. So bilaterally implanted, what you find is that we were able to meet the requirements of this specific patient in the sense that he had good distance visual acuity in both eyes and excellent near visual acuity in the eye which received the plus four doctor ad. We come across a situation of a 55 year old male patient, quite active, drives on his own, wants excellent uh, distant vision, good quality distant vision, and wants a reasonably good near vision also. So we went ahead and uh, those were the days when we eat off lens was the primary implant that we did. Basically, what this patient felt was that his near vision was reasonably good, even in the first time, which received the EDOF intraocular lens. But then he felt that the near vision would, could be somewhat better. But at the same time, he did not want to compromise on the quality of vision, which was also important for him. So what we did was to uh, place a plus 3.25 at thickness lens in the second eye and bilaterally implanted. Again, we are able to uh, meet the requirements of this specific patient. What about the importance of uh, uh, addressing toricity? I mean, we implant these multifocal intraocular lenses is concerned. You find that this patient had a 0.93 diopters of against the rule astigmatism. And in the first time, we went ahead and implanted um, <clears throat> a simple uh, EDOF lens without addressing the toricity. So though he had a reasonably good uh, near visual acuity, as far as the distance vision is concerned, he required a minus 0.75 diopter of, at 90 degrees. So often we would go ahead and address these small amounts of residual error. we be using a laser vision correction at three months out, but while waiting, the patient chose to undergo um, a toric multifocal lens in the other eye. And this is exactly the power that was implanted. And what you find is that once you are able to address the toricity along with the multifocality obviously translates to better outcomes. And this patient actually chose not to undergo the laser vision correction in the fellow eye because bilaterally implanted, he was quite comfortable with the quality and the quantity of vision that he had. Again, a similar situation, as you can see here, we went ahead with a patient with panoptics in talk lens. That was the time and the toric question had not become available to us. 0.87 degrees of against the rule astigmatism. We went ahead and implanted a simple panoptics lens, a trifocal lens. And what you find here is a 
fair amount of astigmatism that was left behind. And even though the near vision of this patient was quite good, was not quite uh, happy with the uh, uncorrected distant visual acuity. So the fellow I received a panoptic storic intraocular lens. And what you find is even though the astigmatism is nearly the same, he required a T3 panoptic storic intraocular lens and bilaterally implanted, what you find is that this patient visual requirements again comfortably met with. And quite often the inadequacies of the first eye need not be addressed because you are able to match the requirements of the patient with what you do in the second eye. Again, as far as the toric intraocular lens indication is concerned, I am asked what is the power at which you go on to a toric intraocular lens. Basically, we have to understand that the with the rule astigmatism and against the rule astigmatism are completely two different animals. Uh, 0.98 diopters of against the rule astigmatism requires a T4 intraocular lens, but almost a similar amount of with the rule astigmatism does require only a non toric intraocular lens. So it's not just the uh, uh, magnitude of the astigmatism, we need to remember that the axis of the astigmatism is also extremely important for us to keep in mind. What about a situation like this, a post-classic situation where the patient is already used to good vision without glasses? It helps if you get the preoperative data. And the most important factor is that the patient was quite happy with the visual outcome after the LASIK surgery. And another important factor is when you look at the topography now, the, it's a sea of green, which means the cornea is quite regular. The higher order abrasions, as you see in the cornea planks in the lower left corner, is quite uh, less. So obviously, this is a patient who would do well at the EDOF multifocal intraocular lens. And that's exactly what he received. And as you can see over here, both the near vision and distant vision is quite adequately addressed with a bilateral symphony lens. And this is a patient who received a monofocal intraocular lens subsequent to a um, laser vision correction. But then here, because he wanted a near vision, in the second eye, we went ahead and implanted a multifocal intraocular lens. So what you find is that this is able to require, uh, um, uh, address the requirement of near vision in this patient. So bilaterally implanted, this patient is again a happy patient. So what I want you to, I'll skip this, where we, we implant a symphony toric in one eye and a uh, um, trifocal toric in the second eye, so as to address the requirements of the patient. So essentially, uh, I believe the second eye surgery one is, is one of the best ways of addressing the refractive aspirations of any individual patient. So optimizing the type and the quantity and the quality of refractive error that you address in the second eye lens uh, helps you to bilaterally improve outcomes and patient satisfaction. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy for beautifully mapping out the judicious use of varieties of IOL in different clinical scenarios. Now, our next presentation is uh, by Dr. Krishna Prasad on choosing uh, between monovision and multifocals. So Dr. Krishna Prasad, uh, in case Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Chandrasekhar is available, then we can go on to his talk. Dr. Bhavna Sharma for managing the traumatic cataract. So, I guess this brings us to the end of the session. And I would like to thank all the speakers for the wonderful demonstration of uh, the different clinical scenarios uh, in cataract surgery. And uh, definitely it's a, a great um, pearl of, uh, uh, I think, a knowledge for all the budding surgeons here. And, uh, uh, and in case we have any questions, we can take up these questions, anything in the chat box or maybe the panelists. Anybody who has a question, we can take a few questions here. So I think we can conclude the session. So thank you all for uh, uh, having made it to this session. And uh, so I guess we'll see you again, maybe uh, for the next, uh, till the next session, come, till we plan a next session again. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much, madam, for conducting this uh, session wonderfully. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now uh, for the upcoming session, I would request our moderator to please come up and join us, Dr. Dewang Agmo. Dr. Dewang Agmo, 
what do we have you here?
Wait, where is Devang? Oh, I thought I could take over and make it a Kapil Sharma show. It is coming. Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome. Namaste to all. Deva, Dr. Devang has joined us. This is not working. Yes, sir. I've joined. Okay. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the day two session of the 55th Foundation Day program. And uh, this is the, the, the session of Glaucoma Fundamentals is ready to start. And with this, I would like to introduce our chairpersons, Professor Vinay Gupta, Dr. Harsh Kumar, Dr. Kirti Singh, and Dr. Shikha. And panelist, Dr. Kanchan, please come. Okay, uh, I would like to now call upon Dr. Shalini Mohan, uh, ma'am, for, to, for, to talk on the decision-making in glaucoma. Dr. Shalini Mohan is an RPC alumni, and she's currently working as a professor in GSPM Medical College. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Devang. It's a real pleasure to be here in RP Center. Respected Chairperson, Dr. Hash Kumar sir, Dr. Vinay Gupta, and Dr. Shikha, and uh, all dear friends present in this hall. I'm going to talk about decision-making in glaucoma. So the first thing which comes to our mind, although I made this talk quite basic, but I can see most of the people are here glaucoma specialists. So whether it is present or not. So first of all, we need to pay focus, pay attention to history and to risk factors. Then we need to see the clinical findings and finally the investigations. Regarding risk factors, it is very, very important to pay attention to a few of the important risk factors like corneal thickness, like older age, like family history of glaucoma, disc hemorrhage, and so on and so forth. Now, whenever there is clinical decision-making in glaucoma, we suspect glaucoma whenever there is elevated intraocular pressure. Now, whenever we are taking intraocular pressure, it is important that we do not pay attention to single IOP reading. We do a dialer variation. Goldman is the gold standard, and of course, pachymetry is required. Whenever there is a suspicious appearance of the optic disc, whenever there is abnormal visual field and abnormal angle appearance, or combination of these factors. So whenever we are seeing this size, it is important to ensure the size of the disc, which we can, if it is a larger disc, obviously it will have a larger cup. If it is a smaller disc, it will, it will have a smaller cup. So we need to rule out the physiological cupping. And then we need to pay attention to the neuroretinal rim and to see the eyes in, in, as it isn't rule, which is the inferior rim is the broadest, followed by superior nasal and temporal. And then, of course, if there is a notch, we need to pay attention to that notch also with corresponding defect of the neuro of the RNFL. 
Now we can see that there is a disc hemorrhage and uh, there is a bearing of circumlinear vessel in this particular photograph, which is important to for, 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 for the patients to see in the follow period regarding the progression of glaucoma. Now this is the disc hemorrhage. And here we can see again the bearing of circumlinear vessel. Now, this is important again. Now this is a small disc where we can see there's a small cup. Now, but in, in the inferior part, we can see there is a disc hemorrhage. So we need to follow this patient, pay, uh, patient more aggressively. Now it is important to be sure about the neurological cup where pallor is more than the disc. And so that we rule out the uh, neurological cupping in our patients. So the evidence says that glaucomatous changes can be detected at the level of optic nerve head and RNFL before any findings on the visual field testing. Now coming to, this is the uh, AO algorithm for POAG suspect. Whenever we see a suspicious disc with normal intraocular pressure, of course, these are the normal tension glaucoma suspect. If IOP is 28 millimeter mercury or more, we need to treat these patients. Now the question arises when the IOP is between 22 to 26 millimeter of mercury. Visual fields are normal. There are no risk factors. Obviously we need to follow up. But if there is visual field defect or, three, or the risk factors are present, which are three or more, then we need to follow these patients more stringently or we need to treat. We need to maintain a balance between the uh, treatment and the follow-up of our patients. Now in NTG suspect, we need to do a dialer variation, which we tend to miss very, very, very often. And if the dialer variation is higher than 22 millimeter of mercury, then obviously these patients need to be treated by, like primary open angle glaucoma suspect. But if the visual field is normal, we can take the guidance of imaging. And if imaging is also normal, we need to follow these patients very, very closely. Now, whenever there is normal uh, imaging, then obviously we need to rule out physiological cup. Whenever we are treating these NTG patients with abnormal visual field, we need to rule out the mimickers, which might be like optic pit or a morning glory syndrome or a coloboma like this. And if these mimickers are not present, then we need to treat these patients. Regarding primary angle closure suspect, whenever there is an occluderable angle and signs of intermittent angle closure like patchy pigmentation or isotrophy, gonioscynechia, then obviously we need to subject these patients to YAC peripheral iridotomy. When the angle deepens, we need to treat these patients like primary open angle glaucoma patients. But if it doesn't, that means there is something else. We need to look for double hump sign like this. And if it is there, then we need to treat these patients for plateau iris and the ideal treatment is the laser iridoplasty. In under scenario, if there are no signs of angle closure or no signs of intermittent angle closure, we need to only follow up these patients. Now coming to decision-making in therapy, target intraocular pressure should be determined before moving on to treatment. And according to the guidelines from European Glaucoma Society, the target intraocular pressure in early glaucoma is in the higher teens. In moderate glaucoma, it is in the middle teens and advanced glaucoma, it is in the lower teens. But whenever we are making sure about the target intraocular pressure, there are certain more things that we need to emphasize besides glaucomatous damage, like life expectancy of patient. If the patient is having longer life expectancy, we need to have a lower target intraocular pressure. Similarly, if untreated IOP, another th important thing is additional risk factors which we already talked about, and then of course, rate of progression. If rate of progression is high, we need to have lower intraocular pressure, lower target intraocular pressure. And to determine the rate of progression, we need to have at least six visual fields in the time duration of two years. Regarding decision-making in medical therapy, I would like to say that primary intervention is required to prevent or delay in glaucoma and first-line treatments are prostaglandin analogs or beta blockers depending on scenario. Now, because of the choice, because of high systemic efficacy, and, uh, high systemic safety, high efficacy, once daily dosing, therefore compliance is good. Rest of the medications can be added depending on the clinical, clinical scenario. Now, when do we decide regarding surgical therapy? We need to maintain a balance between benefits of surgery and risk of progressive visual loss. The important thing is when to shift. Now, there is an unacceptable risk of glaucomatous progression, or we are unable to achieve target intraocular pressure, or there is poor compliance or adherence. 
Now, next decision comes regarding which surgery to choose. Now, whenever we have patients of primary open angle glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, or any non-inflammatory glaucoma, trabeculectomy is the gold standard surgery. But in cases of inflammatory glaucoma, like NVGs, where trabeculectomy is bound to fail, or twice operated and failed traps, secondary glaucomas, tube surgeries can be the surgery of choice. In painful blinders, obviously cyclodestructive procedure, V2. Now the next uh, controversial thing which comes up is PACG. Now in PACG with cataract, combined surgery is done in advanced cases. As per consensus from World Glaucoma Association, cataract surgery alone may be considered in eyes with mild degree of angle closure, where peripheral anterior synechia are less than 180 degree with mild optic nerve or visual field damage. Rest of the patients, we need to do combined surgery. Now, another important thing which has come up is clinical decision support system. And this is the predictive model for glaucoma clinic and based on artificial intelligence. Now, in this, we have advances in the fields of predictive modeling where artificial intelligence has been incorporated with the machines and they have potential to improve the clinical care and outcome of our patient. Now, this, is, this has also been seen that they improve the clinical decision, but we need to have large amount of data to improve the, the diagnostic ability of the artificial intelligence. Now here there is basic principle of integration where clinical findings, they are actually integrated along with diagnostic modalities and then interpreted in the form to improve the diagnostic ability of the machine. So the take home messages, messages that our current tools and understanding might be less perfect in some of the aspects, but by applying them effectively to our clinical decision making, we have actually made, made great strides in the preserving vision of our patients. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Shalini, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think next I would like to call upon Dr. Matthew James, who will be uh, speaking on visual field interpretation. So Dr. Matthew is also an RPC alumnus, and he's currently working as a consultant in Kochi. So over to you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthew. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist at Medical Trust Hospital in Kochi. I'll be basically speaking on the fundamentals of visual field interpretation. Uh, and the most common visual fields that we use regularly is the Humphrey visual fields. Humphrey visual fields can be better understood if we can divide into different zones and understand each of the zone one by one. Zone one actually deals with uh, the patient data. The date of birth has to be entered properly. So because the machine has to analyze the threshold values with a normative uh, database, which is there in the machine. So if that is not entered correctly, again, the analysis can go wrong. The secondly, the refractive error has to be uh, corrected properly and uh, also check for the strategy so that you have comparable fields uh, with if it is a CETA standard or CETA fast or supra threshold, whatever the strategy has been used. Now in zone two, you get uh, three main uh, parameters that is the fixation losses, false positive errors and false negative errors. Fixation losses, if it is more than 20 percentage, uh, the machine itself will show us that it is unreliable. The two X's will be marked. Uh, but in false positive and false negative errors, if it is more than 15 percentage and XX will, XX will be marked. But uh, uh, in false negative errors, even if it is on the higher side, actually you don't have to discard the fields. You can keep it in your follow-up fields because uh, many a times the glaucomatous patients with uh, who have advanced field defects show uh, high false negative errors. Uh, next thing is the fixation target that is uh, which will be shown as central or the fixation diamonds. If a patient has uh, difficulty in fixating in the central target, he can be given the low one. If you have high false positive errors, uh, definitely you'll have high threshold values and uh, the it will be a whiteout field on the gray scale. And if you have uh, high false negative, uh, it will be a cloverleaf pattern typically. Uh, zone three actually deals with the threshold values which has been measured by the machine and the gray scale, corresponding gray scale. Uh, these are the most important zones, uh, the zone four and zone five, which uh, uh, deals with the total deviation and the pattern deviation plots. Total deviation actually subtracts the threshold value which has been uh, measured by the machine from the normative database and gives a subtracted value. The pattern deviation actually uh, compares the points among themselves. It takes the seventh highest points and then 
subtract the rest of the values from the seventh house point and gives the subtracted value. So what benefit does this have is uh, the total deviation actually takes into account the uh, corneal blindness, uh, the cataract blindness, and the localized defects due to glaucoma. But pattern deviation actually can pick up the localized defects separately. So uh, for a glaucoma specialist, the pattern deviation plot will be a more useful one. And the lower, you can get the probability plots uh, also along with this. In zone six, we uh, deal with the global indices, which includes the mean deviation, pattern standard deviation, and the visual field index. Uh, mean deviation, usually uh, per year, you'll get a de uh, depreciation of uh, one decibel. And if it is more than that, then you can consider that it is a significant de uh, defect is there. And pattern standard deviation, if p-value is less than 5%, in fact, that also you consider it as a uh, glaucomatous field defect. The next important thing in this zone is the glaucoma hemifield test, uh, in which the machine actually divides the whole field into two hemifields, and you have five, five clusters of points in the upper hemifield and the lower hemifield, and uh, it compares them among each other. And then if the difference is significant, it will be either labeled as outside normal limits or borderline or uh, the other no within normal limits, etc. Zone eight uh, deals with the gaze tracker. Uh, if you have an upward uh, deviation, it shows that the patient has lost fixation. In this gaze tracker, you can see that the patient lost fixation uh, towards the end of the study. And if you have large de deviation downwards, it shows a blink. This uh, two are actually a, a visual field examination for just to understand. Uh, both of them are reliable fields. One is a 24-2, other one is a 30-2 with a CETA standard strategy. Uh, you can see that there are three contiguous non-edge points uh, which are which have p-value less than five percentage. Uh, the out, uh, GST shows the outside normal limits, and the pattern standard deviation shows less than five percentage. So this can be considered as a significant visual field defect. I emphasize once more: uh, a visual field defect is considered significant if you have an abnormal GST, uh, three or more contiguous non-edge points with p-value less than five percentage, and abnormal PSD with p-value less than five percentage. Uh, the other type of uh, field examination that you can do is the 10-2 where you have more of central points tested. Uh, in fact, much more than 24-2, more of points have been tested. Uh, in, in fact, if you want to add the 10-2 criteria also into the 24-2, you can do a 24-2C. So you can do get both the benefits of both the fields. Uh, now, this is all about uh, single field analysis, but if you want to do an uh, analysis, if the disease is progressing, then you have to take up uh, one of the progressive uh, programs. Uh, usually what I follow is the G GPA glaucoma progression analysis. Uh, in that, you'd need at least five tests to understand if the disease has been progressing. So uh, you'll have to, five tests means if you are doing it at an interval of uh, six months, you'll take around two years to understand whether the patient has been progressing. Now, in the first one, two, uh, two uh, pictures shows the baseline and the second picture shows the follow-up examinations. In these two uh, pictures, you will see that there are two different columns. One is deviation from the baseline has been shown and then a progression analysis is shown. It, it shows actually different types of triangles. One is half triangle, uh, half black triangle and a full black triangle and a white triangle. It shows how many times a particular threshold point is found to be defective in uh, one test or second two test or a third three test basically. So that can be found out with this analysis. And then you have a visual field index, which helps us to extrapolate the patient, how the patient is progressing. If so if the slope of the visual field index graph is steep, then you have to escalate your treatment because you, you don't want the patient to lose, lose more than 40% of the, uh, to end up less than 40% of visual field index. And uh, comparable to these fields, you have another field which is already in the market, uh, which is there, which is Octopus. Uh, it also has a similar strategies, they're just like HFM. Uh, one is the threshold oriented perimetry, dynamic perimetry, et cetera. TOP actually takes lesser time, just like CETA fast. And uh, dynamic strategy takes a little more greater time. Just like uh, HFA, you have uh, different programs in this, just like you say, 30 2 and 24 2. Octopus has G1, S, G2, M2, X, et cetera. Uh, M2 actually takes up more of uh, the central points will be analyzed more. And uh, I'm just comparing each of them to HFA. In HFA, you have a grayscale. This one also has a grayscale, but it's no more gray. It is colored actually. And uh, just like total division plot and a pattern division plot, you have comparison plots and corrected comparison plots. Now, a small difference which you can note in this that there are plus signs in the corrected comparison and uh, comparison plots, basically. They show that there is no significant difference between the normative database and the patient's threshold value. But if the numerical values are given, then uh, it shows that there is a uh, significant defect and 
depending upon the uh, defect, it, it, it can be even marked a black spot. The next thing that uh, Octopus gives specifically is a uh, Bebe's curve, which is very useful to find out if, if there is a localized defect. The patient A has a lo uh, localized defect and you can see that steep Bebe's curve, then other graph is within the normal limits in the patient B. Even uh, hemispheric defects or hemianopic defects, quadrantinopia, et cetera, can be found out with the steepness of the uh, Bebe's curve, as you can see the blue circle. If you have a diffuse defect, then you will have a Bebe's curve just parallel to the 95 percentage line, but without a slope. It is parallel to the 95. With the normal limits, it will be between 5 and 95. In addition to this, uh, Octopus also gives cluster and polar analysis, which can actually help you to actually match with the topographic analysis, whichever you are doing in your center. So to find out if the field defect is actually collaborating with the uh, disk features or RNFL features, which are there. Uh, with this, I would like to end. I'll, I wanted to talk about FDT, but I think the time is over. Uh, and uh, simple thing is when a swap is there, which is also similar to HFA, you can just understand the th things if you know the HFA, basic HFA itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthew, for uh, such a concise uh, sort of which, which <laughs> No, we do get, uh, uh, we have other options which are sending us. Thank you, Dr. Matthew, for uh, giving such a concise presentation on such a vast topic. Now, next, I would like to call upon Dr. Narottama Sindhu, who will, who will be speaking on pearls for optic nerve evaluation. So, ma'am is also an RPC alum, alumnus, and she is a glaucoma consultant working in Delhi. Ma'am, over to you. Good evening to all. I'll be speaking on pearls for optic nerve head evaluation in glaucoma. As we all know that glaucoma is a silent progressive, potentially blinding and everlasting disease. So the emphasis is on its early recognition so that we pick up cases at its early stage. But the problem is that there is no single test or clinical finding which is pathognomic of this disease. So we have to take clues from all possible means, starting from history, detailed examination and investigations to reach to the diagnosis of glaucoma. But we must keep in mind that most of the time, more than 90% of the times, the diagnosis of glaucoma is made on thorough optic nerve head evaluation. The investigations are done to confirm the diagnosis and to quantify the defect. Also, we know that the investigations in the form of fields or uh, scanning, it has to be correlated with the disc findings. So it is of paramount importance that thorough optic nerve head evaluation is to be done and this art has to be learned by each one of us so that we do not have false positive glaucoma cases, which is a huge problem as we already know. The first thing which I would like to impress upon is the moment you start seeing the disc or any disc you want to see, go with the notion that it has a glaucometer changes unless proved otherwise. So our intention to observe has to be 100% because the signs in early stage are so very subtle that it, they can be easily missed if we are not careful in observing. And of course, we should have a good observation power, which comes with experience. We all know that what it involves to have a systematic evaluation of optic nerve head, all these points needs to be looked at under the good favorable conditions and not just mentioning CD ratio, which unfortunately most often gets mentioned and that creates a confusion. So as we look at the disc, the most important thing is to have a mental makeup. What about this, about its size? Because we know that it's the size which governs its cup size. And we know that there is a positive correlation with cup size. It is very easy to discern the disc size looking at the scleral ring, which is elevated whitish as circular band. Now looking at the disc, whether it is small, medium, or large. And then we look and then comparing the cup as per to the disc size, we say whether it is suspicious or highly suspicious. So the guideline says that cup size more than 0.5 millimeter in a small, more than 0.6 in a medium, and more than 0.7 in a large disc should be labeled as suspicious and should be thoroughly looked into for possible signs of glaucoma. Do we really measure the size? No, we only estimate it, though there are, uh, th there are methods described to measure the size and we learn it by experience. It is important that we keep our observation techniques using the, micro, the slit lamp and the lens same so that we learn it faster. 
though the size is very easy to discern, but sometimes the presence of gray crescents create confusion and we should be wary of it. There are two different types of gray crescents, as you can see in these photographs. And one such patient, as an example here, which had a systemic risk factors for glaucoma was being treated for uh, glaucoma without probably looking at it thoroughly. And when we had a look, he basically had gray crescents, which was confounding the interpretation of the disc size and thus erroneously interpreting the whole of disc findings. He was immediately put off the treatment. The shape also matters because it governs the uh, applicability of ISNT rule, which we know is quite specific and sens sp sensitive for glaucoma damage. Now it is to be used only for a normal sized and shaped, uh, normal shaped disc that is vertically oval or circular and not for horizontal or tilted disc. Now coming on to the cup, I would say that the importance of cup is more in follow-up of the patient rather than for diagnosing because cup is ultimately a surrogate marker of the health of the rim and we should actually be focusing more on the rim and RNFL defects rather than on the cup for diagnosis. The another point which I want to highlight is that pallor area and the cup in a normal disc, they go hand in hand. You can say they are synonymous, but that is up to only in the normal disc and not in the diseased disc. How do we then discern the cup? We look at the kink in the blood vessels as they emerge onto the rim. That is the boundary of the cup and we should actually be looking at it to define the cup size. We know that large discs have large cups and they are always labeled as suspicious. But if you look at the cups being similar in both the eyes, it is more likely to turn out to be physiological than pathological and that we should keep in mind. This is one such example where a uh, young adult who, was, who had come to us for the fourth opinion for his glaucoma. He was found to have large discs with large cups and look at the very symmetrical type of a cup. And also note that this has gray crescent which probably was uh, making somebody misinterpret the findings. He was labeled as a normal physiological cup and fields also suggested so. So as I said that importance of the cup lies in the follow up because as the pro glaucoma progresses the cup changes it can change in any direction. Typically it is in vertical direction though we can have a concentric or temporal and nasal also. Now, coming on to the neuroretinal rim we have to look at its color which is normally pink in color. The pallor of the rim is not a sign of a glaucoma. If you see a pallor of the rim, think any other diagnosis but glaucoma. Width, especially neuroretinal rim less than one tenth of the disc diameter is highly suggestive of glaucoma. Presence of notch and rim erosion is highly suggestive of glaucoma. It should be uniform and following and the ISNT rule, but then it is not a sacrosanct, even in a normal shaped disc. And I'll show you a few examples in a while. Coming on to the RNFL, RNFL defect is the single most important finding which is suggestive of glaucoma whenever seen. But unfortunately, most of the time, no comment is usually made on it. And then it creates confusion in proper diagnosis. Here are a few uh, photos showing the RNFL defects. Most of the time we see wedge shaped defects which are narrow at the disc, towards the disc, always touching the disc margin and become wider as they move towards the periphery. They are commonly seen along the arcades, though we can have it at the papillomacular uh, bundle also, as shown in one of the photographs here. Now, let us look at the few examples where looking at the RNFL actually helped in making the correct diagnosis. This cup, somebody may say it's suspicious because of the asymmetry in size of the cup in a normal sized and symmetrical disc size with inferior thinning. But when you look at the RNFL, which is quite healthy and it uh, makes, uh, it, it takes no few seconds to say that it is normal variation. 
same way this cup looks suspicious especially with asymmetry between the two eyes and looking at the rnfl which are which is healthy we say that it is normal and fields also suggest so this is one such case which i recently saw who had come from rajasthan it was his again a fourth opinion for glaucoma who was being treated for joag since last 2000 uh, for last since 2014 now if you look at the disc the uh, cups are quite symmetrical large and appearing deep also he has a gray crescent but the rnfl is very healthy and hence he was told to withhold treatment and to be under observation sometimes when we have large rnfl defects like this we tend to look Uh, we tend to overlook other uh, rnfl defects like this but looking at these field defects here thinking that there must be some rnfl defect here and went back and picked up this rnfl defect which is a very small one so these small rnfl defects can get missed out and sometimes we go back after doing the fields and look at the disc again and pick up those same way here the field defects which is very close to the fixation will make you think that there must no, be some defect in the papillomacular bundle kindly continue yeah, sure. now disc asymmetric disc with asymmetric cups also pose a problem but in if you see our rnfl defects you know that this cup is also glaucomatous but rnfl defect is not very easy to be seen in all the patients and also they are seen in other few conditions hence we cannot solely depend on the presence of rnfl or possibility of rnfl defects uh, always thinking of the glaucoma coming on to the pph they can be as typical and as obvious as seen in the photographs and can be atypical in location as in the photograph here this is the old gentleman where we picked up the glaucoma based on this finding only and they can be as subtle and atypical in location as in here in the nasal side so one has to be very careful uh, in looking for the pph careful examination has to be done in all the cases but then they are not pathognomonic of this disease as we know that they are seen in many other conditions and when seen in a glaucoma patients it is always a sign of progression peripapillary atrophy we know alpha and beta beta being more specific for glaucoma and sometimes peripapillary atrophy can be the only sign of glaucoma like in this gentleman then there are few difficult disc myopic disc and for myopic disc the dictum is all myopic disc should be considered as glaucomatous unless proved otherwise and should be carefully examined so once you've seen the disc should we draw or take a photograph i i would say that do both because drawing makes you look more carefully about the features but you should also draw uh, take a photograph whenever available this is the learning from our study which has found out that 87% of the patients with this hemorrhage were based on the clinical findings and take away message is that meticulous and methodical image disc examination is the only way to diagnose glaucoma cases properly and it will help reduce the problem of over diagnosis of the glaucoma thank you for your kind attention thank you ma'am for your insightful talk and now it's an honor to invite dr harsh kumar sir who is a renowned glaucoma surgeon in delhi and uh, he has been a uh, professor in uh, alpha center and uh, he will be giving us pearls on clinical updates in glaucoma management and he loves teaching that that will be evident as he talks thank you for promoting me actually i was additional professor but thank you so much <laughs> i couldn't achieve that on through my life and also to say uh, sir will give us a very lively and interactive <laughs> talk can't wait to listen to this sir <laughs> okay so this is just a potpourri of small things uh because i had some indication what will be the situation so uh, just a few things here and there so obviously the first thing which is rocking for all glaucoma surgeons now is rock inhibitors because all of us sitting on the dais and i guess all of you are sick of doing surgeries and uh, so this is a really good drug in our armamentarium and uh, obviously it has got triple mechanism increases fluid outflow reduces epidural venous pressure and through the net inhibition reduces the aqueous production so basically two things netarsodil repasodil uh, netarsodil is better as far as od this thing is concerned and uh, it is also rock plus net inhibitor whereas repasodil classically is only a rock inhibitor and uh, the problem is that they are vasodilators 
but and you can end up with situations like this but the lucky part is that i think most of us are using only when nothing much is, else is left to do so patient se kaho ke bhai surgery karni hai kehta nahi yaar ye chalne do lali ho rahi hai to koi baat nahi you know so in the end it you are okay with these kind of things as far as patient can tolerate it and we are very happy because classically they say that obviously you can get cornea verticillata you can get even microcystic edema but the moment you stop the drug it disappears and the beauty is that despite being on 3 to 4 drugs i don't know what your opinions are i do see further lowering of at least 3 to 4 mm so that is really fantastic for all of us so it does help us to dis- yeah exactly right so it is irreparable for endothelium also as a matter of fact if anybody ask me ki sir ye pseudofecal bullous keratopathy hogi aur ye usme pressure bahut high hai to kya do to bhai this is one of the drugs of choice because it will help you to heal the uh, cornea as well so it is really a good thing for us uh, another i'll just tell you I, i see so many times the pressures are high and the people are jumping okay let me give dimox two tablet four times a day six times a day so actually he is treating the doctor is treating himself not the patient so he just want to give everything but then uh, when i was reading through i realized that giving more than 1 gram is only going to increase nausea and vomiting both for the doctor and the patient so it is not advantageous to give that be careful only 250 mg qid is all you want one thing which has really changed my practice and 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 so many of my friends once i have told that is giving low dose dimox i always used to laugh at these kind of things and thought it was you know it's kind of a joke what the hell this uh, this homeopathic dose but i realized that if you keep lft kft normal electrolytes are okay nausea git upset are are under control then there are lots and lots of patient one eyed small field who do not want to undergo surgery you do not want to do surgery and they will get controlled on dimox bdt id half tablet so that really does wonder and how i got the idea was that when i read the paper of katayama who was using it in as anti convulsant in children for as long as 14 years so i thought why not and i really tell you it has done wonders for us so just keep it at the back of the armamentarium please don't tell it to your pg teacher or something like that in exams but this is just a pearl for your practice how my second line has shifted once you are done with uh, <coughs> pg analog and temolol then what else to add so invariably i used to add brimonidine and i must say what the companies do is to brainwash you so well that i thought ha bhai yeah this is a neuroprotector and it has got more lowering than uh, ci inhibitors so let me use this as a second drug then i realized that what is happening is 33% of those people get into allergies and there is also a paper which says very clearly that if they get allergy to brimonidine they'll get allergy to other drugs also so what nonsense yaar and then later i realized that it doesn't even work in night so uh, so many additional things this was taught to us by other companies so <laughs> so <laughs> the companies really do good for us keep teaching things against each other so we can shift out what we want so uh, how so now uh, it is quite pretty much proven that if you take brimonidine and timolol combination and instead of brinzotimo then you realize that the nocturnal diurnal variation control is so much better with brinzotimo because brinzo or darzox both are acting in the night but uh, timo is not acting and obviously travo any all the pg analogs are acting and we do know the advantage of combinations and again the original uh, combination that we use was uh, dorzox timolol combination but as invariably i bet everybody of you has faced this the moment you put dorzolamide they'll say are sir so many singing kya hai dalte hi bura haal ho jata hai obviously that also means that you have not taught them punctal occlusion but so uh, putting brinzolamide timolol has really helped us there because of the ph value and the efficacy is pretty much the same and uh, the <laughs> adherence is so much better another thing that i want to tell you is that the uh, yag laser peripheral iodotmine primary angle closure suspects now there are millions of primary angle closure suspects in india and initially we were so excited oh aa gaya chalo karo karo are bhai there are going to be so many side effects of doing that ps uh, uh, pi 
that we realized that what was happening was some of them uh, were going high on the pressure and um, five years down the line, they will develop cataracts, whereas they had nothing really. Most of them will not go into an acute attack. So, uh, so we have gone down, at least I have gone down and a number of my friends have gone down on that. So if there is gonexopoly, PACS, family history is positive, patient is one-eyed, will need repeated dilatation. There is a history of IOP elevations, female 40 high probes, halos around light. Then you think about doing it. Otherwise, don't jump into it in doing it. I think this has been already taken. I will not do this. Pregnancy, please, every lady which comes to you, sorry, every young girl that comes to you, 18 and above, please write on the card. If you conceive, stop medication. You could be in serious trouble because we end up seeing so many girls whom other people, even I sometimes realize I didn't tell them this. And they then go off, they get married, they are having glaucoma, they never tell anybody and the kid is born and you will be very, very thankful that there's no deformity. The only drug possible is, uh, PG, uh, we do know that it is brimonidine, ALT, SLT, yes, beautifully possible. And uh, but near lactating again, brimoridine must be stopped because we all know that if it goes into the kid's bloodstream, it can even kill the kid. So we don't want that kind of a thing. And whenever you are uh, there's a progressive damage, you are not able to understand. Check the perfusion pressure. Check 24 hour BP. Check that he is not doing water drinking four liters of water in the morning. Curtsy Ramdev ji and uh, Shri Shasan and all that plus sleep apnea. These are the things that we are missing out. And please, in the end, explain to the patient. I get so many patients who have never been told what is glaucoma. They are putting medicines for five years. What is the schedule for follow-up? Nobody has been told that you have to come every two months for pressure check, every six months for field. This thing, punctal occlusion, I beg to say that every prominent institution in the country, patients come to me day in, day out. None of them has been taught punctal occlusion. None means none. <clears throat> so that is the state of affairs. And please stick with them for two minutes. Tell them that you are here to, they are there to be healed, not for that parcha over there, which you write 10 medicines on. Tell them if you come to me regularly, I promise you that you'll be all right and you lose no more vision. That is the single most important line. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk and sharing all your practical yeah. aspects. Yeah. 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 Uh, sir, actually, uh, the letters would be, we are using since six months to one year. Right. Okay. So, uh, in my observation, letters would be, uh, actually, I am not uh, taking it for trial. But in my observation, I'm not looking at the reduction of pressure. Success. The reduction of pressure. So, are so, you using it as a first line, second line, no, third no. line, fourth line, for, which line? For, for trial, ah. when I had doubt, I started in ocular hypertension, like 24, 26 millimeter mercury. No, no. First line, it is not a drug for first line. Okay. For ah. some patient, I've tried, but ah. uh, you are saying that after three to four drugs. Actually, ocular hypertensives, you know, many of the ocular hypertensives actually do not require medication. For them, 26 pressure may be normal. You understand? If, the, if you start any other so, medication, they, it may not come down that much. Oh, but sir, but we have right, in uh, ocular hypertension treatment study. But anyway, forget that part. Uh, the What you are saying is right to some extent because I have been, I had initially started on Ripasudil quite a bit. And they, that gave me a little better uh, lowering than Netarsudil. But let us check with other people because my experience. Uh, is that yes, I am saying that. So, so basically, uh, what he's trying to say is that, that, is that not a I, big... IOP reduction yeah. never happened. That's what no, he says. In half. Yes, so yes. Good uh, uh, not, good, not good enough. And even after uh, what you are saying, no, three to four medication you have started. In that case, we are also starting. Because before surgery, what left? The last is Netarsudil nowadays. No? Yeah. So in that cases also, I am saying my experience. I will give yeah, it a trial, yeah. but uh, I am not looking into a favorable result. No, but our let, letter, I will say. Can I say something? Because yes, sir. Thick, then also some drugs do not act. Oh. So if you look at the ocular hypertensives, the thick corneas, and you're giving them drugs, even single oil prostaglandins also sometimes do not show effect. Why, so why, it, sir? It, we don't know. Either it's lack of penetration or it's something to do with the way IOP is being measured in these eyes, but the, the, the corneal malleability also, there's so many other factors. So, therefore, there is a possibility that if the corneal is sick, none of these drugs is acting. But that is one point. Maybe. The second point, 
we are very right that that the efficacy of the drugs may not be as drastic as a, as a prostaglandin. So if you expect the no, no, I am not uh, expecting as a prostaglandin, it expecting as a timolol. Ah, it will not. Uh, yeah, but uh, I just it shared it my experience. I will say after some months again, I will come with. I add to this. In my experience, nitarsidil works better in secondary glaucomas rather than primary glaucomas. Okay. And it is a drug to be used when the uh, even the baseline pressure is in the lower side, like 18, 20 pressure. You're looking at something like. Uh, advanced glaucoma and you want to further lower, lower yeah. it down it can really bring the pressure down to 10 12 but very selective cases okay. and we really don't know which patients will react to it okay. so and APK glaucomas see. they are really behaving very nicely for those with high cct and we are saying that there is a borderline cases and the mm. pressure may not come down beyond 22 24 especially children it really works wonders so okay. mainly in secondary glaucomas so you can always try Otherwise, yes sir yes sir really actually i am in experimenting, experimenting mode that's why I've tried in uh, some uh, initial cases. Okay, thank you. Okay, next I would like to call upon Dr. Vineet Sagal, who would be speaking on progressing patient and role of early step up. Thank you, ma'am. And it feels great speaking in front of my mentors. I just want to tell you, I was the resident of Shikha ma'am and Devang ma'am when they were SR. And uh, uh, then her sir is not just like a mentor, like a father figure to me and same with the Vinay Gupta sir. So the topic given to me, glaucoma progression, role of early setup, uh, I think everything, most of the things is covered, just coming straight to the point that uh, what is happening is as the glaucoma advances, the quality of life goes down. So we do not want to see a patient in an advanced glaucoma. We want, if even if the patient is coming to our OPD, he should remain in early glaucoma or maximum to maximum in moderate glaucoma. No one wants an advanced glaucoma patient in the OPD. And we have different type of patients. Some patients who are having a, a low rate of progression, they may be good for us. And we do not actually want a patient who is a young patient and uh, having a high rate of progression. So what we can do now? Uh, I think Shalini ma'am have covered most of the things that I would be telling now that whenever you see a patient, you see the what is the IOP level before the treatment? You see, see the stage of glaucoma, rate of visual field progression, what is the age of the patient and life expectancy? And you basically make your target IOP according to that. Whenever you are making a target IOP, you should be having these factors in your mind, the corneal thickness, the family history, always, always do as her sir always tell me, do a gonioscopy in this patient. Take the IOP yourself, applanation tonometry. Do not basically over depend on a tree. See any pigment dispersion or pseudo exfoliation and very important, any other systemic diseases. So once a rate of progression is established, you can basically then start the, uh, you can basically change your treatment. What would be your first line of therapy? The first line of therapy in your open angle patient should be the one which has the greatest chance of highest IOP reduction which should be the most affordable and it should be having a minimal frequency with a minimal concentration. This I want in my first uh, PG, uh, in my first treatment that I should give to the patient. Now, what are our options with this? So lot of, lot of things in our armory. Now I would basically start with a PG analog and why I would start with the PG analog because it has the highest systemic safety once a day dose and highest probability to reach the target IOP. Talking about the bimetoprost, it has the high, it has higher IOP reduction as compared to Timolol. And you can see that even in the patients who have who were earlier on the other PG analogs or other drugs, if we, if we switch over them to bimetoprost, we have got a bit of more IOP reduction as compared to the other drugs. Though hyperemia is a very, very important uh, uh, side effect of this drug and many patients complain of the hyperemia, but I have seen that the hyperemia is more with the 0.03% concentration as compared to the 0.01% concentration. Still, I would say the highest IOP reduction would be in those patients who are basically started on a bimetoprost as compared to those who are switched from the other drugs to the bimetoprost. Now, if we basically see that this bimetoprost not only basically decreases the IOP, it also has been shown that it basically increases the ocular perfusion pressure. Very controversial subject. We would talk about this later. 
and then we basically compare it with other PG analogs and we see that there is almost the same efficacy of all the PG analogs, but few of the studies says that the bimetoprost is giving a bit of more higher IOP reduction as compared to other. So I'm basically uh, making the la last slide here as that it has better IOP reduction as compared to the beta blocker, better IOP reduction throughout the day provides IOP reduction, even in a switchover patient. And it's also basically having a highest IOP reduction among the various PG analogs. So the second uh, section of my slide is on the fixed dose combination. We prefer a fixed dose combination when we are not able to basically maintain a target IOP with one drug and in a fixed dose combination. If we combine a PG analog with a beta blocker, we are basically combining a Sachin Tendulkar with a Virendra Sehwag and we have the best opening partnership. And here also, if we basically see almost everyone have the same amount of IOP reduction, but few studies says that yes, the, if you combine it with the bimetoprost with the Temolol, the total amount of IOP reduction is more though there may be a bit of more hyperemia, but these patients basically have almost similar type of profile as we basically see in the ocular surface. So there was a great trial and great trial. What they have seen is that latinoprost timolol combination. They, if the patient is not having the IOP reduction uh, or uh, over the target IOP, they changed it to the Trav uh, travoprost with timolol or bimetoprost with timolol. And they have seen that the bimetoprost with timolol has higher IOP reduction as compared to the other category. So with this, I end my uh, slides with the last two slides to achieve the effective IOP reduction. We need to provide the treatment with appropriate balance in terms of mean reduction of IOP from baseline PG derivatives are the best. So bimetoprost is the new, uh, I'm not saying that it's new. It's uh, quite older now uh, is a first line uh, option. And we have the same amount of IOP reduction with the bimetoprost 0.01 and the bimetoprost, bimetoprost 0.03. And if you are not able to get the target IOP with one drug, you can always have a fixed dose combination with the bimetoprost with them all. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Vinny, for finishing well in time. Any questions? For yeah. Uh, so, would you, uh, given a general patient, would you like to start on uh, a PG analog like Latanoprost or now they are Latanoprost RT type of things, which are supposedly not yes, uh, not for uh, you know they won't have a cold chain, otherwise you were scared of the cold chain. Or would you give a lumic uh, this thing? Sorry, by metoprost. Sir, uh, the thing is that if there is even a small amount of hyperemia or something ocular surface if we issues in the patient, I would definitely go with a latinoprost or a tefluprost in that patient as compared to a bimetoprost. Bimetoprost, I am using, let's say, patient comes 40 pressures, young patient on no medication, 0 0.9 cupping. I, I just want by anything I want of 15, 14, then I would have my best batsman in that. So then we would go with the bimetoprost with uh, dorzolamide, with timolol, with nitrosodal. I just want it to as low as possible. So any fussy patient in the practice, any elite patient goes for? Yes. Sir, elite to elite. Yes, sir. We are all elite. <laughs> so thank you, Vinny. Next, you. I invite Dr. Neha Mitha. She has been an uh, illustrious um, JR as well as SR at RP Center. And she's a budding entrepreneur now. Uh, she's setting up her own glaucoma practice. And this is what she's going to share us how to set up a good glaucoma practice. Over to you, Neha. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you so much to all the faculty members and chairpersons for having me here. It is indeed a great pleasure. And also before I start this, it's quite, I'm quite a novice to be giving this talk in front of Dr. Harsh, Dr. Devain, Dr. Narotma. I'm a very beginner in setting up. Nee, nee, up a... <laughs> 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 nice, <sir. laughs> so hello, I am Dr. Neha Midha, and I am director and founder at Avantika Eye Care and Glaucoma Services and Tetra V Super Speciality Eye Center. So uh, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge my teachers who have made me this capable enough uh, to be giving this talk today. And although your photographs are not here, ma'am, but uh, whatever you have taught us as senior residents uh, was amazing. So coming to the presentation, what all do you need? So I'll be talking about each of these as we go. So first of all, it's knowledge. 
you have to be master of your subject if you are trying to uh, you know start a specialty practice it is extremely important to feel confident within to be a master of your subject and that confidence to reflect outside initially when you start establishing yourself as a glaucoma person you will get a lot of tele consultations you know your a uh, senior call, senior ophthalmologist would call you discuss their patients would want an opinion rather than referring to you they would want an opinion over the phone i feel as a beginner don't hesitate to share your knowledge feel free educate your colleagues about it whenever a new drug is launched in the market any new laser is being talked about people will start giving you calls how is this performing where are you using this drug so i feel do not hold it to yourself share it and reflect that you know how how updated you are about your subject next comes networking so networking is extremely important once you step out of your institute it is important that the area you are trying to establish yourself meet the general ophthalmologist senior a comprehensive ophthalmologist meet even physicians who have good roaring practice tell them about glaucoma about your practice and also meet your colleagues who are themselves into sub specialty uh, practice don't shy away we as doctors are not very good at networking i feel meeting just once and showing your face it's not enough for anybody to realize that how passionate about you are about your subject and how sincere and how dedicatedly you want to uh, practice your specialty you need to meet more than once always believe in the concept of givers gain so you have to give referrals to get referrals if you keep giving anti vegf to patients of macular edema who are walk, uh, walking into your clinic you are the, your colleagues will also continue to prescribe rimonidine and timolol combination so you have to give them referrals if you want to establish a specialty practice finances obviously this is the most important so uh, whether you are into corporate or you are into multi speciality hospital or a stand alone or a group practice the amount of finances obviously come uh, are huge when you are into your own practice so uh, apart from your running costs that includes your rentals your salaries your uh, uh, electricity bills you need to have certain equipments your basic would be application and a gonioscope a visual field a machine and a oct so a setup with all diagnostic facilities are more likely to get referrals if a doctor a sends a patient to doctor b who is a glaucoma specialist and if doctor b sends a patient to doctor c for getting fields and oct done the doctor a won't be happy and the chances that he would refer you again would be less so coming about funding for these machines either you have a backup from the family or banks these days are a very good option i have recently had a very good experience getting loans for doctors isn't that difficult now you don't you do not need to mortgage your property or something like that and whenever you are planning your practice you should be ready enough to have a backup of one year whether uh, for like you have to be able to be you know bear your expenses for one year before you are diving into this kind of a thing next comes ethical modes of marketing the power of social media is cannot be emphasized more i believe creating educational videos about glaucoma is really helpful it is the most organic way of growing your practice and uh, it is definitely a slow process but over years it will give you great returns and a opd full of glaucoma patients conducting cmes uh, you can invite people doctors in your nearby areas optical people of your nearby areas educate them about your subject getting funding for educational activities is not difficult then coming to honest practice the patient who was referred to you for glaucoma you have to refer it back for cataract if you want to do all the things and eat all the makkhan it is not going to work that way so and and i want to emphasize here for example if the husband was sent to you for glaucoma and later the wife develops cataract i would recommend send it to the doctor to the cataract specialist or the anterior segment specialist who had sent to you otherwise when they will go and they will come to know oh i sent for a glaucoma and the wife has been operated for cataract there only then again it uh, the honesty somewhere breaks down so refer the patient back and then known ones as well you can find me here thank you so much thank you neha neha the mortgage may come later you know <laughs> yes when the practice collapses the mortgage will come later right i tell you something yeah. i i i take these lectures in small small city yes sir but in indore i was so shocked and then i kept this name indore model 
what they did was 12 ophthalmologists got together mm -hmm. and then you have to give only 5-5 five, five lakhs yes. and you get all. So you didn't take that model. Yes, That yes, is yes. one of the finest models yes. where people get together, take a neutral place right. and then just everybody can just book. There's one assistant oh, over there that really works well. Yeah. No way you can pay back these huge, huge machines, their AMCs. And these companies will keep launching higher models just for the heck of it. Yes. And then buying machine also, you have to do a group thing. That he has, you have to know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And company, you have to call the companies for zero EMI. And yes, yes. Payment. Really they easy. are doing a lot and these days. Yeah, group practice is very difficult. I mean, mm. there are very, very rare successful models of group practice. Oh, yeah. In group. We have started one now. Let's hope so. Yes. How it goes. <laughs> that is the best, sir. <laughs> that is the best form of group practice. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Next, thank next you. I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Devan Tuli, who would be speaking on neovascular glaucoma management. So, uh, sir, this is a little debatable topic. Hard, sir. Hard, sir. sir. Uh, debatable topic. So, I've kept it in a kind of a question answer situation after the two slides. So it's a refractory glaucoma and recently, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of the lack of treatment during COVID, we've seen an uptrend in NBG in our practice. And the common causes, uh, diabetes, vascular occlusions, uh, inflammatory, inflammatory uh, perivasculitis, uveitis, and ischemia. So always the dictum has to be treat the primary cause first. Whenever possible, this should be the dictum. So in diabetes, of course, we know what the treatment would be. So lower the uh, the, control the sugar, hypertension, IOP per se can be a cause for vascular occlusions and take care of the inflammation alongside. So once this treatment part, the primary cause is taken care of, let's see the situation number one. So one would be the IOP of course is high, the cornea is clear and the retina has yet not been treated. So we would uh, give the anti-glaucoma medication as appropriate. I'll come to that in the next slide. And uh, we try to give anti-VEGF, PRP, or both. And usually anti-VEGF followed by PRP would be the best sequence. So, sir, anything to add to this situation? Does the IOP lower down uh, normally? Yeah, so yeah, it does, it does, because probably this is still, the angles are still open. So in the open angle stage? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, percentage of patients will very, very, very less, less, very less, yeah, I but still. By the time they're reaching us. Yes, so, so, but just for completeness, sir, this was one. The, the, the what anti glaucoma medications? I think the first line amongst the eye drops, brimonidine, timolol, topical CAIs, and the rokinase inhibitors. Uh, we try to use prostaglandins a little later, if possible, in the course, because usually the inflammation is associated. And uh, myotics, uh, you don't want to use initially because obviously the patient will need treatment for retina. So dilatation is required. Also, it adds to inflammation. Also, ancillary treatment should be uh, like topical steroids and cycloplegics are a must in these cases. So the situation number two is uh, the cornea is hazy and it's hazy enough. And the retina thankfully has been treated. So I'll, I'll divide it into two, retina treated, and the lower part will be retina not treated. So cornea is hazy, retina has been treated. Probably this is now on the verge of uh, angle, uh, the grade four NBG where the angles are getting zipped off. And in this situation, uh, uh, this is where, sir, I would need the input from everyone. Glaucoma surgery is one option because obviously the cornea is hazy, so the IOP is high, you need to do treatment. And when I say this, obviously the anti-glaucoma medication is not enough, as Shikha was pointing out in the last one. So uh, what we follow, sir, rubiosis has regressed enough because of retina treatment. So there are no significant obvious NVI, then a trap could be considered. If there is still significant residual rubiosis, uh, I think we consider a shunt. This would be one situation where you could consider a primary shunt. There is a large cluster, sir, will agree, there's a large cluster of general ophthalmologists in Delhi who are now jumping straight to doing DLCP and micropulse. And uh, this could be done alone, or a lot of them are actually doing a priming first to lower the pressure, the way, such that the cornea clears up. 
and that could be a priming for glaucoma surgery. So this is where, sir, I wanted inputs before I go to the next. Shikha, uh, sir? No, fair enough. I think that is well said. Uh, I think classical choice should be <coughs> classical choice should be to do a parasynthesis. If you have to do a uh, anti vegf get the reviews yeah, down. The last part. Uh, and three days later, you can yeah. go ahead and do this thing. Whether the cornea, the retina is treated or not, that would be number one. If fair. you can get the rubiosis down and a trap seems feasible, do a trap. Otherwise, there's no choice but to do a shunt. And if you are not capable of doing either of them, then please, then definitely, I think we should not put those people down. I think doing micropulse and uh, diode may hold on the things for quite some time. Thanks, how long? How long? Oh, no, they, they refer to Dr. Vinay Gupta. <laughs> Beneath, or beneath. Or so anti has to be repeated at significant Yes, yes. I'll just, I'll, uh, that disclaimer will come in the end. Yeah. But for now, uh, beneath the, you do a lot of micropulse primary. So, so. Only particles in these cases, I have seen uh, 15 or 20 cases. Uh, they, they don't hold on, yeah. They don't hold on, yeah. So, it's a, just a, let's say, patient is uh, from a place where there's a COVID death zone or something. Fair, fair enough, yeah. That's basically, maximum one. Person. Yeah, so, so, but you should also so tell the cost of the micropulse for the patient. Yeah, so I think. Uh, yes. How much you are charging, Vinny? What? The cost. How much I cost think they charge about. <laughs> We have micropulse here, Devang. We have micropulse here. All right. So just to continue and keep the interest of time in mind. So the last situation or the subset of situation two is the cornea is steamy hazy and the retina is not being treated. So this is probably the patient has come much later. And this, as sir said, that doing the paracentesis and uh, releasing the pressure, giving an anti vegf works pretty well here. And usually, yes, you can continue with, as the cornea clears, you can do the uh, PRP also as a follow-up. And if still it doesn't work, then of course, a shunt. Now, the same thing would follow the, because ruby, the retina is not being treated. Obviously, the rubiosis is significant, so a uh, shunt is good. And uh, uh, this would be the third situation is an IOP is of course high of glaucoma. So uh, there's a vitreous hemorrhage or there's a, uh, this thing, uh, media opacity is vitreous hemorrhage. The, the new vessels are bled and the retina obviously is not being treated. So, or has not been adequately treated. That's why the VH is there. So in this regard, sir, uh, uh, still we can do the paracentesis, give an anti vegf and follow it, follow it up with a VR or with an endo laser. If the VH is going to settle by itself, yeah, of course, we wait for the anti vegf effect and then they are saying, but I love posterior valves, you know, because the entire focus shift to the retina chap, not to us. Yeah, so, so, so you, can, you can do the whole thing, they can do the endo laser also at the same sitting, same sitting, yeah, okay. So, so probably I should have same sitting, same sitting, same sitting, you do the valve by all the patient points. So, part sir is uh, sir does a lot of part spray insertion of but once the vitrectomy has been done, so sir does that actually. If, no, fake, yeah, fake, 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 fake. So, three surgeries could be combined. Yes, so yes, that is yes. the problem in India because most of these patients are fake. Yes. Yeah. So that way, uh, not, not on it. Yeah. Yeah. That way. Uh, yeah, but you're right. Hmm. If, if you have Absolutely. to do, then you have to do. From fake, fake, and then shunt doesn't remain an option. So I think just, case. just uh, thank you everyone for uh, the improving the slide. So it should be anti wedge possibly a VR uh, endo laser, and we can add a caveat here with 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 a ddd uh, as a as a combined procedure in the same and of course uh, uh, doing a, a same thing micropulse or a dlcp would be an option here we can do an arc alongside and let's hope the vitreous assemblage clears anything else to add to this sir? arc if you can't yeah. read the yeah. yeah so anything else to add to that sir besides the ddd combined that you said no, no, ARC. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, okay. CPC, no, CPC and arc sir wo reh gaya tha, but uh, this is just to complete that <laughs> So uh, the management, just the last slide, please remember that whatever you have done, whatever I've talked about in the last three situations, whatever has been done, you still need a close follow-up. They will still need a multi-pronged management, including retina, including further glaucoma, including a, a qualified success for surgery. A lot of these will need uh, anti-glaucoma medication also. 
and uh, anything else uh, so i would like to add one point that uh, uh, especially in neovascular glaucoma we need to act very fast yes so that was the last thing like i wanted a, to say uh, versus yes. like a normal patient so the window is wait for the response yeah, to come window. we have to be acting very fast if we want to do surgery do it immediately don't wait for the laser to the laser effect to come if surgery is required yeah whatever is required i think it should be fast so it should be fast and also we get probably a window of 2 to 4 weeks yeah, maximum that. and as as we had said so we need to be very quick in this and uh, uh, the thing is that whatever we do if we, we counsel the patient that you are not going to get uh, do, we cannot do wonders to your uh, lost vision but i think we can control the pressure quite a bit now with yeah. all these multi pronged things I think that should be okay, sir. And lastly, sir, systemic control is one yeah, thing which that, patients don't. वो मैंने सबसे पहले स्टाइल हो रहा है. Treat the primary cause. वो को तो caveat पहले ही बोल दिया मैंने. So for the benefit of the residents yes. who would be listening yes. to this talk, just summarizing what you and yes. sir has already said that in a case of NVG, we do not wait for the retina to be lasered or unlasered, the effect to come, or to treat the vitreous hemorrhage first. Our first priority is controlling the IOP. If the uh, only the vitreous hemorrhage is treated by vitrectomy, it may lead to chronically high pressure, and the patient may lose vision over time. Shikha, so, how much pressure is okay for you? So vitrectomy is actually no, no. Uh, I'm just saying that you say because there are a lot of people who say that thirty to point gap. So that is that sh- that is not acceptable. We should not okay. let the patient so go for vitreous surgery alone. No, no, no. Stage. I'm just asking you if the pressure is thirty. And they are able to do uh, the PRP and all that. Yes, sir. Are you ready to wait, or are you going to jump only above forty? What sir, is what is your pressure, line of uh, thing? Thirty pressure with or without? Is he responding to medications with thirty pressure, no, or is no, after no, medications? That is maximum pressure on medication is thirty. What is your alarm uh, cut off rate? Sir, these are diabetic patients. So we, they are already compromised optic nerves. Right. Right. We have high to operate. The threshold is low for them. Yes. Very yes. They will go home and they will come blind in two or three weeks. We cannot. I mean, thirty so, pressure is is nothing. I mean, it's it's like we have to. So mostly act. these are. Unresponsive to medication. So uh, we need one question: Is like how many percentage of your patients would respond respond to micropulse? Like also NVG patients or NVG? NVG. What percentage would respond to micropulse? That means fifty percent would not have any effect. Sir, fifty. Even transient, sir, is asking. Uh, uh, even transient. Even fifty percent of the patients. Do not respond to the microbursts. Not only in neovascular glaucoma, sir. Any type of secondary glaucoma. Will not respond. Ah, fifty percent of the patients. But particularly neovascular glaucoma, I think the response rate is much lower. It's not I... even fifty percent. Okay, ma'am. I, that is what <laughs> again the key point here is micropulse is not uh, taking so care of the, any vascularization. The thing is that it's so it's that not doing. It just it's a it's a just a transient procedure. Just because the neovascular will continue and the patient will come with even higher pressures. So right. so the thing is that it is only a saving grace. That now last me, he will say that I will not do it. Now what will I do? So nothing. So that is. The, Only that you have to tell that it may work, it may not work, it may 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 work for one week, two week, three week, four week, six weeks maximum. So unlike an ARC, micropulse is not a substitute here. It's not a substitute. It's not a substitute. Not it's not a substitute. But ma'am, in some cases it works. Um, even we cannot expect that. It is good that you told that because most of the practitioners think still that it is a panacea. No, that is. Uh, 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 this is over. So. Okay, sir. Now let, next, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Bhagwat Nayak, who is an RPC alumni and is now working as an assistant professor in AIMS Bhubaneswar. He would be speaking on post-traumatic glaucoma. Bhagwat, over to you. Good afternoon, uh, sir, uh, respected faculty, dear colleague, and my seniors uh, there, and residents. Uh, So it is a great opportunity to me uh, to give a talk on this auspicious day. So I'll start with uh, this uh, this uh, post-traumatic glaucoma is a really discussed topic. So I'll start with a case: a 50-year-old lady uh, presented with blunt injury with a cow horn to left eye. On examination, IP of 22 millimeter mercury after three days with total hyphema. So uh, we planned for hyphema drainage. And the bimineral irrigation aspect. The first post after then rebreeding occurs. Then we started with oral drainage and gas filter and then the BT. Then after three days uh, condition uh, after five days, this uh, they, uh, that uh, this five days that uh, hypermage cleared. But after three months, again the patient 
came up with 44 millimeter mercury circumcellular congestion in a goniscope that was 270 degree uh, the angle decision with all the medication, the IP is not reducing, so we planned for surgery. As a routine surgery, uh, but we, as a, it was a high risk cases, we planned for MMC and Ologen both uh, because many, many cases I do that uh, since seven to eight years. So it is a punishment considered flap uh, as uh, doing it. And uh, there's a four into four millimeter flap with uh, just uh, routine uh, that uh, subconscious uh, three minute. Uh, 0.04 percentage because it's a high risk and uh, with one minute sub uh, sub scleral. Then after age routine, uh, there's some suture, flap suture, and after that age is a high kick with uh, two eligible sutures, and uh, that after put collagen and uh, two wing suture with two uh, danger nylon and to matter suture and that finish. So I want to say that uh, this patient uh, needs uh, trabeculotomy with uh, mitomycin or ologen to reduce the IOP in the high risk cases. And the patient was well after first positive day with 9 to mercury AC was formed. And after three months, the patient was okay, good blab with IP 10 millimeter mercury, six months patient was following. Now the patient is six with 36 with heavy cataract, we will do surgery. So I want to say that uh, my layout presentation pattern of injury I'll discuss angle decisions, high femum, and because these two are closed associated with post traumatic glaucoma management prevention. So, post traumatic glaucoma, closed glaucoma injury, more than 55% in India, responsible open glaucoma injury also. I mean, chemical injury, especially the alkyl injury, as you know, that it is penetrated deep into the eye and is scarred the uh, trabeculum as well. So, it may lead to uh, secondary glaucoma. And in clo acute phase, closed glaucoma injury, high femur, traumatic aerodicyclitis, lens dislocation, subluxation salvage due to evil fusion, vitreous in the SC, and swatch master syndrome, et etc. are the uh, responsible for the acute phase. Close, uh, late phases, angle decision, peripheral antisynechy, ghost cell or khaki cells, due to vitreous hemorrhages, and the, some ongoing inflammation may be the responsible. Open angle as the pressure increases after once you are uh, post repair, either within one month, the causes are like uh, only more lens particle, inflammation, high femur. And later stage, that is synechy and the angle decision are the responsible factors. Coming to the angle decision, as you frequently discuss in the residency days, and it is a very uh, term like uh, it is a somewhat misleading as the research angle caused by country, not the cause of the glaucoma, but rather an indicator of significant trauma to the eye. So, what is angle decision? It is a uh, separate steer between circular and longitudinal fibers of the body. As you can see here, the <clears throat> The longitudinal muscle shield after the scale for and the white separation, and there is retro dispersion of the iris root. And it is one of the ring, as you discussed in the stage, this, seven rings, it is one of the ring angle decisions in uh, blunt trauma. If there is a one de 80 degree less angle decision, the uh, glaucoma is unusual. If more than 180 degree, up to 10% incidence of glaucoma, more than 240 degree, it is a high risk of glaucoma. And there are certain uh, uh, parameters uh, where the glaucoma increases, like if there is absence of cyclodialysis, as you know, there is cyclodialysis decreases the intraocular pressure, along with high baseline IOP, high FEMA, etc. They increase the chance of glaucoma in this angle decisions. Pathogenesis, it is as you know, the tabular mesophore dysfunction or scarring due to blunt trauma, or there may be collapse of sclerosis, you know, narrowing of sclerosis due to uh, loss of tension of sclerosis muscle in the sclerosis. And some say that a hyaline membrane has been deported to grow across the tabular mesophore. So management similar to POH with few special consideration like uh, topical accuracy present the main um, initial medical treatment. Prostangal has a controversial uh, role as it increases influence in acute phase. Repilocarb uh, reported to cause paradisical elision in IOP. Atropine has been reported to reduce IOP in angle decision glaucoma, uh, maybe due to some, uh, it has some inflammation uh, that we see this cyclopagic effect. So maybe tried in where there is conventional uh, medical management failing. Arachnoid laser trabecular pressure has poor results. NDA laser trabecular pressure, uh, trabecular puncture has a significant advantage over trabecular pressure. Ultimately, trabecular pressure with anti metabolites is the most effective at controlling IOP, as I have discussed in the case. So, uh, coming to the high FEMA, the next important topic closed the acidity. Angle decision may occur in 85% of cases of high FEMA, and approximately one third cases the IOP increases. And if there is a rebleeding, 60% of cases there is uh, angle sorry, glaucoma. And in these cases, 50, up to 60% cases have the damage to posterior segments. That's why it is crucial to evaluate the posterior segment and prognosticate according to the uh, according to this to the patient. 
Complications, glaucoma can be early or late complication, corneal blustering in hypema, uh, in this compromised endothelial function, larger hypema, rebranding, etc. You can see this, the corneal endothelial blustering, if you not clear the hypema in appropriate time, this may lead to like this uh, total loss of cornea. And uh, uh, rebranding, one of the uh, important thing, it, it critical time is two to five days. Uh, higher rebranding rates are actually larger hypema, young patient, black patient, etc. while taking aspirin. This is the one clot with this, again, rebranding. Treatment strategy, medical and supportive treatment uh, should be directed towards reducing the rebleeding rate, clearing the hypema. Surgery indicated for the eye pain not restrained to medical treatment. Our old, uh, like, old dictum was like eye pain more than 50 meters for five days, 35 millimeters for seven days to avoid obtaining damage. And if they 25 millimeters for five days with total or near total hypema. But nowadays, is there a medication, more medication has come. If the patient is not responding to the medications within 20 to 40 hours with the maximum three to four medications, you should go for uh, that is the hypema drainage or uh, like if required tabulatomy. And patient has sickle cell, disease or sickle cell trait, even the moderate uh, increase is like 25 to 30 millimeter mercury, you can uh, go for uh, hypema drainage. Surgery, as you know, the paracentesis with the antechamber was, or clot can be removed by Vicks expression or vitreotomy cutter, and ultimately tabulatomy with augmented or mitomycin C may require. So uh, my there should be a preventive strategy is, as it is a uh, post-trauma to uh, glaucoma, use of eye protective glasses while playing outdoor sports involving high-speed projectile prevent almost 90% of sport related injury, especially for the children. Unbreakable polycarbonate spectacles should be used by children if possible. Age appropriate toys should be given to the children with missile firing toy need to be banned. Helmet while playing cricket and driving motorbike because in your OPD, maximum. Any trauma patient you ask, 90% they don't use helmet. Chemical and spray should be kept out of reach of children. And at the last, playing with fireworks is totally discussed and safe holy practice holy is coming nearby uh, should be followed. So thank you uh, to my alma mater, RP Center, all National Medical Science, New Delhi, and now my working station is MC Bhuvan, sir. So thank you also. Thank you, Dr. Next, I would like to call upon Dr. Shikha, and uh, she would be talking on role of preservative-free medications in glaucoma. So it's the last talk of the session. I don't really want to bore you. I'll keep it short and crisp. So preservative ther th uh, free therapy in glaucoma. We all know that glaucoma is a chronic disease and long-term treatment is required, which may affect the patient's ocular surface. So there, with the increased use of medication, there are increased side effects, increased therapy cost, and of course, there is an inconvenience of treatment. 60% of medically treated glaucoma patients report ocular surface disorder, which has a major impact on the quality of life and drug compliance of the patient. So glaucomatous patients have to suffer from various um, symptoms related to OSD, like burning, itching, red eye, tearing, blurred vision, which may also result in decrease in the visual function and affect the patient's ability to work and function, which contributes to the worsening of the quality of life in these patients, also influencing compliance and adherence to treatment, which adds to the substantial social and economic burden of the patient. And therefore, the use of preservative-free contain, uh, preservative containing drops comes into picture. Preservatives, the role of preservatives is that it limits the growth of microbial within the drops, and therefore also prolongs the shelf life of the formulation. The major preservatives used are benzylconium chloride, which is present in 70% of the ophthalmic drops in concentrations ranging from 0.003% to 0.02%, and it has the maximum ocular surface disorder causing effect. The others which are safer are polyquaternium, SOC, sodium perborate, and the mixture of borate and uh, sorbitol. So these preservatives, other than having effect on the microbial cell surface, also has have effect on cornea, conjunctiva, and tear film. They can cause corneal epithelial damage, affect the corneal permeability. Similarly, in conjunctiva, they can cause goblet cell destruction and alter the tear film's composition, decrease cell number and viability of the cells in conjunctiva, and similarly, reduce the TBU, to le leading to dry eye symptoms in these patients. 
So BAK is supposed to be retained in ocular tissue up to seven days. The lipophilic nature of some preservatives causing them to bind to the ocular tissues immediately after topical application. And therefore, they are most likely to cause ocular surface disorder. And if the patient is having pre-existing dry eye disease, this is a case where they may have exaggeration of these symptoms after using the glaucoma medications. So when we look at the side effects of preservatives only, so it's not the active molecule in the glaucoma medications which is causing these side effects. In 83% of the cases, ocular surface disease is caused by the, uh, the uh, preservatives, 75% of the conjunctival inflammation, 71% allergic reactions, and almost 70% dry eye is caused by the preservatives rather than the active compound in the glaucoma medications. Also, other than the ocular symptoms, they may also lead to surgical failure by causing increased inflammation of the ocular surface just before surgery is conducted. And therefore, we need to look at reducing the number of drops the patients are using and look at preserved from uh, using preservative free formulations or safer preservatives than using BAK. So these days we have a lot of options available with us. Um, the advantage of preservative free, uh, free therapy is they improve patients' quality of life, elim eliminate the side effects affect, uh, related to the preservatives, prevent ocular surface inflammation, reduces patient complaints of ocular discomfort, is associated with better adherence and persistence, and improves the outcome of glaucoma surgery. So they are specially indicated if the patient has pre-existing ocular surface disease is receiving multiple therapy like in cases of glaucoma, elderly patients, pediatric and juvenile patients that have increased chances of non-compliance due to side effects, patients with medical risk factor before just before taking up the patient for glaucoma surgery, women and contact lens users. So now the standard is as far as possible, if there's availability, then we should switch to the preservative free formulations because the efficacy remains the same, but the side effects are reduced in these cases. So as we can all see that as a result of preservative free drops, patients complain less pain, discomfort, foreign body sensation, stinging and burning and significant amelioration of their symptoms if they are switched from the preservative, uh, preserved formulation to a preservative free formulation. And better tolerability of the symptoms. So a, a newer uh, uh, bottle system, which is available now in India, which, which, which can be made to use as preservative free system is the APTAR. This is a system in which there is no preservative and uh, there's a filter which filters the air which is coming inside. And as one drop is coming uh, here, there's a silver iron only, which causes the drop to be, uh, uh, to be sterilized. And it, is, it gives one drop as, uh, at a time. This is the system. And these portal system, if they are available, we can use preservative free drops for the patients. So these are totally preservative free and now it is available in India, this system. So the, to summarize, preservative free drops are the key components while treating a glaucoma patient over long term. Their efficacy remains unaltered, but the adverse effects are minimized. And if the benefit is available in the market, it must be shared with our patients. Thank you so much for the patient listening. Thank you, Shikha. That was wonderfully done. And uh, any questions to Shikha? So it has just it is to be launched with Cipla ah, in so Brimocom PF. Is all all their drugs they're going to make. Yes, so they are about to launch Brimocom PF, yeah. which is Aptar system. Yes. It's available. No, Balla, sir, I know we are getting into your time. Uh, now nowadays private practitioners get not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Comes to us. Shikha, sit in Dr. Bhalla. Yeah, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hello, okay. sir. Anyway, yeah, thank good you evening, very much, all the audience and all the participants, and uh, Shikha, Devang, and Anushma, and Vinay for being here, and uh, and uh, Dr. Tuli, Dr. All, all the speakers, all the speakers. and uh, <laughs> Madam Shalini. So, uh, I, we had a wonderful session. I, I also learned quite a few things, and really, very nice, Dr. Nayak also. You can wake up now. You did a wonderful job. We were saying you woke us up. So I would like to request all the chairpersons and the panelists. We can come and take a group photo. Yes. Backdrop. Lagado. Lokoma wala backdrop. Lagado.
All right, so thank you, Dr. Devang, uh, for conducting this uh, lovely session. Thank you, sir. Right, so meanwhile, you are taking your group pictures. For the upcoming session, I would request uh, Dr. Sitar Agarwal. Shalini. Doctor Bala sir. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening. All right. So, uh, Doctor uh, Tushar Agarwal will be with us in a very short moment. And we'll be starting the session soon. Can I share my screen? Uh, yeah, we can check if you want, sir. We can do the technical check. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. We, it is visible now. Yes, sir. All slides. <laughs> Yeah, Bala sir, you can stop sharing if you want. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yes, sir. <coughs> right, once again, do we have Dr. Tushar Agarwal with us? Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Tushar Agarwal, sir, are you at, in the hall? Hello? Yes, Bala sir. Sahab, this is Dr. Gopal Raju. Yeah, sir, yeah. None of good the evening, faculty. Dr. Gopal. How are you, yeah, sir? Yeah, fine, sir. Sir, none of the... Uh, moderators or chairpersons are here. I think we can start maybe or wait okay. for five minutes and then we'll start. Okay, okay. Whenever you say, sir. So for our panelists, uh, Dr. Vanathi, Dr. Nupur Gupta, Dr. Prafula Maharana, Dr. Lomi, Dr. Manpreet Kaur. And our moderator for the session is Dr. Tushara Garwal.
good evening ma'am thank you for joining in thank you good evening everyone and welcome to all of you to the 55th annual rpc foundation day celebrations now today we're going to have a very interesting session named fake emulsification simple to complex and i welcome all the speakers panelists and our chairpersons will be joining us soon so our first speaker today is dr js balla and he'll be speaking on perfect biometry can we do better sir over to you thank you thank you for uh, having me here i'll just do my uh, share my presentation yeah so uh, i really thank for giving me this opportunity to talk on the topic for presentation is perfect biometry can we do better see there are group of patients who greatly value their emetropia the surgeon breaks news to them that they require specs after cataract surgery they are extremely disappointed and what are the sources of prediction error for il power calculation elp prediction is accounts for 35% axial length 17% keratometry 10% so few subjects in the field of ophthalmology are as complex as il power formulas because it involves the help of mathematicians and optical engineers and we ophthalmologists uh, by nature are not very fond of mathematics there are hurdles in accurate estimation of effective lens position because older formula algorithm they worked on few assumptions and uh, assumptions were that shorter eyes and flatter the eyes were supposed to have shallow anterior chamber and shorter effective lens position in contrast to longer eyes and steeper the eyes which were supposed to have deeper anterior chamber and longer effective lens position but holiday told us that there are nine types of eyes even with normal anterior segment 80% may have axial hyperopia that is shorter axial length and 90% will have longer Uh, axial length and in patients with normal axial length 2% on either side may have short or large anterior segment size so the relationship between anterior segment size and axial length is not proportionate in 80% of the short and 90% of longer eyes so older formulae are bound to fall in short and long eyes and if we talk of short axial length we have two types of eyes 20% is nanophthalmic eye where the anterior segment is proportional to the smaller axial length and the it has deeper k shallower anterior chamber depth and these eyes require lesser io power in contrast to axial hypero which are 80% and they have perfectly normal anterior segment in spite of short axial length and they need a lens with more power the first parameter which is important for io power calculation is corneal power estimation and it can be measured with manual k auto k op scan optical biometry or the lens star and why there is difference between the keratometry reading of various instruments is because closer to the center if you estimate it gives you higher power and away from the center it gives you slightly lesser power because of the prolate shape of the cornea and this and so we have to know at what distance they are calculating manual keratometry estimates at 3.2 mm or to k at 2.6 mm corneal topo at 3 mm and the the second important uh, and this can be Uh, by other instruments also like pantacam galilei oct devices where the posterior corneal power estimation is also taken into account the second important variable is axial length and it is important to measure axial length correctly because one millimeter error in axial length estimation will lead to 2.5 diopter error in io power calculation it can be done with either immersion scan or is the is in vogue these days optical biometry and what if we compare immersion scan with optical biometry you will find that immersion a scan was is to fare better in darkly brudescent lens lens with uh, eyes with posterior subcapsular cataract having vitreous hemorrhages or where there is an ability to fix it and optical biometry definitely fares better in eyes with posterior staphyloma or silicon filled eyes or in children and advantages of optical biometry is that it the accuracy estimation is to the tune of 0.1 to 0.12 mm compared to 0.012 mm for optical uh, biometries and also optical biometry measures to the center of the macula optical me biometry measures to axial length from the corneal epithelium to brooks membrane rather than to internal limiting membrane as is done with ultrasound biometry there's no indentation and it is definitely much more superior in staphylomatous children or silicon filled eyes now if we come to the io power formulas we all know 
what are the, the regression formulas and theoretical formulas, but let's straight away jump to the modern formulas. And these are Hoffer H5, LADAS, Olsen, Barrett, Rook, Barrett, Universal, Hill, RBF calculators. Ray tracing calculations as particularly incorporated in formulas like Olsen, where the lens constant is not related to axial length and keratometry, but there are limitations of ray tracing formulas because ray tracing formulas still depend on accurate estimation of effective lens positions. So they are not currently outperforming the standard formulas. So there is no reason to switch to ray tracing formulas. If we talk of sixth generation formulas, Hill RBF is really become very popular. This mathematical method uses artificial intelligence and pattern recognition and the predicted accuracy of 91% of eyes within plus minus 0.5 adapters. Hill RBF formula is self-validating. It not only gives you oil power, it also gives you accuracy level. It will tell you whether this is inbound or out of the bound indication. It gives you inbound by green dots telling your data of the patient is corresponds to the data within the database of the formula, whereas right, uh, the red one tells you out of the bound that the data is not sufficiently robust to parallel the data of your patient. Barrett Universal to formula is a thick lens formula. It uses lens factor, which is influenced by keratometry, axial length, anterior chamber depth, also lens thickness and white to white measurements. If we compare Barrett with Hill RBF, you will find that both are current, both are more sophisticated, although they use completely different pre premises, but both these methods often give recommendations which are within 0.25 diopters of each other. LADA super formula combines the best performing portions of multiple third and fourth generation IOL formulas. And it uses not only artificial intelligence, it gives you 95% accuracy and it, the system should be available in the clinical machines in the next few years. See for axial length less than 21.49, Hoffer Q was used for axial length more than 25, holiday one and for other eyes holiday one was used. So LADA's formula uses the best performing portions of third and fourth generation formula. Gain formula is also making waves. It on incorporates besides the parameters used in the Barrett, but also sex uh, of the patient. So what should I do? Should I use multiple formulas and then compare or average the results? Douglas Koch use says, yes, average the results after using multiple formulas. But Holiday and Barrett says, horses for courses use specific formulas for the specific situation. So if we talk of very short eyes, less than 22 millimeter, what is the best formula? The We thought that Hoffer Q in the literature, as it was mentioned in the current, in the uh, previous teaching, but now the best way is to use median and not mean of holiday one, holiday two, or better still use Barrett and Hill RBF formulas. Problem in longer eyes, hyperopic surprise, and either, and what we find is that three formulas work very well. One is Bangkok modification of holiday one, or again, Barrett Universal 2, an expanded version of Hill RBF. This is how you can use Bang and Cock optimization of the axial length. And if we see the current third and fourth generation formulas, Barrett Universal 2 may be becoming the modern standard for virgin cellular power calculation. Olsen formula, although very promising, still has not be become very popular. And artificial intelligence based IOL calculation like Hill RBF and Kane are constantly evolving and the release of Hill RBF 2.0 has shown greater accuracy. This is a study published in 2020 in JCRS where they found that Hill RBF Kane formulas were outperforming other formulas. If we find one formula that fits all your situations, then the answer is Hill RBF, Barrett Universal 2, and cane, but shorter eyes still remain a problem. What is the status of intraoperative abrometry? There is no accuracy limit for preoperative measurements and no variability of assumptions, but accuracy is not sufficiently consistent. And right now it is valuable only as a confirmatory or co complementary test in post-refractive surgery cases and astigmatism correction. What are current cataract surgery guidelines of uh, Royal College of Ophthalmology? They say that 85% within one diopter of target refraction. And please repeat biometric measurements if your axial length is extreme. That is less than 21 or more than 26.6. Keratometry is less than 41 or more than 47. And difference in axial length between fellow eyes more than 0.7 millimeter and corneal power more than 0.9 diopter. Uh, when the database of black cases was evaluated by Warren Hill, he found that... Uh, <laughs>
0.5 diabetes of more than 92% was achieved by only less than 1% surgeons so uh, why what is the reason of this 90% uh, stagnancy the precision limit is is these measurements for keratometry it is 0.25 axial length 0.1 and least count for anterior chamber depth and effective lens position is 0.2 to 0.3 mm so it is not the formula limit is the precision of the measurements and these errors keep us at about 90% within 0.5 99% uh, accuracy level so if you have to perfect our power calculation then what we have to do is this is another uh, reason why we get errors your time is up sir permitted tolerance of various iul hours is if we i take into account 21.5 uh, diopter the iul power error permitted is 0.4 and i have if i have to implant a lens of 21.5 if i have to implant a lens of 21.3 the nearest available is 21.5 imagine it has 0.4 diopter error and i'm implanting 21.9 this will give rise to error of 0.6 diopter which in spite of doing best surgery and best calculation still error does occur so we have to change for the better and experience is simply the name we give to our mistakes let us be smart and also experienced we are now on the verge of a level of accuracy for iul power and thank so you sir enjoy this thank yeah you, sir, i'll for just a very interesting talk yeah so i'll just uh, summarize we have to really thank these gentlemen ladies for bringing us to the current accuracy level of iul power calculation holiday warren hill bank cock barrett and olson thank you everyone thank you so much dr bhalla for that excellent talk now i would request uh, dr suresh pandey to give his talk on phaco emulsification in postural disorders Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Doctor Titiyal Sir and Doctor Namrata Ma'am for uh, giving me opportunity to participate uh, on this talk. And uh, as we all know that uh, normally phaco emulsification is being performed uh, in patient uh, in the uh, supine position and surgeon in the sitting position. But once in a while, uh, we uh, get some complicated cases where Uh, they are unable to lie flat on the uh, OT table, and in these cases, it is very difficult to perform phaco emulsification, uh, including uh, including weight. So this is the first case which I am going to show you. Uh, this is a case of uh, severe kyphosis and uh, severe congenital kyphosis, and this patient uh, uh, is unable to lie flat on the OT table. So uh, he was a 55 year old male, and he uh, consulted several ophthalmologists, uh, but. Uh, Not everyone was comfortable uh, doing his surgery, so we uh, did examination and uh, uh, we did a mock drill in the O T table uh, just to make sure that uh, how we can do uh, uh, cataract surgery on his eyes. The surgeon uh, took the standing position and present was uh, light uh, on the O T table uh, with the help of some pillows which uh, they quite supported. And the surgeon took a standing position. We used uh, one FR microscope uh, just to uh, make sure that uh, there should be with minimal uh, uh, magnification. And uh, the capsular axis was being done, as you can see here. And this was followed by the uh, hydro dissection and uh, uh, phaco emulsification was being performed uh, with the uh, low phaco power and fluidic parameters. Um, the uh, We used the ellipse phaco emulsification system and to uh, to make sure that uh, there should be uh, minimal phaco energy and uh, minimal phaco power being used. Uh, the case was done uh, uh, with impediments time uh, because it's taking long time. Uh, these cases may become uncomfortable, and uh, the case was uh, it was did uh, three cataract and uh, not get uh, three to get four cataract and. Phaco energy, uh, minimal phaco energy was used, and uh, viscoelastic solution, corneal sulfate viscoelastic solution was used to protect the corneal endothelium. And uh, once uh, the nucleus is being removed, uh, we did uh, bimanual irrigation aspiration uh, to uh, uh, clean up the cortex, and this was followed by implantation of uh, a three-piece uh, lens. In this case, uh, sensor lens was used. And uh, you can see uh, the bimanual irrigation aspiration being done. And uh, though it was uncomfortable for the surgeon, uh, but the surgery took uh, uh, approximately eight to ten minutes time. 
And this is GP Flens, uh, and uh, we use the MRAD mm -hmm. injector to inject the GP Flens into the capsular bag. The surgery was uneventful, and uh, the viscoelastic was being removed after the implantation of the lens from the capsular bag and from the anterior chamber. And uh, after removal of the viscoelastic solution, uh, we uh, did the um, stomal hydration, and then intracranial uh, moxie processing was used. Uh, and the case was uh, over. Uh, next day, uh, the patient regained excellent vision, uh, six by six uh, another uh, with clear cornea. And uh, uh, this, you can see here, this is uh, uh, immediate uh, uh, in the picture after uh, performing surgery, one foot case is about to finish. And uh, this case was, uh, 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 now I'm going to share another case, 55 year old female. Uh, a case of um, uh, chronic uh, pulmonary obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, venous disease, and obesity, and some heart problem. Uh, so we uh, did the mock, mock drill in the operation uh, theater table. Uh, we used the plastic uh, chair. Uh, one plastic chair was used uh, you know, to sit the patient, and another chair was used to uh, her le leg were extended. And we used you know, the pillow to support her back and ask the chin. Uh, uh, chin was kept extended uh, so that she can see towards the roof. And the surgeon took once again a uh, standing position and uh, the foot switch of the FACO uh, emulsification was used uh, with one, uh, one, uh, one, one foot and then the microscope was set, reset uh, and we asked assistant to, uh, to change the focus of the microscope if it is required. And uh, the FACO emulsification was uh, done in this case, we implanted a uh, technical uh, multifocal lens uh, into the capsular bag, and uh, the surgery was uneventful. Uh, we uh, removed the viscoelastic uh, up from the capsular bag, and the patient regained excellent vision after surgery uh, 2020 and M600. So, FACO multiplication in postural disorder is a very uh, challenging situation. It's very important uh, to perform. The mock drill in the OT uh, operation theater before taking these cases in the OR. And uh, it's very important for surgeons uh, to adjust the patient position so that surgeon is comfortable. However, in some cases, surgeon may have to adjust uh, or change uh, his surgical position. He may he or she may resume the standing position as we have done. And uh, the important uh, point is that uh, the surgery should be done quickly and efficiently as the patient may become restless at any time and adjust the bottle height according to the chain position of the patient head during the surgery. In the literature, there are some other techniques are described you know, to manage such cases, uh, like uh, side saddle position, face-to-face -face position, and reverse tendon uh, Lindbergh position. And uh, it is very important to adjust until the microscope carefully, as it is not possible to control both uh, FACO and microscope foot pedals simultaneously. And don't delay these cases too much, otherwise these cases may become too hard and they, it, it may become difficult to manage such cases and especially management of complications such as uh, the general basins or posterior capsule rent may take extra time and uh, may pose extra difficulty in these cases. We have shared uh, the details of our two cases in the uh, general cat, uh, cataract and surgery today. And uh, uh, it's very important uh, to to uh, discuss and explain uh, the uh, the uh, possible complication uh, in these cases if they, uh, this uh, happen and the experienced surgeons would do uh, these cases uh, and uh, it is very important to do the mock drill and also explain uh, and take proper consent uh, because some these you have cases one minute are, left, sir. Yeah, these cases are, uh, are not very common but uh, these are very important sometimes once in a while we encounter these cases. Uh, so thank you very much once again uh, uh, to for giving me opportunity to tell this case. Thank you. Uh, Suresh Pandey for that excellent presentation. It is my pleasure to uh, invite the next speaker, Dr. Neeraj Khungar. Uh, we were in the same group in RP Center when I joined as postgraduate and he was my immediate senior. Uh, lovely to have you, Neeraj, here, and he's going to be talking about uh, prevention tricks and management of stigmat Argentinian flag sign in intumescent cataract. First of all, I thank Professor Titial, Professor Namrata, and the entire RPC team 
for arranging such a excellent physical uh, meeting post covid and inviting me for the same and it had been 2 years that we have not been uh, moving around so okay so i'll be talking on prevention tricks and management of argentinian flag sign in intermission cataract uh, this is what we all want to avoid now we have to understand the anatomy of the lens before we really know that what we have to do to avoid this so the root cause being the positive intraventricular pressure due to trap liquefied cortical fluid under the anterior capsule so we have to use either a side port incision or a graded vein incision so that the visco loss is minimum always use higher order visco elastic like sodium halonate and the removing the trapped fluid first is the key to success along with balancing shearing and tearing forces so we shall be discussing various techniques to handle this positive intra lenticular pressures so first is the conventional capsular axis as we all know this is essentially a two step procedure we make a small opening in the center and allow fluid to drain out by itself then make a small rexis and after implanting the lens we enlarge it then the second way of doing in conventional is we make a spiral rexis that we make a smaller rexis and then we enlarge it in two or three circles then uh, i have been doing phaco capsulotomy that is puncturing the anterior capsule in the center with normal tip bevel down or kelman tip bevel up when i use purely torsional phaco then another technique that i have devised i call it suck and massage technique where we suck the fluid from the small opening in the center and then the fluid that is trapped it is in the in the mid periphery so we have to take care of the mid periphery also so we massage from the mid periphery with the visco uh, this thing and then we bring that into the center and let it uh, drain out and the last one is direct suction with 26 gauge needle so now we so one can use any technique best suited to one's hand but the important carry home message here is that unlike normal rexes it is must to decrease the positive intralenticular pressure in these eyes so you can see that this yellow portion this is the fluid so we have to take care of this and first we have to push it down so pushing we do with visco elastic and that visco elastic has to be totally filled in the anterior chamber so that it pushes the anterior capsule down so once we have achieved this and our aim is to avoid this particular thing for so the fluid to escape push this fluid under the cover of this so this, this is the conventional left. capsule axis we just let the fluid uh, drain by itself and Here then we need to be very careful very slow as the, the shearing and tearing forces this needs to be enlarged after iol implantation to avoid capsular fibrosis scenario check check avoid capsular fibrosis another clipping this is a case of very shallow and so now if the visco loss has to be minimum either it has to be a side port for rexis or a graded incision like we make a smaller incision initially and we enlarge the main wood incision later then coming to phaco capsulotomy uh, what i am using is a kelman tip with uh, my uh, infinity and centurion uh, these are the settings torsional only 80% vacuum 150 flow rate 28 and inject 
and we once we enter with foot position zero, we directly go to foot position three. You, I think you can appreciate here that whenever the moment we will go, you can see the whole of the fluid is sucked in. So once the fluid is sucked in, the fluid is gone, the intra lenticular pressure is gone. So this sudden flattening occurs, and then we can do the capsular axis because now it is a simpler way because the fluid is gone. So we can use a utrata forceps here. Only thing is here, the main wound has to be of full size because we have to introduce the phaco probe. There is another clipping, again you can see the sudden flattening. I think that is quite appreciated in the video. The fluid can be immediately sucked up. And this is a technique where we go with bevel down, enter in the center, we directly suck the fluid. This is more controlled. Nowadays, I do more of this because here the control is more as compared to the FACO capsule ring. Again, we can complete the axis here. Now, all said and done, Honi ko koi taal nahi sakta. Agar Honi Honi hai, to usse to bachna hi padega and we should be prepared ke Honi ho gai hai, to usko kaise manage karna hai. So, this is, I am trying to aspirate with the needle. Video, video nahi aara kya isme? Mere isme aara laptop nahi. Kya video? This is my family actually. Yes sir, Jersey mein hai. Jersey city. नहीं नहीं वहाँ पे एक पार्क है उस पार्क के बीच में ये बने हुए हैं दो दिस इस अ मेमोरियल दिस थिंग फॉर दी व्हाटेवर हैपन इन 2000 Actually, this video was not playing in the slides, so I played it separately. Uh -huh. The only thing that I wanted to show here is that once you have landed into Argentinian flag sign, you have to load down your FACO parameters and then you have to convert. Okay. Okay, so you, once that has happened, you convert uh, as far as possible the edges in such a way that you get the capsular axis. Now, but that at two places it has been lost. So once we convert the rest of the part, then the things become slightly simpler for us. So similarly, the lower bottom also we are converting it into the capsular axis.
So now we have uh, both the side capsular axis edges which have been lost at two places. So do not hydro dissect at the edges. That is one point. Once you have achieved the rotation, after that you can start your FACO, and the FACO has to be in low parameters and controlled movements. You can see how slowly I am doing every step and the pieces that I am removing, I am trying to remove the pieces at the place where I have capsular edge. So I have to remove the piece which is at the lost part in the end. So that is the way. So this piece I am removing in the end. Similarly, the piece that is lying sub incisional where there is a loss that also I will remove in the end. Thank you. And in case you want to save Honi, the flax is there. You can save the money. You can save the money. Often we see that when the directors are talking about it, it usually does not go to the place where they are sitting. The capsule runs to the periphery, but it is very rarely goes to the posterior capsule in this situation. In this situation, it can go if you are keeping the same and you are trying to do the fast. Thank you, Neeraj. As a high volume subject, Dr. Ikeda Lal is there or logged in? Dr. Ikeda Lal? Yes, very good evening, ma'am. I have logged in. So, Ikeda is going to be talking about precision pulse capsulotomy, pearls and pitfalls. Uh, very good evening to all of you. And uh, I would like to thank especially Professor Titial and Professor Namrata Sharma for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be here with you today. And in my talk, I will be discussing uh, the role of precision pulse capsulotomy. Is my screen visible? Am I audible? Perfect. Please carry on. Yes. So the precision pulse capsulotomy system is known in India by the name of Zepto capsulotomy device, which is marketed by the Minosis company. As we can see here, this has a very small console and it can be placed in the same OR. We do not require to have a separate OR to uh, make the Zepto capsulotomy device. It gives us a quick anterior capsular excess and is relatively inexpensive when you compare it to flax. It is also useful for patients with corneal opacity and poorly dilating pupils where it might be difficult for the femtosecond laser to penetrate. How it really works is that we have uh, attached to the console this disposable handpiece to which a tip is attached. This tip consists of a silicon suction cup which houses a nitinol ring. Nitinol is a super alloy which has elastic properties and it can deform and reform its shape. And we will discuss further in the surgical videos how this works. What basically happens is that the suction cup attaches to the anterior lens capsule and there are some uh, water molecules which are trapped within this device and the anterior capsule. When we provide a short electrical discharge, these get uh, into the rapid phase transition and cause the instantaneous mechanical cleavage of the anterior capsule. So what we expect is a perfectly round 5.2 millimeter in size rexis, which has upturned margins and resists tearing. If you look at the literature, most of the studies that compare manual CCC with this system and flax tell us that there is no difference in the eventual visual outcome or in the complication rate. Although uh, this study from the LB Prasad Institute clearly highlights that there's difference in the morphology of these capsular rexis openings. So now let's look at the surgical videos. Here we are using this device uh, for uh, uh, intumescent mature cataract. And after we have stained the lens capsule, we are putting viscoelastic. And here we have pushed the slider in front so that uh, this tip becomes oblong and we can easily enter the anterior capsule through, uh, enter the um, eye through a 2.2 millimeter incision. Once we are inside, we retract the slider back so that the push rod goes back. And then we apply the suction once we have centered the suction cup, uh, depending on the Pukinje image reflex, so that we have a well-centered rexus opening. And uh, once the suction is achieved, we give the electrical discharge here we can see and this gives us a nice round uh, capsular excess. Now it is especially useful uh, for premium IOL surgeries like a toric multifocal IOL since it gives us a very good centration of the lens. But now I would like to share some interesting case scenarios and a few uh, complications and incidences that we have encountered with this device. 
here as soon as we deliver the suction we can see that the iris is getting sucked into the suction cup as well and uh, thankfully there was no bleeding and we could complete uh, the capsulotomy and we could also get uh, there was uh, no tag which was remnant in that area and the lens could be placed very well so this is rare but this can happen this is another case of an intumescent uh, white mature cataract where we had planned a toric IOL and therefore we decided to go ahead uh, to use the precision pulse system and uh, everything seems to be going well. We had applied the suction and we have come out with the device, but we can see here that there is a tag of the capsule which remains uncut. What probably has happened here that uh, the contact is not adequate at this junction and therefore that's the reason why this part of the capsule uh, did not remain, uh, did remain intact and did not get cut. So we are using a combination of forceps and scissors uh, to complete this and uh, to go ahead with a safe surgery. Now, this is another interesting case. This is a grade two cataract, and uh, we are again using the Zepto capsulotomy device. And here, what happens is that uh, once we have made uh, the capsular opening, a lot of fluid gushes into the bag as soon as we release the suction, which can sometimes uh, be seen. And uh, we have a nice round, big opening, but as soon as we go ahead, with our hydro dissection, notice carefully over here, the site of hydro dissection, as soon as we inject the fluid, the anterior capsule tear occurs. So this is probably because the fluid has gone into the bag as soon as the suction is released. And that's the reason why we had an anterior capsule tear, although there was no extension in the posterior capsule and we could implant a single piece IOL in the bag. Uh, Another interesting case of a patient who has a calcified capsule post RK with a small pupil, and we thought that we will try and test the Zepto device in these complicated cases. Here, um, the uh, PPC did cut through the anterior capsule, but of course it did, could not penetrate through the plaque, which had to be dealt with manually. So since the pupil had become pretty small, we went ahead and inserted a malleable ring and then used a combination of, again, forceps, for a micro forceps and micro scissors to get rid of the plaque and continue with the surgery. So learning from this case, uh, this is another patient with a calcified capsule. Here we have intentionally planned an eccentric CCC because we realized that uh, this device is not going to cut through uh, through this plaque and it would be difficult for us to do a manual capsule red excess as well in these kind of cases. So we have intentionally made sure that this entire calcific plaques come within uh, the uh, Zepto device so that this thing can come out as a free floating capsule when we come out. And here we could go ahead with the surgery again. A few of the interesting cases of mature white cataracts. The first case here we can see uh, that when, as soon as we apply the suction, uh, the capsule just tears away. This was a highly swollen lens uh, with a lot of fluid pockets. And although the stair was limited to the uh, area of the scup, but as soon as we try to retract the probe out of the eye, the another part of the capsule gives away and we have a torn capsule like this. The second case over here, what we see is that the uh, this is again a intumescent cataract. And although we have a nice round opening, somehow this suction uh, caught the lens, the intumescent lens is gotten sucked into the suction device and we are unable to release the suction in this case. So we had to, um, you know, I had to go with my uh, dialer again and manually release uh, this so that we could get rid of this device. So we can see here that I'm trying to release the suction and uh, I'm unable to do so. And then I go ahead with the dialer and go under the suction device to actually release the suction and uh, come out. And then the rest of the surgery, we could go ahead and uh, finish uh, in a safe fashion. So these are some of the experiences that we've had uh, with this Zepto system. Uh, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, the uh, Zepto system gives us a safe and precise capsulotomy. It is especially useful for intumescent cataracts, patients with corneal opacities, calcified capsules, and premium IOL surgeries. Uh, initially, few things that I had learned was to keep the handpiece well centered on the Purkinje image can be a little difficult because there's a tendency towards making more nasal capsular excess opening, especially when we are performing temporal phaco emulsifications. And um, the hydro dissection should be a little gentle or ideally, I think we should decompress before we go ahead with hydro dissection. As we saw in that one case that... Seconds left, have... Sorry. Yep. Uh, 
35 seconds left yes. time remaining yeah. yeah so i'll just finish my last slide so we should decompress idly before hydro dissection because in one of the cases that i showed we did have an anterior capsular tear as soon as we went ahead with a hydro procedure so uh, probably we should decompress before going ahead and we have encountered complications that we have discussed in this presentation like incomplete ccc and runaway capsular excess more so in mature intumescent cataracts although we've never had a posterior capsular tear so far with this, I would uh, just like to say that the way forward could be probably to have different options for sizes of CCE, probably have uh, 5 millimeter as well as 4.5 millimeter would be nice for a posterior capsulotomy in pediatric cataracts. And uh, the handpiece seems a little bulky as of now, so we could probably have a sleeker handpiece and a sleeker design, which I think they're coming up with soon. Thank you for your patient hearing and kind <laughs> Thank you, Keda. That was a very comprehensive talk on Zepto. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. It is my pleasure to invite the next speaker, Dr. Satyajit Sena from uh, Patna, who uh, is also the member of the Academic and Research Committee, ESON, and he's going to be talking about management of cataracts post-recurrent uveitis. Uh, at the onset, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, TTL, sir, and uh, Professor Namrata Sharma, ma'am. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. I come from the land of Dr. Rajendra Prasad from Bihar, and it's such a joy to see uh, Prof. Titiyal giving the name of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the true meaning of celebration and involving speakers from all over the country and uh, making it truly All India. Today, I'll be speaking on management of cataracts post uh, who have recurrent uveitis. Uh, it's a common complication of uveitis. Its development can be correlated with duration, chronicity, location of the inflammation, and use of corticosteroids. Uh, the factors influencing the outcome of the cataract surgery at the end may, may be, depend upon the type of the uveitis, control of inflammation, appropriate surgical technique, intraocular lens design, and the management of post-operative complications. Now, good visual prognosis in chronic diffuse anterior uveitis associated with certain di systemic diseases like Bessette, sparse planitis, herpes, VKH, and sarcoidosis is provided the uh, inflammation has been inactive or has been controlled for three months prior to surgery. Preoperative examination is standard. There should be a comprehensive ocular examination. Systemic history is very important. Complete ocular examination has to be done and relevant, relevant systemic examination is very important. Now, uh, often uh, there's non-visualization of the fundus, but if one can see the fundus, then fluorescein angiography is helpful in seeing any active disease. Uh, OCT helps in quantifying the macular edema and detection of epiretinal membranes and vitrofoveal tractions. B-scan uh, also helps in is assessment of the posterior segment of the eyeball. <clears throat> now, four indications for the cataract surgery are phaco angitonic uveitis, where active inflammation as a result of leakage of lens protein is there in which cataract surgery is mandatory. Visually significant cataract is there with well-controlled inflammation with potential for visual improvement exists, then we should do cataract surgery. Cataract impairing the visualization of the posterior segment and cataract impairing visualization of the posterior segment in a patient undergoing vitroretinal surgery. Now, comorbidity is also something we have to keep in mind, like concurrent glaucoma or hypotony, band-shaped keratopathy, extensive posterior sinecae, RD, optic atrophy, CME, macular atrophy, epiretinal membranes, and vitreous opacities. Uh, Preoperative control of inflammation is very important, and the thumb rule is to operate when cells are absent, 0 to 5, in the anterior chamber as assessed on the slit lamp. <clears throat> uh, Preoperatively, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, to give uh, to, uh, systemic steroids and topical uh, steroid drops also. Now, surgical, if we do phaco emulsification, although ECC is not done anymore, but phaco in certain cases, if phaco emulsification, when we do, there is less uh, trauma to the uh, ocular tissue, and thus there is less post-operative inflammation. In this video, I just wanted to show in the end that when you are... Uh, finishing the case, you should wash the viscoelastic properly uh, and so that the remnant viscoelastic itself doesn't uh, cause more inflammatory reaction at the end. Also, I wanted to show in this video that you should, you should not touch the iris as far as possible. And if there is iris prolapse, then you should try to just tap it inside. Uh, there's, when you do phaco emulsification, there, are, there is a lesser incidence of uh, cystoid macular edema. And in managing a small pupil, uh, 
Uh, posterior sinecake can easily be separated with iris hooks and a viscoelastic cushion and helps in enlarging the pupil adequately to complete the surgery. A combined approach of phacoemulsification for removal of lens cortex and nucleus through the anterior approach followed by pars plana vitrectomy for removal of lens has been recommended in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis cases uh, who have recurrent uveitis. The presence of significant vitreous opacities may indicate need for simultaneous vitrectomy with cataract surgery. The cataract can be removed either by phacoemulsification or ACC and a near total pars plana vitrectomy. There are definite complications associated with this combined procedure, including increased incidence of CME, increased post-operative inflammation, choroidal hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, dental detachment, and late IOL decentration. Uh, in, in, previously, IOL implantation was contraindicated, but now times have changed and we are using IOLs in all these. Good to excellent outcome is uh, anticipated in fugues, in burnt out, inactive idiopathic anterior uveitis, in HLA B27 anterior uveitis cases, and in inactive toxoplasmosis. Moderate to good outcome is anticipated in uh, pars planitis and Bessette's intermediate uveitis. Uh, especially poor outcome is anticipated, and you should counsel the patient properly in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, in uveitis in less than 12 years of age hypotony associated with uveitis and chronic glenomatous uh, recurrent uveitis in BKH and sympathetic ophthalmia also. The type of inflammation and suppressive therapy and the expertise in using the immunomodulators have become such that we probably can master most of the resident inflammatory situations. The IUL design is very important. Acrylic IULs provide better visual outcome with lower rate of complications. Commonly encountered intraoperative complications of cataract like posterior catheter may occur during this surgery. Uh, hyphema is also seen uh, in these cases more commonly than in the usual cases that we do. Hyphema can be managed on the operating table by tamponading with an air injection or intracamera adrenaline for uh, vasoconstriction. Uh, immediate or post-operative, severe post-operative inflammation may develop in some uveitic uh, eyes after surgery, although it is more frequent when inflammation is not adequately controlled preoperatively. The sequel of severe inflammation includes cellular deposits on the IUL, posterior sinecae, IUL capture, pupillary block glaucoma, inflammatory membranes, hypotony, and CME. Now, CME is something I'll just skip because we are all aware of this. One of the complications is CME, one is secondary glaucoma, uveitic flare-up is there, recurrent episodes of primary disease may continue to occur even after cataract surgery. Persistent inflammation, in contrast to the recurrence of the primary disease, persistent inflammation refers to those cases where low-grade inflammation persists for months after cataract surgery. Posterior capsule opacification is also common in these cases. Uh, recurrent and chronic uveitis can also cause the appearance of fibrous membrane and dense fibrosis in certain cases. Hypotony may also be seen. Challenges are there in these cases, which are small pupil, zonular dehiscence, and hyphema is there. Um, I'll go to one case where we had a 38-year-old female with history one minute, uh, treatment for uh, CA cervix. All reports revealed positive for COX in 2017. On presentation, she had counting finger in both meters and she had dense posterior capsule uh, cataract. This was her OCT picture where she had uh, macular edema. Uh, she was given a tricot injection intravitreally by Dr. Pooja Sina in the right eye uh, and then phacoemulsification was planned after 15 days. OCT showed reduction in the macular edema, and then we went ahead and did this uh, surgery, uh, which was in the beginning like this, and then I'll go straight to the end and show you that the surgery was completed well, and this was the post-operative picture after one week, and this was after 15 days, and this was at the end of one month. This was the OCT picture. And the patient came with us with, to us with counting finger beater. And uh, at the end of one month, she had 680 in vision. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. So much, Satyajit. I think that was an excellent presentation and an excellent outcome of the patient that you showed. It is my pleasure to invite uh, the next speaker. Uh, again, a very good friend of ours, Dr. Anaga Haroot. She's a uh, uh, member. Uh, academic and research committee very soon and uh, she is going to be talking about BHEX, lot of things small can be beautiful excuse me 
A very good evening to everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Titiyal sir and Professor Dr. Namrata ma'am and team RP Center for giving me this opportunity. It's really a great honor for me to be presenting here in front of you all, sir, uh, in such an apex and pre prestigious institution. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll be speaking on the BHEX expander, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So if the question is asked, how small is really small? So although there is no true consensus on what is the size of the pupil that would be adequate to go ahead with cataract surgery, it, as the surgeon's skill and experience goes on increasing, logically, the size of the pupil at which he is comfortable without using any pupil expanders goes on reducing. It also depends on the intraoperative situation and the iris tissue properties. So all of us know that the technical challenges in small pupil surgery is basically a reduced visibility. And so in a, inadequacy in each of the steps of the cataract surgery leading to a poor visual outcome and an unhappy patient. So you can fine tune the surgery by having a good preoperative screening using multiple techniques, fine tuning FACO settings. And what will bail you out is the timely and optimal use of materials like OVDs and pupillary expanding devices. So the BHEX pupil expander is basically an innovation of our very own uh, Dr. Suven Bhattacharaji. And it is basically a hexagonal ring, which has six notches that engage the pupil and six flanges. The three flanges without the hole usually go above the iris and those with the hole behind the iris, but it can also be used the other way around alternately. So let's see a few cases. So first, what you do is usually do a synecolysis uh, if present and just check if there are any synecolysis, push a little viscoelastic underneath the pupil. And then very gently with the 23 gauge forceps, you can put in through the uh, main incision or the side port. The side flanges, you're usually put in through the side ports, the opposite side port. The third flange is usually the toughest. And what you need to do is stabilize the globe and gently insert it underneath the pupillary margin. You can also use a Sinsky hook to gently manipulate it underneath the pupillary margin. The rest of the cataract surgery steps are usually the same. So it gives you a nice uh, hexagonal opening of around 5.5 to 6 millimeters. A gentle hydrodissection is done here. And because of its thin profile, it usually doesn't come in the way of the FACO emulsification or the irrigation and aspiration. And so all the steps can be carried out in a usual technique. After the IOL implantation has been done, gently the uh, uh, BX ring is then disengaged from the pupillary margin. Ideally, all the three flanges should be disengaged so as to be gentle and not to damage the pupillary edge and the sphincter. And it can be easily and gently removed from the main incision. Now, this is a case of IFIS. So BHEX also works very well in IFIS. So here you can see the third flange is usually the toughest. Here we are going ahead with the capsulotomy. And as we are doing the hydrodissection, you can see how the pupil, is, uh, the iris is trying to prolapse out because of the IFIS property. But at the end of the surgery, uh, the uh, flange is held gently and disengaged from the uh, pupillary margin. So basically the entire surgery can be performed very well because the BHEX keeps it, uh, keeps the pupillary margin at bay. Removing sometimes needs to be uh, checked because sometimes it can cause a little bit of iris pigment release. Irrigation aspiration, you can see how the billowing of the iris and the small area of iris atrophic patch. Six hours post-op, you can see the pupil is nice, central, circular and a good visual outcome. This was an interesting patient where we did a capsulotomy, a mid-dilated pupil. I thought we would not need a pupillary expander, but even before we went ahead with the hydrodissection, you can see how the pupil is coming down. We tried using epitrate, adrenaline, phenocaine, everything, but the pupil didn't budge. So here goes the BHEX again. But remember here, there's already a, capsule, a capsular excess being done. 
So we need to be really gentle and see that the BHEX ring doesn't engage the uh, capsular axis margin. So you uh, in inflate the anterior chamber well with the uh, viscoelastic and then go ahead and put in the BHEX ring. Rest of the steps are the same. Removal is easy, stabilize the globe and remove it before removing the viscoelastic. However, there are also some challenges and some struggles. So here, when you are putting in the first flange, if it is not engaged well, and if the notches are not engaged adequately in the pupil, you can see that sometimes it can slip and go underneath the iris. So sometimes what you need to do is, if the one of the flanges has slipped, you can go on to the neighboring flange, adjust it and then maneuver it to bring it out. Because of the uniplanar nature of the BX ring, sometimes it can become a little tricky. So here again, the FACO probe has engaged into the uh, BHEX ring and we are trying to put it back again. As I said, because of the uniplanar nature, sometimes maneuvering could be a little difficult, but yet definitely it uh, is much, much easier once we get the hang of it. So when removing again is easy, stabilize the globe, good, uh, have a good grasp on the flange and it can be removed easily. Now, this was a patient with a very small pupil, a mature intumescent cataract, and things are more difficult. Again, because of the small pupil, sometimes the flange has to be really pulled. And here you can see, again, one of the flanges has slipped underneath the pupil. What you shouldn't do is this, because it, there is no way one you can actually go and remove uh, the, uh, the part or the flange that has gone underneath with either the Sinsky hook or with the uh, forceps. So what you can do is actually remove the entire um, BHEX ring and then put it back up simpler. Sometimes manipulation like this can be messy and it can cause a little bit of uh, iris pigment uh, dispersion. But at the end of the case, sometimes uh, you can have a very good outcome because finally, you see again here, like we are doing the limbus, at the limbus, you have to actually stabilize the globe and then go ahead and do the uh, BHEX implantation. Now, this was a case with very small pupillary, uh, 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 a small, very small pupil, there was a pupillary membrane. And in such very small pupils, it's difficult to implant the BHEX ring. Here we are trying to remove the pupillary membrane, but definitely it is going to be difficult. So we are doing a stretch pupilloplasty here in both the uh, directions, and then implanting the BHEX ring becomes a little more easy. Uh, this is the visual outcome and this is the last case where a femto has been done in a semi-dilated pupil and now we are putting in the BHEX ring for uh, better uh, phaco emulsification and better visibility. Again, we should not disturb the capsulotomy flap. So after the BHEX has been put, which is very gentle and now we are removing the capsulotomy flap, checking for its integrity and rest of the procedure is the same. This was a multifocal IOL and we are now expanding the capsulotomy after uh, the lens has been implanted. And this is the result. So if you compare it with the Malugin ring, basically it is a jointless, it is uniplanar and more economical. Definitely you can also put it through the side port. And if you compare it with the iris retractors, which usually require multiple incisions, could be more time consuming and could cause fainter damage. So to conclude today's world, when we have increased patients' expectations and use of premium lenses, optimal use of devices can help to overcome challenges and achieve good visual outcomes in these cases. And definitely we can make small beautiful. Thank you so much. Sir. Excellent presentation, Ananda. Beautiful videos and uh, excellent demonstration of uh, uh, perfect skills. You know, how to put the ring, how to take it out. Uh, all those who have used it know that it is not very easy. Uh, it is in fact very dis difficult because it is very flexible. Thank you so much for showing those tips and tricks. I would like to invite the next speaker who's uh, none other than Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary. Uh, he is going to be speaking about chandelier like assisted MICS with conual opacity. So over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Namda, Namrata. Thank you for inviting me, Professor Titial. And as I see that COVID is over, people are sitting without masks. Thankfully, we are back to physical conferences. And it feels... Thanks, thanks to, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it feels good to be physically present for a conference. Okay. So this was our first experience of using the chandelier light. After we had seen one, two videos and Am Amar introducing the concept. 
so we said okay let's try it out so so this was a fairly dense corneal pasty and uh, about a grade 3 cataract we were thinking of doing a capsulotomy with a zepto but since we had decided on using a chandelier we thought let's use the chandelier light all the way so first the challenge was a capsulotomy with the retro illumination from a chandelier light we could see the entire capsule but it wasn't all that clear and a needle capsulotomy was a little difficult it was easier to lead the capsule with the forceps capsule lot me done when we saw in a regular illumination we just couldn't make out anything about the capsule lot me that means it was whatever was there was in retro illumination oblique illumination did not give us any idea of how the capsule lot me was now hydro dissection hydro delineation rotation of the nucleus again a, a, a oblique illumination really doesn't give out much of what is happening inside feco with oblique illumination it was visible to some extent and then we move on to retro illumination with the chandelier's light and see the difference it is almost as if you are in a different world totally an alien area things which you would probably not have seen in your experience with cataract surgery chops coming in as if it was a simple nucleus lying in front of you and the chops are in the bag we pick up each piece and emulsify and this is all in the chandelier retro illumination so oblique light is totally off microscope light is totally off and we are able to continue we were always worried that maybe at some point the feco tip may hit the posterior capsule but somehow i as a surgeon was very comfortable that i am in the right plane and the response of the nuclear material to my feco tip is as it normal is the feel was pretty normal it wasn't something very strange even though this was my first attempt of doing a chandelier light assisted feco surgery in a fairly dense corneal pasty of course i can increase and decrease the intensity of the chandelier light so i increase it to a level that gives me the best retro illumination and the nuclear pieces stand out the best so i titrate the amount of light that i want to give me the best visibility and step by step all the steps are same i really did not have to change any step in the feco emulsification process hold the nucleus mash the nucleus chop the nucleus emulsify the nucleus aspirate the nucleus it was just like a dream world the major bulk gone now irrigation aspiration i use the oblique illumination to enter and then i'm looking at 
the chandelier light illumination to see how things look inside. Very comfortable. This gone now for the first time I could see the Rexes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I removed the cortex, removed the malignant ring, uh, and the lens has gone in. So, all well that ends well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everything looks effortless in your hands. Thank and you. it was, you know, like a retina surgeon doing a cataract surgery. It was so, uh, so clear and so vivid. A different world completely, but uh, excellent, excellent oh, presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. And that was a very hard cataract also. It was fairly really hard, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to announce, to invite the next speaker, Dr. C.V. Gopal Raju. Dr. C.V. Gopal Raju is the proud owner of Vishaka Hospital in uh, Vishaka Patna. And he's the doyen of ophthalmology, in fact, in Vishaka Patna and also in the country. And he is chairman of the, the Andhra Pradesh, chairman scientific committee of Andhra Pradesh of Thalmic Society. He's going to be talking about incorporating toric intraocular lenses, a way to begin your journey towards yeah. refractive cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, respected uh, dignitaries on the chair and my friends, <coughs> I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Tityal sir and Namrata madam. And still I'm wondering uh, how much of energy Namrata has uh, to do all these things. <laughs> really, uh, Tityal sir is very lucky to have a... Uh, oh. and, uh, <laughs> yes, Tityal, first of all, uh, uh, lucky RP Center to lucky to have such a safe hands. Uh, and also, uh, one question I want to ask uh, Tityal, sir, you have made this conference as a new normal. I think in future, uh, the conferences will be the, like in this mode, then uh, there are many, maybe I think it needs a lot of debate. If you see the halls, it is different. And if you see the, uh, the involvement across the globe, it is uh, so wide and if you see the quality. There are many plus and there are few minuses. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how far uh, this will progress. Okay, coming to the my talk. Uh, so mainly uh, for the youngsters and the residents, when they practice, they should uh, involve the, the start doing the uh, the toric eyewears. Uh, no financial disclosures to make. Overall, we'll, uh, we'll deal the talk with how the cataract surgery has evolved into a refractive cataract surgery and then the flaws in the monofocal and non toric cataracts and how to improve on them and then a typical case scenario and take home message. We all know cataract surgery is the one of the dynamic surgery where uh, keep changing, uh, starting from couching to multifocal and then with the, all the sutureless to suture and then sutureless knife, laser like that. It has the, the main eye openers for the refractive cataract surgery or the refractive corneal surgery, perfection, quality of vision, a lot of simultaneous changes. So that has uh, uh, the really cataract surgery has, um, uh, has put a pressure on the optical aberrations, optics, perfect biometry, predictive errors, surgeon-induced factors like this. Generally, unhappy situations are one, uh, the having less than his expected, maybe he's having 6'6", six, six, but his expected, that may be because of the residual error or the one having a 6'6", six, six, but still not happy. Maybe we could not understand the optical aberrations, other reasons, maybe flaws in our planning. So to convert them into happy, a good pre-op planning is essential. Reduce the surgically induced efforts desired by the desired outcomes underperform, uh, underpromise, and then choose the right technology. So things to ponder is work backwards. Normally we work from cataract to 6.6. Now let us work from backwards. Start the aim of 6.6 and then work backwards. First, we, have should, we should come out of that spherical equivalent mode. The, all these days, uh, the biometers have put us into a spherical equivalent mode. We have to come out of that and then really 
look into the the astigmatism and then upgrade your tools upgrade your surgical planning upgrade your surgical methodology and prepare for fine tuning whereas the toric eye oil the difference is uh, it doesn't end at that the completion of the surgery it uh, uh, involves the, the follow up and then see the uh, the uh, placement of axis if necessary prepare for the uh, rotation so aim for the 66 uh, distance benchmark and then first convince yourself for the emetropia and then analyze your own cases where you are what are the routine uh, causes then rectify them and implement the changes and then aim for a zero spherical error i think as already most of our biometers are achieving it our our uh, the involvement is aiming the zero refractive error in our center we have the three step approach first we analyzed our corneal astigmatism trend and then uh, we analyzed the predictive error in the monofocal and non torics then we started doing the uh, the toric eye wells and then we analyzed the results so if you see our cases uh, almost 34 34% of them are the astigmatism was more than one <clears throat> and also nice to analyze the age and then the type of astigmatism these things will help us in the biometry and then even if you remove the 1.25 astigmatism still around significant number of 16 to 20% requires a, uh, our attention to correct the astigmatism this is the first study where we have uh, realized that uh, almost 30% of the four stop cases are having a cylinder of more than five. Then the options uh, available are the steep axis incision location, and then the accurate arcuate cuts, either blade or the laser if you have, and then the toric eye oil. Out of this, I think toric eye oil are more predictable and then the dependable. Choose the toric eye oil at present. And then the, the surgery also, you we need to, Sorry. We need to, uh, to be slightly different in these cases where uh, the, at the end of the surgery, I think positive of the time will fall, uh, will pass forward. And then mainly uh, on a routine surgery, we don't give much importance for the cleaning the, the, uh, the viscoelastic here we have to be very thorough in cleaning the viscoelastic and then the adhesion of the capsule overlapping and then the incision location. So in our third step, when we analyzed our own cases, almost 70% were almost zero astigmatism and then another significant 20%, almost 80 to 90% in between, we got a cylinder of nine, less than 0.5 diopters, that is a vector. So this is another typical case scenario where the uh, cylinder was 2.5 uh, and then this was the eye trace. Then um, yeah, there are two, three tools we can compare and then fine tune as per your results, whether to depend on the IOL master 700, which is more reliable than the Varian and then uh, plan and then the go accordingly. Then this is the case where we got the 6.6 vision and the zero astigmatism. This is the post-op uh, eye trace and then the post-op uh, eye oil master. So to take home, so incorporate eye oils for the correction of astigmatism, prepare uh, a proper preoperative biometry assessment, proper eye oil power selection planning, and then surgically consistency and then the predictability. And then once if you are familiar with the toric, our next step of aiming a 6-6 that's multifocal is not far away. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gopal, for that excellent presentation. And I would like to acknowledge the help of Dr. Manpreet Kaur and Dr. Sri Devi, who really you know, worked extremely hard for the conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, back end, really back end, there will be many people. Yeah. There will be many people. <laughs> So uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to invite the next speaker, uh, Without, uh, Professor Kamaljeet Singh uh, who, from Allahabad, uh, who is going to be talking about hybrid technique of phaco emulsification for residents. Thank you, sir, uh, for coming and thank you so much uh, for your time as well as uh, for your presence here in the RPC. I am so much impressed by you all. Since morning, I have seen you all listening to all the talks. We were sleeping in between, but we were listening to all the talk. 
So it's very difficult and taxing. So thank you so much. <laughs> and it's a great invitation. I'm so proud. And secondly, I wanted to say was that um, I came to this uh, RP center in the year 1995. And since then, my in-laws were also here. So I used to come to the RP center and I found them so welcoming. And I learned everything of ophthalmology from RP center. So I'm so much obliged and thankful to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is my talk. It's actually, we have a large volume uh, surgery in our department. So many a times residents do, and they find it difficult to break the nucleus into two. So what we uh, have been teaching these, uh, our students is to, just do a pre-chop and use a, uh, initially we used to use, a, just till the nucleus out of the bag and with the um, chopper and a uh, Sinsky, we used to break it into two. And uh, the problem at many a times we find, they find is that they uh, have zonular dialysis and problems if they do it in the bag. So this is the normal technique that we adopt for the residents. Although you have seen such beautiful surgeries being done in the bag, uh, Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary just recently showed a beautiful uh, surgery with chandelier. And uh, here we do a capsulorexis. The only thing that you will have to take care is that you take a slightly larger capsulorexis. And I learned it through uh, Professor Keki Mehta used to say that there is a lens salute and the lens tilts. And we keep on doing this in small incision cataract surgery. SIC is the manual one. So you can break it into two pieces without any problem. And you, uh, the only objection to this is that it might touch the cornea, but if you have injected a lot of bolus of Vislon, it does not, and the results are excellent. So you simply break it into two with this, and then with the uh, FACO2 mode, you simply eat away the nucleus, and it takes just half a minute to finish the surgery. After breaking it, you can break it into smaller pieces or just two pieces. And this chop is so easy. We don't have a femto, so we can't break it through femto. So <laughs> this is how you do. And uh, these are some uh, initial few cases. Now my residents do it by this means also. They learn SICS. They do thousands of SICS in our department, but FACO machine is not available to them. So the, the, the centurion that we have, they don't get. So they use the older one and they can easily finish off the surgery without any problem. The, the selection of the cases should be made. It should not be very hard. This is grade two, three cataract. So you finish off the surgery like this. Uh, now uh, what we have started doing is that we are using a MVR blade also to just chop the nucleus into two pieces and the surgery can be done easily. So the results are excellent. And we have done the studies on specular also. The endothelial cell loss is not much. And you can do good surgery in, in a very, very short time. It becomes very cheap. You don't need any other pre-choppers. And you can see this, uh, just a bolus of uh, fluid goes inside and the nucleus pops up. And you just, then you break it into two pieces. And Sometimes it may be difficult to prolapse the nucleus out of the bag. So uh, you should rotate the nucleus with Sinsky dialer and you'll find that one edge comes out and then you can easily do the same thing without any problem. So uh, this can be easily achieved. You can do a, um, a direct chop also in these cases, but many a time our residents, they do a PC rupture at this stage also. So we can easily break it into two and the surgery is finished in no time. You can see the cornea remains clear, absolutely. And uh, different grades of nuclei you can easily chop.
So this is the this is called the hybrid technique, the manual versus manual and FACO both through a small incision and foldable lens. This is another case. Here we have used a, used a MVR blade. It is very sharp and it breaks very easily. You have to just stabilize the uh, nucleus uh, with the other instrument and you will find that it will break easy. So these are some of the cases that we have done and you can see that it's very easy and one can try. It's basically for residents, but I find that such good surgeons are sitting here and there is no resident around, just one or two maybe there. So this can be easily done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh for that excellent presentation. Now, I'm sure all the residents are watching online in their rooms. And anyway, this is for the archives and I'm sure it is of great few weeks, use. you have so many days. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah. That's an advantage of the virtual meetings. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The next talk is going to be by Dr. Amit Purwal, uh, who's uh, uh, going to be talking about managing small people with various devices available in India. And uh, Dr. Naga did talk about the hex. I'm sure you will uh, complete the list. And Amit Porwal is the uh, member scientific committee in All India Ophthalmological Society Scientific uh, uh, Committee uh, group. And uh, he's come from Indore. So over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the sir and Amrita, ma'am for making me part of this Foundation Day celebration. This is my second visit in RP Center in my career of ophthalmology. The first visit was immediately after ophthalmology when I came for the cornea workshop. So I feel proud and privileged to be part today. So without wasting much time, I'm. Uh, can I have the projector, please? to your insert the iris okay is always insert parallel to the insertion your insertion should not be too big or too small so using an mvr you can make the insertion place the iris hooks engage the pupillary border and try to retract only slightly don't over retract immediately after putting the first iris hooks first place the uh, distal to iris hooks titrate the opening uh, try to uh, pull it out gently so that if that uh, iris tissue is fragile you don't want to tear the iris tissue so once you pull the two iris hooks, you uh, insert the other two proximal iris hooks and then titrate the opening slowly. 
So the reason to titrate the opening slowly is when you just pull it fast, the iris tissue, if it tears, then you know that how, with what size of the pupil you are going to be comfortable in doing the FACO. So in this case, I put four, uh, four iris hooks. I'm quite comfortable with the opening which I'm getting. And so I proceed with my FACO. But there are certain advantages and disadvantages when you're using a four iris hook in this manner because it's a square pattern of a pupillary opening, what you get. So uh, you start your FACO, uh, you are doing the access. And the preferred technique of my FACO emulsification in case of small pupil is a small, is a slow motion FACO emulsification. Uh, this was the thing which I was talking about. The disadvantage when you're using four iris hooks, the moment you put the FACO probe, the iris tissue gets incorporated into the FACO tip or it comes in front of the FACO tip and the, the iris tissue gets damaged. So you, this can be avoided by putting another iris hook sub -incisionally. So you have a pentagon sh shape of opening and then the, uh, the iris tissue coming in front of the FACO uh, probe is avoided. So as I told you earlier also, the opening is quite wide and you can do uh, very safely the FACO emulsification uh, procedure. And as I told you, it's a, uh, I use a slow motion FACO emulsification. And whenever you, uh, I'm using the iris hooks, so once the FACO emulsification is done and the cortex wash is done, I try. I don't want the pupil to remain stretched for so long throughout my surgery. So I don't need these two proximal hooks and the right, uh, I'm a right-handed surgeon. So the right lower uh, iris hooks, I don't want it well, uh, when I'm inserting the IOL. So I take it out. Taking out again is an art. You should be very gentle. You should not just withdraw it because if you just withdraw it, the tip of the iris hook might cause a DM. So the left lower one, I need to, I need the iris hooks there because I want to visualize the anterior capsule when I'm inserting the IOL so that the leading haptic goes below the anterior capsule into the capsular bag. And this is how the surgery can be completed. There are advantages that it is just of the iris hooks, but because of positive of time, I won't be able to mention it, but you saw the pupillary opening, how it looks when you're using the iris hooks. Coming to the malleugin ring, it is a 5-0 blue polypropylene square shaped with four circular loops that holds the iris at equidistance. This is a single piece design it comes with the inserter and the holder can uh, has two sizes, seven and 6.25 millimeter can be inserted through a 2.2 or a hold assisted technique of 1.8 millimeter. So basically there are the clips now coming to the video of uh, a case of malleugin, uh, small people using malleugin ring. So this was a case uh, of uh, combined FACO trap. Uh, this patient was a, uh, was a patient of chronic uveitis with a steroid induced glaucoma also. So I had planned the trap. So again, the dictum which I saw was there was any case. So after ingesting high density vasculitic substance, I tried to do a synucleolysis, but I got some matrices, but it was not adequate enough. So I used the malleugin ring. This malleugin ring comes with the insert and the holder. So the, uh, the ring is in the inserter. You just pull the button behind and the uh, ring gets loaded into the uh, inserter. So now inject the inserter into the entry chamber, push the button forward, try to engage the proximal loop into the pupillary border. And then you have to rotate the wrist when you, are, you, uh, when you want to engage the two lateral scrolls. So once you engage the two lateral scrolls, you release it. And with the help of a Sinsky hook, you can pull it, uh, push the uh, opening towards the center and then retract back and uh, engage the pupillary border. So you can see it's a nice circular opening. What you get with this iris hooks, there are eight point of contact. So the opening is very uh, round and very nicely it is opened up. Advantage is this malleugin ring or the other iris expanders, which I'm going to talk about, they lie on the iris plane. So the peripheral shallowing of the entry chamber, the pigment release, which is the main side effect of uh, using an iris hook can be avoided. Again, the choice of surgery is slow motion FACO emulsification. Now, uh, this gives a better visibility when I compare with the iris hooks. Uh, I've given down on iris hooks. I don't use iris hooks much. Uh, I believe these iris expanders, uh, uh, they give much predictable and better result. And the shape of the people, uh, people also post-operatively is better maintained. Removing of the iris hook is very easy. You just disengage with the help of a Sinsky hook. You can reload it. I, being a consultant in the tertiary IK center, it's a charitable institute. I always reuse all these rings. So the lo loading back into the inserter is very, very easy. You can load it back, clean it, and then eat you it and can reuse it. I use it maximum for one ring or an expander at least five times and then the strength deteriorates so we can destroy it. Coming to the OSS iris expander, again, it's a blue polypropylene ring. It, has, it is square shape and they are pocketed at the four corners. Single piece design, similar to malleugin ring, everything else. So coming to the video, again, it comes with the inserter and the holder. So on the uh, holder, you just retract the button and the whole OSS iris expander gets loaded into the inserter. And there, there's slight variation when you're uh, loading these uh, rings into the inserter. So once you're loaded, the trick here is when you're using this OSS iris expander, you don't have to engage the pupillary border when you're inserting it. You just push the button and make sure that the expander lies over the iris. Once the expander lies over the iris, there is a teeth which is there in this inserter, which uh, sometimes blocks the release of the expander. So with the help of a Sinsky, you can release it. Then one of the pocket is first engaged, then the diagonally other pocket is engaged with the help of a Sinsky hook. All these pockets have a hole in the on the center. So with the, you can insert the Sinsky hook in this hole and try to engage the uh, pupillary border. So 
always it is easier to insert the three uh, pockets for the last pocket you need a bimanual technique uh, you need to uh, do it with the sinski hook and the spatula so that the pupillary water gets engaged again the opening is quite adequate there is an eight point contact all the advantages what you get with all this iris expander which is bax oss or the malugin it is there because the thing lies at the iris plane so uh this is the way you are you are going to insert this and the surgery surgical steps being the same so again uh, removal is again very uh, easy once you have loaded the iol uh, basically uh, disengage one of the margins uh, from the pupillary border uh, one of the pockets you can disengage with the help of a sinski hook once you have disengaged uh, uh, the first one then the second one and then you can pull it out with the help of a forceps the mac forceps forceps or you can again reload it so i am showing you the technique of reloading there is a teeth just engage one of the uh, wall of this expander into the uh, inserter and this is how you are going to do it b hex anaga has spoke everything in detail i am just going to show a small video of this b hex which was uh, used earlier b hex uh, is very good made in india innovation but only a uh, few things which i would like to mention about b hex is uh, whenever you want to use a b hex you should first, first we should be able to realize whether this pupil is a rigid pupil or what if it is a rigid pupil using b hex becomes very tricky and very challenging so better to do a stretch pupilloplasty first and then use a b hex but uh, if you are using a malugin ring because of the tensile strength of the malugin ring that becomes very easier so uh, i don't have any fi uh, financial interest in any of these devices so what is the final outcome with any devices available in india we want a dilated pupil so that our surgery becomes much easier thank you thank you so much amit for uh, completing the whole picture of small pupil thank you again for your uh, presence and your time and uh, for the fact that you traveled from all the way to indore for this thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you thank you i think we had a wonderful uh, today's uh, last uh, concluding uh, session and uh, it was so heart warming to see uh, many of our friends coming physically for this particular session if i look into percentile ways uh, this had the largest physical presence of the day and thank you again for people coming from across the india with one request and that uh, is a uh, very nice to see that uh, we have the feeling that we want to be together we want to share the not only knowledge the relationship which we have built in so many years and that had come to a little bit halt because of covid now i think we have to retry and get more energy to be together because uh, it is the bond which uh, needs to be rebuilt i think because we did have that so we require some more protein ch change to fill up those gaps and uh, those protein chains will you know totally take away the covid uh, related proteins i think that is going to give us a lot of enthusiasm and thank you again all of you for being with us not only our rpc alumni people we had uh, faculty from across the country also and i really appreciate that our faculty or staff mainly uh, the younger faculty members the uh, senior residents and junior residents have worked very very hard for last almost two months normally this activity of rpc foundation day starts you know, almost 6 months to begin with we didn't have that time so we right. just begin right. yeah, we just begin the uh, last two months only and because of their help we could do so many things and we did try to do some more innovations getting a touch of you know people from their heart that comes from our heart also and thank you again for a getting into our hearts we are also extremely thankful sir you have given us a chance to speak in that no no, no not no, at no, all sir. we are very honored sir we are very honored sir, and uh, today i think rajesh sina the team he is always in charge of uh, dinner. dinner and other things which i know that is a fellowship <laughs> and uh, he is waiting for us all of you are invited and let's have a, a gala dinner and gala evening yes. and enjoy the uh, the little bit of uh, tiredness we had and that will go off once we reach there yes. it's a beautiful location of uh, aims swimming pool areas all of you are welcome and i, I like to thank uh, namrata said not only namrata tusha rajesh rohit uh, and so many other faculty members the two young people here uh, dr mantri who is in the holding the gate out there <laughs> 
She is the force behind the entire show. And she has not slept for the last one month or so because she does everything, right from a secretarial job to a clinical job to name anything they do. And recently, the best thing was there was every time we used to send a message, there was immediately a problem. Yeah. So that's all because you know, and we have Dr. Sri Devi. She has been a great support to us. And these people have been taught by and correctly. Told by Namrata Sharma. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you again. Well, thank you. I think, sir, after the physical meeting we had in Gurgaon, two years later, this yeah, is the yeah. first meeting. First and thank you, sir, yeah. for yeah. organizing yeah. this and thank you for getting us all together. Yeah. It wouldn't have been possible without sir. Yeah. And yeah. sir yeah. is a very yeah. large hearted person, you know. He, he, he is so. After such a long time, I have to see my person number four. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 